This is Audible. Harper Audio presents The Man in the Brown Suit and 450 from Paddington by Agatha Christie Performed by Amelia Fox and Joan Hickson Prologue Nadina, the Russian dancer who had taken Paris by storm, swayed to the sound of the applause, bowed and bowed again. Her narrow black eyes narrowed themselves still more. The long line of her scarlet mouth curved faintly upwards. Enthusiastic Frenchmen continued to beat the ground appreciatively as the curtain fell with a swish, hiding the reds and blues and magentas of the bizarre décor. In a swirl of blue and orange draperies, the dancer left the stage. A bearded gentleman received her enthusiastically in his arms. It was the manager. Magnificent, petite, magnificent, he cried. Tonight you have surpassed yourself. He kissed her gallantly on both cheeks in a somewhat matter-of-fact manner. Madame Nadina accepted the tribute with the ease of long habit and passed on to her dressing room, where bouquets were heaped carelessly everywhere. Marvellous garments of futuristic design hung on pegs, and the air was hot and sweet with the scent of the massed blossoms and with the more sophisticated perfumes and essences. Jeanne, the dresser, ministered to her mistress, talking incessantly and pouring out a stream of fulsome compliments. A knock at the door interrupted the flow. Jeanne went to answer it and returned with a card in her hand. Madame will receive? Let me see. The dancer stretched out a languid hand, but at the sight of the name on the card, Count Sergius Paulovich, a sudden flicker of interest came into her eyes. I will see him, the maze penoir, Jeanne, and quickly, and when the Count comes, you may go. Bien, madame. Jeanne brought the peignoir, an exquisite wisp of corn-coloured chiffon and ermine. Nadina slipped into it and sat smiling to herself, whilst one long white hand beat a slow tattoo on the glass of the dressing table. The Count was prompt to avail himself of the privilege accorded to him. A man of medium height, very slim, very elegant, very pale, extraordinarily weary. In feature, little to take hold of, a man difficult to recognise again if one left his mannerisms out of account. He bowed over the dancer's hand with exaggerated courtliness. Madame, this is a pleasure indeed. So much Jeanne heard before she went out, closing the door behind her. Alone with her visitor, a subtle change came over Nadina's smile. Compatriots though we are, we will not speak Russian, I think, she observed. Since we neither of us know a word of the language, it might be as well, agreed her guest. By common consent, they dropped into English, and nobody, now that the Count's mannerisms had dropped from him, could doubt that it was his native language. He had indeed started life as a quick-change music hall artist in London. You had a great success tonight he remarked. I congratulate you. All the same, said the woman, I am disturbed. My position is not what it was. The suspicions aroused during the war have never died down. I am continually watched and spied upon. But no charge of espionage was ever brought against you. Our chief lays his plans too carefully for that. Long life to the colonel, said the Count, smiling. Amazing news, is it not, that he means to retire? To retire, just like a doctor or a butcher or a plumber. Or any other businessman, finished Nadina. It should not surprise us. That is what the colonel has always been, an excellent man of business. He has organized crime as another man might organize a boot factory. Without committing himself, he has planned and directed a series of stupendous coups, embracing every branch of what we might call his profession. Jewel robberies, forgery, espionage, the latter very profitable in wartime, sabotage, discreet assassination, there is hardly anything he has not touched. Wisest of all, he knows when to stop. The game begins to be dangerous. He retires gracefully with an enormous fortune. Hmm, said the Count doubtfully. 
It is rather upsetting for all of us. We're at a loose end, as it were. But we are being paid off on a most generous scale. Something, some undercurrent of mockery in her tone, made the man look at her sharply. She was smiling to herself, and the quality of her smile aroused his curiosity. But he proceeded diplomatically. Yes, the colonel has always been a great paymaster. I attribute much of his success to that, and to his invariable plan of providing a suitable scapegoat. A great brain, undoubtedly a great brain, and an apostle of the maxim, if you want a thing done safely, do not do it yourself. Here are we, every one of us incriminated up to the hilt, and absolutely in his power, and not one of us has anything on him. He paused, almost as though he were expecting her to disagree with him. But she remained silent, smiling to herself as before. Not one of us, he mused. Still, you know he's superstitious, the old man. Years ago, I believe he went to one of these fortune-telling people. She prophesied a lifetime of success, but declared that his downfall would be brought about through a woman. It interested her now. She looked up eagerly. That is strange, very strange, through a woman, you say. He smiled and shrugged his shoulders. Doubtless, now that he has retired, he will marry some young society beauty who will disperse his millions faster than he acquired them. Nadina shook her head. No, no, that is not the way of it. Listen, my friend, tomorrow I go to London. But your contract here... I shall be away only one night, and I go incognito, like royalty. No one will ever know that I have left France. And why do you think that I go? Hardly for pleasure at this time of year. January, a detestable foggy month. It must be for profit, eh? Exactly. She rose and stood in front of him, every graceful line of her arrogant with pride. You said just now that none of us had anything on the chief. You were wrong. I have. I, a woman, have had the wit and, yes, the courage, for it needs courage, to double-cross him. You remember the De Beer diamonds? Yes, I remember. At Kimberley, just before the war broke out. I had nothing to do with it, and I never heard the details. The case was hushed up for some reason, was it not? A fine haul, too. A hundred thousand pounds worth of stones. Two of us worked it, under the colonel's orders, of course, and it was then that I saw my chance. You see, the plan was to substitute some of the De Beer diamonds for some sample diamonds brought from South America by two young prospectors who happened to be in Kimberley at the time. Suspicion was then bound to fall on them. Very clever, interpolated the Count approvingly. The colonel is always clever. Well, I did my part but I also did one thing which the colonel had not foreseen. I kept back some of the South American stones. One or two are unique and could easily be proved never to have passed through De Beer's hands. With these diamonds in my possession, I have the whip hand of my esteemed chief. Once the two young men are cleared, his part in the matter is bound to be suspected. I have said nothing all these years— I have been content to know that I had this weapon in reserve, but now matters are different. I want my price, and it will be big. I might almost say a staggering price. Extraordinary, said the Count, and doubtless you carry these diamonds about with you everywhere. His eyes roamed gently around the disordered room. Nadina laughed softly. You need suppose nothing of the sort. I am not a fool. The diamonds are in a safe place where no one will dream of looking for them. I never thought you a fool, my dear lady, but may I venture to suggest that you are somewhat foolhardy? The colonel is not the type of man to take kindly to being blackmailed, you know. I am not afraid of him, she laughed. There is only one man I have ever feared, and he is dead. The man looked at her curiously. Let us hope that he will not come to life again, then, he remarked lightly. What do you mean? 
cried the dancer sharply. The Count looked slightly surprised. I only meant that resurrection would be awkward for you, he explained. A foolish joke. She gave a sigh of relief. Oh no, he is dead all right, killed in the war. He was a man who once loved me. In South Africa, asked the Count negligently. Yes, since you ask it, in South Africa. That's your native country, is it not? She nodded. Her visitor rose and reached for his hat. Well, he remarked, you know your own business best, but if I were you, I should fear the colonel far more than any disillusioned lover. He is a man whom it is particularly easy to underestimate. She laughed scornfully, as if I did not know him after all these years. I wonder if you do, he said softly. I very much wonder if you do. Oh, I am not a fool, and I am not alone in this. The South African mailboat docks at Southampton tomorrow, and on board her is a man who has come specially from Africa at my request, and who has carried out certain orders of mine. The colonel will have not one of us to deal with, but two. Is that wise? It is necessary. You are sure of this man? A rather peculiar smile played over the dancer's face. I am quite sure of him. He is inefficient, but perfectly trustworthy. She paused and then added in an indifferent tone of voice, As a matter of fact, he happens to be my husband. Chapter One Everybody has been at me right and left to write this story, from the great, represented by Lord Naseby, to the small, represented by our late maid of all work, Emily, whom I saw when I was last in England. Law, miss, what a beautiful book you might make out of it all, just like the pictures. I'll admit that I have certain qualifications for the task. I was mixed up in the affair from the very beginning. I was in the thick of it all through, and I was triumphantly in at the death. Very fortunately, too, the gaps that I cannot supply from my own knowledge are amply covered by Sir Eustace Pedler's diary, of which he has kindly begged me to make use. So here goes. Anne Bedingfeld starts to narrate her adventures. I'd always longed for adventures. You see, my life had such a dreadful sameness. My father, Professor Bedingfeld, was one of England's greatest living authorities on primitive man. He really was a genius, everyone admits that. His mind dwelt in Paleolithic times, and the inconvenience of life for him was that his body inhabited the modern world. Papa did not care for modern man, even Neolithic man he despised as a mere herder of cattle, and he did not rise to enthusiasm until he reached the Mousterian period. Unfortunately, one cannot entirely dispense with modern men, one is forced to have some kind of truck with butchers and bakers and milkmen and greengrocers. Therefore, Papa being immersed in the past, Mama having died when I was a baby, it fell to me to undertake the practical side of living. Frankly, I hate Paleolithic man, be he Aurignacian, Mousterian, Shellian, or anything else, and though I typed and revised most of Papa's Neanderthal man and his ancestors, Neanderthal men themselves fill me with loathing, and I always reflect what a fortunate circumstance it was that they became extinct in remote ages. I do not know whether Papa guessed my feelings on the subject, probably not, and in any case he would not have been interested. The opinion of other people never interested him in the slightest degree. I think it was really a sign of his greatness— in the same way, he lived quite detached from the necessities of daily life. He ate what was put before him in an exemplary fashion, but seemed mildly pained when the question of paying for it arose. We never seemed to have any money. His celebrity was not of the kind that brought in a cash return. Although he was a fellow of almost every important society, and had rows of letters after his name, the general public scarcely knew of his existence and his long, learned books, though adding signally to the sum total of human knowledge, had no attraction for the masses. 
Only on one occasion did he leap into the public gaze. He had read a paper before some society on the subject of the young of the chimpanzee. The young of the human race show some anthropoid features, whereas the young of the chimpanzee approach more nearly to the human than the adult chimpanzee does. That seems to show that whereas our ancestors were more simian than we are, the chimpanzees were of a higher type than the present species. In other words, the chimpanzee is a degenerate. That enterprising newspaper, the Daily Budget, being hard up for something spicy, immediately brought itself out with large headlines. We are not descended from monkeys, but are monkeys descended from us? Eminent professor says chimpanzees are decadent humans. Shortly afterwards, a reporter called to see Papa and endeavoured to induce him to write a series of popular articles on the theory. I have seldom seen Papa so angry. He turned the reporter out of the house with scant ceremony, much to my secret sorrow, as we were particularly short of money at the moment. In fact, for a moment I meditated running after the young man and informing him that my father had changed his mind and would send the articles in question. I could easily have written them myself, and the probabilities were that Papa would never have learnt of the transaction, not being a reader of the daily budget. However, I rejected this course as being too risky, so I merely put on my best hat and went sadly down the village to interview our justly irate grocer. The reporter from the daily budget was the only young man who ever came to our house. There were times when I envied Emily, our little servant, who walked out whenever occasion offered with a large sailor to whom she was affianced. In between times, to keep her hand in, as she expressed it, she walked out with the greengrocer's young man and the chemist's assistant. I reflected sadly that I had no one to keep my hand in with. All Papa's friends were aged professors, usually with long beards. It is true that Professor Peterson once clasped me affectionately and said I had a neat little waist and then tried to kiss me. The phrase alone dated him hopelessly. No self-respecting female has had a neat little waist since I was in my cradle. I yearned for adventure, for love, for romance, and I seemed condemned to an existence of drab utility. The village possessed a lending library, full of tattered works of fiction, and I enjoyed perils and love-making at second hand, and went to sleep dreaming of stern, silent Rhodesians, and of strong men who always felled their opponent with a single blow. There was no one in the village who even looked as though they could fell an opponent with a single blow or several. There was the cinema, too, with a weekly episode of The Perils of Pamela. Pamela was a magnificent young woman. Nothing daunted her. She fell out of aeroplanes, adventured in submarines, climbed skyscrapers, and crept about in the underworld without turning a hair. She was not really clever. The master criminal of the underworld caught her each time, but as he seemed loath to knock her on the head in a simple way, and always doomed her to death in a sewer gas chamber, or by some new and marvellous means— the hero was always able to rescue her at the beginning of the following week's episode. I used to come out with my head in a delirious whirl, and then I would get home and find a notice from the gas company threatening to cut us off if the outstanding account was not paid. And yet, though I did not suspect it, every moment was bringing adventure nearer to me. It is possible that there are many people in the world who have never heard of the finding of an antique skull at the Broken Hill Mine in northern Rhodesia. I came down one morning to find Papa excited to the point of apoplexy. He poured out the whole story to me. You understand, Anne, there are undoubtedly certain resemblances to the Java skull, but superficial, superficial only. No, here we have what I have always maintained— the ancestral form of the Neanderthal race. You grant that the Gibraltar skull is the most primitive of the Neanderthal skulls found. Why? The cradle of the race was in Africa. They passed to Europe. Not marmalade on kippers, Papa, I said hastily, arresting my parents' absent-minded hand. 
Yes, you were saying? They passed to Europe on- Here, he broke down with a bad fit of choking, the result of an immoderate mouthful of kipper bones. But we must start at once, he declared as he rose to his feet at the conclusion of the meal. There is no time to be lost. We must be on the spot. There are doubtless incalculable finds to be found in the neighborhood. I shall be interested to note whether the implements are typical of the Mousterium period. There will be the remains of the primitive ox, I should say, but not those of the woolly rhinoceros. Yes, a little army will be starting soon. We must get ahead of them. You will write to Cook's today, Anne. What about money, Papa? I hinted delicately. He turned a reproachful eye on me. Your point of view always depresses me, my child. We must not be sordid. No, no, in the cause of science one must not be sordid. I feel cooks might be sordid, Papa. Papa looked pained. My dear Anne, you will pay them in ready money. I haven't got any ready money. Papa looked thoroughly exasperated. My child, I really cannot be bothered with these vulgar money details. The bank... I had something from the manager yesterday saying I had twenty-seven pounds. That's your overdraft, I fancy. Ah, I have it. Write to my publishers. I acquiesced doubtfully, Papa's books bringing in more glory than money. I liked the idea of going to Rhodesia immensely. Stern, silent men, I murmured to myself in an ecstasy. Then something in my parents' appearance struck me as unusual. You have odd boots on, Papa, I said. Take off the brown one and put on the other black one, and don't forget your muffler. It's a very cold day. In a few minutes, Papa stalked off, correctly booted and well mufflered. He returned late that evening, and, to my dismay, I saw his muffler and overcoat were missing. Dear me, Anne, you're quite right. I took them off to go into the cavern. One gets so dirty there. I nodded feelingly, remembering an occasion when Papa had returned, literally plastered from head to foot with rich Pleistocene clay. Our principal reason for settling in Little Hampsley had been the neighbourhood of Hampsley Cavern, a buried cave rich in deposits of the Aurignacian culture. We had a tiny museum in the village, and the curator and papa spent most of their days messing about underground and bringing to light portions of woolly rhinoceros and cave bear. Papa coughed badly all the evening, and the following morning I saw he had a temperature and sent for the doctor. Poor papa. He never had a chance. It was double pneumonia. He died four days later. Chapter 2 Everyone was very kind to me. Dazed as I was, I appreciated that. I felt no overwhelming grief. Papa had never loved me, I knew that well enough. If he had, I might have loved him in return. No, there had not been love between us. But we had belonged together, and I had looked after him and had secretly admired his learning and his uncompromising devotion to science— and it hurt me that Papa should have died just when the interest of life was at its height for him. I should have felt happier if I could have buried him in a cave with paintings of reindeer and flint implements, but the force of public opinion constrained a neat tomb with marble slab in our hideous local churchyard. The vicar's consolations, though well meant, did not console me in the least. It took some time to dawn upon me that the thing I had always longed for, freedom, was at last mine. I was an orphan and practically penniless, but free. At the same time, I realized the extraordinary kindness of all these good people. The vicar did his best to persuade me that his wife was in urgent need of a companion help. Our tiny local library suddenly made up its mind to have an assistant librarian. Finally, the doctor called upon me, and, after making various ridiculous excuses for failing to send a proper bill, he hummed and hawed a good deal, and suddenly suggested I should marry him. I was very much astonished. The doctor was nearer forty than thirty, and a round, tubby little man. He was not at all like the hero of The Perils of Pamela, and even less like the stern and silent Rhodesian. 
I reflected a minute, and then asked why he wanted to marry me. That seemed to fluster him a good deal, and he murmured that a wife was a great help to a general practitioner. The position seemed even more unromantic than before, and yet something in me urged towards its acceptance. Safety. That was what I was being offered. Safety and a comfortable home. Thinking it over now, I believe I did the little man an injustice. He was honestly in love with me, but a mistaken delicacy prevented him from pressing his suit on those lines. Anyway, my love of romance rebelled. It's extremely kind of you, I said, but it's impossible. I could never marry a man unless I loved him madly. You don't think— No, I don't, I said firmly. He sighed. But, my dear child, what do you propose to do? Have adventures and see the world, I replied without the least hesitation. Miss Anne, you are very much a child still. You don't understand— the practical difficulties. Yes, I do, Doctor. I'm not a sentimental schoolgirl. I'm a hard-headed mercenary shrew. You'd know it if you married me. Oh, I wish you would reconsider. I can't. He sighed again. I have another proposal to make. An aunt of mine who lives in Wales is in want of a young lady to help her. How would that suit you? No, Doctor. I'm going to London. If things happen anywhere, they happen in London. I shall keep my eyes open, and you'll see, something will turn up. You'll hear of me next in China or Timbuktu. My next visitor was Mr. Fleming, Papa's London solicitor. He came down specially from town to see me. An ardent anthropologist himself, he was a great admirer of Papa's work. He was a tall, spare man with a thin face and grey hair. He rose to meet me as I entered the room, and, taking both my hands in his, patted them affectionately. "'My poor child,' he said, "'my poor, poor child!' Without conscious hypocrisy, I found myself assuming the demeanour of a bereaved orphan. He hypnotised me into it. He was benignant, kind, and fatherly." and without the least doubt he regarded me as a perfect fool of a girl, left adrift to face an unkind world. From the first, I felt that it was quite useless to try to convince him of the contrary. As things turned out, perhaps it was just as well I didn't. My dear child, do you think you can listen to me whilst I try to make a few things clear to you? Oh, yes. Your father, as you know, was a very great man. Posterity will appreciate him, but he was not a good man of business. I knew that quite as well, if not better, than Mr. Fleming, but I restrained myself from saying so. He continued, I do not suppose you understand much of these matters. I will try to explain as clearly as I can. He explained at unnecessary length. The upshot seemed to be that I was left to face life with the sum of eighty-seven pounds, seventeen shillings, and fourteen pence. It seemed a strangely unsatisfying amount. I waited in some trepidation for what was coming next. I feared that Mr. Fleming would be sure to have an aunt in Scotland who was in want of a bright young companion. Apparently, however, he hadn't. The question is, he went on, the future. I understand you have no living relatives. I am alone in the world, I said, and was struck anew by my likeness to a film heroine. You have friends? Everyone has been very kind to me, I said gratefully. Who would not be kind to one so young and charming? said Mr. Fleming gallantly. Well, well, my dear, we must see what can be done. He hesitated a minute, and then said, Supposing, how would it be if you came to us for a time? I jumped at the chance. London, the place for things to happen. It's awfully kind of you, I said. Might I really? Just while I'm looking around, I must start out to earn my living, you know. Yes, yes, my dear child, I quite understand. We will look round for something suitable. I felt instinctively that Mr. Fleming's ideas of something suitable and mine were likely to be widely divergent, 
but it was certainly not the moment to air my views. That is settled then. Why not return with me today? Oh, thank you. But will Mrs. Fleming? My wife will be delighted to welcome you. I wonder if husbands know as much about their wives as they think they do. If I had a husband, I should hate him to bring home orphans without consulting me first. We will send her a wire from the station, continued the lawyer. My few personal belongings were soon packed. I contemplated my hat sadly before putting it on. It had originally been what I call a Mary hat, meaning by that the kind of hat a housemaid ought to wear on her day out, but doesn't. A limp thing of black straw with a suitably depressed brim. With the inspiration of genius, I had kicked it once, punched it twice, dented in the crown, and affixed to it a thing like a cubist's dream of a jazz carrot. The result had been distinctly chic. The carrot I had already removed, of course, and now I proceeded to undo the rest of my handiwork. The Mary hat resumed its former status with an additional battered appearance which made it even more depressing than formerly. I might as well look as much like the popular conception of an orphan as possible. I was just a shade nervous of Mrs. Fleming's reception, but hoped my appearance might have a sufficiently disarming effect. Mr. Fleming was nervous too. I realised that as we went up the stairs of the tall house in a quiet Kensington Square. Mrs. Fleming greeted me pleasantly enough. She was a stout, placid woman of the good wife and mother type. She took me up to a spotless, chintz-hung bedroom, hoped that I had everything I wanted, informed me that tea would be ready in about a quarter of an hour, and left me to my own devices. I heard her voice slightly raised as she entered the drawing room below on the first floor. Well, Henry, why on earth? I lost the rest, but the acerbity of the tone was evident, and a few minutes later another phrase floated up to me in an even more acid voice. I agree with you. She is certainly very good-looking. It is really a very hard life. Men will not be nice to you if you are not good-looking, and women will not be nice to you if you are. With a deep sigh, I proceeded to do things with my hair. I have nice hair. It is black, a real black, not dark brown, and it grows well back from my forehead and down over the ears. With a ruthless hand, I dragged it upwards. As ears, my ears are quite all right, but there is no doubt about it. Ears are demo day nowadays. They're quite like the Queen of Spain's legs in Professor Peterson's young day. When I had finished, I looked almost unbelievably like the kind of orphan that walks out in a queue with a little bonnet and red cloak. I noticed when I went down that Mrs. Fleming's eyes rested on my exposed ears with quite a kindly glance. Mr. Fleming seemed puzzled. I had no doubt that he was saying to himself, What has the child done to herself? On the whole, the rest of the day passed off well. It was settled that I was to start at once to look for something to do. When I went to bed, I stared earnestly at my face in the glass. Was I really good-looking? Honestly, I couldn't say I thought so. I hadn't got a straight Grecian nose or a rosebud mouth or any of the things you ought to have. It is true that a curate once told me that my eyes were like imprisoned sunshine in a dark, dark wood— but curates always know so many quotations and fire them off at random. I'd much prefer to have Irish blue eyes than dark green ones with yellow flecks. Still, green is a good colour for adventuresses. I wound a black garment tightly round me, leaving my arms and shoulders bare. Then I brushed back my hair and pulled it well down over my ears again. I put a lot of powder on my face so that the skin seemed even whiter than usual. I fished about until I found some lip salve, and I put oceans of it on my lips. Then I did under my eyes with burnt cork. Finally, I draped a red ribbon over my bare shoulder, stuck a scarlet feather in my hair, and placed a cigarette in one corner of my mouth. The whole effect pleased me very much. Anna the Adventurous, I said aloud, nodding at my reflection. Anna the Adventurous, Episode 1 the house in Kensington.
Girls are foolish things. Chapter 3 In the succeeding weeks I was a good deal bored. Mrs. Fleming and her friends seemed to me to be supremely uninteresting. They talked for hours of themselves and their children, and of the difficulties of getting good milk for the children, and of what they say to the dairy when the milk wasn't good. Then they would go on to the servants, and the difficulties of getting good servants, and of what they had said to the woman at the registry office, and of what the woman at the registry office had said to them. They never seemed to read the papers, or to care about what went on in the world. They disliked travelling. Everything was so different to England. The Riviera was all right, of course, because one met all one's friends there. I listened, and contained myself with difficulty. Most of these women were rich. The whole wide, beautiful world was theirs to wander in, and they deliberately stayed in dirty, dull London and talked about milkmen and servants. I think now, looking back, that I was perhaps a shade intolerant. But they were stupid, stupid even at their chosen job. Most of them kept the most extraordinarily inadequate and muddled housekeeping accounts. My affairs did not progress very fast. The house and furniture had been sold, and the amount realised had just covered our debts. As yet, I had not been successful in finding a post. Not that I really wanted one. I had the firm conviction that, if I went about looking for adventure, adventure would meet me halfway. It is a theory of mine that one always gets what one wants. My theory was about to be proved in practice. It was early in January, the 8th to be exact. I was returning from an unsuccessful interview with a lady who said she wanted a secretary companion, but really seemed to require a strong charwoman who would work twelve hours a day for twenty-five pounds a year. Having parted with mutual veiled impoliteness, I walked down Edgware Road. The interview had taken place in a house in St. John's Wood, and across Hyde Park to St. George's Hospital. There I entered Hyde Park Corner Tube Station and took a ticket to Gloucester Road. Once on the platform I walked to the extreme end of it. My inquiring mind wished to satisfy itself as to whether there really were points and an opening between the two tunnels just beyond the station in the direction of Down Street. I was foolishly pleased to find I was right. There were not many people on the platform, and at the extreme end there was only myself and one man. As I passed him, I sniffed dubiously. If there is one smell I cannot bear, it is that of mothballs. This man's heavy overcoat simply reeked of them. And yet most men begin to wear their winter overcoats before January, and consequently by this time the smell ought to have worn off. The man was beyond me, standing close to the edge of the tunnel. He seemed lost in thought, and I was able to stare at him without rudeness. He was a small, thin man, very brown of face, with blue light eyes and a small dark beard. Just come from abroad, I deduced. That's why his overcoat smells so. He's come from India. Not an officer, or he wouldn't have a beard. Perhaps a tea planter. At this moment the man turned as though to retrace his steps along the platform. He glanced at me, and then his eyes went on to something behind me. And his face changed. It was distorted by fear, almost panic. He took a step backwards as though involuntarily recoiling from some danger, forgetting that he was standing on the extreme edge of the platform, and went down and over. There was a vivid flash from the rails and a crackling sound. I shrieked. People came running up. Two station officials seemed to materialise from nowhere and took command. I remained where I was, rooted to the spot by a sort of horrible fascination. Part of me was appalled at the sudden disaster, and another part of me was coolly and dispassionately interested in the methods employed for lifting the man off the live rail and back onto the platform. Let me pass, please. I'm a medical man. A tall man with a brown beard pressed past me and bent over the motionless body. As he examined it, a curious sense of unreality seemed to possess me. The thing wasn't real. Couldn't be. Finally, the doctor stood upright and shook his head. Dead as a doornail, 
nothing to be done. We had all crowded nearer, and an aggrieved porter raised his voice. Now then, stand back there, will you? What's the sense in crowding round? A sudden nausea seized me, and I turned blindly and ran up the stairs again towards the lift. I felt that it was too horrible. I must get out into the open air. The doctor who had examined the body was just ahead of me. The lift was just about to go up, another having descended, and he broke into a run. As he did so, he dropped a piece of paper. I stopped, picked it up and ran after him, but the lift gates clanged in my face and I was left holding the paper in my hand. By the time the second lift reached street level, there was no sign of my quarry. I hoped it was nothing important that he had lost, and for the first time I examined it. It was a plain half-sheet of notepaper with some figures and words scrawled upon it in pencil. 17.122 Kilmorden Castle On the face of it, it certainly did not appear to be of any importance. Still, I hesitated to throw it away. As I stood there holding it, I involuntarily wrinkled my nose in displeasure. Mothballs again! I held the paper gingerly to my nose. Yes, it smelt strongly of them, but then... I folded up the paper carefully and put it in my bag. I walked home slowly and did a good deal of thinking. I explained to Mrs. Fleming that I had witnessed a nasty accident in the tube and that I was rather upset and would go to my room and lie down. The kind woman insisted on my having a cup of tea. After that, I was left to my own devices, and I proceeded to carry out a plan I had formed coming home. I wanted to know what it was that had produced that curious feeling of unreality whilst I was watching the doctor examine the body. First I lay down on the floor in the attitude of the corpse, then I laid a bolster down in my stead and proceeded to duplicate, so far as I could remember, every motion and gesture of the doctor. When I had finished I had got what I wanted. I sat back on my heels and frowned at the opposite walls. There was a brief notice in the evening papers that a man had been killed in the tube, and a doubt was expressed whether it was suicide or accident. That seemed to me to make my duty clear, and when Mr. Fleming heard my story, he quite agreed with me. Undoubtedly you will be wanted at the inquest. You say no one else was near enough to see what happened. I had the feeling someone was coming up behind me, but I can't be sure and, anyway, they wouldn't be as near as I was. The inquest was held. Mr. Fleming made all the arrangements and took me there with him. He seemed to fear that it would be a great ordeal for me, and I had to conceal from him my complete composure. The deceased had been identified as L. B. Carton. Nothing had been found in his pockets except a house agent's order to view a house on the river near Marlow. It was in the name of L. B. Carton, Russell Hotel. The bureau clerk from the hotel identified the man as having arrived the day before and booked a room under that name. He had registered as L. B. Carton, Kimberley, South Africa. He had evidently come straight off the steamer. I was the only person who had seen anything of the affair. You think it was an accident? the coroner asked me. I'm positive of it. Something alarmed him, and he stepped backwards blindly without thinking what he was doing. But what could have alarmed him? That I don't know, but there was something. He looked panic-stricken. A stolid juryman suggested that some men were terrified of cats. The man might have seen a cat. I didn't think his suggestion a very brilliant one, but it seemed to pass muster with the jury, who were obviously impatient to get home and only too pleased at being able to give a verdict of accident as opposed to suicide. It is extraordinary to me, said the coroner, that the doctor who first examined the body has not come forward. His name and address should have been taken at the time. It is most irregular not to do so. I smiled to myself. I had my own theory in regard to the doctor. In pursuance of it, I determined to make a call upon Scotland Yard at an early date. But the next morning brought a surprise. 
The Flemings took in the daily budget, and the daily budget was having a day after its own heart. Extraordinary sequel to tube accident. Woman found strangled in lonely house. I read eagerly. A sensational discovery was made yesterday at the Mill House Marlow. The Mill House, which is the property of Sir Eustace Pedler, MP, is to be let unfurnished, and an order to view this property was found in the pocket of the man who was at first thought to have committed suicide by throwing himself on the live rail at Hyde Park Corner tube station. In an upper room of the Mill House, the body of a beautiful young woman was discovered yesterday, strangled. She is thought to be a foreigner, but so far has not been identified. The police are reported to have a clue. Sir Eustace Pedler, the owner of the Mill House, is wintering on the Riviera. Chapter 4 Nobody came forward to identify the dead woman. The inquest elicited the following facts. Shortly after one o'clock on January the 8th, a well-dressed woman with a slight foreign accent had entered the offices of Messrs. Butler and Park, house agents in Knightsbridge. She explained that she wanted to rent or purchase a house on the Thames within easy reach of London. The particulars of several were given to her, including those of the mill house. She gave the name of Mrs. de Castina and her address at the Ritz, but there proved to be no one of that name staying there, and the hotel people failed to identify the body. Mrs. James, the wife of Sir Eustace Pedler's gardener, who acted as caretaker to the mill house and inhabited the small lodge opening on the main road, gave evidence. About three o'clock that afternoon, a lady came to see over the house. She produced an order from the house agents, and, as was the usual custom, Mrs. James gave her the keys to the house. It was situated at some distance from the lodge, and she was not in the habit of accompanying prospective tenants. A few minutes later, a young man arrived. Mrs. James described him as tall and broad-shouldered, with a bronzed face and light grey eyes. He was clean-shaven and was wearing a brown suit. He explained to Mrs. James that he was a friend of the lady who had come to look over the house, but had stopped at the post office to send a telegram. She directed him to the house and thought no more about the matter. Five minutes later, he reappeared, handed back the keys, and explained that he feared the house would not suit them. Mrs. James did not see the lady, but thought that she had gone on ahead. What she did notice was that the young man seemed very much upset about something. He looked like a man who'd seen a ghost. I thought he was taken ill. On the following day, another lady and gentleman came to see the property and discovered the body lying on the floor in one of the upstairs rooms. Mrs. James identified it as that of the lady who had come the day before. The house agents also recognised it as that of Mrs. de Castina. The police surgeon gave it as his opinion that the woman had been dead about twenty-four hours. The daily budget had jumped to the conclusion that the man in the tube had murdered the woman and afterwards committed suicide. However, as the tube victim was dead at two o'clock and the woman was alive and well at three o'clock, the only logical conclusion to come to was that the two occurrences had nothing to do with each other and that the order to view the house at Marlow, found in the dead man's pocket, was merely one of those coincidences which so often occur in this life. A verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown was returned, and the police and the daily budget were left to look for the man in the brown suit. Since Mrs. James was positive that there was no one in the house when the lady entered it, and that nobody except the young man in question entered it until the following afternoon, it seemed only logical to conclude that he was the murderer of the unfortunate Mrs. de Castina. She had been strangled with a piece of stout black cord, and had evidently been caught unawares with no time to cry out. The black silk handbag which she carried contained a well-filled note-case and some loose change, a fine lace handkerchief, unmarked, and the return half of a first-class ticket to London. Nothing much there to go upon. Such were the details published, 
broadcast by the daily budget, and find the man in the brown suit was their daily war cry. On an average, about 500 people wrote daily to announce their success in the quest, and tall young men with well-tanned faces cursed the day when their tailors had persuaded them to a brown suit. The accident in the tube, dismissed as a coincidence, faded out of the public mind. Was it a coincidence? I was not so sure. No doubt I was prejudiced, the tube incident was my own pet mystery— but there certainly seemed to me to be a connection of some kind between the two fatalities. In each there was a man with a tanned face, evidently an Englishman living abroad, and there were other things. It was the consideration of these other things that finally impelled me to what I considered a dashing step. I presented myself at Scotland Yard and demanded to see whoever was in charge of the Mill House case. My request took some time to understand— as I had inadvertently selected the department for lost umbrellas, but eventually I was ushered into a small room and presented to Detective Inspector Meadows. Inspector Meadows was a small man with a ginger head and what I considered a peculiarly irritating manner. A satellite, also in plain clothes, sat unobtrusively in a corner. Good morning, I said nervously. Good morning? Will you take a seat? I understand you've something to tell me that you think may be of use to us. His tone seemed to indicate that such a thing was unlikely in the extreme. I felt my temper stirred. Of course you know about the man who was killed in the tube, the man who had an order to view this same house at Marlow in his pocket. Ah, said the inspector, you are the Miss Beddingfeld who gave evidence at the inquest. Certainly the man had an order in his pocket— a lot of other people may have had two, only they didn't happen to be killed. I rallied my forces. You didn't think it odd that this man had no ticket in his pocket? Easiest thing in the world to drop your ticket, done it myself. And no money? He had some loose change in his trousers pocket. But no note case. Some men don't carry a pocket book or note case of any kind. I tried another tack. You don't think it's odd that the doctor never came forward afterwards? A busy medical man very often doesn't read the papers. He probably forgot all about the accident. In fact, Inspector, you are determined to find nothing odd, I said sweetly. Well, I'm inclined to think you're a little too fond of the word, Miss Beddingfeld. Young ladies are romantic, I know, fond of mysteries and such like, but as I'm a busy man... I took the hint and rose. The man in the corner raised a meek voice. Perhaps if the young lady would tell us briefly what her ideas really are on the subject, Inspector. The Inspector fell in with the suggestion readily enough. Yes, come now, Miss Beddingfeld, don't be offended. You've asked questions and hinted things. Just straight out what it is you've got in your head. I wavered between injured dignity and the overwhelming desire to express my theories. Injured dignity went to the wall. You said at the inquest you were positive it wasn't suicide. Yes, I'm quite certain of that. The man was frightened. What frightened him? It wasn't me. But someone might have been walking up the platform towards us, someone he recognised. You didn't see anyone? No, I admitted. I didn't turn my head— then, as soon as the body was recovered from the line, a man pushed forward to examine it, saying he was a doctor. Nothing unusual in that, said the inspector dryly. But he wasn't a doctor. What? He wasn't a doctor, I repeated. How do you know that, Miss Beddingfeld? It's difficult to say exactly. I've worked in hospitals during the war, and I've seen doctors handle bodies— there's a sort of deft professional callousness that this man hadn't got. Besides, a doctor doesn't usually feel for the heart on the right side of the body. He did that? Yes, I didn't notice it specially at the time, except that I felt there was something wrong. But I worked it out when I got home, and then I saw why the whole thing had looked so unhandy to me at the time. Hmm, said the inspector. He was reaching slowly for pen and paper. 
In running his hands over the upper part of the man's body, he would have ample opportunity to take anything he wanted from the pockets. Doesn't sound likely to me, said the inspector. But, well, can you describe him at all? He was tall and broad-shouldered, wore a dark overcoat and black boots, a bowler hat. He had a dark pointed beard and gold-rimmed eyeglasses. Take away the overcoat, the beard and the eyeglasses, and there wouldn't be much to know him by, grumbled the inspector. He could alter his appearance easily enough in five minutes if he wanted to, which he would do if he's the swell pickpocket you suggest. I had not intended to suggest anything of the kind, but from this moment I gave the inspector up as hopeless. Nothing more you can tell us about him? he demanded as I rose to depart. Yes, I said. I seized my opportunity to fire a parting shot. His head was markedly brachycephalic. He will not find it so easy to alter that. I observed with pleasure that Inspector Meadows' pen wavered. It was clear that he did not know how to spell brachycephalic. Chapter 5 In the first heat of indignation, I found my next step unexpectedly easy to tackle. I had had a half-formed plan in my head when I went to Scotland Yard, one to be carried out if my interview there was unsatisfactory. It had been profoundly unsatisfactory. That is, if I had the nerve to go through with it. Things that one would shrink from attempting normally are easily tackled in a flush of anger. Without giving myself time to reflect, I walked straight to the house of Lord Naseby. Lord Naseby was the millionaire owner of the Daily Budget. He owned other papers, several of them, but the Daily Budget was his special child. It was as the owner of the Daily Budget that he was known to every householder in the United Kingdom. Owing to the fact that an itinerary of the great man's daily proceedings had just been published, I knew exactly where to find him at this moment. It was his hour for dictating to his secretary in his own house. I did not, of course, suppose that any young woman who chose to come and ask for him would be at once admitted to the august presence. But I had attended to that side of the matter. In the card tray in the hall of the Fleming's house, I had observed the card of the Marquis of Lomesley, England's most famous sporting peer. I had removed the card, cleaned it carefully with breadcrumbs, and penciled upon it the words, Please give Miss Beddingfeld a few moments of your time. Adventuresses must not be too scrupulous in their methods. The thing worked. A powdered footman received the card and bore it away. Presently a pale secretary appeared. I fenced with him successfully. He retired in defeat. He again reappeared and begged me to follow him. I did so. I entered a large room. A frightened-looking shorthand typist fled past me like a visitant from the spirit world. Then the door shut, and I was face to face with Lord Naseby. A big man. Big head, big face, big moustache, big stomach— I pulled myself together. I had not come here to comment on Lord Naseby's stomach. He was already roaring at me. Well, what is it? What does Lomesley want? You are his secretary. What's it all about? To begin with, I said, with as great an appearance of coolness as I could manage, I don't know Lord Lomesley, and he certainly knows nothing about me. I took his card from the tray in the house of the people I'm staying with, and I wrote those words on it myself. It was important that I should see you. For a moment it appeared to be a toss-up as to whether Lord Naseby had apoplexy or not. In the end, he swallowed twice and got over it. I admire your coolness, young woman. Well, you see me. If you interest me, you will continue to see me for exactly two minutes longer. That will be ample, I replied, and I shall interest you. It's the Mill House mystery. If you found the man in the brown suit, write to the editor, he interrupted hastily. If you will interrupt, I shall be more than two minutes, I said sternly. I haven't found the man in the brown suit, but I'm quite likely to do so. In as few words as possible, I put the facts of the tube accident and the conclusions I had drawn from them before him. When I had finished, he said unexpectedly, What do you know of brachycephalic heads? 
I mentioned Papa. The monkey man, eh? Well, you seem to have a head of some kind upon your shoulders, young woman. But it's all pretty thin, you know, not much to go upon, and no use to us, as it stands. I'm perfectly aware of that. What do you want, then? I want a job on your paper to investigate this matter. Can't do that. We've got our own special man on it. And I've got my own special knowledge. What you've just told me, eh? Oh, no, Lord Naseby. I've still got something up my sleeve. Oh, you have, have you? You seem a bright sort of girl. Well, what is it? When this so-called doctor got into the lift, he dropped a piece of paper. I picked it up. It smelt of mothballs. So did the dead man. The doctor didn't, so I saw at once that the doctor must have taken it off the body. It had two words written on it and some figures. Let's see it. Lord Naseby stretched out a careless hand. I think not, I said, smiling. It's my find, you see. I'm right. You are a bright girl. Quite right to hang on to it. No scruples about not handing it over to the police. I went there to do so this morning. They persisted in regarding the whole thing as having nothing to do with the Marlowe affair, so I thought that in the circumstances I was justified in retaining the paper. Besides, the inspector put my back up. Short-sighted man. Well, my dear girl, here's all I can do for you. Go on working on this line of yours. If you get anything, anything that's publishable, send it along and you shall have your chance. There's always room for real talent on the daily budget, but you've got to make good first, see? I thanked him and apologized for my methods. Don't mention it. I rather like cheek from a pretty girl. By the way, you said two minutes and you've been three, allowing for interruptions. For a woman, that's quite remarkable. Must be your scientific training. I was in the street again, breathing hard as though I had been running. I found Lord Naseby rather wearing as a new acquaintance. Chapter 6 I went home with a feeling of exultation. My scheme had succeeded far better than I could possibly have hoped. Lord Naseby had been positively genial. It only now remained for me to make good, as he expressed it. Once locked in my own room, I took out my precious piece of paper and studied it attentively. Here was the clue to the mystery. To begin with, what did the figures represent? There were five of them, and a dot after the first two. Seventeen, one hundred and twenty-two, I murmured. That did not seem to lead to anything. Next, I added them up. That is often done in works of fiction and leads to surprising deductions. One and seven make eight, and one is nine, and two are eleven, and two are thirteen. Thirteen! Fateful number! Was this a warning to me to leave the whole thing alone? Very possibly. Anyway, except as a warning, it seemed to be singularly useless. I declined to believe that any conspirator would take that way of writing thirteen in real life. If he meant thirteen, he would write thirteen, one three, like that. There was a space between the one and the two. I accordingly subtracted twenty-two from a hundred and seventy-one. The result was a hundred and fifty-nine. I did it again and made it a hundred and forty-nine. These arithmetical exercises were doubtless excellent practice, but as regarded the solution of the mystery, they seemed totally ineffectual. I left arithmetic alone, not attempting fancy division or multiplication, and went on to the words. Kilmorden Castle. That was something definite. A place, probably the cradle of an aristocratic family. Missing heir, claimant to title, or possibly a picturesque ruin. Buried treasure. Yes, on the whole, I incline to the theory of buried treasure. Figures always go with buried treasure. One pace to the right, seven paces to the left, dig one foot, descend twenty-two steps. That sort of idea. I could work out that later. The thing was to get to Kilmorden Castle as quickly as possible. I made a strategic sally from my room and returned laden with books of reference, Who's Who, Whittaker, a gazetteer, a history of Scotch ancestral homes, and somebody or other's British Isles. Time passed. 
I searched diligently, but with growing annoyance. Finally, I shut the last book with a bang. There appeared to be no such place as Kilmorden Castle. Here was an unexpected check. There must be such a place. Why should anyone invent a name like that and write it down on a piece of paper? Absurd. Another idea occurred to me. Possibly it was a castellated abomination in the suburbs with a high-sounding name invented by its owner. But if so, it was going to be extraordinarily hard to find. I sat back gloomily on my heels. I always sit on the floor to do anything really important, and wondered how on earth I was to set about it. Was there any other line I could follow? I reflected earnestly, and then sprang to my feet delightedly. Of course, I must visit the scene of the crime, always done by the best sleuths, and no matter how long afterwards it may be, they always find something that the police have overlooked. My course was clear. I must go to Marlow. But how was I to get into the house? I discarded several adventurous methods and plumped for stern simplicity. The house had been to let, presumably was still to let. I would be a prospective tenant. I also decided on attacking the local house agents as having fewer houses on their books. Here, however, I reckoned without my host. A pleasant clerk produced particulars of about half a dozen desirable properties. It took me all my ingenuity to find objections to them. In the end, I feared I had drawn a blank. And you've really nothing else? I asked, gazing pathetically into the clerk's eyes. Something right on the river, and with a fair amount of garden and a small lodge, I added, summing up the main points of the mill house as I had gathered them from the papers. Well, of course, there's Sir Eustace Pedler's place, said the man doubtfully. The mill house, you know. Not, not where, I faltered. Really, faltering is getting to be my strong point. That's it, where the murder took place, but perhaps you wouldn't like— Oh, I don't think I should mind, I said with an appearance of rallying. I felt my bona fides was now quite established. And perhaps I might get it cheap, in the circumstances. A master touch that, I thought. Well, it's possible. There's no pretending that it will be easy to let now, servants and all that, you know— if you like the place after you've seen it, I should advise you to make an offer. Shall I write you out an order? If you please. A quarter of an hour later, I was at the lodge of the mill house. In answer to my knock, the door flew open, and a tall, middle-aged woman literally bounced out. Nobody can go into the house, do you hear that? Fairly sick of you reporters I am. Sir Eustace's orders are— I understood the house was to let, I said freezingly, holding out my order— of course, if it's already taken. Oh, I'm sure I beg your pardon, miss. I've been fairly pestered with these newspaper people. Not a minute's peace. No, the house isn't let, nor likely to be now. Are the drains wrong? I asked in an anxious whisper. Oh, Lord, miss, the drains is all right. But surely you've heard about that foreign lady as was done to death here? Well, I believe I did read something about it in the papers, I said carelessly. My indifference piqued the good woman. If I had betrayed any interest, she would probably have closed up like an oyster. As it was, she positively bridled. I should say you did, miss. It's been in all the newspapers. The daily budget's out still to catch the man who did it. It seems, according to them, as our police are no good at all. Well, I hope they'll get him. Although a nice-looking fellow he was, and no mistake. A kind of soldierly look about him. Ah, well, I dare say he'd been wounded in the war, and sometimes they go a bit queer afterwards. My sister's boy did. Perhaps she used him bad. They're a bad lot, those foreigners, though she was a fine-looking woman. Stood there where you're standing now. Was she dark or fair? I ventured. You can't tell from these newspaper portraits. Dark hair and a very white face. Too white for nature, I thought. Had her lips reddened something cruel. I don't like to see it. A little powder now and then is quite another thing. We were conversing like old friends now. I put another question. Did she seem nervous or upset at all? 
Not a bit. She was smiling to herself quiet-like, as though she was amused at something. That's why you could have knocked me down with a feather when, the next afternoon, those people came running out calling for the police and saying they'd be murder done. I shall never get over it. And as for setting foot in that house after dark, I wouldn't do it. Not if it was ever so. Why, I wouldn't even stay here at the lodge if Sir Eustace hadn't been down on his bended knees to me. I thought Sir Eustace Pedler was at Cannes. So he was, miss. He came back to England when he heard the news, and, as to the bended knees, that was a figure of speech. His secretary, Mr. Paget, having offered us double pay to stay on, and, as my John says, money is money nowadays. I concurred heartily with John's by no means original remarks. The young man now, said Mrs. James, reverting suddenly to a former point in the conversation, he was upset. His eyes, light eyes they were. I noticed them particular, was all shining, excited, I thought. But I never dreamt of anything being wrong, not even when he came out again looking all queer. How long was he in the house? Oh, not long, a matter of five minutes, maybe. How tall was he, do you think? About six foot? I should say so, maybe. He was clean-shaven, you say? Yes, miss, not even one of these toothbrush moustaches. Was his chin at all shiny? I asked on a sudden impulse. Mrs. James stared at me with awe. Well, now you come to mention it, miss. It was. However, did you know? It's a curious thing, but murderers often have shiny chins. I explained wildly. Mrs. James accepted the statement in all good faith. Really now, miss, I've never heard that before. You didn't notice what kind of a head he had, I suppose? Just the ordinary kind, miss. I'll fetch you the keys, shall I? I accepted them and went on my way to the mill house. My reconstruction so far I considered good, all along I had realised that the differences between the man Mrs. James had described and my tube doctor were those of non-essentials, an overcoat, a beard, gold-rimmed eyeglasses. The doctor had appeared middle-aged, but I remembered that he had stooped over the body like a comparatively young man. There had been a suppleness which told of young joints. The victim of the accident— the mothball man, as I called him to myself, and the foreign woman, Mrs. de Castina, or whatever her real name was, had had an assignation to meet at the mill house. That was how I pieced the thing together. Either because they feared they were being watched, or for some other reason, they chose the rather ingenious method of both getting an order to view the same house. Thus, their meeting there might have the appearance of pure chance." that the mothball man had suddenly caught sight of the doctor, and that the meeting was totally unexpected and alarming to him, was another fact of which I was fairly sure. What had happened next? The doctor had removed his disguise and followed the woman to Marlowe, but it was possible that had he removed it rather hastily, traces of spirit gum might still linger on his chin. Hence my question to Mrs. James— Whilst occupied with my thoughts, I had arrived at the low, old-fashioned door of the mill house. Unlocking it with the key, I passed inside. The hall was low and dark, the place smelt forlorn and mildewy. In spite of myself, I shivered. Did the woman who had come here, smiling to herself, a few days ago, feel no chill of premonition as she entered this house? I wondered. Did the smile fade from her lips, and did a nameless dread close round her heart? Or had she gone upstairs, smiling still, unconscious of the doom that was so soon to overtake her? My heart beat a little faster. Was the house really empty? Was doom waiting for me in it also? For the first time I understood the meaning of the much-used word, atmosphere. There was an atmosphere in this house— an atmosphere of cruelty, of menace, of evil. Chapter 7 Shaking off the feelings that oppressed me, I went quickly upstairs. I had no difficulty in finding the room of the tragedy. On the day the body was discovered, it had rained heavily, and large muddy boots had trampled the uncarpeted floor in every direction. I wondered if the murderer had left any footmarks the previous day. 
It was likely that the police would be reticent on the subject if he had, but on consideration I decided it was unlikely. The weather had been fine and dry. There was nothing of interest about the room. It was almost square with two big bay windows, plain white walls and a bare floor, the boards being stained round the edges where the carpet had ceased. I searched it carefully, but there was not so much as a pin lying about. The gifted young detective did not seem likely to discover a neglected clue. I had brought with me a pencil and notebook. There did not seem much to note, but I duly dotted down a brief sketch of the room to cover my disappointment at the failing of my quest. As I was in the act of returning the pencil to my bag, it slipped from my fingers and rolled along the floor. The mill house was really old, and the floors were very uneven. The pencil rolled steadily, with increasing momentum, until it came to rest under one of the windows. In the recess of each window there was a broad window seat, underneath which there was a cupboard. My pencil was lying right against the cupboard door. The cupboard was shut, but it suddenly occurred to me that if it had been open my pencil would have rolled inside. I opened the door, and my pencil immediately rolled in and sheltered modestly in the farthest corner. I retrieved it, noting as I did so that owing to lack of light and the peculiar formation of the cupboard, one could not see it, but had to feel for it. Apart from my pencil the cupboard was empty, but being thorough by nature, I tried the one under the opposite window. At first sight it looked as though that also was empty, but I grubbed about perseveringly and was rewarded by feeling my hand close on a hard paper cylinder which lay in a sort of trough or depression in the far corner of the cupboard. As soon as I had it in my hand, I knew what it was. A roll of Kodak films. Here was a find. I realised, of course, that these films might very well be an old roll belonging to Sir Eustace Pedler, which had rolled in here and had not been found when the cupboard was emptied. But I did not think so. The red paper was far too fresh-looking. It was just as dusty as it would have been had it lain there for two or three days, that is to say, since the murder. Had it been there for any length of time, it would have been thickly coated. Who had dropped it, the man or the woman? I remembered that the contents of her handbag had appeared to be intact. If it had been jerked open in the struggle and the roll of films had fallen out, surely some of the loose money would have been scattered about also. No, it was not the woman who had dropped the films. I sniffed suddenly and suspiciously. Was the smell of mothballs becoming an obsession with me? I could swear that the roll of films smelt of it also. I held them under my nose. They had, as usual, a strong smell of their own, but apart from that I could clearly detect the odour I disliked so much. I soon found the cause a minute thread of cloth had caught on a rough edge of the centre wood, and that shred was strongly impregnated with mothballs. At some time or another the films had been carried in the overcoat pocket of the man who was killed in the tube. Was it he who had dropped them here? Hardly. His movements were all accounted for. No, it was the other man. The doctor, he had taken the films when he had taken the paper. It was he who had dropped them here during his struggle with the woman. I had got my clue. I would have the role developed, and then I would have further developments to work on. Very elated, I left the house, returned the keys to Mrs. James, and made my way as quickly as possible to the station. On the way back to town, I took out my paper and studied it afresh. Suddenly the figures took on a new significance. Suppose they were a date. Seventeen one twenty two. The seventeenth of January, nineteen twenty two. Surely that must be it. Idiot that I was not to have thought of it before. But in that case I must find out the whereabouts of Kilmorden Castle, for today was actually the fourteenth. Three days. Little enough. Almost hopeless when one had no idea of where to look. It was too late to hand in my roll today. I had to hurry home to Kensington so as not to be late for dinner. It occurred to me that there was an easy way of verifying whether some of my conclusions were correct. 
I asked Mr. Fleming whether there had been a camera amongst the dead man's belongings. I knew that he had taken an interest in the case and was conversant with all the details. To my surprise and annoyance, he replied that there had been no camera. All Carton's effects had been gone over very carefully in the hopes of finding something that might throw light upon his state of mind. He was positive that there had been no photographic apparatus of any kind. That was rather a setback to my theory. If he had no camera, why should he be carrying a roll of films? I set out early next morning to take my precious roll to be developed. I was so fussy that I went all the way to Regent Street to the big Kodak place. I handed it in and asked for a print of each film. The man finished stacking together a heap of films packed in yellow tin cylinders for the tropics and picked up my roll. He looked at me. You've made a mistake, I think, he said, smiling. Oh, no, I said. I'm sure I haven't. You've given me the wrong roll. This is an unexposed one. I walked out with what dignity I could muster. I dare say it is good for one now and again to realise what an idiot one can be, but nobody relishes the process. And then, just as I was passing one of the big shipping offices, I came to a sudden halt. In the window was a beautiful model of one of the company's boats, and it was labelled Kenilworth Castle. A wild idea shot through my brain. I pushed the door open and went in. I went up to the counter, and in a faltering voice, genuine this time, I murmured, Kilmorden Castle? On the 17th from Southampton, Cape Town, first or second class. How much is it? First class, eighty-seven pounds. I interrupted him. The coincidence was too much for me. Exactly the amount of my legacy. I would put all my eggs in one basket. First class, I said. I was now definitely committed to the adventure. Chapter 8 Extracts from the Diary of Sir Eustace Pedler, M.P. It's an extraordinary thing that I never seem to get any peace. I am a man who likes a quiet life. I like my club, my rubber of bridge, a well-cooked meal, a sound wine. I like England in the summer and the Riviera in the winter. I have no desire to participate in sensational happenings. Sometimes, in front of a good fire, I do not object to reading about them in the newspaper. But that is as far as I am willing to go. My object in life is to be thoroughly comfortable. I have devoted a certain amount of thought and a considerable amount of money to further that end, but I cannot say that I always succeed. If things do not actually happen to me, they happen round me, and frequently, in spite of myself, I become involved. I hate being involved. All this because Guy Paget came into my bedroom this morning with a telegram in his hand and a face as long as a mute at a funeral. Guy Paget is my secretary, a zealous, painstaking, hard-working fellow, admirable in every respect. I know no one who annoys me more. For a long time I have been racking my brains as to how to get rid of him. But you cannot very well dismiss a secretary because he prefers work to play, likes getting up early in the morning, and has positively no vices. The only amusing thing about the fellow is his face. He has the face of a fourteenth-century poisoner the sort of man the Borgias got to do their odd jobs for them. I wouldn't mind so much if Paget didn't make me work too. My idea of work is something that should be undertaken lightly and airily, trifled with, in fact. I doubt if Guy Paget has ever trifled with anything in his life. He takes everything seriously. That is what makes him so difficult to live with. Last week I had the brilliant idea of sending him off to Florence. He talked about Florence and how much he wanted to go there. My dear fellow, I cried, you shall go tomorrow. I will pay all your expenses. January isn't the usual time for going to Florence, but it would be all one to Paget. I could imagine him going about guidebook in hand, religiously doing all the picture galleries, and a week's freedom was cheap to me at the price. It has been a delightful week. I have done everything I wanted to, and nothing that I did not want to do. But when I blinked my eyes open and perceived Paget standing between me and the light at the unearthly hour of 9 a.m. this morning, I realized that freedom was over. My dear fellow, 
I said. Has the funeral already taken place, or is it for later in the morning? Paget does not appreciate dry humour. He merely stared. So you know, Sir Eustace. No what? I said crossly. From the expression on your face, I inferred that one of your near and dear relatives was to be interred this morning. Paget ignored the sally as far as possible. I thought you couldn't know about this. He tapped the telegram. I know you dislike being aroused early, but it is nine o'clock. Paget insists on regarding nine a.m. as practically the middle of the day. And I thought that under the circumstances... He tapped the telegram again. What is that thing? I asked. It's a telegram from the police at Marlow. A woman has been murdered in your house. That aroused me in earnest. What colossal cheek, I exclaimed. Why, in my house? Who murdered her? They don't say. I suppose we shall go back to England at once, Sir Eustace. You need suppose nothing of the kind. Why should we go back? The police. What on earth have I to do with the police? Well, it is your house. That, I said, appears to be more my misfortune than my fault. Guy Paget shook his head gloomily. It will have a very unfortunate effect upon the constituency, he remarked lugubriously. I don't see why it should have, and yet I have a feeling that in such matters, Paget's instincts are always right. On the face of it, a member of Parliament will be none the less efficient because a stray young woman comes and gets herself murdered in an empty house that belongs to him. But there is no accounting for the view the respectable British public takes of a matter. She's a foreigner, too, and that makes it worse, continued Paget gloomily. Again, I believe he is right. If it is disreputable to have a woman murdered in your house, it becomes more disreputable if the woman is a foreigner. Another idea struck me. Good heavens, I exclaimed. I hope this won't upset Caroline. Caroline is the lady who cooks for me. Incidentally, she is the wife of my gardener. What kind of a wife she makes, I don't know, but she is an excellent cook. James, on the other hand, is not a good gardener, but I support him in idleness and give him the lodge to live in solely on account of Caroline's cooking. I don't suppose she'll stay after this, said Paget. You always were a cheerful fellow, I said. I expect I shall have to go back to England. Paget clearly intends that I shall, and there is Caroline to pacify. Three days later. It is incredible to me that anyone who can get away from England in winter does not do so. It is an abominable climate. All this trouble is very annoying. The house agents say it will be next to impossible to let the mill house after all the publicity. Caroline has been pacified, with double pay. We could have sent her a cable to that effect from Cannes. In fact, as I have said all along, there was no earthly purpose to serve by our coming over. I shall go back tomorrow. One day later. Several very surprising things have occurred. To begin with, I met Augustus Milray, the most perfect example of an old ass the present government has produced. His manner oozed diplomatic secrecy as he drew me aside in the club into a quiet corner. He talked a good deal about South Africa and the industrial situation there, about the growing rumours of a strike on the Rand, of the secret causes actuating that strike. I listened as patiently as I could. Finally, he dropped his voice to a whisper and explained that certain documents had come to light which ought to be placed in the hands of General Smuts. I've no doubt you're quite right, I said, stifling a yawn. But how are we to get them to him? Our position in the matter is delicate, very delicate. What's wrong with the post? I said cheerfully. Put a Tupney stamp on and drop him in the nearest letterbox. He seemed quite shocked at the suggestion. My dear peddler, the common post. It has always been a mystery to me why governments employ king's messengers and draw such attention to their confidential documents. If you don't like the post, send one of your own young fellows. He'll enjoy the trip. Impossible, said Milray, wagging his head in a senile fashion. There are reasons, my dear peddler. I assure you there are reasons. Well, I said, rising, all this is very interesting, but I must be off. 
One minute, my dear peddler, one minute, I beg of you. Now tell me, in confidence, is it not true that you intend visiting South Africa shortly yourself? You have large interests in Rhodesia, I know, and the question of Rhodesia joining in the Union is one in which you have a vital interest. Well, I had thought of going out in about a month's time. You couldn't possibly make it sooner, this month, this week, in fact. I could, I said, eyeing him with some interest, but I don't know that I particularly want to. You would be doing the government a great service, a very great service. You would not find them, uh, ungrateful. Meaning you want me to be the postman? Exactly. Your position is an unofficial one. Your journey is bona fide. Everything would be eminently satisfactory. Well, I said slowly, I don't mind if I do. The one thing I am anxious to do is to get out of England again as soon as possible. You will find the climate of South Africa delightful, quite delightful. My dear fellow, I know all about the climate. I was out there shortly before the war. I am really much obliged to you, peddler. I will send you round the package by messenger, to be placed in General Smut's own hands, you understand. The Kilmorden Castle sails on Saturday. Quite a good boat. I accompanied him a short way along Pall Mall before we parted. He shook me warmly by the hand and thanked me again effusively. I walked home reflecting on the curious byways of governmental policy. It was the following evening that Jarvis, my butler, informed me that a gentleman wished to see me on private business, but declined to give his name. I have always a lively apprehension of insurance touts, so told Jarvis to say I could not see him. Guy Paget, unfortunately, when he might for once have been of real use, was laid up with a bilious attack. These earnest, hard-working young men with weak stomachs are always liable to bilious attacks. Jarvis returned. The gentleman asked me to tell you, Sir Eustace, that he comes to you from Mr. Milray. That altered the complexion of things. A few minutes later, I was confronting my visitor in the library. He was a well-built young fellow with a deeply tanned face. A scar ran diagonally from the corner of his eye to the jaw, disfiguring what would otherwise have been a handsome, though somewhat reckless, countenance. Well, I said, what's the matter? Mr. Milray sent me to you, Sir Eustace. I am to accompany you to South Africa as your secretary. My dear fellow, I said, I've got a secretary already. I don't want another. I think you do, Sir Eustace. Where is your secretary now? He's down with a bilious attack, I explained. You are sure it's only a bilious attack? Of course it is. He's subject to them. My visitors smiled. It may or may not be a bilious attack. Time will show. But I can tell you this, Sir Eustace, Mr. Milray would not be surprised if an attempt were made to get your secretary out of the way. Oh, you need have no fear for yourself. I suppose a momentary alarm had flickered across my face. You are not threatened. Your secretary out of the way, access to you would be easier. In any case, Mr. Milray wishes me to accompany you. The passage money will be our affair, of course, but you will take the necessary steps about the passport as though you had decided that you needed the services of a second secretary. He seemed a determined young man. We stared at each other, and he stared me down. Very well, I said feebly. You will say nothing to anyone as to my accompanying you. Very well, I said again. After all, perhaps it was better to have this fellow with me. But I had a premonition that I was getting into deep waters, just when I thought I had attained peace. I stopped my visitor as he was turning to depart, it might be just as well if I knew my new secretary's name, I observed sarcastically. He considered for a minute. Harry Rayburn seems quite a suitable name, he observed. It was a curious way of putting it. Very well, I said for the third time. Chapter 9 Anne's Narrative Resumed it is most undignified for a heroine to be seasick. 
In books, the more it rolls and tosses, the better she likes it. When everybody else is ill, she alone staggers along the deck, braving the elements and positively rejoicing in the storm. I regret to say that at the first roll the Kilmorden gave, I turned pale and hastened below. A sympathetic stewardess received me. She suggested dry toast and ginger ale. I remained groaning in my cabin for three days. Forgotten was my quest. I had no longer any interest in solving mysteries. I was a totally different Anne to the one who had rushed back to the South Kensington Square so jubilantly from the shipping office. I smiled now as I remembered my abrupt entry into the drawing room. Mrs. Fleming was alone there. She turned her head as I entered. Is that you, Anne, my dear? There is something I want to talk over with you. Yes, I said, curbing my impatience. Miss Emery is leaving me. Miss Emery was the governess. As you have not yet succeeded in finding anything, I wondered if you would care. It would be so nice if you remained with us altogether. I was touched. She didn't want me, I knew. It was sheer Christian charity that prompted the offer. I felt remorseful for my secret criticism of her. Getting up, I ran impulsively across the room and flung my arms round her neck. You're a dear, I said. A dear, a dear, a dear, and thank you ever so much. But it's all right. I'm off to South Africa on Saturday. My abrupt onslaught had startled the good lady. She was not used to sudden demonstrations of affection. My words startled her still more. To South Africa? My dear Anne, we would have to look into anything of that kind very carefully. That was the last thing I wanted. I explained that I had already taken my passage, and that upon arrival I proposed to take up duties as a parlour-maid. It was the only thing I could think of on the spur of the moment. There was, I said, a great demand for parlour-maids in South Africa. I assured her that I was equal to taking care of myself, and in the end, with a sigh of relief at getting me off her hands, she accepted the project without further query. At parting, she slipped an envelope into my hand. Inside it I found five new crisp five-pound notes, and the words, I hope you will not be offended and will accept this with my love. She was a very good, kind woman. I could not have continued to live in the same house with her, but I did recognise her intrinsic worth. So here I was, with twenty-five pounds in my pocket, facing the world and pursuing my adventure. It was on the fourth day that the stewardess finally urged me up on deck. Under the impression that I should die quicker below, I had steadfastly refused to leave my bunk. She now tempted me with the advent of Madeira. Hope rose in my breast. I could leave the boat and go ashore and be a parlour-maid there, anything for dry land. Muffled in coats and rugs and weak as a kitten on my legs, I was hauled up and deposited, an inert mass on a deck chair. I lay there with my eyes closed, hating life. The purser, a fair-haired young man with a round boyish face, came and sat down beside me. Hello. Feeling rather sorry for yourself, eh? Yes, I replied, hating him. Ah, you won't know yourself in another day or two. We've had a rather nasty dusting in the bay, but there's smooth weather ahead. I'll be taking you on at Coit's tomorrow. I did not reply. Think you'll never recover, eh? But I've seen people much worse than you, and two days later they were the life and soul of the ship. You'll be the same. I did not feel sufficiently pugnacious to tell him outright that he was a liar. I endeavoured to convey it by a glance. He chatted pleasantly for a few minutes more, then he mercifully departed. People passed and repassed, brisk couples exercising, coveting children, laughing young people. A few other pallid sufferers lay, like myself, in deck chairs. The air was pleasant, crisp, not too cold, and the sun was shining brightly. Insensibly I felt a little cheered. I began to watch the people. One woman in particular attracted me. She was about thirty, of medium height and very fair, with a round, dimpled face and very blue eyes. Her clothes, though perfectly plain, had that indefinable air of cut about them which spoke of Paris. 
Also, in a pleasant but self-possessed way, she seemed to own the ship. Deck stewards ran to and fro, obeying her commands. She had a special deck chair and an apparently inexhaustible supply of cushions. She changed her mind three times as to where she would like it placed. Throughout everything, she remained attractive and charming. She appeared to be one of those rare people in the world who know what they want, see that they get it, and manage to do so without being offensive. I decided that if ever I recovered, but of course I shouldn't, it would amuse me to talk to her. We reached Madeira about midday. I was still too inert to move, but I enjoyed the picturesque-looking merchants who came on board and spread their merchandise about the decks. There were flowers, too. I buried my nose in an enormous bunch of sweet, wet violets and felt distinctly better. In fact, I thought I might just possibly last out the end of the voyage. When my stewardess spoke of the attractions of a little chicken broth, I only protested feebly. When it came, I enjoyed it. My attractive woman had been ashore. She came back escorted by a tall, soldierly-looking man with dark hair and a bronzed face, whom I had noticed striding up and down the deck earlier in the day. I put him down at once as one of the strong, silent men of Rhodesia. He was about forty, with a touch of greying hair at either temple, and was easily the best-looking man on board. When the stewardess brought me up an extra rug, I asked her if she knew who my attractive woman was. "'That's a well-known society lady, the Honourable Mrs. Clarence Blair. You must have read about her in the papers.' I nodded, looking at her with renewed interest. Mrs. Blair was very well known indeed as one of the smartest women of the day. I observed, with some amusement, that she was the centre of a good deal of attention. Several people essayed to scrape acquaintance with the pleasant informality that a boat allows. I admired the polite way that Mrs. Blair snubbed them. She appeared to have adopted the strong, silent man as her special cavalier, and he seemed duly sensible of the privilege accorded him. The following morning, to my surprise, after taking a few turns round the deck with her attentive companion, Mrs. Blair came to a halt by my chair. Feeling better this morning? I thanked her and said I felt slightly more like a human being. You did look ill yesterday. Colonel Grace and I decided that we should have the excitement of a funeral at sea, but you've disappointed us. I laughed. Being up in the air has done me good. Nothing like fresh air, said Colonel Race, smiling. Being shut up in those stuffy cabins would kill anyone declared Mrs. Blair, dropping into a seat by my side and dismissing her companion with a little nod. You've got an outside one, I hope. I shook my head. My dear girl, why don't you change? There's plenty of room. A lot of people got off at Madeira and the boat's very empty. Talk to the purser about it. He's a nice little boy. He changed me into a beautiful cabin because I didn't care for the one I'd got. You talk to him at lunchtime when you go down. I shuddered. I couldn't move. Don't be silly. Come and take a walk now with me. She dimpled at me encouragingly. I felt very weak on my legs at first, but as we walked briskly up and down, I began to feel a brighter and better being. After a turn or two, Colonel Race joined us again. You can see the grand peak of Tenerife from the other side. Can we? Can I get a photograph of it, do you think? No, but that won't deter you from snapping off at it. Mrs. Blair laughed. Oh, you are unkind. Some of my photographs are very good. About three percent effective, I should say. We all went round to the other side of the deck. There, glimmering white and snowy, enveloped in a delicate rose-coloured mist, rose the glistening pinnacle. I uttered an exclamation of delight. Mrs. Blair ran for her camera. Undeterred by Colonel Race's sardonic comments, she snapped vigorously. There, that's the end of the roll. Oh, her tone changed to one of chagrin. I've had the thing at bulb all the time. I always like to see a child with a new toy, murmured the Colonel. How horrid you are, but I've got another roll. She produced it in triumph from the pocket of her sweater. 
A sudden roll of the boat upset her balance, and as she caught at the rail to steady herself, the roll of films flashed over the side. Oh! cried Mrs. Blair, comically dismayed. She leaned over. Do you think they've gone overboard? No. You may have been fortunate enough to brain an unlucky steward in the deck below. A small boy who had arrived unobserved a few paces to our rear blew a deafening blast on a bugle. Lunch! declared Mrs. Blair ecstatically. I've had nothing to eat since breakfast except two cups of beef tea. Lunch, Miss Beddingfeld? Well, I said waveringly, yes, I do feel rather hungry. Splendid! You're sitting at the purser's table, I know. Tackle him about the cabin. I found my way down to the saloon, began to eat gingerly, and finished by consuming an enormous meal. My friend of yesterday congratulated me on my recovery. Everyone was changing cabins today, he told me, and he promised that my things should be moved to an outside one without delay. There were only four at our table. Myself, a couple of elderly ladies, and a missionary who talked a lot about our poor black brothers. I looked round at the other tables. Mrs. Blair was sitting at the captain's table, Colonel Race next to her. On the other side of the captain was a distinguished-looking grey-haired man. A good many people I had already noticed on deck, but there was one man who had not previously appeared. Had he done so, he could hardly have escaped my notice. He was tall and dark, and had such a peculiarly sinister type of countenance that I was quite startled. I asked the purser, with some curiosity, who he was. That man... Oh, that's Sir Eustace Pedler's secretary. Been very seasick, poor chap, and not appeared before. Sir Eustace has got two secretaries with him, and the sea's been too much for both of them. The other fellow hasn't turned up yet. This man's name is Paget. So Sir Eustace Pedler, the owner of the mill house, was on board. Probably only a coincidence. And yet? That's Sir Eustace, my informant continued, sitting next to the captain pompous old ass. The more I studied the secretary's face, the less I liked it. Its even pallor, the secretive, heavy-lidded eyes, the curiously flattened head, it all gave a feeling of distaste, of apprehension. Leaving the saloon at the same time as he did, I was close behind him as he went up on deck. He was speaking to Sir Eustace, and I overheard a fragment or two. I'll see about the cabin at once, then, shall I? It's impossible to work in yours with all your trunks. My dear fellow, Sir Eustace replied, my cabin is intended, A, for me to sleep in, and B, to attempt to dress in. I never had any intentions of allowing you to sprawl about the place, making an infernal clicking with that typewriter of yours. That's just what I say, Sir Eustace. We must have somewhere to work. Here I parted company from them and went below to see if my removal was in progress. I found my steward busy at the task. Very nice cabin, miss. On D-deck, number thirteen. Oh, no, I cried. Not thirteen. Thirteen is the one thing I am superstitious about. It was a nice cabin, too. I inspected it, wavered, but a foolish superstition prevailed. I appealed almost tearfully to the steward. Isn't there any other cabin I can have? The steward reflected. Well, there's seventeen just along the starboard side. That was empty this morning, but I rather fancy it's been allotted to someone. Still, as the gentleman's things aren't in it yet, and as gentlemen aren't anything like so superstitious as ladies, I dare say he wouldn't mind changing. I hailed the proposition gratefully, and the steward departed to obtain permission from the purser. He returned, grinning. That's all right, miss. We can go along. He led the way to seventeen. It was not quite as large as number thirteen, but I found it eminently satisfactory. I'll fetch your things right away, miss, said the steward. But at that moment, the man with the sinister face, as I had nicknamed him, appeared in the doorway. Excuse me, he said, but this cabin is reserved for the use of Sir Eustace Pedler. That's all right, sir explained the steward. We're fitting up number 13 instead. No, it was number 17 I was to have. Number 13 is a better cabin, sir, larger. 
I specially selected number 17, and the purser said I could have it. I'm sorry, I said coldly, but number 17 has been allotted to me. I can't agree to that, the steward put in his oar. The other cabin's just the same, only better. I want number 17. What's all this? demanded a new voice. Steward, put my things in here. This is my cabin. It was my neighbour at lunch, the Reverend Edward Chichester. I beg your pardon, I said. It's my cabin. It is allotted to Sir Eustace Pedler, said Mr. Paget. We were all getting rather heated. I'm sorry to have to dispute the matter, said Chichester with a meek smile, which failed to mask his determination to get his own way. Meek men are always obstinate, I have noticed. He edged himself sideways into the doorway. You ought to have number 28 on the port side, said the steward. A very good cabin, sir. I am afraid that I must insist. Number 17 was the cabin promised to me. We had come to an impasse. Each one of us was determined not to give way. Strictly speaking, I, at any rate, might have retired from the contest and eased matters by offering to accept cabin 28. So long as I did not have 13, it was immaterial to me what other cabin I had. But my blood was up, and I had not the least intention of being the first to give way. And I disliked Chichester. He had false teeth that clicked when he ate. Many men have been hated for less. We all said the same things over again. The steward assured us even more strongly that both the other cabins were better cabins. None of us paid any attention to him. Paget began to lose his temper. Chichester kept his serenely. With an effort, I also kept mine. And still, none of us would give way an inch. A wink and a whispered word from the steward gave me my cue. I faded unobtrusively from the scene. I was lucky enough to encounter the purser almost immediately. Oh, please, I said. You did say I could have cabin 17, and the others won't go away. Mr. Chichester and Mr. Paget, you will let me have it, won't you? I always say that there are no people like sailors for being nice to women. My little purser came to scratch splendidly. He strode to the scene, informed the disputants that number 17 was my cabin, they could have numbers 13 and 28 respectively, or stay where they were, whichever they chose. I permitted my eyes to tell him what a hero he was, and then installed myself in my new domain. The encounter had done me worlds of good. The sea was smooth, the weather growing daily warmer. Seasickness was a thing of the past. I went up on deck and was initiated into the mysteries of deck coits. I entered my name for various sports. Tea was served on deck and I ate heartily. After tea, I played shovelboard with some pleasant young men. They were extraordinarily nice to me. I felt that life was satisfactory and delightful. The dressing bugle came as a surprise and I hurried to my new cabin. The stewardess was awaiting me with a troubled face. There's a terrible smell in your cabin, miss. What is it? I'm sure I can't think, but I doubt if you'll be able to sleep here. There's a deck cabin up on sea deck. You might move into that, just for the night anyway. The smell really was pretty bad, quite nauseating. I told the stewardess I would think over the question of moving whilst I dressed. I hurried over my toilet, sniffing distastefully as I did so. What was the smell? Dead rat? No, worse than that, and quite different. Yet I knew it. It was something I had smelt before. Something... Ah, I'd got it. Asafetida. I had worked in a hospital dispensary during the war for a short time and had become acquainted with various nauseous drugs. Asafetida, that was it. But how? I sank down on the sofa, suddenly realising the thing. Somebody had put a pinch of asafetida in my cabin. Why? So that I should vacate it? Why were they so anxious to get me out? I thought of the scene this afternoon from a rather different point of view. What was it about cabin 17 that made so many people anxious to get hold of it? The other two cabins were better cabins. Why had both men insisted on sticking to 17? 17. 17. 
how the number persisted. It was on the 17th I had sailed from Southampton. It was a 17. I stopped with a sudden gasp. Quickly I unlocked my suitcase and took my precious paper from its place of concealment in some rolled stockings. 17, 1, 22. I had taken that for a date, the date of departure of the Kilmorden Castle. Supposing I was wrong. When I came to think of it, would anyone writing down a date think it necessary to put the year as well as the month? Supposing 17 meant cabin 17, and 1, the time, 1 o'clock, then 22 must be the date. I looked up at my little almanac. Tomorrow was the 22nd. Chapter 10 I was violently excited. I was sure that I had hit on the right trail at last. One thing was clear, I must not move out of the cabin. The asafetida had got to be born. I examined my facts again. Tomorrow was the 22nd, and at 1 a.m. or 1 p.m. something would happen. I plumped for 1 a.m. It was now 7 o'clock. In six hours I should know. I don't know how I got through the evening. I retired to my cabin fairly early. I told the stewardess that I had a cold in the head and didn't mind smells. She still seemed distressed, but I was firm. The evening seemed interminable. I duly retired to bed, but in view of emergencies I swathed myself in a thick flannel dressing gown and encased my feet in slippers. Thus attired, I felt that I could spring up and take an active part in anything that happened. What did I expect to happen? I hardly knew. Vague fancies, most of them wildly improbable, flitted through my brain. But one thing I was firmly convinced of. At one o'clock, something would happen. At various times I heard fellow passengers coming to bed— Fragments of conversation, laughing good nights, floated in through the open transom. Then, silence. Most of the lights went out. There was still one in the passage outside, and there was therefore a certain amount of light in my cabin. I heard eight bells go. The hour that followed seemed the longest I had ever known. I consulted my watch surreptitiously to be sure I had not overshot the time. If my deductions were wrong, if nothing happened at one o'clock, I should have made a fool of myself and spent all the money I had in the world on a mare's nest. My heart beat painfully. Two bells went overhead. One o'clock. And nothing. Wait, what was that? I heard the quick, light patter of feet running, running along the passage. Then, with the suddenness of a bombshell, my cabin door burst open and a man almost fell inside. Save me, he said hoarsely. They're after me. It was not a moment for argument or explanation. I could hear footsteps outside. I had about forty seconds in which to act. I had sprung to my feet and was standing facing the stranger in the middle of the cabin. A cabin does not abound in hiding places for a six-foot man— with one arm I pulled out my cabin trunk. He slipped down behind it under the bunk. I raised the lid. At the same time, with the other hand, I pulled down the wash basin. A deft movement, and my hair was screwed into a tiny knot on the top of my head. From the point of view of appearance, it was inartistic. From another standpoint, it was supremely artistic. A lady, with her hair screwed into an unbecoming knob, and in the act of removing a piece of soap from her trunk, with which, apparently, to wash her neck, could hardly be suspected of harbouring a fugitive. There was a knock at the door, and without waiting for me to say, come in, it was pushed open. I don't know what I expected to see. I think I had vague ideas of Mr. Paget brandishing a revolver, or my missionary friend with a sandbag or some other lethal weapon but I certainly did not expect to see a night stewardess with an inquiring face and looking the essence of respectability. "'I beg your pardon, miss. I thought you called out.' "'No,' I said. "'I didn't.' Oh, "'I'm sorry for interrupting you.' "'That's all right,' I said. "'I couldn't sleep. I thought a wash would do me good.' It sounded rather as though it were a thing I never had as a general rule. 
I'm so sorry, miss, said the stewardess again, but there's a gentleman about who's rather drunk, and we're afraid he might get into one of the ladies' cabins and frighten them. How dreadful, I said, looking alarmed. He won't come in here, will he? Oh, I don't think so, miss. Ring the bell if he does. Good night. Good night. I opened the door and peeped down the corridor. Except for the retreating form of the stewardess, there was nobody in sight. Drunk. So that was the explanation of it. My histrionic talents had been wasted. I pulled the cabin trunk out a little farther and said, Come out at once, please, in an acid voice. There was no answer. I peered under the bunk. My visitor lay immovable. He seemed to be asleep. I tugged at his shoulder. He did not move. Dead drunk, I thought vexedly. What am I to do? Then I saw something that made me catch my breath, a small scarlet spot on the floor. Using all my strength, I succeeded in dragging the man out into the middle of the cabin. The dead whiteness of his face showed that he had fainted. I found the cause of his fainting easily enough. He had been stabbed under the left shoulder blade, a nasty deep wound. I got his coat off and set to work to attend it. At the sting of the cold water he stirred, then sat up. Keep still, please, I said. He was the kind of young man who recovers his faculties very quickly. He pulled himself to his feet and stood there swaying a little. Thank you. I don't need anything done for me. His manner was defiant, almost aggressive. Not a word of thanks, of even common gratitude. That's a nasty wound. You must let me dress it. You will do nothing of the kind. He flung the words in my face as though I had been begging a favour of him. My temper, never placid, rose. I cannot congratulate you on your manners, I said coldly. I can at least relieve you of my presence. He started for the door, but reeled as he did so. With an abrupt movement, I pushed him down upon the sofa. Don't be a fool, I said unceremoniously. You don't want to go bleeding all over the ship, do you? He seemed to see the sense of that, for he sat quietly whilst I bandaged up the wound as best I could. There, I said, bestowing a pat on my handiwork. That will have to do for the present. Are you better tempered now, and do you feel inclined to tell me what it's all about? I'm sorry that I can't satisfy your very natural curiosity. Why not? I said chagrined. He smiled nastily. If you want a thing broadcast, tell a woman. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut. Don't you think I could keep a secret? I don't think. I know. He rose to his feet. At any rate, I said spitefully, I shall be able to do a little broadcasting about the events of this evening. I've no doubt you will, too, he said indifferently. How dare you? I cried angrily. We were facing each other, glaring at each other with the ferocity of bitter enemies. For the first time, I took in the details of his appearance. The close-cropped dark head, the lean jaw, the scar on the brown cheek, the curious light grey eyes that looked into mine with a sort of reckless mockery hard to describe. There was something dangerous about him. You haven't thanked me yet for saving your life, I said with false sweetness. I hit him there. I saw him flinch distinctly. Intuitively, I knew that he hated above all to be reminded that he owed his life to me. I didn't care. I wanted to hurt him. I'd never wanted to hurt anyone so much. I wish to God you hadn't, he said explosively. I'd be better dead and out of it. I'm glad you acknowledge the debt. You can't get out of it. I saved your life, and I'm waiting for you to say thank you. If looks could have killed, I think he would have liked to kill me then. He pushed roughly past me. At the door, he turned back and spoke over his shoulder. I shall not thank you, now or at any other time, but I acknowledge the debt. Some day I will pay it. He was gone, leaving me with clenched hands and my heart beating like a mill race. Chapter 11 There were no further excitements that night. I had breakfast in bed and got up late the next morning. Mrs. Blair hailed me as I came on deck. 
Good morning, gypsy girl. Sit down here by me. You look as though you hadn't slept well. Why do you call me that? I asked as I sat down obediently. Do you mind? It suits you somehow. I've called you that in my own mind from the beginning. It's the gypsy element in you that makes you so different from anyone else. I decided in my own mind that you and Colonel Race were the only two people on board who wouldn't bore me to death to talk to. That's funny, I said. I thought the same about you. Only it's more understandable in your case. You're... you're such an exquisitely finished product. Not badly put, said Mrs. Blair, nodding her head. Tell me about yourself, gypsy girl. Why are you going to South Africa? I told her something about Papa's life work. So, you're Charles Beddingfeld's daughter. I thought you weren't a mere provincial miss. Are you going to Broken Hill to grub up more skulls? I may, I said cautiously. I've got other plans as well. What a mysterious minx you are. But you do look tired this morning. Didn't you sleep well? I can't keep awake on board a boat. Ten hours sleep for a fool, they say. I could do with twenty. She yawned, looking like a sleepy kitten. An idiot of a steward woke me up in the middle of the night to return me that roll of films I dropped yesterday. He did it in the most melodramatic manner, stuck his arm through the ventilator and dropped them neatly in the middle of my tummy. I thought it was a bomb for a moment. Here's your colonel, I said, as the tall, soldierly figure of Colonel Race appeared on the deck. He's not my colonel particularly, in fact, he admires you very much, gypsy girl, so don't run away. I want to tie something round my head. It will be more comfortable than a hat. I slipped quickly away. For some reason or other, I was uncomfortable with Colonel Race. He was one of the few people who were capable of making me feel shy. I went down to my cabin and began looking for something with which I could restrain my rebellious locks. Now, I am a tidy person. I like my things always arranged in a certain way, and I keep them so. I had no sooner opened my drawer than I realized that somebody had been disarranging my things. Everything had been turned over and scattered. I looked in the other drawers and the small hanging cupboard. They told the same tale. It was as though someone had been making a hurried and ineffectual search for something. I sat down on the edge of the bunk with a grave face, who had been searching my cabin, and what had they been looking for? Was it the half-sheet of paper with scribbled figures and words? I shook my head, dissatisfied. Surely that was past history now. But what else could there be? I wanted to think. The events of last night, though exciting, had not really done anything to elucidate matters. Who was the young man who had burst into my cabin so abruptly? I had not seen him on board previously, either on deck or in the saloon. Was he one of the ship's company, or was he a passenger? Who had stabbed him? Why had they stabbed him? And why, in the name of goodness, should cabin number 17 figure so prominently? It was all a mystery, but there was no doubt that some very peculiar occurrences were taking place on the Kilmorden Castle. I counted off on my fingers the people on whom it behoved me to keep watch. Setting aside my visitor of the night before, but promising myself that I would discover him on board before another day had passed, I selected the following persons as worthy of my notice. 1. Sir Eustace Pedler. He was the owner of the mill house, and his presence on the Kilmorden Castle seemed something of a coincidence. 2. Mr. Paget the sinister-looking secretary, whose eagerness to obtain cabin 17 had been so very marked. Note, find out whether he had accompanied Sir Eustace to Cannes. 3. The Reverend Edward Chichester. All I had against him was his obstinacy over cabin 17, and that might be entirely due to his own peculiar temperament. Obstinacy can be an amazing thing. But a little conversation with Mr. Chichester would not come amiss, I decided. Hastily tying a handkerchief round my hair, I went up on deck again, full of purpose. I was in luck. My quarry was leaning against the rail, drinking beef tea. I went up to him. I hope you've forgiven me over cabin 17, I said with my best smile. 
I consider it unchristian to bear a grudge, said Mr. Chichester coldly. But the purser had distinctly promised me that cabin. Pursers are such busy men, aren't they? I said vaguely. I suppose they're bound to forget sometimes. Mr. Chichester did not reply. Is this your first visit to South Africa? I inquired conversationally. To South Africa, yes, but I have worked for the last two years amongst the cannibal tribes in the interior of East Africa. How thrilling! Have you had many narrow escapes? Escapes? Of being eaten, I mean. You should not treat sacred subjects with levity, Miss Beddingfeld. I didn't know that cannibalism was a sacred subject, I retorted, stung. As the words left my lips, another idea struck me. If Mr. Chichester had indeed spent the last two years in the interior of Africa, how was it that he was not more sunburnt? His skin was as pink and white as a baby's. Surely there was something fishy there. Yet his manner and voice were so absolutely it. Too much so, perhaps. Was he, or was he not, just a little like a stage clergyman? I cast my mind back to the curates I had known at Little Hampsley. Some of them I had liked, some of them I had not, but certainly none of them had been quite like Mr. Chichester. They had been human, he was a glorified type. I was debating all this when Sir Eustace Pedler passed down the deck. Just as he was abreast of Mr. Chichester, he stooped and picked up a piece of paper, which he handed to him, remarking, You've dropped something! He passed on without stopping, and so probably did not notice Mr. Chichester's agitation. I did. Whatever it was he had dropped, its recovery agitated him considerably. He turned a sickly green and crumpled up the sheet of paper into a ball. My suspicions were accentuated a hundredfold. He caught my eye and hurried into explanations. A, a fragment of a sermon I was composing, he said with a sickly smile. Indeed, I rejoined politely. A fragment of a sermon, indeed. No, Mr. Chichester, too weak for words. He soon left me with a muttered excuse. I wished, oh, how I wished that I had been the one to pick up that paper and not Sir Eustace Pedler. One thing was clear, Mr. Chichester could not be exempted from my list of suspects. I was inclined to put him top of the three. After lunch, when I came up to the lounge for coffee, I noticed Sir Eustace and Paget sitting with Mrs. Blair and Colonel Race. Mrs. Blair welcomed me with a smile, so I went over and joined them. They were talking about Italy. But it is misleading, Mrs. Blair insisted. Aqua calda certainly ought to be cold water, not hot. You're not a Latin scholar, said Sir Eustace, smiling. Men are so superior about their Latin, said Mrs. Blair. But all the same, I notice that when you ask them to translate inscriptions in old churches, they can never do it. They hem and haw and get out of it somehow. Quite right, said Colonel Race. I always do. But I love the Italians continued Mrs. Blair. They're so obliging, though even that has its embarrassing side. You ask them the way somewhere, and instead of saying first to the right, second to the left, or something that one could follow, they pour out a flood of well-meaning directions, and when you look bewildered, they take you kindly by the arm and walk all the way there with you. Is that your experience in Florence, Paget? asked Sir Eustace, turning with a smile to his secretary. For some reason the question seemed to disconcert Mr. Paget. He stammered and flushed. Oh, c c quite so, yes, uh, quite so. Then, with a murmured excuse, he rose and left the table. I'm beginning to suspect Guy Paget of having committed some dark deed in Florence, remarked Sir Eustace, gazing after his secretary's retreating figure. Whenever Florence or Italy is mentioned, he changes the subject or bolts precipitately. Perhaps he murdered someone there, said Mrs. Blair, hopefully. He looks... I hope I'm not hurting your feelings, Sir Eustace, but he does look as though he might murder someone. Yes, poor Cinquecento. 
It amuses me sometimes, especially when one knows as well as I do how essentially law-abiding and respectable the poor fellow really is. He's been with you some time, hasn't he, Sir Eustace? asked Colonel Race. Six years, said Sir Eustace with a deep sigh. He must be quite invaluable to you, said Mrs. Blair. Oh, invaluable. Yes, quite invaluable. The poor man sounded even more depressed, as though the invaluableness of Mr. Paget was a secret grief to him. Then he added more briskly, But his face should really inspire you with confidence, my dear lady. No self-respecting murderer would ever consent to look like one. Crippen, now, I believe, was one of the pleasantest fellows imaginable. He was caught on a liner, wasn't he? murmured Mrs. Blair. There was a slight rattle behind us. I turned quickly. Mr. Chichester had dropped his coffee cup. Our party soon broke up. Mrs. Blair went below to sleep, and I went out on deck. Colonel Race followed me. You're very elusive, Miss Beddingfeld. I looked for you everywhere last night at the dance. I went to bed early, I explained. Are you going to run away tonight, too, or are you going to dance with me? I shall be very pleased to dance with you. I murmured shyly, but Mrs. Blair. Our friend Mrs. Blair doesn't care for dancing. And to you? I care for dancing with you. Oh, I said nervously. I was a little afraid of Colonel Race. Nevertheless, I was enjoying myself. This was better than discussing fossilized skulls with stuffy old professors. Colonel Race was really just my ideal of a stern, silent Rhodesian. Possibly I might marry him. I hadn't been asked, it is true, but, as the boy scouts say, be prepared. And all women, without in the least meaning it, consider every man they meet as a possible husband for themselves or their best friend. I danced several times with him that evening. He danced well. When the dancing was over and I was thinking of going to bed, he suggested a turn round the deck. We walked round three times and finally subsided into two deck chairs. There was nobody else in sight. We made desultory conversation for some time. Do you know, Miss Beddingfeld, I think I once met your father, a very interesting man, on his own subject, and it's a subject that has a special fascination for me. In my humble way, I've done a bit in that line myself. Why, when I was in the Dordogne region, our talk became technical. Colonel Race's boast was not an idle one. He knew a great deal. At the same time, he made one or two curious mistakes, slips of the tongue, I might almost have thought them. But he was quick to take his cue from me and to cover them up. Once he spoke of the Mousterian period as succeeding the Aurignacian, an absurd mistake for one who knew anything of the subject. It was twelve o'clock when I went to my cabin. I was still puzzling over those queer discrepancies. Was it possible that he had got the whole subject up for the occasion, that really he knew nothing of archaeology? I shook my head, vaguely dissatisfied with that solution. Just as I was dropping off to sleep, I sat up with a sudden start as another idea flashed into my head. Had he been pumping me? Were those slight inaccuracies just tests to see whether I really knew what I was talking about? In other words, he suspected me of not being genuinely Anne Beddingfeld. Why? Chapter 12 Extract from the Diary of Sir Eustace Pedler there is something to be said for life on board ship. It is peaceful. My grey hairs fortunately exempt me from the indignities of bobbing for apples, running up and down deck with potatoes and eggs, and the more painful sports of Brother Bill and Bolster Bar. What amusement people can find in these painful proceedings has always been a mystery to me. But there are many fools in the world. One praises God for their existence and keeps out of their way. Fortunately, I am an excellent sailor. Paget, poor fellow, is not. He began turning green as soon as we were out of the Solent. I presume my other so-called secretary is also seasick. At any rate, he has not yet made an appearance. But perhaps it is not seasickness, but high diplomacy. 
the great thing is that I have not been worried by him. On the whole, the people on board are a mangy lot. Only two decent bridge players and one decent-looking woman, Mrs. Clarence Blair. I've met her in town, of course. She is one of the only women I know who can lay claim to a sense of humour. I enjoy talking to her, and should enjoy it more if it were not for a long-legged, taciturn ass who attached himself to her like a limpet. I cannot think that this Colonel Race really amuses her. He's good-looking in his way, but dull as ditch-water. One of those strong, silent men that lady novelists and young girls always wave over. Guy Paget struggled up on deck after we left Madeira and began babbling in a hollow voice about work. What the devil does anyone want to work for on board ship? It is true that I promised my publishers my reminiscences early in the summer, but what of it? Who really reads reminiscences? Old ladies in the suburbs. And what do my reminiscences amount to? I've knocked against a certain number of so-called famous people in my lifetime. With the assistance of Paget, I invented insipid anecdotes about them. And the truth of the matter is, Paget is too honest for the job. He won't let me invent anecdotes about the people I might have met but haven't. I tried kindness with him. You look a perfect wreck still, my dear chap, I said easily. What you need is a deck chair in the sun. No, not another word. The work must wait. The next thing I knew, he was worrying about an extra cabin. There's no room to work in your cabin, Sir Eustace. It's full of trunks. From his tone, you might have thought the trunks were black beetles, something that had no business to be there. I explained to him that, though he might not be aware of the fact, it was usual to take a change of clothing with one when travelling. He gave the one smile with which he always greets my attempts at humour, and then reverted to the business in hand. And we could hardly work in my little hole. I know Paget's little holes. He usually has the best cabin on the ship. I'm sorry the captain didn't turn out for you this time, I said sarcastically. Perhaps you'd like to dump some of your extra luggage in my cabin. Sarcasm is dangerous with a man like Paget. He brightened up at once. Well, if I could get rid of the typewriter and the stationary trunk. The stationary trunk weighs several solid tons. It causes endless unpleasantness with the porters, and it is the aim of Paget's life to foist it on me. It is a perpetual struggle between us. He seems to regard it as my special personal property. I, on the other hand, regard the charge of it as the only thing where a secretary is really useful. We'll get an extra cabin, I said hastily. The thing seemed simple enough, but Paget is a person who loves to make mysteries. He came to me the next day with a face like a Renaissance conspirator. You know you told me to get cabin 17 for an office? Well, what of it? Has the stationary trunk jammed in the doorway? The doorways are the same size in all the cabins, replied Paget seriously. But I tell you, Sir Eustace, there's something very queer about that cabin. Memories of reading The Upper Berth floated through my mind. If you mean that it's haunted, I said, we're not going to sleep there, so I don't see that it matters. Ghosts don't affect typewriters. Paget said that it wasn't a ghost and that, after all, he hadn't got cabin 17. He told me a long garbled story. Apparently, he and Mr. Chichester and a girl called Beddingfeld had almost come to blows over the cabin. Needless to say, the girl had won, and Paget was apparently feeling sore over the matter. Both 13 and 28 are better cabins, he reiterated, but they wouldn't look at them. Well... I said, stifling a yawn. For that matter, no more would you, my dear Paget. He gave me a reproachful look. You told me to get cabin 17. There is a touch of the boy upon the burning deck about Paget. My dear fellow, I said testily, I mentioned number 17 because I happened to observe that it was vacant, but I didn't mean you to make a stand to the death about it. 13 or 28 would have done us equally well. He looked hurt. There's something more, though, he insisted. Miss Beddingfeld got the cabin, but this morning I saw Chichester coming out of it in a furtive sort of way. I looked at him severely. 
If you're trying to get up a nasty scandal about Chichester, who is a missionary, though a perfectly poisonous person, and that attractive child Anne Beddingfeld, I don't believe a word of it, I said coldly. Anne Beddingfeld is an extremely nice girl, with particularly good legs. I should say she had far and away the best legs on board. Paget did not like my reference to Anne Beddingfeld's legs. He is the sort of man who never notices legs himself, or, if he does, would die sooner than say so. Also, he thinks my appreciation of such things frivolous. I like annoying Paget, so I continued maliciously. As you've made her acquaintance, you might ask her to dine at our table tomorrow night. It's the fancy dress dance. By the way, you'd better go down to the barber and select a fancy costume for me. Surely you will not go in fancy dress, said Paget in tones of horror. I could see that it was quite incompatible with his idea of my dignity. He looked shocked and pained. I had really had no intention of donning fancy dress, but the complete discomfiture of Paget was too tempting to be forborne. What do you mean? I said. Of course I shall wear fancy dress. So will you. Paget shuddered. So go down to the barber's and see about it. I finished. I don't think he'll have any outsizes, murmured Paget, measuring my figure with his eye. Without meaning it, Paget can occasionally be extremely offensive. And order a table for six in the saloon, I said. We'll have the captain, the girl with the nice legs, Mrs. Blair. You won't get Mrs. Blair without Colonel Race, Paget interposed. He's asked her to dine with him, I know. Paget always knows everything. I was justifiably annoyed. Who is Race? I demanded, exasperated. As I said before, Paget always knows everything, or thinks he does. He looked mysterious again. They say he's a secret service chap, Sir Eustace. Rather a great gun, too. But of course, I don't know for certain. Isn't that like the government? I exclaimed. Here's a man on board whose business it is to carry about secret documents, and they go giving them to a peaceful outsider who only asks to be let alone. Paget looked even more mysterious. He came a pace nearer and dropped his voice. If you ask me, the whole thing is very queer, Sir Eustace. Look at the illness of mine before we started. My dear fellow, I interrupted brutally. That was a bilious attack. You're always having bilious attacks. Paget winced slightly. It wasn't the usual sort of bilious attack. This time... For God's sake, don't go into details of your condition, Paget. I don't want to hear them. Very well, Sir Eustace, but my belief is that I was deliberately poisoned. Ah, I said. You've been talking to Rayburn. He did not deny it. At any rate, Sir Eustace, he thinks so, and he should be in a position to know. By the way, where is the chap? I asked. I've not set eyes on him since we came on board. He gives out that he's ill and stays in his cabin, Sir Eustace. Paget's voice dropped again. But that's camouflage, I'm sure, so that he can watch better. Watch! over your safety, Sir Eustace, in case an attack should be made upon you. You're such a cheerful fellow, Paget. I said. I trust that your imagination runs away with you. If I were you, I should go to the dance as a death's head or an executioner. It will suit your mournful style of beauty. That shut him up for the time being. I went on deck. The Beddingfell girl was deep in conversation with the missionary parson, Chichester, Women always flutter round Parsons. A man of my figure hates stooping, but I had the courtesy to pick up a bit of paper that was fluttering round the Parsons' feet. I got no word of thanks for my pains. As a matter of fact, I couldn't help seeing what was written on the sheet of paper. There was just one sentence. Don't try to play a lone hand, or it will be worse for you. That's a nice thing for a Parson to have. Who is this fellow Chichester, I wonder? He looks mild as milk, but looks are deceptive. I shall ask Paget about him. Paget always knows everything. I sank gracefully into my deck chair by the side of Mrs. Blair, thereby interrupting her tete-a-tete -tete with race, and remarked that I didn't know what the clergy were coming to nowadays. Then I asked her to dine with me on the night of the fancy dress dance. 
Somehow or other, Race managed to get included in the invitation. After lunch, the Beddingfeld girl came and sat with us for coffee. I was right about her legs. They are the best on the ship. I shall certainly ask her to dinner as well. I would very much like to know what mischief Paget was up to in Florence. Whenever Italy is mentioned, he goes to pieces. If I did not know how intensely respectable he is, I should suspect him of some disreputable amour. I wonder now, even the most respectable men, it would cheer me up enormously if it were so. Paget, with a guilty secret. Splendid. Chapter 13 It had been a curious evening. The only costume that fitted me in the barber's emporium was that of a teddy bear. I don't mind playing bears with some nice young girls on a winter's evening in England, but it's hardly an ideal costume for the equator. However, I created a good deal of merriment and won first prize for brought on board, an absurd term for a costume hired for the evening. Still, as nobody seemed to have the least idea whether they were made or brought, it didn't matter. Mrs. Blair refused to dress up. Apparently, she is at one with Paget on the matter. Colonel Race followed her example. Anne Beddingfeld had concocted a gypsy costume for herself and looked extraordinarily well. Paget said he had a headache and didn't appear. To replace him, I asked a quaint little fellow called Reeves, He's a prominent member of the South African Labour Party. Horrible little man, but I want to keep in with him, as he gives me information that I need. I want to understand this Rand business from both sides. Dancing was a hot affair. I danced twice with Anne Beddingfeld, and she had to pretend she liked it. I danced once with Mrs. Blair, who didn't trouble to pretend, and I victimised various other damsels whose appearance struck me favourably. Then we went down to supper. I had ordered champagne. The steward suggested Clicquot 1911 as being the best they had on the boat, and I fell in with his suggestion. I seemed to have hit on the one thing that would loosen Colonel Wace's tongue. Far from being taciturn, the man became actually talkative. For a while, this amused me. Then it occurred to me that Colonel Wace, and not myself, was becoming the life and soul of the party. He chafed me at length about keeping a diary. It will reveal all your indiscretions one of these days, peddler. My dear race, I said, I venture to suggest that I am not quite the fool you think me. I may commit indiscretions, but I don't write them down in black and white. After my death, my executors will know my opinion of a great many people, but I doubt if they will find anything to add or detract from their opinion of me. A diary is useful for recording the idiosyncrasies of other people, but not one's own. There is such a thing as unconscious self-revelation, though. In the eyes of the psychoanalyst, all things are vile, I replied sententiously. You must have had a very interesting life, Colonel Race, said Miss Beddingfeld, gazing at him with wide, starry eyes. That's how they do it, these girls. Othello charmed Desdemona by telling her stories. But, oh, didn't Desdemona charm Othello by the way she listened? Anyway... The girl set race off all right. He began to tell lion stories. A man who has shot lions in large quantities has an unfair advantage over other men. It seemed to me that it was time I, too, told a lion story, one of a more sprightly character. By the way, I remarked, that reminds me of a rather exciting tale I heard. A friend of mine was out on a shooting trip somewhere in East Africa. One night, he came out of his tent for some reason and was startled by a low growl. He turned sharply and saw a lion crouching to spring. He had left his rifle in the tent. Quick as thought, he ducked, and the lion sprang right over his head. Annoyed at having missed him, the animal growled and prepared to spring again. Again he ducked, and again the lion sprang right over him. This happened a third time, but by now he was close to the entrance of his tent, and he darted in and seized his rifle. When he emerged, rifle in hand, the lion had disappeared. That puzzled him greatly. He crept round the back of the tent, where there was a little clearing. There, sure enough, was the lion, busily practising low jumps. This was received by a roar of applause. I drank some champagne. On another occasion, I remarked, this friend of mine had a second curious experience. 
he was trekking across country, and, being anxious to arrive at his destination before the heat of the day, he ordered his boys to inspan while it was still dark. They had some trouble in doing so, as the mules were very restive, but at last they managed it, and a start was made. The mules raced along like the wind, and when daylight came they saw why. In the darkness, the boys had inspanned a lion as the near wheeler. This too was well received, a ripple of merriment going round the table. But I'm not sure that the greatest tribute did not come from my friend, the Labour member, who remained pale and serious. My God, he said anxiously, who unharnessed them? I must go to Rhodesia, said Mrs. Blair. After what you have told us, Colonel Race, I simply must. It's a horrible journey, though, five days in the train. You must join me in my private car, I said gallantly. Oh, Sir Eustace, how sweet of you. Do you really mean it? Do I mean it? I exclaimed reproachfully and drank another glass of champagne. Just about another week and we shall be in South Africa, sighed Mrs. Blair. Ah, South Africa. I said sentimentally, and began to quote from a recent speech of mine at the Colonial Institute. What has South Africa to show the world? What indeed? Her fruit and her farms, her wool and her wattles, her herds and her hides, her gold mines and her diamonds. I was hurrying on because I knew that as soon as I paused, Reeves would butt in and inform me that the hides were worthless because the animals hung themselves up on barbed wire or something of that sort, would crab everything else and end up with the hardships of the miners on the rand. And I was not in the mood to be abused as a capitalist. However, the interruption came from another source at the magic word diamonds. Diamonds? said Mrs. Blair ecstatically. Diamonds? breathed Miss Beddingfeld. They both addressed Colonel Race. I suppose you've been to Kimberley. I had been to Kimberley too, but I didn't manage to say so in time. Race was being inundated with questions. What were mines like? Was it true that the natives were kept shut up in compounds? And so on. Race answered their questions and showed a good knowledge of his subject. He described the methods of housing the natives, the searches instituted, and the various precautions that de Beers took. Then it's practically impossible to steal any diamonds, asked Mrs. Blair, with as keen an air of disappointment as though she had been journeying there for the express purpose. Nothing's impossible, Mrs. Blair. Thefts do occur, like the case I told you of where the Kaffir hid the stone in his wound. Yes, but on a large scale. Once, in recent years, just before the war, in fact. You must remember the case, Peddler. You were in South Africa at the time. I nodded. Tell us, cried Miss Beddingfeld. Oh, do tell us. Race smiled. Very well. You shall have the story. I suppose most of you have heard of Sir Lawrence Erdsley, the great South African mining magnate. His mines were gold mines, but he comes into the story through his son. You may remember that just before the war, rumours were a field of a new potential Kimberley, hidden somewhere in the rocky floor of the British Guyana jungles. Two young explorers, so it was reported, had returned from that part of South America, bringing with them a remarkable collection of rough diamonds, some of them of considerable size. Diamonds of small size had been found before in the neighbourhood of the Essequibo and Mazaruni rivers, but these two young men, John Erdsley and his friend Lucas, claimed to have discovered beds of great carbon deposits at the common head of two streams. The diamonds were of every colour, pink, blue, yellow, green, black, and the purest white. Erdsley and Lucas came to Kimberley, where they were to submit their gems to inspection. At the same time, a sensational robbery was found to have taken place at De Beers. When sending diamonds to England, they are made up into a packet. This remains in the big safe, of which the two keys are held by two different men, whilst a third man knows the combination. They are handed to the bank, and the bank send them to England. Each package is worth roughly about a hundred thousand pounds. On this occasion, the bank was struck by something a little unusual about the sealing of the packet. It was opened, 
and found to contain knobs of sugar. Exactly how suspicion came to fasten on John Erdsley, I do not know. It was remembered that he had been very wild at Cambridge, and that his father had paid his debts more than once. Anyhow, it soon got about that this story of South American diamond fields was all a fantasy. John Erdsley was arrested. In his possession was found a portion of the De Beers diamonds. But the case never came to court. Sir Lawrence Erdsley paid over a sum equal to the missing diamonds, and De Beers did not prosecute. Exactly how the robbery was committed has never been known, but the knowledge that his son was a thief broke the old man's heart. He had a stroke shortly afterwards. As for John, his fate was in a way merciful. He enlisted, went to the war, fought there bravely, and was killed, thus wiping out the stain on his name. Sir Lawrence himself had a third stroke, and died about a month ago. He died in Testet, and his vast fortune passed to his next of kin, a man whom he hardly knew. The colonel paused. A babble of ejaculations and questions broke out. Something seemed to attract Miss Beddingfeld's attention, and she turned in her chair. At the little gasp she gave, I too turned. My new secretary, Rayburn, was standing in the doorway. Under his tan, his face had the pallor of one who has seen a ghost. Evidently, Race's story had moved him profoundly. Suddenly conscious of our scrutiny, he turned abruptly and disappeared. Do you know who that is? asked Anne Beddingfeld abruptly. That's my other secretary, I explained. Mr. Rayburn, he's been seedy up to now. She toyed with the bread by her plate. Has he been your secretary long? Not very long, I said cautiously. But caution is useless with a woman. The more you hold back, the more she presses forward. Anne Beddingfeld made no bones about it. How long? she asked bluntly. Well, uh, I engaged him just before I sailed. Old friend of mine recommended him. She said nothing more, but relapsed into a thoughtful silence. I turned to race with the feeling that it was my turn to display an interest in his story. Who is Sir Lawrence's next of kin, race? Do you know? I should do so, he replied with a smile. I am. Chapter 14 Anne's Narrative Resumed It was on the night of the fancy dress dance that I decided that the time had come for me to confide in someone. So far I had played a lone hand and rather enjoyed it. Now suddenly everything was changed. I distrusted my own judgment, and for the first time a feeling of loneliness and desolation crept over me. I sat on the edge of my bunk, still in my gypsy dress, and considered the situation. I thought first of Colonel Race. He had seemed to like me. He would be kind, I was sure. And he was no fool. Yet, as I thought it over, I wavered. He was a man of commanding personality. He would take the whole matter out of my hands, and it was my mystery. There were other reasons, too, which I would hardly acknowledge to myself, but which made it inadvisable to confide in Colonel Race. Then I thought of Mrs. Blair. She, too, had been kind to me. I did not delude myself into the belief that that really meant anything. It was probably a mere whim of the moment. All the same, I had it in my power to interest her. She was a woman who had experienced most of the ordinary sensations in life. I proposed to supply her with an extraordinary one. And I liked her. Liked her ease of manner, her lack of sentimentality, her freedom from any form of affectation. My mind was made up. I decided to seek her out then and there. She would hardly be in bed yet. Then I remembered that I did not know the number of her cabin. My friend, the night stewardess, would probably know. I rang the bell. After some delay, it was answered by a man. He gave me the information I wanted. Mrs. Blair's cabin was number 71. He apologised for the delay in answering the bell, but explained that he had all the cabins to attend to. Where is the stewardess, then? I asked. They all go off duty at ten o'clock. No, I mean the night stewardess. 
No stewardess on at night, miss. But, but a stewardess came the other night, about one o'clock. You must have been dreaming, miss. There's no stewardess on duty after ten. He withdrew, and I was left to digest this morsel of information. Who was the woman who had come to my cabin on the night of the 22nd? My face grew graver as I realized the cunning and audacity of my unknown antagonists. Then, pulling myself together, I left my own cabin and sought that of Mrs. Blair. I knocked at the door. Who's that? called her voice from within. It's me, Anne Beddingfeld. Oh, come in, gypsy girl. I entered. A good deal of scattered clothing lay about, and Mrs. Blair herself was draped in one of the loveliest kimonos I had ever seen. It was all orange and gold and black, and made my mouth water to look at it. Mrs. Blair, I said abruptly, I want to tell you the story of my life. That is, if it isn't too late and you won't be bored. Not a bit. I always hate going to bed said Mrs. Blair, her face crinkling into smiles in the delightful way it had. And I should love to hear the story of your life. You're a most unusual creature, gypsy girl. Nobody else would think of bursting in on me at 1am to tell me the story of their life, especially after snubbing my natural curiosity for weeks as you have done. I'm not accustomed to being snubbed. It's been quite a pleasing novelty. Sit down on the sofa and unburden your soul. I told her the whole story. It took some time as I was conscientious over all the details. She gave a deep sigh when I had finished, but she did not say at all what I had expected her to say. Instead, she looked at me, laughed a little, and said, Do you know, Anne, you're a very unusual girl. Haven't you ever had qualms? Qualms? I asked, puzzled. Yes, qualms, 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 starting off alone with practically no money. What will you do when you find yourself in a strange country with all your money gone? It's no good bothering about that until it comes. I've got plenty of money still. The twenty-five pounds that Mrs. Fleming gave me is practically intact. And then I won the sweep yesterday. That's another fifteen pounds. Why, I've got lots of money. Forty pounds. Lots of money? My God, murmured Mrs. Blair. I couldn't do it, Anne, and I've got plenty of pluck in my own way. I couldn't start off gaily with a few pounds in my pocket and no idea as to what I was doing and where I was going. But that's the fun of it, I cried, thoroughly roused. It gives one such a splendid feeling of adventure. She looked at me, nodded once or twice, and then smiled. Lucky Anne, there aren't many people in the world who feel as you do. Well, I said impatiently, what do you think of it all, Mrs. Blair? I think it's the most thrilling thing I ever heard. Now, to begin with, you will stop calling me Mrs. Blair. Suzanne will be ever so much better. Is that agreed? I should love it, Suzanne. Good girl. Now, let's get down to business. You say that in Sir Eustace's secretary not that long-faced Paget, the other one, you recognized the man who was stabbed and came into your cabin for shelter. I nodded. That gives us two links connecting Sir Eustace with the tangle. The woman was murdered in his house, and it's his secretary who gets stabbed at the mystic hour of one o'clock. I don't suspect Sir Eustace himself, but it can't be all a coincidence. There's a connection somewhere, even if he himself is unaware of it. Then there's the queer business of the stewardess, she continued thoughtfully. What was she like? I hardly noticed her. I was so excited and strung up, and a stewardess seemed such an anticlimax. But, yes, I did think her face was familiar. Of course it would be if I'd seen her about the ship. Her face seemed familiar to you? said Suzanne. Sure she wasn't a man? She was very tall, I admitted. Hmm, hardly Sir Eustace, I should think, nor Mr. Paget. Wait. She caught up a scrap of paper and began drawing feverishly. She inspected the result with her head poised on one side. A very good likeness of the Reverend Edward Chichester. Now for the etceteras. She passed the paper over to me. 
Is that your stewardess? Why, yes, I cried. Suzanne, how clever of you. She disdained the compliment with a light gesture. I've always had suspicions about that Chichester creature. Do you remember how he dropped his coffee cup and turned a sickly green when we were discussing Crippen the other day? And he tried to get cabin 17. Yes, it all fits in so far. But what does it all mean? What was really meant to happen at one o'clock in cabin 17? It can't be the stabbing of the secretary. There would be no point in timing that for a special hour on a special day in a special place. No, it must have been some kind of appointment. And he was on his way to keep it when they knifed him. But who was the appointment with? Certainly not with you. It might have been with Chichester, or it might have been with Paget. That seems unlikely, I objected. They can see each other any time. We both sat silent for a minute or two. Then Suzanne started off on another tack. Could there have been anything hidden in the cabin? That seems more probable. I agreed. It would explain my things being ransacked the next morning. But there was nothing hidden there, I'm sure of it. The young man couldn't have slipped something into a drawer the night before. I shook my head. I should have seen him. Could it have been your precious bit of paper they were looking for? It might have been, but it seems rather senseless. It was only a time and a date, and they were both passed by then. Suzanne nodded. That's so, of course. No, it wasn't the paper. By the way, have you got it with you? I'd rather like to see it. I had brought the paper with me as Exhibit A, and I handed it over to her. She scrutinized it, frowning. There's a dot after the seventeen. Why isn't there a dot after the one, too? There's a space, I pointed out. Yes, there's a space, but... Suddenly she rose and peered at the paper, holding it as close under the light as possible. There was a repressed excitement in her manner. Anne, that isn't a dot, that's a flaw in the paper. A flaw in the paper, you see? So you've got to ignore it and just go by the spaces. The spaces! I had risen and was standing by her. I read out the figures as I now saw them. One, seventy-one, twenty-two. You see, said Suzanne, it's the same, but not quite. It's one o'clock still, and the twenty-second, but it's cabin seventy-one. My cabin, Anne. We stood staring at each other, so pleased with our new discovery, and so wrapped with excitement that you might have thought we had solved the whole mystery. Then I fell to earth with a bump. But Suzanne, nothing happened here at one o'clock on the twenty-second. Her face fell also. No, it didn't. Another idea struck me. This isn't your own cabin, is it, Suzanne? I mean, not the one you originally booked. No, the purser changed me into it. I wonder if it was booked before sailing for someone... someone who didn't turn up. I suppose we could find out. We don't need to find out, gypsy girl cried Suzanne. I know. The purser was telling me about it. The cabin was booked in the name of Mrs. Gray. But it seems that Mrs. Gray was merely a pseudonym for the famous Madame Nadina. She's a celebrated Russian dancer, you know. She's never appeared in London, but Paris has been quite mad about her. She had a terrific success there all through the war. A thoroughly bad lot, I believe, but most attractive. The purser expressed his regrets that she wasn't on board in a most heartfelt fashion when he gave me her cabin, and then Colonel Race told me a lot about her. It seems there were very queer stories afloat in Paris. She was suspected of espionage, but they couldn't prove anything. I rather fancy Colonel Race was over there simply on that account. He's told me some very interesting things. There was a regular organized gang— not German in origin at all. In fact, the head of it, a man always referred to as the Colonel, was thought to be an Englishman, but they never got any clue to his identity. But there is no doubt that he controlled a considerable organization of international crooks, 
Robberies, espionage, assaults, he undertook them all and usually provided an innocent scapegoat to pay the penalty. Diabolically clever he must have been. This woman was supposed to be one of his agents, but they couldn't get hold of anything to go upon. Yes, Anne, we're on the right tack. Nadina is just the woman to be mixed up in this business. The appointment on the morning of the 22nd was with her in this cabin. But where is she? Why didn't she sail? A light flashed upon me. She meant to sail, I said slowly. Then why didn't she? Because she was dead. Suzanne, Nadina, was the woman murdered at Marlow. My mind went back to the bare room in the empty house, and there swept over me again the indefinable sensation of menace and evil. With it came the memory of the falling pencil and the discovery of the roll of films. A roll of films that struck a more recent note. Where had I heard of a roll of films? And why did I connect that thought with Mrs. Blair? Suddenly I flew at her and almost shook her in my excitement. Your films, the ones that were passed to you through the ventilator. Wasn't that on the 22nd? The ones I lost? How do you know that they were the same? Why would anyone return them to you that way in the middle of the night? It's a mad idea. No, they were a message. The films have been taken out of the yellow tin case and something else put inside. Have you still got it? I may have used it. No, here it is. I remember I tossed it into the rack at the side of the bunk. She held it out to me. It was an ordinary round tin cylinder, such as films are packed in for the tropics. I took it with trembling hand. But even as I did so, my heart leapt. It was noticeably heavier than it should have been. With shaking fingers, I peeled off the strip of adhesive plaster that kept it airtight. I pulled off the lid, and a stream of dull, glassy pebbles rolled onto the bed. Pebbles, I said, keenly disappointed. Pebbles? cried Suzanne. The ring in her voice excited me. Pebbles? No, Anne, not pebbles! Diamonds! Chapter 15 Diamonds! I stared, fascinated, at the glassy heap on the bunk. I picked up one which, but for the weight, might have been a fragment of broken bottle. Are you sure, Suzanne? Oh, yes, my dear. I've seen rough diamonds too often to have any doubts. They're beauties, too, Anne, and some of them are unique, I should say. There's a history behind these. The history we heard tonight, I cried. You mean? Colonel Race's story. It can't be a coincidence. He told it for a purpose. To see its effect, you mean? I nodded. Its effect on Sir Eustace? Yes. But even as I said it, a doubt assailed me. Was it Sir Eustace who had been subjected to a test, or had the story been told for my benefit? I remembered the impression I had received on that former night of having been deliberately pumped. For some reason or other, Colonel Race was suspicious. But where did he come in? What possible connection could he have with the affair? Who is Colonel Race? I asked. That's rather a question, said Suzanne. He's pretty well known as a big game hunter, and, as you heard him say tonight, he was a distant cousin of Sir Lawrence Erdsley. I've never actually met him until this trip. He journeys to and from Africa a good deal. There's a general idea that he does secret service work. I don't know whether it's true or not. He's certainly rather a mysterious creature. I suppose he came into a lot of money as Sir Lawrence Erdsley's heir. My dear Anne, he must be rolling. You know, he'd be a splendid match for you. I can't have a good go at him with you aboard the ship, I said, laughing. Oh, these married women. We do have a pool, murmured Suzanne complacently. And everybody knows that I am absolutely devoted to Clarence, my husband, you know. It's so safe and pleasant to make love to a devoted wife. 
It must be very nice for Clarence to be married to someone like you. Well, I'm wearing to live with. Still, he can always escape to the foreign office, where he fixes his eyeglass in his eye and goes to sleep in a big armchair. We might cable him to tell us all he knows about race. I love sending cables, and they annoy Clarence so. He always says a letter would have done as well. I don't suppose he'd tell us anything, though. He's so frightfully discreet. That's what makes him so hard to live with for long on end. But let us go on with our matchmaking. I'm sure Colonel Race is very attracted to you, Anne. Give him a couple of glances from those wicked eyes of yours, and the deed is done. Everyone gets engaged on board ship. There's nothing else to do. I don't want to get married. Don't you? said Suzanne. Why not? I love being married, even to Clarence. I disdained her flippancy. What I want to know is, I said with determination, what has Colonel Race got to do with this? He's in it somewhere. You don't think it was mere chance he's telling that story? No, I don't, I said decidedly. He was watching us all narrowly. You remember, some of the diamonds were recovered, not all. Perhaps these are the missing ones, or perhaps... Perhaps what? I did not answer her directly. I should like to know, I said, what became of the other young man. Not Erdsley, but... What was his name? Lucas. We're getting some light on the thing anyway. It's the diamonds all these people are after. It must have been to obtain possession of the diamonds that the man in the brown suit killed Nadina. He didn't kill her, I said sharply. Of course he killed her. Who else could have done so? I don't know, but I'm sure he didn't kill her. He went into the house three minutes after her and came out as white as a sheet. Because he found her dead. But nobody else went in. Then the murderer was in the house already, or else he got in some other way. There's no need for him to pass the lodge. He could have climbed over the wall. Suzanne glanced at me sharply. The man in the brown suit, she mused. Who was he, I wonder? Anyway, he was identical with the doctor in the tube. He would have had time to remove his makeup and follow the woman to Marlowe. She and Carton were to have met there. They both had an order to view the same house, and if they took such elaborate precautions to make their meeting appear accidental, they must have suspected they were being followed. All the same, Carton did not know that his shadower was the man in the brown suit. When he recognised him, the shock was so great that he lost his head completely and stepped back onto the line. That all seems pretty clear, don't you think so, Anne? I did not reply. Yes, that's how it was. He took the paper from the dead man and, in his hurry to get away, he dropped it. Then he followed the woman to Marlowe. What did he do when he left there? when he had killed her, or, according to you, found her dead. Where did he go? Still, I said nothing. I wonder now, said Suzanne musingly. Is it possible that he induced Sir Eustace Pedler to bring him on board as his secretary? It would be a unique chance of getting safely out of England and dodging the hue and cry. But how did he square Sir Eustace? It looks as though he had some hold over him. Or over Paget, I suggested in spite of myself. You don't seem to like Paget, Anne. Sir Eustace says he's a most capable and hard-working young man. And really, he may be for all we know against him. Well, to continue my surmises, Rayburn is the man in the brown suit. He had read the paper he dropped. Therefore, misled by the dot, as you were... He attempts to reach cabin 17 at one o'clock on the 22nd, having previously tried to get possession of the cabin through Paget. On the way there, somebody knifes him. Who? I interpolated. Chichester. Yes, it all fits in. Cable to Lord Naseby that you have found the man in the brown suit and your fortune's made, Anne. There are several things you've overlooked. What things? Rabin's got a scar, I know, but a scar can be faked easily enough. He's the right height and build. What's the description of a head with which you pulverised them at Scotland Yard? I trembled. 
Suzanne was a well-educated, well-read woman, but I prayed that she might not be conversant with technical terms of anthropology. Dolicocephalic, I said lightly. Suzanne looked doubtful. Was that it? Yes, long-headed, you know, a head whose width is less than seventy-five percent of its length, I explained fluently. There was a pause. I was just beginning to breathe freely when Suzanne said suddenly, What's the opposite? What do you mean, the opposite? Well, there must be an opposite. What do you call heads whose breadth is more than seventy-five percent of their length? Brachycephalic, I murmured unwillingly. That's it. I thought that was what you said. Did I? It was a slip of the tongue. I meant dolicocephalic, I said with all the assurance I could muster. Suzanne looked at me searchingly. Then she laughed. You lie very well, gypsy girl, but it will save time and trouble now if you tell me all about it. There is nothing to tell, I said unwillingly. Isn't there? said Suzanne gently. I suppose I shall have to tell you, I said slowly. I'm not ashamed of it. You can't be ashamed of something that just happens to you. That's what he did. He was detestable, rude and ungrateful. But that I think I understand. It's like a dog that's been chained up or badly treated. It'll bite anybody. That's what he was like, bitter and snarling. I don't know why I care, but I do. I care horribly. Just seeing him has turned my whole life upside down. I love him. I want him. I'll walk all over Africa barefoot till I find him, and I'll make him care for me. I'd die for him. I'd work for him, slave for him, steal for him, even beg or borrow for him. There. Now you know. Suzanne looked at me for a long time. You're very un-English, gypsy girl, she said at last. There's not a scrap of the sentimental about you. I've never met anyone who was at once so practical and so passionate. I shall never care for anyone like that, mercifully for me. And yet, and yet I envy you, gypsy girl. It's something to be able to care. Most people can't. But what a mercy for your little doctor man that you didn't marry him. He doesn't sound at all the sort of individual who would enjoy keeping high explosive in the house. So there's to be no cabling to Lord Naseby. I shook my head. And yet you believe him to be innocent? I also believe that innocent people can be hanged. Hmm, yes. But Anne, dear, you can face facts. Face them now. In spite of all you say, he may have murdered this woman. No, I said, he didn't. That's sentiment. No, it isn't. He might have killed her, he may even have followed her there with that idea in mind, but he wouldn't take a bit of black cord and strangle her with it. If he'd done it, he would have strangled her with his bare hands. Suzanne gave a little shiver, her eyes narrowed appreciatively. Hmm, Anne, I'm beginning to see why you find this young man of yours so attractive. Chapter 16 I got an opportunity of tackling Colonel Race on the following morning. The auction of the sweep had just been concluded, and we walked up and down the deck together. How's the gypsy this morning, longing for land and her caravan? I shook my head. Now that the sea is behaving so nicely, I feel I should like to stay on it forever and ever. What enthusiasm! Well, isn't it lovely this morning? We leant together over the rail. It was a glassy calm. The sea looked as though it had been oiled. There were great patches of colour on it. Blue, pale green, emerald, purple, and deep orange, like a cubist picture. There was an occasional flash of silver that showed the flying fish. The air was moist and warm, almost sticky. Its breath was like a perfumed caress. That was a very interesting story you told us last night, I said, breaking the silence. Which one? The one about the diamonds. I believe women are always interested in diamonds. Of course we are. By the way, what became of the other young man? You said there were two of them. Young Lucas. 
Well, of course, they couldn't prosecute one without the other, so he went scot-free too. And what happened to him? Eventually, I mean. Does anyone know? Colonel Race was looking straight ahead of him out to sea. His face was as devoid of expression as a mask, but I had an idea that he did not like my questions. Nevertheless, he replied readily enough. He went to the war and acquitted himself bravely. He was reported missing and wounded, believed killed. That told me what I wanted to know. I asked no more. But more than ever I wondered how much Colonel Race knew. The part he was playing in all this puzzled me. One other thing I did, that was to interview the night steward. With a little financial encouragement, I soon got him to talk. The lady wasn't frightened, was she, miss? It seemed a harmless sort of joke, a bet, or so I understood. I got it all out of him, little by little. On the voyage from Cape Town to England, one of the passengers had handed him a roll of film with instructions that they were to be dropped onto the bunk in cabin 71 at 1 a.m. on January the 22nd on the outward journey. A lady would be occupying the cabin, and the affair was described as a bet. I gathered the steward had been liberally paid for his part in the transaction. The lady's name had not been mentioned. Of course, as Mrs. Blair went straight into cabin 71, interviewing the purser as soon as she got on board, it never occurred to the steward that she was not the lady in question. The name of the passenger who had arranged the transaction was Carton, and his description tallied exactly with that of the man killed on the tube. So one mystery, at all events, was cleared up, and the diamonds were obviously the key to the whole situation. Those last days on the Kilmorden seemed to pass very quickly. As we drew nearer and nearer to Cape Town, I was forced to consider carefully my future plans. There were so many people I wanted to keep an eye on. Mr. Chichester, Sir Eustace and his secretary, and, yes, Colonel Race. What was I to do about it? Naturally, it was Chichester who had first claim on my attention— Indeed, I was on the point of reluctantly dismissing Sir Eustace and Mr. Paget from their position of suspicious characters when a chance conversation awakened fresh doubts in my mind. I had forgotten Mr. Paget's incomprehensible emotion at the mention of Florence. On the last evening on board, we were all sitting on deck, and Sir Eustace addressed a perfectly innocent question to his secretary. I forget exactly what it was, something to do with railway delays in Italy but at once I noticed that Mr. Paget was displaying the same uneasiness which had caught my attention before. When Sir Eustace claimed Mrs. Blair for a dance, I quickly moved into the chair next to the secretary. I was determined to get to the bottom of the matter. I have always longed to go to Italy, I said, and especially to Florence. Didn't you enjoy it very much there? Indeed I did, Miss Beddingfeld. If you will excuse me, there is some correspondence of Sir Eustace's that— I took hold of him firmly by his coat sleeve. Oh, you mustn't run away, I cried with the skittish accent of an elderly dowager. I'm sure Sir Eustace wouldn't like you to leave me alone with no one to talk to. You never seem to want to talk about Florence. Oh, Mr. Paget, I believe you have a guilty secret. I still had my hand on his arm, and I could feel the sudden start he gave. Not at all, Miss Beddingfeld, not at all, he said earnestly. I should be only too delighted to tell you all about it, but there really are some cables. Oh, Mr. Paget, what a thin pretense. I shall tell Sir Eustace. I got no further. He gave another jump. The man's nerve seemed in a shocking state. What is it you want to know? The resigned martyrdom of his tone made me smile inwardly. Oh, everything— the pictures, the olive trees. I paused, rather at a loss myself. I suppose you speak Italian, I resumed. Not a word, unfortunately, but of course, with hall porters and, uh, guides. Exactly, I hastened to reply. And which was your favourite picture? Oh, uh, the Madonna, uh, Raphael, you know. Dear old Florence, I murmured sentimentally, 
So picturesque on the banks of the Arno, a beautiful river, and the Duomo, you remember the Duomo? Of course, of course. Another beautiful river, is it not? I hazarded, almost more beautiful than the Arno. Decidedly so, I should say. Emboldened by the success of my little trap, I proceeded further. But there was little room for doubt. Mr. Paget delivered himself into my hands with every word he uttered. The man had never been in Florence in his life. But if not in Florence, where had he been? In England? Actually in England at the time of the Mill House mystery? I decided on a bold step. The curious thing is, I said, that I fancied I had seen you before somewhere. But I must be mistaken, since you were in Florence at the time, and yet... I studied him frankly. There was a hunted look in his eyes. He passed his tongue over dry lips. Where, uh, where... Did I think I had seen you? I finished for him. At Marlowe. You know Marlowe. Why, of course, how stupid of me. Sir Eustace has a house there. But with an incoherent muttered excuse, my victim rose and fled. That night I invaded Suzanne's cabin, alight with excitement. You see, Suzanne, I urged as I finished my tale, he was in England, in Marlowe, at the time of the murder. Are you so sure now that the man in the brown suit is guilty? I'm sure of one thing, Suzanne said, twinkling unexpectedly. What's that? That the man in the brown suit is better looking than poor Mr. Paget. No, Anne, don't get cross. I was only teasing. Sit down here. Joking apart, I think you've made a very important discovery. Up till now, we've considered Paget as having an alibi. Now we know he hasn't. Exactly, I said. We must keep an eye on him. As well as everybody else, she said ruefully. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. That and finance. No, don't stick your nose in the air. I know you are absurdly proud and independent, but you've got to listen to horse sense over this. We're partners. I wouldn't offer you a penny because I liked you or because you're a friendless girl. What I want is a thrill, and I'm prepared to pay for it. We're going into this together regardless of expense. To begin with, you'll come with me to the Mount Nelson Hotel at my expense, and we'll plan out our campaign. We argued the point. In the end, I gave in. But I didn't like it. I wanted to do the thing on my own. That's settled, said Suzanne at last, getting up and stretching herself with a big yawn. I'm exhausted with my own eloquence. Now then, let us discuss our victims. Mr. Chichester is going on to Durban. Sir Eustace is going to the Mount Nelson Hotel in Cape Town and then up to Rhodesia. He's going to have a private car on the railway, and in a moment of expansion, after his fourth glass of champagne the other night, he offered me a place in it. I dare say he didn't really mean it, but all the same, he can't very well back out of it if I hold him to it. Good, I approved. You keep an eye on Sir Eustace and Mr. Paget, and I take on Chichester. But what about Colonel Race? Suzanne looked at me queerly. Anne, you can't possibly suspect. I do. I suspect everybody. I'm in the mood when one looks round for the most unlikely person. Colonel Race is going to Rhodesia too, said Suzanne thoughtfully. If we could arrange for Sir Eustace to invite him also. You can manage it. You can manage anything. I love butter, purred Suzanne. We parted on the understanding that Suzanne should employ her talents to her best advantage. I felt too excited to go to bed immediately. It was my last night on board. Early tomorrow morning we should be in Table Bay. I slipped up on deck. The breeze was fresh and cool. The boat was rolling a little in the choppy sea. The decks were dark and deserted. It was after midnight. I leaned over the rail, watching the phosphorescent trail of foam. Ahead of us lay Africa. We were rushing towards it through the dark water. I felt alone in a wonderful world, 
Wrapped in a strange peace, I stood there, taking no heed of time, lost in a dream. And suddenly, I had a curious, intimate premonition of danger. I had heard nothing, but I swung round instinctively. A shadowy form had crept up behind me. As I turned, it sprang. One hand gripped my throat, stifling any cry I might have uttered. I fought desperately, but I had no chance. I was half choking from the grip on my throat, but I bit and clung and scratched in the most approved feminine fashion. The man was handicapped by having to keep me from crying out. If he had succeeded in reaching me unawares, it would have been easy enough for him to sling me overboard with a sudden heave. The sharks would have taken care of the rest. Struggle as I would, I felt myself weakening. My assailant felt it too. He put out all his strength, and then, running on swift, noiseless feet, another shadow joined in. With one blow of his fist, he sent my opponent crashing headlong to the deck. Released, I fell back against the rail, sick and trembling. My rescuer turned to me with a quick movement. You're hurt. There was something savage in his tone, a menace against the person who had dared to hurt me. Even before he spoke, I had recognized him. It was my man, the man with the scar. But that one moment in which his attention had been diverted to me had been enough for the fallen enemy. Quick as a flash, he had risen to his feet and taken to his heels down the deck. With an oath, Rayburn sprang after him. I always hate being out of things. I joined the chase, a bad third. Round the deck we went to the starboard side of the ship. There, by the saloon door, lay the man in a crumpled heap. Rayburn was bending over him. Did you hit him again? I called breathlessly. There was no need, he replied grimly. I found him collapsed by the door, or else he couldn't get it open and is shamming. We'll soon see about that, and we'll see who he is too. With a beating heart I drew nearer. I had realized at once that my assailant was a bigger man than Chichester. Anyway, Chichester was a flabby creature who might use a knife at a pinch, but who would have little strength in his bare hands. Rayburn struck a match. We both uttered an ejaculation. The man was Guy Paget. Rayburn appeared absolutely stupefied by the discovery. Paget, he muttered. My God, Paget. I felt a slight sense of superiority. You seem surprised. I am, he said heavily. I never suspected. He wheeled suddenly round on me. And you? You're not. You recognized him, I suppose, when he attacked you. No, I didn't. All the same, I'm not so very surprised. He stared at me suspiciously. Where do you come in, I wonder? And how much do you know? I smiled. A good deal, Mr. Uh, Lucas? He caught my arm. The unconscious strength of his grip made me wince. Where did you get that name? He asked hoarsely. Isn't it yours? I demanded sweetly. Or do you prefer to be called the man in the brown suit? That did stagger him. He released my arm and fell back a pace or two. Are you a girl or a witch? He breathed. I'm a friend. I advanced a step towards him. I offered you my help once. I offer it again. Will you have it? The fierceness of his answer took me aback. No, I'll have no truck with you or with any woman. Do your damnedest. As before, my own temper began to rise. Perhaps, I said, you don't realize how much in my power you are. A word from me to the captain. Say it, he sneered, then advancing with a quick step. And whilst we're realizing things, my dear girl, do you realize you're in my power this minute? I could take you by the throat like this. With a swift gesture, he suited the action to the word. I felt his two hands clasp my throat and press ever so little. Like this, and squeeze the life out of you. And then, like our unconscious friend here, but with more success, fling your dead body to the sharks. What do you say to that? I said nothing. I laughed. And yet I knew that the danger was real. Just at that moment, he hated me.
but I knew that I loved the danger, loved the feeling of his hands on my throat, that I would not have exchanged that moment for any moment in my life. With a short laugh, he released me. What's your name? he asked abruptly. Anne Beddingfeld. Does nothing frighten you, Anne Beddingfeld? Oh, yes, I said with an assumption of coolness I was far from feeling. Wasps, sarcastic women, very young men, cockroaches, and superior shop assistants. He gave the same short laugh as before. Then he stirred the unconscious form of Paget with his feet. What shall we do with this junk? Throw it overboard? He asked carelessly. If you like, I answered with equal calm. I admire your wholehearted, bloodthirsty instincts, Miss Beddingfeld, but we will leave him to recover at his leisure. He is not seriously hurt. You shrink from a second murder, I see, I said sweetly. A second murder? He looked genuinely puzzled. The woman at Marlow, I reminded him, watching the effect of my words closely. An ugly brooding expression settled down on his face. He seemed to have forgotten my presence. I might have killed her he said. Sometimes I believed that I meant to kill her. A wild rush of feeling, hatred of the dead woman surged through me. I could have killed her that moment had she stood before me, for he must have loved her once. He must, he must to have felt like that. I regained control of myself and spoke in my normal voice. We seem to have said all there is to be said, except good night. Good night and goodbye, Miss Beddingfeld. Au revoir, Mr. Lucas. Again he flinched at the name. He came nearer. Why do you say that? Au revoir, I mean. Because I have a fancy that we shall meet again. Not if I can help it. Emphatic as his tone was, it did not offend me. On the contrary, I hugged myself with secret satisfaction. I am not quite a fool. All the same, I said gravely, I think we shall. Why? I shook my head, unable to explain the feeling that had actuated my words. I never wish to see you again, he said suddenly and violently. It was really a very rude thing to say, but I only laughed softly and slipped away into the darkness. I heard him start after me and then pause, and a word floated down the deck. I think it was which. Chapter 17 Extract from the Diary of Sir Eustace Pedler Mount Nelson Hotel, Cape Town It is really the greatest relief to get off the Kilmorden. The whole time that I was on board, I was conscious of being surrounded by a network of intrigue. To put the lid on everything, Guy Paget must needs engage in a drunken brawl the last night. It is all very well to explain it away, but that is what it actually amounts to. What else would you think if a man comes to you with a lump the size of an egg on the side of his head and an eye coloured all the tints of the rainbow? Of course, Paget would insist on trying to be mysterious about the whole thing. According to him, you would think his black eye was the direct result of his devotion to my interests. His story was extraordinarily vague and rambling, and it was a long time before I could make head or tail of it. To begin with, it appears he caught sight of a man behaving suspiciously. Those are Paget's words. He has taken them straight from the pages of a German spy story. What he means by a man behaving suspiciously, he doesn't know himself. I said so to him. He was slinking along in a very furtive manner, and it was the middle of the night, Sir Eustace. Well, what were you doing yourself? Why weren't you in bed and asleep like a good Christian? I demanded irritably. I had been coding those cables of yours, Sir Eustace, and typing the diary up to date. Trust Paget to be always in the right and a martyr over it. Well? I just thought I would have a look round before turning in, Sir Eustace. The man was coming down the passage from your cabin. I thought at once there was something wrong by the way he looked about him. He slunk up the stairs by the saloon. I followed him. My dear Paget, I said, why shouldn't the poor chap go on deck without having his footsteps dogged? Lots of people even sleep on deck. Very uncomfortable, I've always thought. 
The sailors wash you down with the rest of the deck at five in the morning. I shuddered at the idea. Anyway, I continued, if you went worrying some poor devil who was suffering from insomnia, I don't wonder he landed you one. Paget looked patient. If you would hear me out, Sir Eustace, I was convinced the man had been prowling about near your cabin where he had no business to be. The only two cabins down that passage are yours and Colonel Race's. Race, I said, lighting a cigar carefully, can look after himself without your assistance, Paget. I added as an afterthought, so can I. Paget came nearer and breathed heavily as he always does before imparting a secret. You see, Sir Eustace, I fancied, and now indeed I am sure, it was Rayburn. Rayburn? Yes, Sir Eustace. I shook my head. Rayburn has far too much sense to attempt to wake me up in the middle of the night. Quite so, Sir Eustace. I think it was Colonel Race he went to see. A secret meeting for orders. Don't hiss at me, Paget. I said, drawing back a little, and do control your breathing. Your idea is absurd. Why should they want to have a secret meeting in the middle of the night? If they'd anything to say to each other, they could hobnob over beef tea in a perfectly casual and natural manner. I could see that Paget was not in the least convinced. Something was going on last night, Sir Eustace, he urged. Or why should Rayburn assault me so brutally? You're quite sure it was Rayburn? Paget appeared to be perfectly convinced of that. It was the only part of the story that he wasn't vague about. There's something very queer about all this, he said. To begin with, where is Rayburn? It's perfectly true that we haven't seen the fellow since we came on shore. He did not come up to the hotel with us. I decline to believe that he is afraid of Paget, however. Altogether, the whole thing is very annoying. One of my secretaries has vanished into the blue, and the other looks like a disreputable prize fighter. I can't take him about with me in his present condition. I shall be the laughing stock of Cape Town. I have an appointment later in the day to deliver old Milray's B.A. Do, but I shall not take Paget with me. Confound the fellow and his prowling ways. Although I am decidedly out of temper, I had a poisonous breakfast with poisonous people. Dutch waitresses with thick ankles who took half an hour to bring me a bad bit of fish. And this farce of getting up at 5 a.m. on arrival at the port to see a blinking doctor and hold your hands above your head simply makes me tired. Later. A very serious thing has occurred. I went to my appointment with the Prime Minister, taking Melray's sealed letter. It didn't look as though it had been tampered with, but inside was a blank sheet of paper. Now I suppose I'm in the devil of a mess. Why I ever let that bleating old fool Milray embroil me in the matter, I can't think. Paget is a famous jobs comforter. He displays a certain gloomy satisfaction that maddens me. Also, he had taken advantage of my perturbation to saddle me with a stationary trunk. Unless he is careful, the next funeral he attends will be his own. However, in the end, I had to listen to him. Supposing, Sir Eustace, that Rayburn had overheard a word or two of your conversation with Mr. Milray in the street. Remember, you had no written authority from Mr. Milray. You accepted Rayburn on his own valuation. You think Rayburn is a crook, then? I said slowly. Paget did. How far his views were influenced by resentment over his black eye, I don't know. He made out a pretty fair case against Rayburn, and the appearance of the latter told against him. My idea was to do nothing in the matter. A man who has permitted himself to be made a thorough fool of is not anxious to broadcast the fact. But Paget, his energy unimpaired by his recent misfortunes, was all for vigorous measures. He had his way, of course. He bustled out to the police station, sent innumerable cables, and brought a herd of English and Dutch officials to drink whiskies and sodas at my expense. We got Milray's answer that evening. He knew nothing of my late secretary. There was only one spot of comfort to be extracted from the situation. At any rate, I said to Paget, you weren't poisoned. You had one of your ordinary bilious attacks. 
I saw him wince. It was my only score. Later. Paget is in his element. His brain positively scintillates with bright ideas. He will have it now that Rayburn is none other than the famous man in the brown suit. I dare say he is right. He usually is. But all this is getting unpleasant. The sooner I get off to Rhodesia, the better. I've explained to Paget that he is not to accompany me. You see, my dear fellow, I said, you must remain here on the spot. You might be required to identify Rayburn any minute. And besides, I have my dignity as an English member of Parliament to think of. I can't go about with a secretary who has apparently recently been indulging in a vulgar street brawl. Paget winced. He is such a respectable fellow that his appearance is pain and tribulation to him. But what will you do about your correspondence and the notes for your speeches, Sir Eustace? I shall manage, I said airily. Your private car is to be attached to the eleven o'clock train tomorrow, Wednesday morning. Paget continued. I have made all arrangements. Is Mrs. Blair taking a maid with her? Mrs. Blair? I gasped. She tells me you offered her a place. So I did, now I come to think of it. On the night of the fancy dress ball, I even urged her to come. But I never thought she would. Delightful as she is, I do not know that I want Mrs. Blair's society all the way to Rhodesia and back. Women require such a lot of attention, and they are confoundedly in the way sometimes. Have I asked anyone else? I said nervously. One does these things in moments of expansion. Mrs. Blair seemed to think you had asked Colonel Race as well. I groaned. Oh, I must have been very drunk if I asked Race. Very drunk indeed. Take my advice, Paget, and let your black eye be a warning to you. Don't go on the bust again. As you know, I am a teetotaler, Sir Eustace. Much wiser to take the pledge if you have a weakness that way. I haven't asked anyone else, have I, Paget? Not that I know of, Sir Eustace. I heaved a sigh of relief. There's Miss Beddingfeld, I said thoughtfully. She wants to get to Rhodesia to dig up bones, I believe. I've a good mind to offer her a temporary job as a secretary. She can't typewrite, I know, for she told me so. To my surprise, Paget opposed the idea vehemently. He does not like Anne Beddingfeld. Ever since the night of the black eye, he has displayed uncontrollable emotion whenever she is mentioned. Paget is full of mysteries nowadays. Just to annoy him, I shall ask the girl. As I said before, she has extremely nice legs. Chapter 18 Anne's Narrative Resumed I don't suppose that as long as I live I shall forget my first sight of Table Mountain. I got up frightfully early and went out on deck. I went right up to the boat deck, which I believe is a heinous offence, but I decided to dare something in the cause of solitude. We were just steaming into Table Bay. There were fleecy white clouds hovering over Table Mountain, and nestling on the slopes below, right down to the sea, was the sleeping town gilded and bewitched by the morning sunlight. It made me catch my breath and have that curious hungry pain inside that seizes one sometimes when one comes across something that's extra beautiful. I'm not very good at expressing these things, but I knew well enough that I had found if only for a fleeting moment, the thing that I had been looking for ever since I left Little Hampsley. Something new, something hitherto undreamed of, something that satisfied my aching hunger for romance. Perfectly silently, or so it seemed to me, the Kilmorden glided nearer and nearer. It was still very like a dream. Like all dreamers, however, I could not let my dream alone. We poor humans are so anxious not to miss anything. This is South Africa, I kept saying to myself industriously. South Africa, South Africa. You are seeing the world. This is the world. You are seeing it. Think of it, Anne Beddingfeld, you pudding head. You're seeing the world. I had thought that I had the boat deck to myself, but now I observed another figure leaning over the rail, absorbed as I had been in the rapidly approaching city. Even before he turned his head, I knew who it was. 
The scene of last night seemed unreal and melodramatic in the peaceful morning sunshine. What must he have thought of me? It made me hot to realize the things that I had said, and I hadn't meant them. Or had I? I turned my head resolutely away and stared hard at Table Mountain. If Rayburn had come up here to be alone, I, at least, need not disturb him by advertising my presence. But to my intense surprise, I heard a light footfall on the deck behind me, and then his voice, pleasant and normal. Miss Beddingfeld? Yes? I turned. I want to apologize to you. I behaved like a perfect bore last night. It... it was a peculiar night, I said hastily. It was not a very lucid remark, but it was absolutely the only thing I could think of. Will you forgive me? I held out my hand without a word. He took it. There's something else I want to say. His gravity deepened. Miss Beddingfeld, you may not know it, but you are mixed up in a rather dangerous business. I gather as much, I said. No, you don't. You can't possibly know. I want to warn you. Leave the whole thing alone. It can't concern you, really. Don't let your curiosity lead you to tamper with other people's business. No, please don't get angry again. I'm not speaking of myself. You've no idea of what you might come up against. These men will stop at nothing. They are absolutely ruthless. Already you're in danger. Look at last night. They fancy you know something. Your only chance is to persuade them that they are mistaken. But be careful. Always be on the lookout for danger. And look here. If at any time you should fall into their hands, don't try and be clever. Tell the whole truth. It will be your only chance. You make my flesh creep, Mr. Rayburn, I said with some truth. Why do you take the trouble to warn me? He did not answer for some minutes. Then he said in a low voice, It may be the last thing I can do for you. Once on shore, I shall be all right, but I may not get on shore. What? I cried. You see, I'm afraid you're not the only person on board who knows that I am the man in the brown suit. If you think that I told, I said hotly. He reassured me with a smile. I don't doubt you, Miss Beddingfeld. If I ever said I did, I lied. No, but there's one person on board who's known all along. He's only to speak, and my number's up. All the same, I'm taking a sporting chance that he won't speak. Why? Because he's a man who likes playing a lone hand, and when the police have got me, I should be of no further use to him. Free, I might be. Well, an hour will show. He laughed rather mockingly, but I saw his face harden. If he had gambled with fate, he was a good gambler. He could lose and smile. In any case, he said lightly, I don't suppose we shall meet again. No, I said slowly, I suppose not. So, goodbye. Goodbye. He gripped my hand hard, just for a minute his curious light eyes seemed to burn into mine, then he turned abruptly and left me. I heard his footsteps ringing along the deck, they echoed and re-echoed, I felt that I should hear them always, footsteps, going out of my life. I can admit frankly that I did not enjoy the next two hours. Not till I stood on the wharf, having finished with most of the ridiculous formalities that bureaucracies require, did I breathe freely once more. No arrest had been made, and I realized that it was a heavenly day, and that I was extremely hungry. I joined Suzanne, in any case, I was staying the night with her at the hotel. The boat did not go on to Port Elizabeth and Durban until the following morning. We got into a taxi and drove to the Mount Nelson. It was all heavenly, the sun, the air, the flowers. When I thought of Little Hampsley in January, the mud knee-deep and the sure-to-be-falling rain, I hugged myself with delight. Suzanne was not nearly so enthusiastic. She has travelled a great deal, of course, Besides, she is not the type that gets excited before breakfast.
She snubbed me severely when I let out an enthusiastic yelp at the sight of a giant blue convolvulus. By the way, I should like to make clear here and now that this story will not be a story of South Africa. I guarantee no genuine local colour. You know the sort of thing, half a dozen words in italics on every page. I admire it very much, but I can't do it. In South Sea Islands, of course, you make an immediate reference to Beche de Mer. I don't know what Beche de Mer is. I've never known. I probably never shall know. I've guessed once or twice and guessed wrong. In South Africa, I know you at once begin to talk about a stup. I don't know what a stup is. It's the thing round a house and you sit on it. In various other parts of the world, you call it a veranda, a piazza and a ha-ha. Then again, there are pawpaws. I'd often read of pawpaws. I discovered at once what they were, because I had one plumped down in front of me for breakfast. I thought at first that it was a melon gone bad. The Dutch waitress enlightened me, and persuaded me to use lemon juice and sugar and try again. I was very pleased to meet a pawpaw. I'd always vaguely associated it with a hula hula, which, I believe, though I may be wrong, is a kind of straw skirt that Hawaiian girls dance in. No, I think I'm wrong. That is a lava lava. At any rate, all these things are very cheering after England. I can't help thinking that it would brighten our cold island life if one could have a breakfast of bacon bacon and then go out clad in a jumper jumper to pay the books. Suzanne was a little tamer after breakfast. They had given me a room next to hers with a lovely view right out over Table Bay. I looked at the view while Suzanne hunted for some special face cream. When she had found it and started an immediate application, she became capable of listening to me. Did you see Sir Eustace? I asked. He was marching out of the breakfast room as we went in. He'd had some bad fish or something, and was just telling the head waiter what he thought about it, and he bounced a peach on the floor to show how hard it was, only it wasn't quite as hard as he thought, and it squashed. Suzanne smiled. Sir Eustace doesn't like getting up early any more than I do. But Anne, did you see Mr. Paget? I ran against him in the passage. He's got a black eye. What can he have been doing? Only trying to push me overboard. I replied nonchalantly. It was a distinct score for me. Suzanne left her face half anointed and pressed for details. I gave them to her. It all gets more and more mysterious, she cried. I thought I was going to have the soft job sticking to Sir Eustace and that you would have all the fun with the Reverend Edward Chichester, but now I'm not so sure. I hope Paget won't push me off the train some dark night. I think you're still above suspicion, Suzanne, but if the worst happens, I'll wire to Clarence. That reminds me. Give me a cable form. Let me see now. What shall I say? Implicated in the most thrilling mystery, please send me a thousand pounds at once. Suzanne. I took the form from her and pointed out that she could eliminate a thee, an a, and possibly, if she didn't care about being polite, a please. Suzanne, however, appears to be perfectly reckless in money matters. Instead of attending to my economical suggestions, she added three more words. Enjoying myself hugely. Suzanne was engaged to lunch with friends of hers, who came to the hotel about eleven o'clock to fetch her. I was left to my own devices. I went down through the grounds of the hotel, crossed the tram lines, and followed a cool, shady avenue right down till I came to the main street. I strolled about, seeing the sights, enjoying the sunlight and the black-faced cellars of flowers and fruits. I also discovered a place where they had the most delicious ice cream sodas. Finally, I bought a sixpenny basket of peaches and retraced my steps to the hotel. To my surprise and pleasure, I found a note awaiting me. It was from the curator of the museum. He had read of my arrival on the Kilmorden, in which I was described as the daughter of the late Professor Beddingfeld. He had known my father slightly, and had had great admiration for him. He went on to say that his wife would be delighted if I would come out and have tea with them that afternoon at their villa at Musenberg. He gave me instructions for getting there. It was pleasant to think that poor papa was still remembered and highly thought of, I foresaw that I would have to be personally escorted round the museum before I left Cape Town, but I risked that.
To most people, it would have been a treat, but one can have too much of a good thing if one is brought up on it morning, noon, and night. I put on my best hat, one of Suzanne's cast-offs, and my least crumpled white linen, and started off after lunch. I caught a fast train to Musenberg and got there in about half an hour. It was a nice trip. We wound slowly round the base of Table Mountain, and some of the flowers were lovely. My geography being weak, I'd never fully realised that Cape Town is on a peninsula. Consequently, I was rather surprised on getting out of the train to find myself facing the sea once more. There was some perfectly entrancing bathing going on. The people had short curved boards and came floating in on the waves. It was far too early to go to tea. I made for the bathing pavilion, and when they said would I have a surfboard, I said, yes, please. Surfing looks perfectly easy. It isn't. I say no more. I got very angry and fairly hurled my plank from me. Nevertheless, I determined to return on the first possible opportunity and have another go. I would not be beaten. Quite by mistake, I then got a good run on my board and came out delirious with happiness. Surfing is like that. You are either vigorously cursing or else you are idiotically pleased with yourself. I found the Villa Meggi after some difficulty. It was right up on the side of the mountain, isolated from the other cottages and villas. I rang the bell, and a smiling cafe boy answered it. Mrs. Ruffini? I inquired. He ushered me in, preceded me down the passage, and flung open a door. Just as I was about to pass in, I hesitated. I felt a sudden misgiving. I stepped over the threshold, and the door swung sharply behind me. A man rose from his seat behind a table and came forward with outstretched hand. So glad we have persuaded you to visit us, Miss Beddingfeld, he said. He was a tall man, obviously a Dutchman, with a flaming orange beard. He did not look in the least like the curator of a museum. In fact, I realized in a flash that I had made a fool of myself. I was in the hands of the enemy. Chapter 19 It reminded me forcibly of episode 3 in The Perils of Pamela. How often had I not sat in the sixpenny seats, eating a tuppenny bar of milk chocolate, and yearning for similar things to happen to me? Well, they had happened with a vengeance, and somehow it was not nearly so amusing as I had imagined. It's all very well on the screen. You have the comfortable knowledge that there's bound to be an episode four. But in real life, there was absolutely no guarantee that Anna the Adventuress might not terminate abruptly at the end of any episode. Yes, I was in a tight place. All the things that Rayburn had said that morning came back to me with unpleasant distinctness. Tell the truth, he had said. Well, I could always do that, but was it going to help me? To begin with, would my story be believed? Would they consider it likely or possible that I had started off on this mad escapade simply on the strength of a scrap of paper smelling of mothballs? It sounded to me a wildly incredible tale. In that moment of cold sanity, I cursed myself for a melodramatic idiot and yearned for the peaceful boredom of little Hampsley. All this passed through my mind in less time than it takes to tell, my first instinctive movement was to step backwards and feel for the handle of the door. My captor merely grinned. Here you are, and here you stay, he remarked facetiously. I did my best to put a bold face upon the matter. I was invited to come here by the curator of the Cape Town Museum. If I've made a mistake... A mistake? Oh, yes, a big mistake. He laughed coarsely. What right of you to detain me? I shall inform the police. Yap, 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 like a little toy dog, he laughed. I sat down on a chair. I can only conclude that you are a dangerous lunatic, I said coldly. Indeed. I should like to point out to you that my friends are perfectly well aware where I have gone, and that if I have not returned by this evening, they will come in search of me. You understand? So your friends know where you are, do they? Which of them? Thus challenged, I did a lightning calculation of chances. Should I mention Sir Eustace? 
He was a well-known man, and his name might carry weight. But if they were in touch with Paget, they might know I was lying. Better not risk Sir Eustace. Mrs. Blair, for one, I said lightly. A friend of mine with whom I am staying. I think not, said my captor, slyly shaking his orange head. You have not seen her since eleven this morning, and you received our note bidding you to come here at lunchtime. His words showed me how closely my movements had been followed, but I was not going to give in without a fight. You are very clever, I said. Perhaps you have heard of that useful invention, the telephone. Mrs. Blair called me up on it when I was resting in my room after lunch. I told her then where I was going this afternoon. To my great satisfaction, I saw a shade of uneasiness pass over his face. Clearly, he had overlooked the possibility that Suzanne might have telephoned me. I wished she really had done so. Enough of this, he said harshly, rising. What are you going to do with me? I asked, still endeavouring to appear composed. Put you where you can do no harm in case your friends come after you. For a moment my blood ran cold, but his next words reassured me. Tomorrow you'll have some questions to answer, and after you've answered them we shall know what to do with you. And I can tell you, young lady, we've more ways than one of making obstinate little fools talk. It was not cheering, but it was at least a respite. I had until tomorrow. This man was clearly an underling obeying the orders of a superior. Could that superior by any chance be Paget? He called, and two kaffirs appeared. I was taken upstairs. Despite my struggles, I was gagged and then bound hand and foot. The room into which they had taken me was a kind of attic right under the roof. It was dusty and showed little signs of having been occupied. The Dutchman made a mock bow and withdrew, closing the door behind him. I was quite helpless. Turn and twist as I would, I could not loosen my bonds in the slightest degree, and the gag prevented me from crying out. If, by any possible chance, anyone did come to the house, I could do nothing to attract their attention. Down below I heard the sound of a door shutting. Evidently the Dutchman was going out. It was maddening not to be able to do anything. I strained again at my bonds, but the knots held. I desisted at last, and either fainted or fell asleep. When I awoke, I was in pain all over. It was quite dark now, and I judged that the night must be well advanced, for the moon was high in the heavens and shining down through the dusty skylight. The gag was half choking me, and the stiffness and pain were unendurable. It was then that my eyes fell on a bit of broken glass lying in the corner. A moonbeam slanted right down on it, and its glistening had caught my attention. As I looked at it, an idea came into my head. My arms and legs were helpless, but surely I could still roll. Slowly and awkwardly, I set myself in motion. It was not easy. Besides being extremely painful, since I could not guard my face with my arms, it was also exceedingly difficult to keep any particular direction. I tended to roll in every direction except the one I wanted to go. In the end, however, I came right up against my objective. It almost touched my bound hands. Even then it was not easy. It took an infinity of time before I could wriggle the glass into such a position, wedged against the wall, that it would rub up and down on my bonds. It was a long, heart-rending process, and I almost despaired. But in the end I succeeded in sawing through the cords that bound my wrists. The rest was a matter of time. Once I had restored the circulation to my hands by rubbing the wrists vigorously, I was able to undo the gag. One or two full breaths did a lot for me. Very soon I had undone the last knot, though even then it was some time before I could stand on my feet. But at last I stood erect, swinging my arms to and fro to restore the circulation, and wishing above all things that I could get hold of something to eat. I waited about a quarter of an hour to be quite sure of my recovered strength. Then I tiptoed noiselessly to the door. 
as I had hoped, it was not locked, only latched. I unlatched it and peeped cautiously out. Everything was still. The moonlight came in through a window and showed me the dusty, uncarpeted staircase. Cautiously, I crept down it. Still no sound. But as I stood on the landing below, a faint murmur of voices reached me. I stopped dead and stood there for some time. A clock on the wall registered the fact that it was after midnight. I was fully aware of the risks I might run if I descended lower, but my curiosity was too much for me. With infinite precautions I prepared to explore. I crept softly down the last flight of stairs and stood in the square hall. I looked round me, and then caught my breath with a gasp. A kaffir boy was sitting by the hall door. He had not seen me. Indeed, I soon realised by his breathing that he was fast asleep. Should I retreat, or should I go on? The voices came from the room I had been shown into on arrival. One of them was that of my Dutch friend. The other I could not for the moment recognise, though it seemed vaguely familiar. In the end, I decided that it was clearly my duty to hear all I could. I must risk the kaffir boy waking up. I crossed the hall noiselessly and knelt by the study door. For a moment or two I could hear no better. The voices were louder, but I could not distinguish what they said. I applied my eye to the keyhole instead of my ear. As I had guessed, one of the speakers was the big Dutchman. The other man was sitting outside my circumscribed range of vision. Suddenly he rose to get himself a drink. His back, black-clad and decorous, came into view. Even before he turned round, I knew who he was. Mr. Chichester. Now I began to make out the words. All the same, it is dangerous. Suppose our friends come after her. It was the big man speaking. Chichester answered him. He had dropped his clerical voice entirely. No wonder I had not recognised it. Oh, bluff. They haven't an idea where she is. She spoke very positively. I dare say. I've looked into the matter and we've nothing to fear. Anyway, it's the colonel's orders. You don't want to go against them, I suppose. The Dutchman ejaculated something in his own language. I judged it to be a hasty disclaimer. But why not knock her on the head? He growled. It would be simple. The boat is all ready. She could be taken out to sea. Yes, said Chichester meditatively. That is what I should do. She knows too much, that is certain. But the colonel is a man who likes to play a lone hand, though no one else must do so. Something in his own words seemed to awaken a memory that annoyed him. He wants... Information of some kind from this girl. He had paused before the information, and the Dutchman was quick to catch him up. Information. Something of that kind. Diamonds, I said to myself. And now, continued Chichester, give me the lists. For a long time their conversation was quite incomprehensible to me. It seemed to deal with large quantities of vegetables, Dates were mentioned, prices, and various names of places which I did not know. It was quite half an hour before they had finished their checking and counting. Good, said Chichester, and there was a sound as though he pushed back his chair. I will take these with me for the colonel to see. When do you leave? Ten o'clock tomorrow morning will do. Do you want to see the girl before you go? No, there are strict orders that no one is to see her until the colonel comes. Is she all right? I looked in on her when I came in for dinner. She was asleep, I think. What about food? A little starvation will do no harm. The colonel will be here sometime tomorrow. She will answer questions better if she is hungry. No one had better go near her till then. Is she securely tied up? The Dutchman laughed. What do you think? They both laughed. So did I, under my breath. Then, as the sound seemed to betoken that they were about to come out of the room, I beat a hasty retreat. I was just in time. As I reached the head of the stairs, I heard the door of the room open, 
and at the same time the Kaffir stirred and moved. My retreat by the way of the hall door was not to be thought of. I retired prudently to the attic, gathered my bonds round me, and lay down again on the floor, in case they should take it into their heads to come and look at me. They did not do so, however. After about an hour, I crept down the stairs, but the Kaffir by the door was awake and humming softly to himself. I was anxious to get out of the house, but I did not quite see how to manage it. In the end, I was forced to retreat to the attic again. The Kaffir was clearly on guard for the night. I remained there patiently all through the sounds of early morning preparation. The men breakfasted in the hall. I could hear their voices distinctly floating up the stairs. I was getting thoroughly unnerved. How on earth was I to get out of the house? I counseled myself to be patient. A rash move might spoil everything. After breakfast came the sounds of Chichester departing. To my intense relief, the Dutchman accompanied him. I waited breathlessly. Breakfast was being cleared away. The work of the house was being done. At last, the various activities seemed to die down. I slipped out from my lair once more. Very carefully, I crept down the stairs. The hall was empty. Like a flash I was across it, had unlatched the door, and was outside in the sunshine. I ran down the drive like one possessed. Once outside, I resumed a normal walk. People stared at me curiously, and I do not wonder. My face and clothes must have been covered in dust from rolling about in the attic. At last I came to a garage. I went in. I have met with an accident. I explained. I want a car to take me to Cape Town at once. I must catch the boat to Durban. I had not long to wait. Ten minutes later I was speeding along in the direction of Cape Town. I must know if Chichester was on the boat. Whether to sail on her myself or not I could not determine, but in the end I decided to do so. Chichester would not know that I had seen him in the villa at Musenberg. He would doubtless lay further traps for me, but I was forewarned. And he was the man I was after, the man who was seeking the diamonds on behalf of the mysterious colonel. Alas for my plans! As I arrived at the docks, the Kilmorden Castle was steaming out to sea, and I had no means of knowing whether Chichester had sailed on her or not. Chapter 20 I drove to the hotel, there was no one in the lounge that I knew. I ran upstairs and tapped on Suzanne's door. Her voice bade me come in. When she saw who it was, she literally fell on my neck. Anne, dear, where have you been? I've been worried to death about you. What have you been doing? Having adventures, I replied. Episode three of The Perils of Pamela. I told her the whole story. She gave vent to a deep sigh when I finished. Why do these things always happen to you? She demanded plaintively. Why does no one gag me and bind me hand and foot? You wouldn't like it if they did, I assured her. To tell you the truth, I'm not nearly so keen on having adventures myself as I was. A little of that sort of thing goes a long way. Suzanne seemed unconvinced. An hour or two of gagging and binding would have changed her view quickly enough. Suzanne likes thrills, but she hates being uncomfortable. And what are we all doing now? she asked. I don't quite know, I said thoughtfully. You still go to Rhodesia, of course, to keep an eye on Paget. And you? That was just my difficulty. Had Chichester gone on the Kilmorden, or had he not? Did he mean to carry out his original plan of going to Durban, the hour of his leaving Musenberg seemed to point to an affirmative answer to both questions. In that case, I might go to Durban by train. I fancied that I should get there before the boat. On the other hand, if the news of my escape were wired to Chichester, and also the information that I had left Cape Town for Durban, nothing was simpler for him than to leave the boat at either Port Elizabeth or East London, and so give me the slip completely. It was rather a knotty problem— We'll inquire about trains to Durban anyway, I said. And it's not too late for morning tea, said Suzanne. We'll have it in the lounge. 
The Durban train left at 8.15 that evening, so they told me at the office. For the moment, I postponed decision and joined Suzanne for somewhat belated 11 o'clock tea. Do you feel that you would really recognise Chichester again, in any other disguise, I mean? asked Suzanne. I shook my head ruefully. I certainly didn't recognise him as the stewardess, and never should have but for your drawing. The man's a professional actor, I'm sure of it, said Suzanne thoughtfully. His makeup is perfectly marvellous. He might come off the boat as a navvy or something, and you'd never spot him. You're very cheering, I said. At that minute, Colonel Race stepped in through the window and came and joined us. What is Sir Eustace doing? asked Suzanne. I haven't seen him about today. Rather an odd expression passed over the colonel's face. He's got a little trouble of his own to attend to, which is keeping him busy. Tell us about it. I mustn't tell tales out of school. Tell us something, even if you have to invent it for our special benefit. Well, what would you say to the famous man in the brown suit having made the voyage with us? What? I felt the colour die out of my face and then surge back again. Fortunately, Colonel Race was not looking at me. It's a fact, I believe. Every port watched for him, and he bamboozled Peddler into bringing him out as his secretary. Not Mr. Paget. Oh, not Paget. The other fellow. Rayburn, he called himself. Have they arrested him? asked Suzanne. Under the table, she gave my hand a reassuring squeeze. I waited breathlessly for an answer. He seems to have disappeared into thin air. How does Sir Eustace take it? Regards it as a personal insult offered him by fate. An opportunity of hearing Sir Eustace's views on the matter presented itself later in the day. We were awakened from a refreshing afternoon nap by a page boy with a note. In touching terms, it requested the pleasure of our company at tea in his sitting room. The poor man was indeed in a pitiable state. He poured out his troubles to us, encouraged by Suzanne's sympathetic murmurs. She does that sort of thing very well. First, a perfectly strange woman has the impertinence to get herself murdered in my house, on purpose to annoy me, I do believe. Why my house? Why, of all the houses in Great Britain, choose the mill house? What harm had I ever done the woman that she must needs get herself murdered there? Suzanne made one of her sympathetic noises again, and Sir Eustace proceeded in a still more aggrieved tone. And, if that's not enough, the fellow who murdered her has the impudence, the colossal impudence, to attach himself to me as my secretary. My secretary, if you please. I'm tired of secretaries. I won't have any more secretaries. Either they're concealed murderers, or else they're drunken brawlers. Have you seen Paget's black eye? But of course you have. How can I go about with a secretary like that? And his face is such a nasty shade of yellow, too. Just the colour that doesn't go with a black eye. I've done with secretaries. Unless I have a girl, a nice girl with liquid eyes, who'll hold my hand when I'm feeling cross. What about you, Miss Anne? Will you take on the job? How often shall I have to hold your hand? I asked, laughing. All day long replied Sir Eustace gallantly. I shan't get much typing done at that rate, I reminded him. That doesn't matter. All this work is Paget's idea. He works me to death. I'm looking forward to leaving him behind in Cape Town. He is staying behind? Yes, he'll enjoy himself thoroughly sleuthing about after Rayburn. That's the sort of thing that suits Paget down to the ground. He adores intrigue. But I'm quite serious in my offer. Will you come? Mrs. Blair here is a competent chaperone, and you can have a half-holiday every now and again to dig for bones. Thank you very much, Sir Eustace, I said cautiously, but I think I'm leaving for Durban tonight. Now don't be an obstinate girl. Remember, there are lots of lions in Rhodesia. You'll like lions, all girls do. Will they be practising low jumps? I asked, laughing. No, thank you very much, but I must go to Durban. Sir Eustace looked at me, sighed deeply, then opened the door of the adjoining room and called to Paget. 
If you've quite finished your afternoon sleep, my dear fellow, perhaps you'd do a little work for a change. Guy Paget appeared in the doorway. He bowed to us both, starting slightly at the sight of me, and replied in a melancholy voice, I have been typing that memorandum all this afternoon, Sir Eustace. Well, stop typing it then. Go down to the Trade Commissioner's office, or the Board of Agriculture, or the Chamber of Mines, or one of those places, and ask them to lend me some kind of a woman to take to Rhodesia. She must have liquid eyes and not object to my holding her hand. Yes, Sir Eustace, I will ask for a competent shorthand typist. Padgett's a malicious fellow said Sir Eustace after the secretary had departed. I'd be prepared to bet that he'll pick out some slab-faced creature on purpose to annoy me. She must have nice feet, too. I forgot to mention that. I clutched Suzanne excitedly by the hand and almost dragged her along to her room. Now, Suzanne, I said, we've got to make plans and make them quickly. Paget is staying behind here. You heard that. Yes, I suppose that means that I shan't be allowed to go to Rhodesia, which is very annoying because I want to go to Rhodesia. How tiresome. Cheer up, I said. You're going all right. I don't see how you could back out at the last moment without its appearing frightfully suspicious. And besides, Paget might suddenly be summoned by Sir Eustace, and it would be far harder for you to attach yourself to him for the journey up. It would hardly be respectable said Suzanne, dimpling. I should have to pretend a fatal passion for him as an excuse. On the other hand, if you were there when he arrived, it would all be perfectly simple and natural. Besides, I don't think we ought to lose sight of the other two entirely. Oh, Anne, you surely can't suspect Colonel Race or Sir Eustace. I suspect everybody. I said darkly, and if you've read any detective story, Suzanne, you must know that it's always the most unlikely person who's the villain. Lots of criminals have been cheerful fat men like Sir Eustace. Colonel Race isn't particularly fat or particularly cheerful either. Sometimes they're lean and saturnine. I retorted. I don't say I seriously suspect either of them, but after all, the woman was murdered in Sir Eustace's house. Yes, yes, we needn't go over all that again. I'll watch him for you, Anne, and if he gets any fatter and any more cheerful, I'll send you a telegram at once. Sir E, swelling, highly suspicious. Come at once. Really, Suzanne, I cried, you seem to think all this is a game. I know I do, said Suzanne, unabashed. It seems like that. It's your fault, Anne. I've got imbued with your let's-have-an-adventure spirit. It doesn't seem a bit real. Dear me, if Clarence knew that I was running about Africa tracking dangerous criminals, he'd have a fit. Why don't you cable him about it? I asked sarcastically. Suzanne's sense of humour always fails her when it comes to sending cables. She considered my suggestion in perfectly good faith. I might. It would have to be a very long one. Her eyes brightened at the thought. But I think it's better not. Husbands always want to interfere with perfectly harmless amusements. Well, I said, summing up the situation, you will keep an eye on Sir Eustace and Colonel Race. I know why I've got to watch Sir Eustace, interrupted Suzanne, because of his figure and his humorous conversation. But I think it's carrying it rather far to suspect Colonel Race. I do indeed. Why, he's something to do with the Secret Service. Do you know, Anne, I believe the best thing we could do would be to confide in him and tell him the whole story. I objected vigorously to this unsporting proposal. I recognised in it the disastrous effects of matrimony. How often have I not heard a perfectly intelligent female say, in the tone of one clinching an argument, Edgar says, and all the time you are perfectly aware that Edgar is a perfect fool. Suzanne, by reason of her married state, was yearning to lean upon some man or other. However, she promised faithfully that she would not breathe a word to Colonel Race, and we went on with our plan-making. It's quite clear that I must stay here and watch Paget, and this is the best way to do it. I must pretend to leave for Durban this evening, take my luggage down and so on, but really I shall go to some small hotel in the town. 
I can alter my appearance a little, wear a fair toupee and one of those thick white lace veils, and I shall have a much better chance of seeing what he's really at if he thinks I'm safely out of the way. Suzanne approved this plan heartily. We made due and ostentatious preparations, inquiring once more about the departure of the train at the office and packing my luggage. We dined together in the restaurant. Colonel Race did not appear, but Sir Eustace and Paget were at their table in the window. Paget left the table halfway through the meal, which annoyed me as I had planned to say goodbye to him. However, doubtless Sir Eustace would do as well. I went over to him when I had finished. Goodbye, Sir Eustace, I said. I'm off tonight to Durban. Sir Eustace sighed heavily. So I heard. You wouldn't like me to come with you, would you? I should love it. Nice girl. Sure you won't change your mind and come and look for lions in Rhodesia? Quite sure. He must be a very handsome fellow, said Sir Eustace plaintively. Some young whippersnapper in Durban, I suppose, who puts my mature charms completely in the shade. By the way, Paget's going down in the car in a minute or two. He could take you to the station. Oh, no, thank you, I said hastily. Mrs. Blair and I have got our own taxi ordered. To go down with Guy Paget was the last thing I wanted. Sir Eustace looked at me attentively. I don't believe you like Paget. I don't blame you. Of all the officious, interfering asses, going about with the air of a martyr and doing everything he can to annoy and upset me. What has he done now? I inquired with some curiosity. He's got hold of a secretary for me. You never saw such a woman. Forty, if she's a day, wears pince-nez and sensible boots and an air of brisk efficiency that will be the death of me. A regular slab-faced woman. Won't she hold your hand? I devoutly hope not, exclaimed Sir Eustace. That would be the last straw. Well, goodbye, liquid eyes. If I shoot a lion, I shan't give you the skin, after the base way you've deserted me. He squeezed my hand warmly, and we parted. Suzanne was waiting for me in the hall. She was to come down to see me off. Let's start at once, I said hastily, and motioned to the man to get a taxi. Then a voice behind me made me start. Excuse me, Miss Beddingfeld, but I'm just going down in a car. I can drop you and Mrs. Blair at the station. Oh, thank you, I said hastily, but there's no need to trouble you. I... No trouble at all, I assure you. Put the luggage in, Porter. I was helpless. I might have protested further, but a slight warning nudge from Suzanne urged me to be on my guard. Thank you, Mr. Paget, I said coldly. We all got into the car. As we raced down the road into the town, I racked my brains for something to say. In the end, Paget himself broke the silence. I have secured a very capable secretary for Sir Eustace, he observed. Miss Pettigrew. He wasn't exactly raving about her just now, I remarked. Paget looked at me coldly. She is a proficient shorthand typist, he said repressively. We pulled up in front of the station. Here, surely, he would leave us. I turned with outstretched hand, but no. I'll come and see you off. It's just eight o'clock. Your train goes in a quarter of an hour. He gave efficient directions to porters. I stood helpless, not daring to look at Suzanne. The man suspected. He was determined to make sure that I did go by the train. And what could I do? Nothing. I saw myself in a quarter of an hour's time, steaming out of the station with Paget planted on the platform, waving me adieu. He had turned the tables on me adroitly. His manner towards me had changed, moreover. It was full of an uneasy geniality which sat ill upon him and which nauseated me. The man was an oily hypocrite. First he tried to murder me, and now he paid me compliments. Did he imagine for one minute that I hadn't recognized him that night on the boat? No, it was a pose, a pose which he forced me to acquiesce in, his tongue in his cheek all the while. Helpless as a sheep, I moved along under his expert directions. My luggage was piled in my sleeping compartment. I had a two-berth one to myself. It was twelve minutes past eight. 
In three minutes, the train would start. But Paget had reckoned without Suzanne. It will be a terribly hot journey, Anne, she said suddenly, especially going through the Karoo tomorrow. You've got some eau de cologne or lavender water with you, haven't you? My cue was plain. Oh, dear, I cried. I left my eau de cologne on the dressing table at the hotel. Suzanne's habit of command served her well. She turned imperiously to Paget. Mr. Paget, quick, you've just time. There's a chemist almost opposite the station. Anne must have some eau de cologne. He hesitated, but Suzanne's imperative manner was too much for him. She is a born autocrat. He went. Suzanne followed him with her eyes till he disappeared. Quick, Anne, get out the other side in case he hasn't really gone, but is watching us from the end of the platform. Never mind your luggage. You can telegraph about that tomorrow. Oh, if only the train starts on time. I opened the gate on the opposite side to the platform and climbed down. Nobody was observing me. I could just see Suzanne standing where I had left her, looking up at the train and apparently chatting to me at the window. A whistle blew. The train began to draw out. Then I heard feet racing furiously up the platform. I withdrew to the shadow of a friendly bookstall and watched. Suzanne turned from waving her handkerchief to the retreating train. Too late, Mr. Paget," she said cheerfully. She's gone. Is that the eau de cologne? What a pity we didn't think of it sooner. They passed not far from me on their way out of the station. Guy Paget was extremely hot. He had evidently run all the way to the chemist and back. Shall I get you a taxi, Mrs. Blair? Suzanne did not fail in her role. Yes, please. Can't I give you a lift back? Have you much to do for Sir Eustace? Dear me, I wish Anne Beddingfeld was coming with us tomorrow. I don't like the idea of a young girl like that travelling off to Durban all by herself. But she was set upon it. Some little attraction there, I fancy. They passed out of earshot. Clever Suzanne. She had saved me. I allowed a minute or two to elapse, and then I too made my way out of the station, almost colliding as I did so with a man, an unpleasant-looking man with a nose disproportionately big for his face. Chapter 21 I had no further difficulty in carrying out my plans. I found a small hotel in a back street, got a room there, paid a deposit as I had no luggage with me, and went placidly to bed. On the following morning I was up early and went out into the town to purchase a modest wardrobe. My idea was to do nothing until after the departure of the eleven o'clock train to Rhodesia with most of the party on board. Paget was not likely to indulge in any nefarious activities until he had got rid of them. Accordingly, I took a train out of the town and proceeded to enjoy a country walk. It was comparatively cool, and I was glad to stretch my legs after the long voyage and my close confinement at Musenberg. A lot hinges on small things. My shoelace came untied, and I stopped to do it up. The road had just turned a corner, and as I was bending over the offending shoe, a man came right round and almost walked into me. He lifted his hat, murmuring an apology, and went on. It struck me at the time that his face was vaguely familiar, but at the moment I thought no more of it. I looked at my wristwatch. The time was getting on. I turned my feet in the direction of Cape Town. There was a tram on the point of going, and I had to run for it. I heard other footsteps running behind me. I swung myself on, and so did the other runner. I recognized him at once. It was the man who had passed me on the road when my shoe came untied, and in a flash I knew why his face was familiar. It was the small man with the big nose whom I had run into on leaving the station the night before. The coincidence was rather startling. Could it be possible that the man was deliberately following me? I resolved to test that as promptly as possible. I rang the bell and got off at the next stop. The man did not get off. I withdrew into the shadow of a shop doorway and watched. He alighted at the next stop and walked back in my direction. The case was clear enough. I was being followed. I had crowed too soon. My victory over Guy Paget took on another aspect. 
I hailed the next tram and, as I expected, my shadower also got on. I gave myself up to some very serious thinking. It was perfectly apparent that I had stumbled on a bigger thing than I knew. The murder in the house at Marlow was not an isolated incident committed by a solitary individual. I was up against a gang, and, thanks to Colonel Race's revelations to Suzanne and what I had overheard at the house at Musenberg, I was beginning to understand some of its manifold activities. Systematized crime, organized by the man known to his followers as the Colonel. I remembered some of the talk I had heard on board ship, of the strike on the Rand and the causes underlying it, and the belief that some secret organization was at work fermenting the agitation. That was the colonel's work. His emissaries were acting according to plan. He took no part in these things himself, I had always heard, as he limited himself to directing and organizing. The brain work, not the dangerous labor, for him. But still, it well might be that he himself was on the spot, directing affairs from an apparently impeccable position. That, then, was the meaning of Colonel Race's presence on the Kilmorden Castle. He was out after the arch-criminal. Everything fitted in with that assumption. He was someone high up in the Secret Service, whose business it was to lay the Colonel by the heels. I nodded to myself. Things were becoming very clear to me. What of my part in the affair? Where did I come in? Was it only diamonds they were after? I shook my head. Great as the value of the diamonds might be, they hardly accounted for the desperate attempts which had been made to get me out of the way. No, I stood for more than that. In some way, unknown to myself, I was a menace, a danger. Some knowledge that I had, or that they thought I had, made them anxious to remove me at all costs, and that knowledge was bound up somehow with the diamonds. There was one person I felt sure who could enlighten me, if he would. The man in the brown suit, Harry Rayburn. He knew the other half of the story, but he had vanished into the darkness. He was a hunted creature flying from pursuit, in all probability, he and I would never meet again. I brought myself back with a jerk to the actualities of the moment. It was no good thinking sentimentally of Harry Rayburn. He had displayed the greatest antipathy to me from the first. Or, at least, there I was again, dreaming. The real problem was what to do now. I, priding myself upon my role of watcher, had become the watched and I was afraid. For the first time, I began to lose my nerve. I was the little bit of grit that was impeding the smooth working of the great machine, and I fancied that the machine would have a short way with little bits of grit. Once Harry Rayburn had saved me, once I had saved myself, but I felt suddenly that the odds were heavily against me. My enemies were all around me in every direction, and they were closing in. If I continued to play a lone hand, I was doomed. I rallied myself with an effort. After all, what could they do? I was in a civilized city, with policemen every few yards. I would be wary in future. They should not trap me again as they had done in Musenberg. As I reached this point in my meditations, the tram arrived at Adderley Street. I got out. Undecided what to do, I walked slowly up the left-hand side of the street. I did not trouble to look if my watcher was behind me. I knew he was. I walked into Cartwright's and ordered two coffee ice cream sodas to steady my nerves. A man, I suppose, would have had a stiff peg, but girls derive a lot of comfort from ice cream sodas. I applied myself to the end of the straw with gusto. The cool liquid went trickling down my throat in the most agreeable manner. I pushed the first glass aside, empty. I was sitting on one of the little high stools in front of the counter. Out of the tail of my eye, I saw my tracker come in and sit down unostentatiously at a little table near the door. I finished the second coffee soda and demanded a maple one. I can drink practically an unlimited amount of ice cream sodas. Suddenly, the man by the door got up and went out. That surprised me. If he was going to wait outside, why not wait outside from the beginning? 
I slipped down from my stool and went cautiously to the door. I drew back quickly into the shadow. The man was talking to Guy Paget. If I had ever had any doubts, that would have settled it. Paget had his watch out and was looking at it. They exchanged a few brief words, and then the secretary swung on down the street towards the station. Evidently, he had given his orders. But what were they? Suddenly, my heart leapt into my mouth. The man who had followed me crossed to the middle of the road and spoke to a policeman. He spoke at some length, gesticulating towards Cartwrights and evidently explaining something. I saw the plan at once. I was to be arrested on some charge or other, pocket-picking perhaps. It would be easy enough for the gang to put through a simple little matter like that. Of what good to protest my innocence? They would have seen to every detail. Long ago they had brought a charge of robbing De Beers against Harry Rayburn, and he had not been able to disprove it, though I had little doubt but that he had been absolutely blameless. What chance had I against such a frame-up as the Colonel could devise? I glanced up at the clock almost mechanically, and immediately another aspect of the case struck me. I saw the point of Guy Paget's looking at his watch. It was just on eleven, and at eleven the mail train left for Rhodesia bearing with it the influential friends who might otherwise come to my rescue. That was the reason of my immunity up to now. From last night till eleven this morning I had been safe, but now the net was closing in upon me. I hurriedly opened my bag and paid for my drinks, and as I did so, my heart seemed to stand still, for inside it was a man's wallet stuffed with notes. It must have been deftly introduced into my handbag as I left the tram. Promptly I lost my head. I hurried out of Cartwright's. The little man with the big nose and the policeman were just crossing the road. They saw me, and the little man designated me excitedly to the policeman. I took to my heels and ran. I judged him to be a slow policeman. I should get a start. But I had no plan even then. I just ran for my life down Adderley Street. People began to stare. I felt that in another minute someone would stop me. An idea flashed into my head. The station! I asked in a breathless gasp. Just down on the right. I sped on. It is permissible to run for a train. I turned into the station, but as I did so, I heard footsteps close behind me. The little man with the big nose was a champion sprinter. I foresaw that I should be stopped before I got to the platform I was in search of. I looked up to the clock, one minute to eleven. I might just do it if my plan succeeded. I had entered the station by the main entrance in Adderley Street. I now darted out again through the side exit. Directly opposite me was the side entrance to the post office, the main entrance to which is in Adderley Street. As I expected, my pursuer, instead of following me in, ran down the street to cut me off when I emerged by the main entrance, or to warn the policeman to do so. In an instant I slipped across the street again and back into the station. I ran like a lunatic. It was just eleven. The long train was moving as I appeared on the platform. A porter tried to stop me, but I wriggled myself out of his grasp and sprang upon the footboard. I mounted the two steps and opened the gate. I was safe. The train was gathering way. We passed a man standing by himself at the end of the platform. I waved to him. Goodbye, Mr. Paget. I shouted. Never have I seen a man more taken aback. He looked as though he had seen a ghost. In a minute or two, I was having trouble with the conductor, but I took a lofty tone. I am Sir Eustace Pedler's secretary. I said haughtily, please take me to his private car. Suzanne and Colonel Race were standing on the rear observation platform. They both uttered an exclamation of utter surprise at seeing me. Hello, Miss Anne, cried Colonel Race. Where have you turned up from? I thought you'd gone to Durban. What an unexpected person you are. Suzanne said nothing, but her eyes asked a hundred questions. I must report myself to my chief, I said demurely. Where is he? He's in the office, middle compartment, dictating at an incredible rate to the unfortunate Miss Pettigrew. This enthusiasm for work is something new, I commented. Hmm, said Colonel Race. 
His idea is, I think, to give her sufficient work to chain her to her typewriter in her own compartment for the rest of the day. I laughed. Then, followed by the other two, I sought out Sir Eustace. He was striding up and down the circumscribed space, hurling a flood of words at the unfortunate secretary, whom I now saw for the first time. A tall, square woman in drab clothing, with pince-nez and an efficient air. I judged that she was finding it difficult to keep pace with Sir Eustace, for her pencil was flying along, and she was frowning horribly. I stepped into the compartment. Come aboard, sir, I said saucily. Sir Eustace paused dead in the middle of a complicated sentence on the labour situation and stared at me. Miss Pettigrew must be a nervous creature in spite of her efficient air, for she jumped as though she had been shot. God bless my soul, ejaculated Sir Eustace. What about the young man in Durban? I prefer you, I said softly. Darling, said Sir Eustace, you can start holding my hand at once. Miss Pettigrew coughed, and Sir Eustace hastily withdrew his hand. Ah, yes, he said. Let me see, where were we? Yes, Tileman Ruse, in his speech at... What's the matter? Why aren't you taking it down? I think, said Colonel Race gently, that Miss Pettigrew has broken her pencil. He took it from her and sharpened it. Sir Eustace stared, and so did I. There was something in Colonel Race's tone that I did not quite understand. Chapter 22 Extract from the Diary of Sir Eustace Pedler I am inclined to abandon my reminiscences. Instead, I shall write a short article entitled Secretaries I Have Had. As regards secretaries, I seem to have fallen under a blight. At one minute I have no secretaries, at another I have too many. At the present minute I am journeying to Rhodesia with a pack of women. Race goes off with the two best looking, of course, and leaves me with a dud. That is what always happens to me, and after all, this is my private car, not Race's. Also, Anne Bedingfeld is accompanying me to Rhodesia on the pretext of being my temporary secretary. But all this afternoon she has been out on the observation platform with Race, exclaiming at the beauty of the Hex River Pass. It is true that I told her her principal duty would be to hold my hand, but she isn't even doing that. Perhaps she is afraid of Miss Pettigrew. I don't blame her if so. There is nothing attractive about Miss Pettigrew. She is a repellent female with large feet, more like a man than a woman. There is something very mysterious about Anne Bedingfeld. She jumped on board the train at the last minute, puffing like a steam engine, for all the world as though she's been running a race. And yet Paget told me that he'd seen her off to Durban last night. Either Paget has been drinking again, or else the girl must have an astral body. And she never explains. Nobody ever explains. Yes, secretaries I have had. Number one, a murderer fleeing from justice. Number two, a secret drinker who carries on disreputable intrigues in Italy. Number three, a beautiful girl who possesses the useful faculty of being in two places at once. Number four, Miss Pettigrew, who I have no doubt is really a particularly dangerous crook in disguise. Probably one of Paget's Italian friends that he has palmed off on me. I shouldn't wonder if the world found some day that it had been grossly deceived by Paget. On the whole, I think Rayburn was the best of the bunch. He never worried me or got in my way. Guy Paget has had the impertinence to have the stationary trunk put in here. None of us can move without falling over it. I went out on the observation platform just now, expecting my appearance to be greeted with hails of delight. Both the women were listening spellbound to one of Race's traveller's tales. I shall label this car, not Sir Eustace Peddler and Party, but Colonel Race and Harim. Then Mrs. Blair must needs begin talking silly photographs. Every time we went round a particularly appalling curve, as we climbed higher and higher, she snapped at the engine. You see the point? she cried delightedly. It must be some curve if you can photograph the front part of the train from the back, and with the mountain background it will look awfully dangerous. 
I pointed out to her that no one could possibly tell it had been taken from the back of the train. She looked at me pityingly. I shall write underneath it, taken from the train, engine going round a curve. You could write that under any snapshot of a train, I said. Women never think of these simple things. I'm glad we've come up here in daylight, cried Anne Bedingfeld. I shouldn't have seen this if I'd gone last night to Durban, should I? No, said Colonel Race, smiling. You'd have woken up tomorrow morning to find yourself in the Karoo, a hot, dusty desert of stones and rocks. I'm glad I changed my mind, said Anne, sighing contentedly and looking round. It was rather a wonderful sight, the great mountains all around, through which we turned and twisted and laboured ever steadily upwards. Is this the best train in the day to Rhodesia? asked Anne Bedingfeld. In the day? laughed Race. Why, my dear Miss Anne, there are only three trains a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. Do you realise that you don't arrive at the Falls until Saturday next? How well we shall know each other by that time, said Mrs. Blair maliciously. How long are you going to stay at the Falls, Sir Eustace? That depends, I said cautiously. On what? On how things go at Johannesburg. My original idea was to stay a couple of days at the Falls, which I've never seen, though this is my third visit to Africa, and then go on to Joburg and study the conditions of things on the Rand. At home, you know, I pose as being an authority on South African politics. But from all I hear, Joburg will be a particularly unpleasant place to visit in about a week's time. I don't want to study conditions in the midst of a raging revolution. Race smiled in a rather superior manner. I think your fears are exaggerated, Sir Eustace. There will be no great danger in Joburg. The women immediately looked at him in the what a brave hero you are manner. It annoyed me intensely. I am every bit as brave as race, but I lack the figure. These long, lean brown men have it all their own way. I suppose you'll be there, I said coldly. Very possibly, we might travel together. I'm not sure that I shan't stay on at the falls a bit, I answered noncommittally. Why is Race so anxious that I should go to Joburg? He's got his eye on Anne, I believe. What are your plans, Miss Anne? That depends, she replied demurely, copying me. I thought you were my secretary, I objected. Oh, but I've been cut out. You've been holding Miss Pettigrew's hand all the afternoon. Whatever I've been doing, I can swear I've not been doing that, I assured her. Thursday night. We have just left Kimberley. Race was made to tell the story of the diamond robbery all over again. Why are women so excited by anything to do with diamonds? At last Anne Bedingfeld has shed her veil of mystery. It seems that she's a newspaper correspondent. She sent an immense cable from De R this morning. To judge by the jabbering that went on nearly all night in Mrs. Blair's cabin, she must have been reading aloud all her special articles for years to come. It seems that all along she's been on the track of the man in the brown suit. Apparently she didn't spot him on the Kilmorden. In fact, she hardly had the chance, but she's now very busy cabling home, how I journeyed out with the murderer and inventing highly fictitious stories of what he said to me, etc. I know how these things are done. I do them myself in my reminiscences when Paget will let me. And of course, one of Naseby's efficient staff will brighten up the details still more so that when it appears in the daily budget, Rayburn won't recognize himself. The girl's clever, though. All on her own, apparently, she's ferreted out the identity of the woman who was killed in my house. She was a Russian dancer called Nadina. I asked Anne Bedingfeld if she was sure of this. She replied that it was merely a deduction, quite in the Sherlock Holmes manner. However, I gathered that she had cabled it home to Naseby as a proved fact. Women have these intuitions. I've no doubt that Anne Bedingfeld is perfectly right in her guess, but to call it a deduction is absurd. How she ever got on the staff of the Daily Budget is more than I can imagine. But she's the kind of young woman who does these things, impossible to withstand her. 
She is full of coaxing ways that mask an invincible determination. Look how she has got into my private car. I'm beginning to have an inkling why. Ray said something about the police suspecting that Rayburn would make for Rhodesia. He might just have got off by Monday's train. They telegraphed all along the line, I presume, and no one of his description was found. But that says little. He's an astute young man, and he knows Africa. He's probably exquisitely disguised as an old cafe woman, and the simple police continue to look for a handsome young man with a scar dressed in the height of European fashion. I never did quite swallow that scar. Anyway, Anne Bedingfeld is on his track. She wants the glory of discovering him for herself and the daily budget. Young women are very cold-blooded nowadays. I hinted to her that it was an unwomanly action. She laughed at me. She assured me that did she run him to earth, her fortune was made. Race doesn't like it either, I can see. Perhaps Rayburn is on this train. If so, we may all be murdered in our beds. I said so to Mrs. Blair, but she seemed quite to welcome the idea, and remarked that if I were murdered, it would be really a terrific scoop for Anne. A scoop for Anne, indeed. Tomorrow we shall be going through Bequana land. The dust will be atrocious. Also, at every station, little cafe children come and sell you quaint wooden animals that they carve themselves. Also mealy bowls and baskets. I am rather afraid that Mrs. Blair may run amok. There is a primitive charm about these toys that I feel will appeal to her. Friday evening. As I feared, Mrs. Blair and Anne have bought 49 wooden animals. Chapter 23. Anne's narrative resumed. I thoroughly enjoyed the journey up to Rhodesia. There was something new and exciting to see every day. First the wonderful scenery of the Hex River Valley, then the desolate grandeur of the Karoo, and finally that wonderful straight stretch of line in Bekwana land and the perfectly adorable toys the natives brought to sell. Suzanne and I were nearly left behind at each station if you could call them stations. It seemed to me that the train just stopped whenever it felt like it, and no sooner had it done so than a horde of natives materialised out of the empty landscape, holding up mealy bowls and sugar canes and fur carosses and adorable carved wooden animals. Suzanne began at once to make a collection of the latter. I imitated her example. Most of them cost a tiki, threepence, and each was different. There were giraffes and tigers and snakes and a melancholy-looking eland and absurd little black warriors. We enjoyed ourselves enormously. Sir Eustace tried to restrain us, but in vain. I still think it was a miracle we were not left behind at some oasis of the line. South African trains don't hoot or get excited when they are going to start off again. They just glide quietly away, and you look up from your bargaining and run for your life. Suzanne's amazement at seeing me climb upon the train at Cape Town can be imagined. We held an exhaustive survey of the situation on the first evening out. We talked half the night. It had become clear to me that defensive tactics must be adopted as well as aggressive ones. Travelling with Sir Eustace Pedler and his party, I was fairly safe. Both he and Colonel Race were powerful protectors, and I judged that my enemies would not wish to stir up a hornet's nest about my ears. Also, as long as I was near Sir Eustace, I was more or less in touch with Guy Paget, and Guy Paget was the heart of the mystery. I asked Suzanne whether, in her opinion, it was possible that Paget himself was the mysterious colonel. His subordinate position was, of course, against the assumption, but it had struck me once or twice that for all his autocratic ways, Sir Eustace was really very much influenced by his secretary. He was an easy-going man, and one whom an adroit secretary might be able to twist round his little finger. The comparative obscurity of his position might in reality be useful to him, since he would be anxious to be well out of the limelight. Suzanne, however, negatived these ideas very strongly. She refused to believe that Guy Paget was the ruling spirit. The real head, the colonel, was somewhere in the background and had probably been already in Africa at the time of our arrival. I agreed that there was much to be said for her view, but I was not entirely satisfied. 
for in each suspicious instance, Paget had been shown as the directing genius. It was true that his personality seemed to lack the assurance and decision that one would expect from a master criminal, but after all, according to Colonel Race, it was brainwork only that this mysterious leader supplied, and creative genius is often allied to a weak and timorous physical constitution. There speaks the professor's daughter, interrupted Suzanne, when I had got to this point in my argument. It's true, all the same. On the other hand, Paget may be the grand vizier, so to speak, of the all-highest. I was silent for a minute or two, and then went on musingly. I wish I knew how Sir Eustace made his money. Suspecting him again? Suzanne, I've got into that state that I can't help suspecting somebody. I don't really suspect him, but after all, he is Paget's employer, and he did own the mill house. I've always heard that he made his money in some way he isn't anxious to talk about, said Suzanne thoughtfully. But that doesn't necessarily mean crime. It might be tin tax or hair restorer. I agreed ruefully. I suppose, said Suzanne doubtfully, that we're not barking up the wrong tree, being led completely astray, I mean, by assuming Paget's complicity, supposing that, after all, he is a perfectly honest man. I considered that for a minute or two. Then I shook my head. I can't believe that. After all, he has his explanations for everything. Yes, but they're not very convincing. For instance, the night he tried to throw me overboard on the Kilmorden, he says he followed Rayburn up on deck, and Rayburn turned and knocked him down. Now, we know that's not true. No, said Suzanne unwillingly, but we only heard the story at second hand from Sir Eustace, if we'd heard it direct from Paget himself, it might have been different. You know how people always get his story a little wrong when they repeat it. I turned the thing over in my mind. No, I said at last, I don't see any way out. Paget's guilty. You can't get away from the fact that he tried to throw me overboard, and everything else fits in. Why are you so persistent in this new idea of yours? Because of his face his face, but yes, I know what you're going to say. It's a sinister face. That's just it. No man with a face like that could be really sinister. It must be a colossal joke on the part of nature. I did not believe much in Suzanne's argument. I know a lot about nature in past ages. If she's got a sense of humour, she doesn't show it much. Suzanne is just the sort of person who would clothe nature with all her own attributes. We passed on to discuss our immediate plans. It was clear to me that I must have some kind of standing. I couldn't go on avoiding explanations forever. The solution of all my difficulties lay ready to my hand, though I didn't think of it for some time. The daily budget. My silence or my speech could no longer affect Harry Rayburn. He was marked down as the man in the brown suit through no fault of mine, I could help him best by seeming to be against him. The colonel and his gang must have no suspicion that there existed any friendly feeling between me and the man they had elected to be the scapegoat of the murder at Marlow. As far as I knew, the woman killed was still unidentified. I would cable to Lord Naseby, suggesting that she was no other than the famous Russian dancer Nadina, who had been delighting Paris for so long. It seemed incredible to me that she had not been identified already, but when I learnt more of the case long afterwards, I saw how natural it really was. Nadina had never been to England during her successful career in Paris. She was unknown to London audiences. The pictures in the papers of the Marlowe victim were so blurred and unrecognisable that it is small wonder no one identified them. And, on the other hand, Nadina had kept her intention of visiting England a profound secret from everyone. The day after the murder, a letter had been received by her manager purporting to be from the dancer, in which she said that she was returning to Russia on urgent private affairs and that he must deal with her broken contract as best he could. All this, of course, I only learned afterwards. With Suzanne's full approval, I sent a long cable from Dea.
It arrived at a psychological moment. This again, of course, I learnt afterwards. The daily budget was hard up for a sensation. My guess was verified and proved to be correct, and the daily budget had the scoop of its lifetime. Victim of the Millhouse murder identified by our special reporter, and so on. Our reporter makes voyage with the murderer, the man in the brown suit, what he is really like. The main facts were, of course, cabled to South African papers, but I only read my own lengthy articles at a much later date. I received approval and full instructions by cable at Bulawayo. I was on the staff of the Daily Budget, and I had a private word of congratulation from Lord Naseby himself. I was definitely accredited to hunt down the murderer, and I, and only I, knew that the murderer was not Harry Rayburn. But let the world think that it was he. Best so for the present. Chapter 24 We arrived at Bulawayo early on Saturday morning. I was disappointed in the place. It was very hot, and I hated the hotel. Also, Sir Eustace was what I can only describe as thoroughly sulky. I think it was all our wooden animals that annoyed him, especially the big giraffe. It was a colossal giraffe with an impossible neck, a mild eye, and a dejected tail. It had character. It had charm. A controversy was already arising as to whom it belonged to, me or Suzanne. We had each contributed a tiki to its purchase— Suzanne advanced the claims of seniority and the married state. I stuck to the position that I had been the first to behold its beauty. In the meantime, I must admit, it occupied a good deal of this three-dimensional space of ours. To carry forty-nine wooden animals, all of awkward shape and all of extremely brittle wood, is somewhat of a problem. Two porters were laden with a bunch of animals each, and one promptly dropped a ravishing group of ostriches and broke their heads off. Warned by this, Suzanne and I carried all we could. Colonel Race helped, and I pressed the big giraffe into Sir Eustace's arms. Even the correct Miss Pettigrew did not escape. A large hippopotamus and two black warriors fell to her share. I had a feeling Miss Pettigrew didn't like me. Perhaps she fancied I was a bold hussy. Anyway, she avoided me as much as she could. And the funny thing was, her face seemed vaguely familiar to me, though I couldn't quite place it. We reposed ourselves most of the morning, and in the afternoon we drove out to the Matopos to see Rhodes' grave. That is to say, we were to have done so, but at the last moment Sir Eustace backed out. He was very nearly in as bad a temper as the morning we arrived at Cape Town when he bounced the peaches on the floor and they squashed. Evidently arriving early in the morning at places is bad for his temperament. He cursed the porters, he cursed the waiter at breakfast, he cursed the whole hotel management. He would doubtless have liked to curse Miss Pettigrew, who hovered around with her pencil and pad. But I don't think even Sir Eustace would have dared to curse Miss Pettigrew. She's just like the efficient secretary in a book. I only rescued our dear giraffe just in time. I feel Sir Eustace would have liked to dash him to the ground. To return to our expedition, after Sir Eustace had backed out, Miss Pettigrew said she would remain at home in case he might want her. And at the very last minute, Suzanne sent down a message to say she had a headache. So Colonel Race and I drove off alone. He is a strange man. One doesn't notice it so much in a crowd, but when one is alone with him, the sense of his personality seems really almost overpowering. He becomes more taciturn, and yet his silence seems to say more than speech might do. It was so that day that we drove to the Matopos through the soft yellow-brown scrub. Everything seemed strangely silent, except our car, which I should think was the first Ford ever made by man. The upholstery of it was torn to ribbons, and, though I know nothing about engines, even I could guess that all was not as it should be in its interior. By and by the character of the country changed. Great boulders appeared, piled up into fantastic shapes. I felt suddenly that I had got into a primitive era. Just for a moment, Neanderthal men seemed quite as real to me as they had to Papa. I turned to Colonel Race. There must have been giants once.
I said dreamily, and their children were just like children are today, and played with handfuls of pebbles, piling them up and knocking them down, and the more cleverly they balanced them, the better pleased they were. If I were to give a name to this place, I should call it the country of giant children. Perhaps you're nearer the mark than you know, said Colonel Race gravely. Simple, primitive, big. That is Africa. I nodded appreciatively. You love it, don't you? I asked. Yes, but to live in it long, well, it makes one what you would call cruel. One comes to hold life and death very lightly. Yes, I said, thinking of Harry Rayburn. He had been like that too. But not cruel to weak things. Opinions differ as to what are and are not weak things, Miss Anne. There was a note of seriousness in his voice which almost startled me. I felt that I knew very little, really, of this man at my side. I meant children and dogs, I think. I can truthfully say I've never been cruel to children or dogs. So you don't class women as weak things? I considered. No, I don't think I do. Though they are, I suppose. That is, they are nowadays. But Papa always said that in the beginning men and women roamed the world together, equal in strength, like lions and tigers. And giraffes, interpolated Colonel Race slyly. I laughed. Everyone makes fun of that giraffe. And giraffes. They were nomadic, you see. It wasn't till they settled down in communities and women did one kind of thing and men another that women got weak. And of course, underneath, one is still the same. One feels the same, I mean, and that is why women worship physical strength in men. It's what they once had and have lost. Almost ancestor worship, in fact. Something of the kind. And you really think that's true? That women worship strength, I mean? I think it's quite true, if one's honest. You think you admire moral qualities, but when you fall in love, you revert to the primitive where the physical is all that counts. But I don't think that's the end. If you lived in primitive conditions, it would be all right, but you don't. And so, in the end, the other thing wins after all. It's the things that are apparently conquered that always do win, isn't it? They win in the only way that counts, like what the Bible says about losing your life and finding it. In the end, said Colonel Race thoughtfully, you fall in love and you fall out of it. Is that what you mean? Not exactly, but you can put it that way if you like. But I don't think you've ever fallen out of love, Miss Anne. No, I haven't, I admitted frankly. Or fallen in love either. I did not answer. The car drew up at our destination and brought the conversation to a close. We got out and began the slow ascent to the world's view. Not for the first time, I felt a slight discomfort in Colonel Race's company. He veiled his thoughts so well behind those impenetrable black eyes. He frightened me a little. He had always frightened me. I never knew where I stood with him. We climbed in silence till we reached the spot where Rhodes lies, guarded by giant boulders. A strange, eerie place, far from the haunts of men, that sings a ceaseless paean of rugged beauty. We sat there a time in silence, then descended once more, but diverging slightly from the path. Sometimes it was a rough scramble, and once we came to a sharp slope or rock that was almost sheer. Colonel Race went first, then turned to help me. Better lift you, he said suddenly, and swung me off my feet with a quick gesture. I felt the strength of him as he set me down and released his clasp a man of iron with muscles like taut steel. And again I felt afraid, especially as he did not move aside, but stood directly in front of me, staring into my face. What are you really doing here, Anne Bedingfeld? He said abruptly. I'm a gypsy seeing the world. Yes, that's true enough. The newspaper correspondent is only a pretext. You've not the soul of a journalist. You're out for your own hand, snatching at life, but that's not all. 
What was he going to make me tell him? I was afraid, afraid. I looked him full in the face. My eyes can't keep secrets like his, but they can carry the war into the enemy's country. What are you really doing here, Colonel Race? I asked deliberately. For a moment, I thought he wasn't going to answer. He was clearly taken aback, though. At last he spoke, and his words seemed to afford him a grim amusement. Pursuing ambition, he said. Just that, pursuing ambition. You will remember, Miss Beddingfeld, that by that sin fell the angels, etc. They say, I said slowly, that you are really connected with the government, that you are in the secret service. Is that true? Was it my fancy, or did he hesitate for a fraction of a second before he answered? I can assure you, Miss Beddingfeld, that I am out here strictly as a private individual travelling for my own pleasure. Thinking the answer over later, it struck me as slightly ambiguous. Perhaps he meant it to be so. We rejoined the car in silence. Halfway back to Bulawayo, we stopped for tea at a somewhat primitive structure at the side of the road. The proprietor was digging in the garden and seemed annoyed at being disturbed, but he graciously promised to see what he could do. After an interminable wait, he brought us some stale cakes and some lukewarm tea, then disappeared to his garden again. No sooner had he departed than we were surrounded by cats, six of them all meowing piteously at once. The racket was deafening. I offered them some pieces of cake. They devoured them ravenously. I poured all the milk there was into a saucer, and they fought each other to get it. Oh, I cried indignantly, they're starved. It's wicked. Please, please order some more milk and another plate of cake. Colonel Race departed silently to do my bidding. The cats had begun meowing again, he returned with a big jug of milk, and the cats finished it all. I got up with determination on my face. I'm going to take those cats home with us. I shan't leave them here. My dear child, don't be absurd. You can't carry six cats as well as fifty wooden animals round with you. Never mind the wooden animals. These cats are alive. I shall take them back with me. You will do nothing of the kind. I looked at him resentfully but he went on. You think me cruel, but one can't go through life sentimentalizing over these things. It's no good standing out. I shan't allow you to take them. It's a primitive country, you know, and I'm stronger than you. I always know when I am beaten. I went down to the car with tears in my eyes. They're probably short of food just today, he explained consolingly. That man's wife has gone into Bulawayo for stores, so it will be all right. And anyway, you know, the world's full of starving cats. Don't, don't, I said fiercely. I'm teaching you to realize life as it is. I'm teaching you to be hard and ruthless, like I am. That's the secret of strength and the secret of success. I'd sooner be dead than hard, I said passionately. We got into the car and started off. I pulled myself together again slowly. Suddenly, to my intense astonishment, he took my hand in his. Anne, he said gently, I want you. Will you marry me? I was utterly taken aback. Oh, n no, I stammered. I, I can't. Why not? I don't care for you in that way. I've never thought of you like that. I see. Is that the only reason? I had to be honest. I owed it to him. No, I said. It is not. You see, I care for someone else. I see, he said again. And was that true at the beginning, when I first saw you on the Kilmorden? No, I whispered. It was since then. I see, he said for the third time, but this time there was a purposeful ring in his voice that made me turn and look at him. His face was grimmer than I had ever seen it. What? What do you mean? I faltered. He looked at me, inscrutable. 
dominating. Only that I now know what I have to do. His words sent a shiver through me. There was a determination behind them that I did not understand, and it frightened me. We neither of us said any more until we got back to the hotel. I went straight up to Suzanne. She was lying on her bed, reading, and did not look in the least as though she had a headache. Here reposes the perfect gooseberry, she remarked, alias the tactful chaperone. Why, Anne, dear, what's the matter? For I had burst into a flood of tears. I told her about the cats. I felt it wasn't fair to tell her about Colonel Race. But Suzanne is very sharp. I think she saw that there was something more behind. You haven't caught a chill, have you, Anne? Sounds absurd even to suggest such things in this heat, but you keep on shivering. It's nothing, I said. Nerves or someone walking over my grave. I keep feeling something dreadful's going to happen. Don't be silly, said Suzanne with decision. Let's talk of something interesting. Anne, about those diamonds. What about them? I'm not sure they're safe with me. It was all right before. No one could think they'd be amongst my things. But now that everyone knows we're such friends, you and I, I'll be under suspicion too. Nobody knows they're in a roll of films, though, I argued. It's a splendid hiding place, and I really don't think we could better it. She agreed doubtfully, but said we would discuss it again when we got to the falls. Our train went at nine o'clock. Sir Eustace's temper was still far from good, and Miss Pettigrew looked subdued. Colonel Race was completely himself. I felt that I had dreamed the whole conversation on the way back. I slept heavily that night on my hard bunk, struggling with ill-defined, menacing dreams. I awoke with a headache and went out on the observation platform of the car. It was fresh and lovely, and everywhere, as far as one could see, were the undulating wooded hills. I loved it, loved it more than any place I had ever seen. I wished then that I could have a little hut somewhere in the heart of the scrub and live there always, always. Just before half-past two, Colonel Race called me out from the office and pointed to a bouquet-shaped white mist that hovered over one portion of the bush. The spray from the falls, he said. We're nearly there. I was still wrapped in that strange dream feeling of exultation that had succeeded my troubled night. Very strongly implanted in me was the feeling that I had come home. Home, and yet I had never been here before, or had I in dreams? We walked from the train to the hotel, a big white building closely wired against mosquitoes. There were no roads, no houses. We went out on the stoop, and I uttered a gasp. There, half a mile away, facing us, were the falls. I've never seen anything so grand and beautiful. I never shall. Anne, you're fay said Suzanne, as we sat down to lunch. I've never seen you like this before. She stared at me curiously. Am I? I laughed, but I felt that my laugh was unnatural. It's just that I love it all. It's more than that. A little frown crossed her brow, one of apprehension. Yes, I was happy, but beyond that I had the curious feeling that I was waiting for something, something that would happen soon. I was excited, restless. After tea, we strolled out, got on the trolley, and were pushed by smiling blacks down the little tracks of rails to the bridge. It was a marvellous sight, the great chasm and then the rushing waters below, and the veil of mist and spray in front of us that parted every now and then for one brief minute to show the cataract of water, and then closed up again in its impenetrable mystery. That, to my mind, has always been the fascination of the falls, their elusive quality. You always think you're going to see, and you never do. We crossed the bridge and walked slowly on by the path that was marked out with white stone on either side and led round the brink of the gorge. Finally, we arrived in a big clearing where, on the left, a path led downwards towards the chasm. 
The Palm Gully, explained Colonel Race. Shall we go down, or shall we leave it until tomorrow? It will take some time, and it's a good climb up again. We'll leave it until tomorrow, said Sir Eustace, with decision. He isn't at all fond of strenuous physical exercise, I've noticed. He led the way back. As we went, we passed a fine native stalking along. Behind him came a woman who seemed to have the entire household belongings piled upon her head. The collection included a frying pan. I never have my camera when I want it, groaned Suzanne. That's an opportunity that will occur often enough, Mrs. Blair, said Colonel Race, so don't lament. We arrived back on the bridge. Shall we go into the Rainbow Forest, he continued, or are you afraid of getting wet? Suzanne and I accompanied him. Sir Eustace went back to the hotel. I was rather disappointed in the Rainbow Forest. There weren't nearly enough rainbows, and we got soaked to the skin. But every now and then we got a glimpse of the falls opposite and realised how enormously wide they are. Oh, dear, dear falls, how I love and worship you and always shall. We got back to the hotel just in time to change for dinner. Sir Eustace seems to have taken a positive antipathy to Colonel Race. Suzanne and I rallied him gently, but didn't get much satisfaction. After dinner, he retired to his sitting room, dragging Miss Pettigrew with him. Suzanne and I talked for a while with Colonel Race, and then she declared, with an immense yawn, that she was going to bed. I didn't want to be left alone with him, so I got up too and went to my room. But I was far too excited to go to sleep. I did not even undress. I lay back in a chair and gave myself up to dreaming. And all the while I was conscious of something coming nearer and nearer. There was a knock at the door, and I started. I got up and went to it. A little black boy held out a note. It was addressed to me in a handwriting I did not know. I took it and came back into the room. I stood there holding it. At last I opened it. It was very short. I must see you. I dare not come to the hotel. Will you come to the clearing by the palm gully? In memory of cabin 17, please come. The man you knew as Harry Rayburn. My heart beat to suffocation. He was here then. Oh, I had known it. I had known it all along. I had felt him near me. All unwittingly I had come to his place of retreat. I wound a scarf round my head and stole to the door. I must be careful. He was hunted down. No one must see me meet him. I stole along to Suzanne's room. She was fast asleep. I could hear her breathing evenly. Sir Eustace? I paused outside the door of his sitting room. Yes, he was dictating to Miss Pettigrew. I could hear her monotonous voice repeating, I therefore venture to suggest that in tackling this problem of coloured labour, she paused for him to continue, and I heard him grunt something angrily. I stole on again. Colonel Race's room was empty. I did not see him in the lounge, and he was the man I feared most. Still, I could waste no more time. I slipped quickly out of the hotel and took the path to the bridge. I crossed it and stood there waiting in the shadow. If anyone had followed me, I should see them crossing the bridge. But the minutes passed, and no one came. I had not been followed. I turned and took the path to the clearing. I took six paces or so, and then stopped. Something had rustled behind me. It could not be anyone who had followed me from the hotel. It was someone who was already here, waiting. And immediately, without rhyme or reason, but with the sureness of instinct, I knew that it was I myself who was threatened. It was the same feeling as I had had on the Kilmorden that night, a sure instinct warning me of danger. I looked sharply over my shoulder. Silence. I moved on a pace or two. Again I heard that rustle. Still walking, I looked over my shoulder again. A man's figure came out of the shadow. He saw that I saw him and jumped forward hard on my track. It was too dark to recognise anybody. All I could see was that he was tall and a European, not a native. 
I took to my heels and ran. I heard him pounding behind. I ran quicker, keeping my eyes fixed on the white stones that showed me where to step, for there was no moon that night. And suddenly, my foot felt nothingness. I heard the man behind me laugh, an evil, sinister laugh. It rang in my ears as I fell headlong, down, down, down to destruction far beneath. Chapter 25 I came to myself slowly and painfully. I was conscious of an aching head and a shooting pain down my left arm when I tried to move, and everything seemed dreamlike and unreal. Nightmare visions floated before me. I felt myself falling, falling again. Once Harry Rayburn's face seemed to come to me out of the mist. Almost I imagined it real. Then it floated away again, mocking me. Once, I remember, someone put a cup to my lips, and I drank. A black face grinned into mine, a devil's face, I thought it, and screamed out. Then dreams again, long, troubled dreams, in which I vainly sought Harry Rayburn to warn him. Warn him? What of? I did not know myself. But there was some danger, some great danger, and I alone could save him. Then darkness again, merciful darkness and real sleep. I woke at last myself again. The long nightmare was over. I remembered perfectly everything that had happened, my hurried flight from the hotel to meet Harry, the man in the shadows, and the last terrible moment of falling. By some miracle or other I had not been killed. I was bruised and aching and very weak, but I was alive. But where was I? Moving my head with difficulty, I looked round me. I was in a small room with rough wooden walls. On them were huge skins of animals and various tusks of ivory. I was lying on a kind of rough couch, also covered with skins, and my left arm was bandaged up and felt stiff and uncomfortable. At first I thought I was alone, and then I saw a man's figure sitting between me and the light, his head turned towards the window. He was so still that he might have been carved out of wood. Something in the close-cropped black head was familiar to me, but I did not dare let my imagination run astray. Suddenly he turned, and I caught my breath. It was Harry Rayburn. Harry Rayburn in the flesh. He rose and came over to me. Feeling better, he said a trifle awkwardly. I could not answer. The tears were running down my face. I was weak still, but I held his hand in both of mine. If only I could die like this, whilst he stood there looking down on me with that new look in his eyes. Don't cry, Anne. Please don't cry. You're safe now. No one shall hurt you. He went and fetched a cup and brought it to me. Drink some of this milk. I drank obediently. He went on talking, in a low, coaxing tone, such as he might have used to a child. Don't ask any more questions now. Go to sleep again. You'll be stronger by and by. I'll go away if you like. No, I said urgently. No, no. Then I'll stay. He brought a small stool over beside me and sat there. He laid his hand over mine and, soothed and comforted, I dropped off to sleep once more. It must have been evening then, but when I woke again the sun was high in the heavens. I was alone in the hut. But as I stirred, an old native woman came running in. She was hideous as sin, but she grinned at me encouragingly. She brought me water in a basin and helped me wash my face and hands. Then she brought me a large bowl of soup, and I finished it every drop. I asked her several questions, but she only grinned and nodded and chattered away in a guttural language, so I gathered she knew no English. Suddenly she stood up and drew back respectfully as Harry Rayburn entered. He gave her a nod of dismissal, and she went out, leaving us alone. He smiled at me. Really better today? Yes, indeed, but very bewildered still. Where am I? You're on a small island on the Zambezi, about four miles up from the falls. Do... do my friends know I'm here? 
he shook his head. I must send word to them. That is as you like, of course, but if I were you, I should wait until you were a little stronger. Why? He did not answer immediately, so I went on. How long have I been here? His answer amazed me. Nearly a month. Oh, I cried. I must send word to Suzanne. She'll be terribly anxious. Who is Suzanne? Mrs. Blair. I was with her and Sir Eustace and Colonel Race at the hotel, but you knew that, surely. He shook his head. I know nothing, except that I found you caught in a fork of a tree, unconscious and with a badly wrenched arm. Where was the tree? Overhanging the ravine, but for your clothes catching on the branches, you would certainly have been dashed to pieces. I shuddered. Then a thought struck me. You say you didn't know I was there. What about the note, then? What note? The note you sent me, asking me to meet you in the clearing. He stared at me. I sent no note. I felt myself flushing up to the roots of my hair. Fortunately, he did not seem to notice. How did you come to be on the spot in such a marvellous manner? I asked, in as nonchalant a manner as I could assume. And what are you doing in this part of the world, anyway? I live here, he said simply. On this island? Yes, I came here after the war. Sometimes I take parties from the hotel out in my boat, but it costs me very little to live, and mostly I do as I please. You live here all alone? I am not pining for society, I assure you, he replied coldly. I am sorry to have inflicted mine upon you, I retorted, but I seem to have had very little say in the matter. To my surprise, his eyes twinkled a little. None whatever. I slung you across my shoulders like a sack of coal and carried you to my boat, quite like a primitive man of the Stone Age. But for a different reason, I put in. He flushed this time, a deep burning blush, the tan of his face was suffused. But you haven't told me how you came to be wandering about so conveniently for me, I said hastily to cover his confusion. I couldn't sleep. I was restless, disturbed, had the feeling something was going to happen. In the end, I took the boat and came ashore and tramped down towards the falls. I was just at the head of the palm gully when I heard you scream. Why didn't you get help from the hotel instead of carting me all the way here? I asked. He flushed again. I suppose it seems an unpardonable liberty to you, but I don't think that even now you realize your danger. You think I should have informed your friends, pretty friends who allowed you to be decoyed out to death. No, I swore to myself that I'd take better care of you than anyone else could. Not a soul comes to this island. I got old Batani, whom I cured of a fever once, to come and look after you. She's loyal. She'll never say a word. I could keep you here for months and no one would ever know. I could keep you here for months and no one would ever know. How some words please one. You did quite right, I said quietly, and I shall not send word to anyone. A day or so more anxiety doesn't make much difference, it's not as though they were my own people. They're only acquaintances, really, even Suzanne. And whoever wrote that note must have known a great deal. It was not the work of an outsider. I managed to mention the note this time without blushing at all. If you would be guided by me, he said, hesitating. I don't expect I shall be, I answered candidly. But there's no harm in hearing. Do you always do what you like, Miss Beddingfeld? Usually, I replied cautiously. To anyone else, I would have said always. I pity your husband, he said unexpectedly. You needn't, I retorted. I shouldn't dream of marrying anyone unless I was madly in love with him. And of course, there is really nothing a woman enjoys so much as doing all the things she doesn't like for the sake of someone she does like. And the more self-willed she is, the more she likes it. I'm afraid I disagree with you. 
The boot is on the other leg as a rule. He spoke with a slight sneer. Exactly, I cried eagerly, and that's why there are so many unhappy marriages. It's all the fault of the men. Either they give way to their women, and then the women despise them, or else they are utterly selfish, insist on their own way, and never say thank you. Successful husbands make their wives do just what they want, and then make a frightful fuss over them for doing it. Women like to be mastered, but they hate not to have their sacrifices appreciated. On the other hand, men don't really appreciate women who are nice to them all the time. When I am married, I shall be a devil most of the time, but every now and then, when my husband least expects it, I shall show him what a perfect angel I can be. Harry laughed outright. What a cat and dog life you will lead. Lovers always fight, I assured him, because they don't understand each other, and by the time they do understand each other, they aren't in love any more. Does the reverse hold true? Are people who fight each other always lovers? I... I don't know, I said, momentarily confused. He turned away to the fireplace. Like some more soup? he asked in a casual tone. Yes, please. I'm so hungry that I would eat a hippopotamus. That's good. He busied himself with the fire. I watched. When I can get off the couch, I'll cook for you. I promised. I don't suppose you know anything about cooking. I can warm up things out of tins as well as you can, I retorted, pointing to a row of tins on the mantelpiece. Touché, he said, and laughed. His whole face changed when he laughed. It became boyish, happy, a different personality. I enjoyed my soup, as I ate it, I reminded him that he had not, after all, tendered me his advice. Ah, yes, what I was going to say was this. If I were you, I would stay quietly perdu here until you are quite strong again. Your enemies will believe you dead. They will hardly be surprised at not finding the body. It would have been dashed to pieces on the rocks and carried down with the torrent. I shivered. Once you are completely restored to health, you can journey quietly on to Beira and get a boat to take you back to England. That would be very tame, I objected scornfully. There speaks a foolish schoolgirl. I'm not a foolish schoolgirl, I cried indignantly. I'm a woman. He looked at me with an expression I could not fathom as I sat up flushed and excited. God help me, so you are he muttered, and went abruptly out. My recovery was rapid. The two injuries I had sustained were a knock on the head and a badly wrenched arm. The latter was the most serious, and, to begin with, my rescuer had believed it to be actually broken. A careful examination, however, convinced him that it was not so, and although it was very painful, I was recovering the use of it quite quickly. It was a strange time, we were cut off from the world, alone together as Adam and Eve might have been, but with what a difference. Old Batani hovered about, counting no more than a dog might have done. I insisted on doing the cooking, or as much of it as I could manage with one arm. Harry was out a good part of the time, but we spent long hours together, lying out in the shade of the palms, talking and quarrelling, discussing everything under high heaven, quarrelling and making it up again. We bickered a good deal, but there grew up between us a real and lasting comradeship, such as I could never have believed possible. That and something else. The time was drawing near, I knew it, when I should be well enough to leave, and I realised it with a heavy heart. Was he going to let me go? Without a word? Without a sign? He had fits of silence, long, moody intervals, moments when he would spring up and tramp off by himself. One evening the crisis came. We had finished our simple meal and were sitting in the doorway of the hut. The sun was sinking. Hairpins were necessities of life with which Harry had not been able to provide me, and my hair, straight and black, hung to my knees. I sat, my chin on my hands, lost in meditation. 
I felt rather than saw Harry looking at me. You look like a witch, Anne, he said at last, and there was something in his voice that had never been there before. He reached out his hand and just touched my hair. I shivered. Suddenly he sprang up with an oath. You must leave here tomorrow, do you hear? He cried. I... I can't bear any more. I'm only a man, after all. You must go, Anne. You must. You're not a fool. You know yourself that this can't go on. I suppose not, I said slowly. But it's been happy, hasn't it? Happy? It's been hell. As bad as that? What do you torment me for? Why are you mocking at me? Why do you say that, laughing into your hair? I wasn't laughing, and I'm not mocking. If you want me to go, I'll go. But if you want me to stay, I'll stay. Not that, he cried vehemently. Not that. Don't tempt me, Anne. Do you realize what I am? A criminal twice over, a man hunted down. They know me here as Harry Parker. They think I've been away on a trek up country. But any day they may put two and two together, and then the blow will fall. You're so young, Anne, and so beautiful, with the kind of beauty that sends men mad. All the world's before you, love, life, everything. Mine's behind me, scorched, spoiled, with a taste of bitter ashes. If you don't want me... You know I want you. You know that I'd give my soul to pick you up in my arms and keep you here, hidden away from the world, forever and ever. And you're tempting me, Anne. You with your long witch's hair and your eyes that are golden and brown and green and never stop laughing even when your mouth is grave. But I'll save you from yourself and from me. You shall go tonight. You shall go to Bearer. I'm not going to Bearer. I interrupted. You are. You shall go to Bearer if I have to take you there myself and throw you onto the boat. What do you think I'm made of? Do you think I'll wake up night after night, fearing they've got you? One can't go on counting on miracles happening. You must go back to England, Anne, and... and marry and be happy. With a steady man who'll give me a good home? Better that than utter disaster. And what of you? His face grew grim and set. I've got my work ready to hand. Don't ask what it is. You can guess, I dare say. But I'll tell you this. I'll clear my name or die in the attempt, and I'll choke the life out of the damned scoundrel who did his best to murder you the other night. We must be fair, I said. He didn't actually push me over. He'd no need to. His plan was cleverer than that. I went up to the path afterwards. Everything looked all right, but by the marks on the ground, I saw that the stones which outlined the path had been taken up and put down again in a slightly different place. There are tall bushes growing just over the edge. He'd balanced the outside stones on them so that you'd think you were still on the path when in reality you were stepping into nothingness. God help him if I lay my hands upon him. He paused a minute and then said in a totally different tone, We've never spoken of these things, Anne, have we? But the time's come. I want you to hear the whole story from the beginning. If it hurts you to go over the past, don't tell me, I said in a low voice. But I want you to know. I never thought I should speak of that part of my life to anyone. Funny, isn't it? The tricks fate plays. He was silent for a minute or two. The sun had set, and the velvety darkness of the African night was enveloping us like a mantle. Some of it I know, I said gently. What do you know? I know that your real name is Harry Lucas. Still, he hesitated, not looking at me, but staring straight out in front of him. I had no clue as to what was passing in his mind, but at last he jerked his head forward as though acquiescing in some unspoken decision of his own, and began his story. Chapter 26 You are right. My real name is Harry Lucas. My father was a retired soldier who came out to farm in Rhodesia, 
He died when I was in my second year at Cambridge. Were you fond of him? I asked suddenly. I don't know. Then he flushed and went on with sudden vehemence. Why do I say that? I did love my father. We said bitter things to each other the last time I saw him, and we had many rows over my wildness and my debts, but I cared for the old man. I know how much now, when it's too late, he continued more quietly. It was at Cambridge that I met the other fellow. Young Erdsley? Yes, young Erdsley. His father, as you know, was one of South Africa's most prominent men. We drifted together at once, my friend and I. We had our love of South Africa in common, and we both had a taste for the untrodden places of the world. After he left Cambridge, Erdsley had a final quarrel with his father. The old man had paid his debts twice. He refused to do so again. There was a bitter scene between them, Sir Lawrence declared himself at the end of his patience. He would do no more for his son. He must stand on his own legs for a while. The result was, as you know, that those two young men went off to South America together, prospecting for diamonds. I'm not going into that now, but we had a wonderful time out there. Hardships in plenty, you understand, but it was a good life, a hand-to-mouth scramble for existence, far from the beaten track. And my God, that's the place to know a friend. There was a bond forged between us two out there that only death could have broken. Well, as Colonel Race told you, our efforts were crowned with success. We found a second Kimberley in the heart of the British Guyana jungles. I can't tell you our elation. It wasn't so much the actual value in money of the find. You see, Erdsley was used to money, and he knew that when his father died he would be a millionaire, and Lucas had always been poor and was used to it. No, it was the sheer delight of discovery. He paused and then added, almost apologetically, You don't mind me telling it this way, do you? As though I wasn't in it at all. It seems like that now when I look back and see those two boys. I almost forget that one of them was Harry Rayburn. Tell it any way you like, I said, and he went on. We came to Kimberley, very cock-a-hoop over our find. We brought a magnificent selection of diamonds with us to submit to the experts. And then, in the hotel at Kimberley, we met her. I stiffened a little, and the hand that rested on the doorpost clenched itself involuntarily. Anita Grunberg, that was her name. She was an actress, quite young and very beautiful. She was South African-born, but her mother was a Hungarian, I believe. There was some sort of mystery about her, and that, of course, heightened her attraction for two boys home from the wilds. She must have had an easy task. We both fell for her right away, and we both took it hard. It was the first shadow that had ever come between us, but even then it didn't weaken our friendship. Each of us, I honestly believe, was willing to stand aside for the other to go in and win. But that wasn't her game. Sometimes afterwards, I wondered why it hadn't been, for Sir Lawrence Erdsley's only son was quite a parti. But the truth of it was that she was married, to a sorter in De Beers, though nobody knew of it. She pretended enormous interest in our discovery, and we told her all about it, and even showed her the diamonds. Delilah. That's what she should have been called, and she played her part well. The De Beers robbery was discovered, and like a thunderclap the police came down upon us. They seized our diamonds. We only laughed at first. The whole thing was so absurd. And then the diamonds were produced in court, and without question they were the stones stolen from De Beers. Anita Grunberg had disappeared. She had effected the substitution neatly enough, and our story that these were not the stones originally in our possession was laughed to scorn. Sir Lawrence Erdsley had enormous influence. He succeeded in getting the case dismissed, but it left two young men ruined and disgraced to face the world with the stigma of thief attached to their name, and it pretty well broke the old fellow's heart. 
He had one bitter interview with his son in which he heaped upon him every reproach imaginable. He had done what he could to save the family name, but from that day on his son was his son no longer. He cast him off utterly, and the boy, like the proud young fool that he was, remained silent, disdaining to protest his innocence in the face of his father's disbelief. He came out furious from the interview. His friend was waiting for him. A week later, war was declared. The two friends enlisted together. You know what happened. The best pal a man ever had was killed, partly through his own mad recklessness in rushing into unnecessary danger. He died with his name tarnished. I swear to you, Anne, that it was mainly on his account that I was so bitter against that woman. It had gone deeper with him than with me. I had been madly in love with her for the moment. I even think that I frightened her sometimes. But with him, it was a quieter and deeper feeling. She had been the very centre of his universe, and her betrayal of him tore up the very roots of life. The blow stunned him and left him paralysed. Harry paused, after a minute or two, he went on. As you know, I was reported missing, presumed killed. I never troubled to correct the mistake. I took the name of Parker and came to this island, which I knew of old. At the beginning of the war, I had had ambitious hopes of proving my innocence, but now all that spirit seemed dead. All I felt was, what's the good? My pal was dead, neither he nor I had any living relations who would care. I was supposed to be dead too, let it remain at that. I led a peaceful existence here, neither happy nor unhappy, numbed of all feeling. I see now, though I did not realise it at the time, that that was partly the effect of the war. And then one day, something occurred to wake me right up again. I was taking a party of people in my boat on a trip up the river, and I was standing at the landing stage, helping them in, when one of the men uttered a startled exclamation. It focused my attention on him. He was a small, thin man with a beard, and he was staring at me for all he was worth as though I was a ghost. So powerful was his emotion that it awakened my curiosity. I made inquiries about him at the hotel, and learned that his name was Carton, that he came from Kimberley, and that he was a diamond sorter employed by De Beers. In a minute, all the old sense of wrong surged over me again. I left the island and went to Kimberley. I could find out little more about him, however. In the end, I decided that I must force an interview. I took my revolver with me. In the brief glimpse I had had of him, I had realised that he was a physical coward. No sooner were we face to face than I recognised that he was afraid of me. I soon forced him to tell me all he knew. He had engineered part of the robbery, and Anita Grunberg was his wife. He had once caught sight of both of us when we were dining with her at the hotel, and, having read that I was killed, my appearance in the flesh at the falls had startled him badly. He and Anita had married quite young, but she had soon drifted away from him. She had got in with a bad lot, he told me, and it was then for the first time that I heard of the Colonel. Carton himself had never been mixed up in anything except this one affair, so he solemnly assured me, and I was inclined to believe him. He was emphatically not of the stuff of which successful criminals are made. I still had the feeling that he was keeping back something— as a test, I threatened to shoot him there and then, declaring that I cared very little what became of me now. In a frenzy of terror, he poured out a further story. It seems that Anita Grunberg did not quite trust the colonel. Whilst pretending to hand over to him the stone she had taken from the hotel, she kept back some in her own possession. Carton advised her, with his technical knowledge, which to keep. If, at any time, these stones were produced, they were of such colour and quality as to be readily identifiable, and the experts at De Beers would admit at once that these stones had never passed through their hands. In this way, my story of a substitution would be supported, my name would be cleared, and suspicion would be diverted to the proper quarter.
I gathered that, contrary to his usual practice, the colonel himself had been concerned in this affair. Therefore, Anita felt satisfied that she had a real hold over him, should she need it. Carton now proposed that I should make a bargain with Anita Grunberg, or Nadina, as she now called herself. For a sufficient sum of money, he thought that she would be willing to give up the diamonds and betray her former employer. He would cable to her immediately. I was still suspicious of Carton. He was a man whom it was easy enough to frighten, but who, in his fright, would tell so many lies that to sift the truth out from them would be no easy job. I went back to the hotel and waited. By the following evening, I judged that he would have received the reply to his cable. I called round to his house and was told that Mr. Carton was away, but would be returning on the morrow. Instantly, I became suspicious. In the nick of time, I found out that he was in reality sailing for England on the Kilmorton Castle, which left Cape Town in two days' time. I had just time to journey down and catch the same boat. I had no intention of alarming Carton by revealing my presence on board. I had done a good deal of acting in my time at Cambridge, and it was comparatively easy for me to transform myself into a grave-bearded gentleman of middle age. I avoided Carton carefully on board the boat, keeping to my own cabin as far as possible under the pretense of illness. I had no difficulty in trailing him when we got to London. He went straight to an hotel and did not go out until the following day. He left the hotel shortly before one o'clock. I was behind him. He went straight to a house agent in Knightsbridge. There he asked for particulars of houses to let on the river. I was at the next table also inquiring about houses. Then suddenly in walked Anita Grunberg, Nadina, whatever you like to call her. Superb, insolent, and almost as beautiful as ever. God, how I hated her. There she was, the woman who had ruined my life and who had also ruined a better life than mine. At that minute I could have put my hands round her neck and squeezed the life out of her inch by inch. Just for a minute or two I saw red. I hardly took in what the agent was saying. It was her voice that I heard next, high and clear, with an exaggerated foreign accent. The mill house, Marlowe, the property of Sir Eustace Peddler. That sounds as though it might suit me. At any rate, I will go and see it. The man wrote her an order, and she walked out again in her regal, insolent manner. Not by word or a sign had she recognized Carton, yet I was sure that their meeting there was a preconceived plan. Then I started to jump to conclusions. Not knowing that Sir Eustace was at Cannes, I thought that this house-hunting business was a mere pretext for meeting him in the mill house. I knew that he had been in South Africa at the time of the robbery, and never having seen him, I immediately leapt to the conclusion that he himself was the mysterious colonel of whom I had heard so much. I followed my two suspects along Knightsbridge. Nadina went into the Hyde Park Hotel. I quickened my pace and went in also. She walked straight into the restaurant, and I decided that I would not risk her recognizing me at the moment, but would continue to follow Carton. I was in great hopes that he was going to get the diamonds, and that by suddenly appearing and making myself known to him when he least expected it, I might startle the truth out of him. I followed him down into the tube station at Hyde Park Corner. He was standing by himself at the end of the platform. There was some girl standing near, but no one else. I decided that I would accost him then and there. You know what happened. In the sudden shock of seeing a man whom he imagined far away in South Africa, he lost his head and stepped back upon the line. He was always a coward. Under the pretext of being a doctor, I managed to search his pockets. There was a wallet with some notes in it and one or two unimportant letters. There was also a roll of films, which I must have dropped somewhere later and there was a piece of paper with an appointment made on it for the 22nd on the Kilmorden Castle. In my haste to get away before anyone detained me, I dropped that also, but fortunately I remembered the figures. I hurried to the nearest cloakroom and hastily removed my makeup. 
I did not want to be laid by the heels for picking a dead man's pocket. Then I retraced my steps to the Hyde Park Hotel. Nadina was still having lunch. I needn't describe in detail how I followed her down to Marlow. She went into the house, and I spoke to the woman at the lodge, pretending that I was with her. Then I, too, went in. He stopped. There was a tense silence. You will believe me, Anne, won't you? I swear before God that what I am going to say is true. I went into the house after her with something very like murder in my heart. And she was dead. I found her in that first floor room. God, it was horrible. Dead. And I was not more than three minutes behind her. And there was no sign of anyone else in the house. Of course, I realized at once the terrible position I was in. By one masterstroke, the blackmailed had rid himself of the blackmailer, and at the same time had provided a victim to whom the crime would be ascribed. The hand of the colonel was very plain. For the second time, I was to be his victim. Fool that I had been to walk into the trap so easily. I hardly know what I did next. I managed to go out of the place looking fairly normal, but I knew that it could not be long before the crime was discovered and a description of my appearance telegraphed all over the country. I lay low for some days, not daring to make a move. In the end, chance came to my aid. I overheard a conversation between two middle-aged gentlemen in the street, one of whom proved to be Sir Eustace Pedler. I at once conceived the idea of attaching myself to him as his secretary. The fragment of conversation I had overheard gave me my clue. I was now no longer so sure that Sir Eustace Pedler was the colonel. His house might have been appointed as a rendezvous by accident or for some obscure motive that I had not fathomed. Do you know, I interrupted, that Guy Paget was in Marlow at the date of the murder? That settles it, then. I thought he was at Cannes with Sir Eustace. He was supposed to be in Florence, but he certainly never went there. I'm pretty certain he was really in Marlow, but of course I can't prove it. And to think I never suspected Paget for a minute until the night he tried to throw you overboard. The man's a marvellous actor. Yes, isn't he? That explains why the mill house was chosen. Paget could probably get in and out of it unobserved. Of course he made no objection to my accompanying Sir Eustace across in the boat. He didn't want me laid by the heels immediately. You see... Evidently, Nadina didn't bring the jewels with her to the rendezvous, as they had counted on her doing. I fancied that Carton really had them and concealed them somewhere on the Kilmorden Castle. That's where he came in. They hoped that I might have some clue as to where they were hidden. As long as the colonel did not recover the diamonds, he was still in danger, hence his anxiety to get them at all costs. Where the devil Carton hid them... If he did hide them, I don't know. That's another story, I quoted. My story, and I'm going to tell it to you now. Chapter 27 Harry listened attentively whilst I recounted all the events that I have narrated in these pages. The thing that bewildered and astonished him most was to find that all along the diamonds had been in my possession, or rather in Suzanne's. That was a fact he'd never suspected. Of course, after hearing his story, I realized the point of Carton's little arrangement, or rather Nadina's, since I had no doubt that it was her brain which had conceived the plan. No surprise tactics executed against her or her husband could result in the seizure of the diamonds. The secret was locked in her own brain, and the colonel was not likely to guess that they had been entrusted to the keeping of an ocean steward. Harry's vindication from the old charge of theft seemed assured. It was the other graver charge that paralysed all our activities, for, as things stood, he could not come out into the open to prove his case. The one thing we came back to again and again was the identity of the colonel. Was he or was he not Guy Paget? I should say he was, but for one thing, said Harry. 
It seems pretty much of a certainty that it was Paget who murdered Anita Grunberg at Marlow, and that certainly lends colour to the supposition that he is actually the colonel, since Anita's business was not of the nature to be discussed with a subordinate. No, the only thing that militates against that theory is the attempt to put you out of the way the night of your arrival here. You saw Paget left behind at Cape Town. By no possible means could he have arrived here before the following Wednesday. He is unlikely to have any emissaries in this part of the world, and all his plans were laid to deal with you in Cape Town. He might, of course, have cabled instructions to some lieutenant of his in Johannesburg, who could have joined the Rhodesian train at Mafeking, but his instructions would have had to be particularly definite to allow of that note being written. We sat silent for a moment, then Harry went on slowly. You say that Mrs. Blair was asleep when you left the hotel, and that you heard Sir Eustace dictating to Miss Pettigrew. Where was Colonel Race? I could not find him anywhere. Had he any reason to believe that you and I might be friendly with each other? He might have had. I answered thoughtfully, remembering our conversation on the way back from the Matopos. He's a very powerful personality, I continued, but not at all my idea of the colonel, and anyway, such an idea would be absurd. He's in the Secret Service. How do we know that he is? It's the easiest thing in the world to throw out a hint of that kind. No one contradicts it, and the rumour spreads until everyone believes it as gospel truth. It provides an excuse for all sorts of doubtful doings. Anne, do you like race? I do, and I don't. He repels me and at the same time fascinates me. But I know one thing, I'm always a little afraid of him. He was in South Africa, you know, at the time of the Kimberley robbery, said Harry slowly but it was he who told Suzanne all about the colonel and how he had been in Paris trying to get on his track. Camouflage of a particularly clever kind. But where does Paget come in? Is he in Race's pay? Perhaps, said Harry slowly, he doesn't come in it at all. What? Think back, Anne. Did you ever hear Paget's own account of that night on the Kilmorden? Yes, through Sir Eustace. I repeated it. Harry listened closely. He saw a man coming from the direction of Sir Eustace's cabin and followed him up on deck. Is that what he says? Now who had the cabin opposite to Sir Eustace? Colonel Race. Supposing Colonel Race crept up on deck and foiled in his attack on you, fled round the deck and met Paget just coming through the saloon door. He knocks him down and springs inside, closing the door. We dash round and find Paget lying there. How's that? You forget that he declares positively it was you who knocked him down. Well, suppose that just as he regains consciousness, he sees me disappearing in the distance. Wouldn't he take it for granted that I was his assailant, especially as he thought all along it was I he was following? It's possible, yes, I said slowly, but it alters all our ideas, and there are other things. Most of them are open to explanation. The man who followed you in Cape Town spoke to Paget, and Paget looked at his watch. The man might have merely asked him the time. It was just a coincidence, you mean? Not exactly. There's a method in all this, connecting Paget with the affair. Why was the mill house chosen for the murder? Was it because Paget had been in Kimberley when the diamonds were stolen? Would he have been made the scapegoat if I had not appeared so providentially upon the scene? Then you think he may be entirely innocent? It looks like it. But if so, we've got to find out what he was doing in Marlow. If he's got a reasonable explanation of that, we're on the right tack. He got up. It's past midnight. Turn in, Anne, and get some sleep. Just before dawn, I'll take you over in the boat. You must catch the train at Livingston. I've got a friend there who will keep you hidden away until the train starts. 
You go to Bulawayo and catch the bear a train there. I can find out from my friend in Livingston what's going on at the hotel and where your friends are now. Bearer, I said meditatively. Yes, Anne, it's bearer for you. This is man's work. Leave it to me. We had had a momentary respite from emotion whilst we talked the situation out, but it was on us again now. We did not even look at each other. Very well, I said, and passed into the hut. I lay down on the skin-covered couch, but I didn't sleep, and outside I could hear Harry Rayburn pacing up and down, up and down through the long, dark hours. At last he called me. Come, Anne, it's time to go. I got up and came out obediently. It was still quite dark, but I knew that dawn was not far off. We'll take the canoe, not the motorboat, Harry began, when suddenly he stopped dead and held up his hand. Hush, what's that? I listened, but could hear nothing. His ears were sharper than mine, however, the ears of a man who has lived long in the wilderness. Presently, I heard it too, the faint splash of paddles in the water coming from the direction of the right bank of the river and rapidly approaching our little landing stage. We strained our eyes in the darkness and could make out a dark blur on the surface of the water. It was a boat. Then there was a momentary spurt of flame. Someone had struck a match. By its light I recognised one figure, the red-bearded Dutchman of the villa at Musenberg. The others were natives. Quick, back to the hut. Harry swept me back with him. He took down a couple of rifles and a revolver from the wall. Can you load a rifle? I never have. Show me how. I grasped his instructions well enough. We closed the door, and Harry stood by the window which overlooked the landing stage, the boat was just about to run alongside it. Who's that? called out Harry in a ringing voice. Any doubt we might have had as to our visitors' intentions was swiftly resolved. A hail of bullets splattered round us. Fortunately, neither of us was hit. Harry raised the rifle. It spat murderously, and again and again I heard two groans and a splash. That's given him something to think about he muttered grimly as he reached for the second rifle. Stand well back, Anne, for God's sake, and load quickly. More bullets. One just grazed Harry's cheek. His answering fire was more deadly than theirs. I had the rifle reloaded when he turned for it. He caught me close with his left arm and kissed me once savagely before he turned to the window again. Suddenly he uttered a shout. They're going! Had enough of it! They're a good mark out there on the water, and they can't see how many of us there are. They're routed for the moment, but they'll come back. We'll have to get ready for them. He flung down the rifle and turned to me. Anne, you beauty, you wonder, you little queen, as brave as a lion, black-haired witch. He caught me in his arms. He kissed my hair, my eyes, my mouth. And now to business he said, suddenly releasing me. Get out those tins of paraffin. I did as I was told. He was busy inside the hut. Presently, I saw him on the roof of the hut, crawling along with something in his arms. He rejoined me in a minute or two. Go down to the boat. We'll have to carry it across the island to the other side. He picked up the paraffin as I disappeared. They're coming back, I called softly. I'd seen the blur moving out from the opposite shore. He ran down to me, just in time. Why, where the hell's the boat? Both had been cut adrift. Harry whistled softly. We're in a tight place, honey. Mind? Not with you. Ah, but dying together's not much fun. We'll do better than that. See, they've got two boatloads this time, going to land at two different points. Now for my little scenic effect. Almost as he spoke, a long flame shot up from the hut. Its light illuminated two crouching figures huddled together on the roof. My old clothes, stuffed with rags, but they won't tumble to it for some time. Come, Anne, we've got to try desperate means. Hand in hand, we raced across the island. Only a narrow channel of water divided it from the shore on that side. 
We've got to swim for it. Can you swim at all, Anne? Not that it matters. I can get you across. It's the wrong side for a boat. Too many rocks. But the right side for swimming, and the right side for Livingston. I can swim a little. Further than that. What's the danger, Harry? For I had seen the grim look on his face. Sharks? No, you little goose. Sharks live in the sea. But you're sharp, Anne. Crocs, that's the trouble. Crocodiles? Yes, don't think of them, or say your prayers, whichever you feel inclined. We plunged in. My prayers must have been efficacious, for we reached the shore without adventure and drew ourselves up wet and dripping on the bank. Now for Livingston. It's rough going, I'm afraid, and wet clothes won't make it any better, but it's got to be done. That walk was a nightmare. My wet skirts flapped round my legs, and my stockings were soon torn off by the thorns. Finally, I stopped, utterly exhausted. Harry came back to me. Hold up, honey. I'll carry you for a bit. That was the way I came into Livingston, slung across his shoulder like a sack of coals. How he did it for all that way, I don't know. The first faint light of dawn was just breaking. Harry's friend was a young man of twenty years old who kept a store of native curios. His name was Ned. Perhaps he had another, but I never heard it. He didn't seem in the least surprised to see Harry walk in, dripping wet, holding an equally dripping female by the hand. Men are very wonderful. He gave us food to eat and hot coffee and got our clothes dried for us whilst we rolled ourselves in Manchester blankets of gaudy hue. In the tiny back room of the hut we were safe from observation whilst he departed to make judicious inquiries as to what had become of Sir Eustace's party and whether any of them were still at the hotel. It was then that I informed Harry that nothing would induce me to go to Bearer. I never meant to anyway, but now all reason for such proceedings had vanished. The point of the plan had been that my enemies believed me dead— now that they knew I wasn't dead, my going to Bearer would do no good whatever. They could easily follow me there and murder me quietly. I should have no one to protect me. It was finally arranged that I should join Suzanne wherever she was and devote all my energies to taking care of myself. On no account was I to seek adventures or endeavour to checkmate the colonel. I was to remain quietly with her and await instructions from Harry. The diamonds were to be deposited in the bank at Kimberley under the name of Parker. There's one thing, I said thoughtfully. We ought to have a code of some kind. We don't want to be hoodwinked again by messages purporting to come from one to the other. That's easy enough. Any message that comes genuinely from me will have the word and crossed out in it. Without trademark, none genuine, I murmured. What about wires? Any wires from me will be signed Andy. Train will be in before long, Harry, said Ned, putting his head in and withdrawing it immediately. I stood up. And shall I marry a nice steady man if I find one? I asked demurely. Harry came close to me. My God! Anne, if you ever marry anyone else but me, I'll wring his neck. And as for you... Yes, I said, pleasurably excited. I shall carry you away and beat you black and blue. What a delightful husband I have chosen, I said satirically. And doesn't he change his mind overnight? Chapter 28 Extract from the Diary of Sir Eustace Pedler as I remarked once before, I am essentially a man of peace. I yearn for a quiet life, and that's just the one thing I don't seem able to have. I'm always in the middle of storms and alarms. The relief of getting away from Paget with his incessant nosing out of intrigues was enormous, and Miss Pettigrew is certainly a useful creature. Although there is nothing of the hoary about her, one or two of her accomplishments are invaluable. It is true that I had a touch of liver at Bulawayo and behaved like a bear in consequence, but I had had a disturbed night in the train. 
At 3 a.m., an exquisitely dressed young man, looking like a musical comedy hero of the Wild West, entered my compartment and asked where I was going. Disregarding my first murmur of tea, and for God's sake, don't put sugar in it, he repeated his question, laying stress on the fact that he was not a waiter, but an immigration officer. I finally succeeded in satisfying him that I was suffering from no infectious disease, that I was visiting Rhodesia from the purest of motives, and further gratified him with my full Christian names and my place of birth. I then endeavoured to snatch a little sleep, but some officious ass aroused me at 5.30 with a cup of liquid sugar which he called tea. I don't think I threw it at him, but I know that that was what I wanted to do. He brought me unsugared tea, stone cold at six, and I then fell asleep utterly exhausted to awaken just outside Bulawayo and be landed with a beastly wooden giraffe, all legs and neck. But for these small contretemps, all had been going smoothly, and then fresh calamity befell. It was the night of our arrival at the falls. I was dictating to Miss Pettigrew in my sitting room, when suddenly Mrs. Blair burst in without a word of excuse and wearing most compromising attire. Where's Anne? she cried. A nice question to ask, as though I were responsible for the girl. What did she expect Miss Pettigrew to think? That I was in the habit of producing Anne Bedingfeld from my pocket at midnight or thereabouts? Very compromising for a man in my position. I presume, I said coldly, that she is in her bed. I cleared my throat and glanced at Miss Pettigrew to show that I was ready to resume dictating. I hoped Mrs. Blair would take the hint. She did nothing of the kind. Instead, she sank into a chair and waved a slippered foot in an agitated manner. She's not in her room. I've been there. I had a dream, a terrible dream, that she was in some awful danger. And I got up and went to her room, just to reassure myself, you know. She wasn't there, and her bed hadn't been slept in. She looked at me appealingly. What shall I do, Sir Eustace? Repressing the desire to reply, go to bed and don't worry over nothing, an able-bodied young woman like Anne Bedingfeld is perfectly well able to take care of herself. I frowned judicially. What does race say about it? Why should race have it all his own way? Let him have some of the disadvantages as well as the advantages of female society. I can't find him anywhere. She was evidently making a night of it. I sighed and sat down in a chair. I don't quite see the reason for your agitation, I said patiently. My dream! That curry we had for dinner. Oh, Sir Eustace! The woman was quite indignant, and yet everybody knows that nightmares are a direct result of injudicious eating. After all, I continued persuasively, why shouldn't Anne Bedingfeld and Race go out for a little stroll without having the whole hotel aroused about it? You think they've just gone out for a stroll together, but it's after midnight. One does these foolish things when one is young, I murmured. The race is certainly old enough to know better. Do you really think so? I dare say they've run away to make a match of it, I continued soothingly, though fully aware that I was making an idiotic suggestion, for after all, at a place like this, where is there to run away to? I don't know how much longer I should have gone on making feeble remarks, but at that moment Race himself walked in upon us. At any rate, I had been partly right, he had been out for a stroll, but he hadn't taken Anne with him. However, I'd been quite wrong in my way of dealing with the situation. I was soon shown that. Race had the whole hotel turned upside down in three minutes. I'd never seen a man more upset. The thing is very extraordinary. Where did the girl go? She walked out of the hotel fully dressed about ten minutes past eleven, and she was never seen again. The idea of suicide seems impossible. She was one of these energetic young women who are in love with life and have not the faintest intention of quitting it. There was no train either way until midday on the morrow, so she can't have left the place. Then where the devil is she? Race is almost beside himself, poor fellow. He has left no stone unturned. All the DCs, or whatever they call themselves, for hundreds of miles round have been pressed into the service. 
the native trackers have run about on all fours. Everything that can be done is being done, but no sign of Anne Beddingfeld. The accepted theory is that she walked in her sleep. There are signs on the path near the bridge which seem to show that the girl walked deliberately off the edge. If so, of course, she must have been dashed to pieces on the rocks below. Unfortunately, most of the footprints were obliterated by a party of tourists who chose to walk that way early on the Monday morning. I don't know that it's a very satisfactory theory. In my young days, I was always told that sleepwalkers couldn't hurt themselves, that their own sixth sense took care of them. I don't think the theory satisfies Mrs. Blair either. I can't make that woman out. Her whole attitude towards race has changed. She watches him now like a cat a mouse, and she makes obvious efforts to bring herself to be civil to him. And they used to be such friends. Altogether, she's unlike herself, nervous, hysterical, starting and jumping at the least sound. I'm beginning to think that it is high time I went to Joburg. A rumour came along yesterday of a mysterious island somewhere up the river with a man and a girl on it. Race got very excited. It turned out to be all a mare's nest, however. The man had been there for years and is well known to the manager of the hotel. He takes parties up and down the river in the season and points out crocodiles and a stray hippopotamus or so to them. I believe that he keeps a tame one which is trained to bite pieces out of the boat on occasions. Then he fends it off with a boat hook, and the party feel they've really got to the back of beyond at last. How long the girl has been there is not definitely known, but it seems pretty clear that she can't be Anne, and there is a certain delicacy in interfering in other people's affairs. If I were this young fellow, I should certainly kick Race off the island if he came asking questions about my love affairs. Later. It is definitely settled that I go to Joburg tomorrow. Race urges me to do so. Things are getting unpleasant there, by all I hear, but I might as well go before they get worse. I dare say I shall be shot by a striker anyway. Mrs. Blair was to have accompanied me, but at the last minute she changed her mind and decided to stay on at the falls. It seems as though she couldn't bear to take her eyes off race. She came to me tonight and said, with some hesitation, that she had a favour to ask. Would I take charge of her souvenirs for her? Not the animals, I asked in lively alarm. I always felt that I should get stuck with those beastly animals sooner or later. In the end, we effected a compromise. I took charge of two small wooden boxes for her which contained fragile articles. The animals are to be packed by the local store in vast crates and sent to Cape Town by rail, where Paget will see to their being stored. The people who are packing them say that they are of a particularly awkward shape and that special cases will have to be made. I pointed out to Mrs. Blair that by the time she has got them home, those animals will have cost her easily a pound apiece. Paget is straining at the leash to rejoin me in Joburg. I shall make an excuse of Mrs. Blair's cases to keep him in Cape Town. I have written him that he must receive the cases and see to their safe disposal as they contain rare curios of immense value. So all is settled, and I and Miss Pettigrew go off into the blue together. And anyone who has seen Miss Pettigrew will admit that it is perfectly respectable. Chapter 29 Johannesburg, March 6th There is something about the state of things here that is not at all healthy. To use the well-known phrase that I have so often read, we are all living on the edge of a volcano. Bands of strikers, or so-called strikers, patrol the streets and scowl at one in a murderous fashion. They are picking out the bloated capitalists, ready for when the massacres begin, I suppose. You can't ride in a taxi. If you do, strikers pull you out again. And the hotels hint pleasantly that when the food gives out, they will fling you out on the mat. I met Reeves, my labour friend of the Kilmorden last night. He has cold feet worse than any man I ever saw. He's like all the rest of these people. They make inflammatory speeches of enormous length solely for political purposes, and then wish they hadn't. 
He's busy now going about and saying he didn't really do it. When I met him, he was just off to Cape Town where he meditates making a three days speech in Dutch, vindicating himself and pointing out that the things he said really meant something entirely different. I am thankful that I do not have to sit in the Legislative Assembly of South Africa. The House of Commons is bad enough, but at least we have only one language and some slight restriction as to the length of speeches. When I went to the assembly before leaving Cape Town, I listened to a grey-haired gentleman with a drooping moustache who looked exactly like the mock turtle in Alice in Wonderland. He dropped out his words one by one in a particularly melancholy fashion. Every now and then he galvanised himself to further efforts by ejaculating something that sounded like platskeet, uttered fortissimo and in marked contrast to the rest of his delivery. When he did this, half his audience yelled, Woof, woof, which is possibly Dutch for hear, hear, and the other half woke up with a start from the pleasant nap they had been having. I was given to understand that the gentleman had been speaking for at least three days. They must have a lot of patience in South Africa. I have invented endless jobs to keep Paget in Cape Town but at last the fertility of my imagination has given out, and he joins me tomorrow in the spirit of the faithful dog who comes to die by his master's side. And I was getting on so well with my reminiscences, too. I had invented some extraordinarily witty things that the strike leader said to me and I said to the strike leaders. This morning I was interviewed by a government official. He was urbane, persuasive, and mysterious in turn. To begin with, he alluded to my exalted position and importance and suggested that I should remove myself, or be removed by him, to Pretoria. You expect trouble then? I asked. His reply was so worded as to have no meaning whatsoever, so I gathered that they were expecting serious trouble. I suggested to him that his government were letting things go rather too far. There is such a thing as giving a man enough rope and letting him hang himself, Sir Eustace. Oh, quite so, quite so. It is not the strikers themselves who are causing the trouble. There is some organisation at work behind them. Arms and explosives have been pouring in, and we have made a haul of certain documents which throw a good deal of light on the methods adopted to import them. There is a regular code. Potatoes mean detonators, cauliflower, rifles. Other vegetables stand for various explosives. That's very interesting, I commented. More than that, Sir Eustace, we have every reason to believe that the man who runs the whole show, the directing genius of the affair, is at this minute in Johannesburg. He stared at me so hard that I began to fear that he suspected me of being the man. I broke out into a cold perspiration at the thought and began to regret that I had ever conceived the idea of inspecting a miniature revolution at first hand. No trains are running from Joburg to Pretoria, he continued but I can arrange to send you over by private car. In case you should be stopped on the way, I can provide you with two separate passes, one issued by the Union government and the other stating that you are an English visitor who has nothing whatsoever to do with the Union. One for your people and one for the strikers, eh? Exactly. The project did not appeal to me. I know what happens in a case of that kind. You get flustered and mix the things up. I should hand the wrong pass to the wrong person, and it would end in my being summarily shot by a bloodthirsty rebel, or one of the supporters of law and order whom I notice guarding the streets wearing bowler hats and smoking pipes, with rifles tucked carelessly under their arms. Besides, what should I do with myself in Pretoria? Admire the architecture of the Union buildings, and listen to the echoes of the shooting round Johannesburg? I should be penned up there God knows how long. They've blown up the railway line already, I hear. It isn't even as if one could get a drink there. They put the place under martial law two days ago. My dear fellow, I said, you don't seem to realise that I'm studying conditions on the Rand. How the devil am I going to study them from Pretoria? I appreciate your care for my safety, but don't worry about me. I shall be all right. I warn you, Sir Eustace, that the food question is already serious. A little fasting will improve my figure, I said with a sigh. We were interrupted by a telegram being handed to me. I read it with amazement. Anne is safe, here with me at Kimberley, Suzanne Blair. 
I don't think I ever really believed in the annihilation of Anne. There is something peculiarly indestructible about that young woman. She is like the patent balls that one gives to terriers. She has an extraordinary knack of turning up smiling. I still don't see why it was necessary for her to walk out of the hotel in the middle of the night in order to get to Kimberley. There was no train anyway. She must have put on a pair of angel's wings and flown there. And I don't suppose she will ever explain. Nobody does, to me. I always have to guess. It becomes monotonous after a while. I suppose the exigencies of journalism are at the bottom of it. How I shot the rapids by our special correspondent. I refolded the telegram and got rid of my governmental friend. I don't like the prospect of being hungry, but I'm not alarmed for my personal safety. Smuts is perfectly capable of dealing with the revolution, but I would give a considerable sum of money for a drink. I wonder if Paget will have the sense to bring a bottle of whiskey with him when he arrives tomorrow. I put on my hat and went out, intending to buy a few souvenirs. The curio shops in Joburg are rather pleasant. I was just studying a window full of imposing carrosses when a man coming out of the shop cannoned into me. To my surprise, it turned out to be race. I can't flatter myself that he looked pleased to see me. As a matter of fact, he looked distinctly annoyed, but I insisted on his accompanying me back to the hotel. I get tired of having no one but Miss Pettigrew to talk to. I had no idea you were in Joburg, I said chattily. When did you arrive? Last night. Where are you staying? With friends. He was disposed to be extraordinarily taciturn and seemed to be embarrassed by my questions. I hope they keep poultry, I remarked. A diet of new laid eggs and the occasional slaughtering of an old cock will be decidedly agreeable soon from all I hear. By the way, I said when we were back in the hotel, have you heard that Miss Beddingfeld is alive and kicking? He nodded. She gave us quite a fright. I said airily. Where the devil did she go that night? That's what I'd like to know. She was on the island all the time. Which island? Not the one with the young man on it. Yes. How very improper, I said. Paget will be quite shocked. He always did disapprove of Anne Beddingfeld. I suppose that was the young man she originally intended to meet in Durban. I don't think so. Don't tell me anything if you don't want to. I said, by way of encouraging him. I fancy that this is a young man we should all be very glad to lay our hands on. Not! I cried in rising excitement. He nodded. Harry Rayburn, alias Harry Lucas. That's his real name, you know. He's given us all the slip once more, but we're bound to rope him in soon. Dear me, dear me, I murmured. We don't suspect the girl of complicity in any case. On her side, it's just a love affair. I always did think Race was in love with Anne. The way he said those last words made me feel sure of it. She's gone to Beira, he continued rather hastily. Indeed, I said, staring. How do you know? She wrote to me from Bulawayo, telling me she was going home that way. The best thing she can do, poor child. Somehow I don't fancy she is in Beira, I said meditatively. She was just starting when she wrote. I was puzzled. Somebody was clearly lying. Without stopping to reflect that Anne might have excellent reasons for her misleading statements, I gave myself up to the pleasure of scoring off race. He is always so cocksure. I took the telegram from my pocket and handed it to him. Then how do you explain this? I asked nonchalantly. He seemed dumbfounded. She said she was just starting for Beira, he said in a dazed voice. I know that Race is supposed to be clever. He is, in my opinion, rather a stupid man. It never seemed to occur to him that girls do not always tell the truth. Kimberly, too. What are they doing there? He muttered. Yes, that surprised me. I should have thought Miss Anne would have been in the thick of it here, gathering copy for the daily budget. Kimberly, he said again. The place seemed to upset him. There's nothing to see there. The pits aren't being worked. You know what women are, I said vaguely. He shook his head and went off. 
I have evidently given him something to think about. No sooner had he departed than my government official reappeared. I hope you will forgive me for troubling you again, Sir Eustace, he apologized, but there are one or two questions I should like to ask you. Certainly, my dear fellow, I said cheerfully. Ask away. It concerns your secretary. I know nothing about him. I said hastily. He foisted himself upon me in London, robbed me of valuable papers, for which I shall be hauled over the coals, and disappeared like a conjuring trick at Cape Town. It's true that I was at the falls at the same time as he was, but I was at the hotel and he was on an island. I can assure you that I never set eyes upon him the whole time that I was there. I paused for breath. You misunderstand me. It was of your other secretary that I spoke. What? Paget? I cried in lively astonishment. He's been with me eight years, a most trustworthy fellow. My interlocutor smiled. We are still at cross purposes. I refer to the lady. Miss Pettigrew? I exclaimed. Yes, she has been seen coming out of Agrasato's native curio shop. God bless my soul! I interrupted. I was going into that place myself this afternoon. You might have caught me coming out. There doesn't seem to be any innocent thing that one can do in Joburg without being suspected for it. Ah, but she has been seen there more than once, and in rather doubtful circumstances. I may as well tell you, in confidence, Sir Eustace, that the place is suspected of being a well-known rendezvous used by the secret organisation behind this revolution. That is why I should be glad to hear all that you can tell me about this lady. Where and how did you come to engage her? She was lent to me, I replied coldly, by your own government. He collapsed utterly. Chapter 30 Anne's Narrative Resumed As soon as I got to Kimberley, I wired to Suzanne. She joined me there with the utmost dispatch, heralding her arrival with telegrams sent off en route. I was awfully surprised to find she really was fond of me. I thought I had been just a new sensation, but she positively fell on my neck and wept when we met. When we had recovered from our emotion a little, I sat down on the bed and told her the whole story from A to Z. You always did suspect Colonel Race, she said thoughtfully when I had finished. I didn't until the night you disappeared. I liked him so much all along and thought he would make such a nice husband for you. Oh, Anne, dear, don't be cross. But how do you know that this young man of yours is telling the truth? You believe every word he says? Of course I do, I cried indignantly. But what is there in him that attracts you so? I don't see that there's anything in him at all, except his rather reckless good looks and his modern chic come stone age love-making. I poured out the vials of my wrath upon Suzanne for some minutes. Just because you're comfortably married and getting fat, you've forgotten that there's any such thing as romance, I ended. Oh, I'm not getting fat, Anne. All the worry I've had about you lately must have worn me to a shred. You look particularly well nourished, I said coldly. I should say you must have put on about half a stone. And I don't know that I'm so comfortably married either continued Suzanne in a melancholy voice. I've been having the most dreadful cables from Clarence ordering me to come home at once. At last I didn't answer them, and now I haven't heard for over a fortnight. I'm afraid I didn't take Suzanne's matrimonial troubles very seriously. She will be able to get round Clarence all right when the time comes. I turned the conversation to the subject of the diamonds. Suzanne looked at me with a dropped jaw. I must explain, Anne. You see, as soon as I began to suspect Colonel Race, I was terribly upset about the diamonds. I wanted to stay on at the Falls in case he might have kidnapped you somewhere close by, but didn't know what to do about the diamonds. I was afraid to keep them in my possession. Suzanne looked round her uneasily, as though she feared the walls might have ears, and then whispered vehemently in my ear. A distinctly good idea. I approved. At the time, that is. It's a bit awkward now. What did Sir Eustace do with the cases? 
The big ones were sent down to Cape Town. I heard from Paget before I left the falls, and he enclosed the receipt for their storage. He's leaving Cape Town today, by the by, to join Sir Eustace in Johannesburg. I see, I said thoughtfully. And the small ones, where are they? I suppose Sir Eustace has got them with him. I turned the matter over in my mind. Well, I said at last, it's awkward, but it's safe enough. We'd better do nothing for the present. Suzanne looked at me with a little smile. You don't like doing nothing, do you, Anne? Not very much, I replied honestly. The one thing I could do was to get hold of a timetable and see what time Guy Paget's train would pass through Kimberley. I found that it would arrive at 5.40 on the following afternoon and depart again at 6. I wanted to see Paget as soon as possible, and that seemed to me a good opportunity. The situation on the Rand was getting very serious, and it might be a long time before I got another chance. The only thing that livened up the day was a wire dispatched from Johannesburg, a most innocent-sounding telegram. Arrived safely, all going well. Eric here, also Eustace, but not Guy. Remain where you are for the present. Andy. Eric was our pseudonym for race. I chose it because it is a name I dislike exceedingly. There was clearly nothing to be done until I could see Paget. Suzanne employed herself in sending off a long, soothing cable to the far-off Clarence. She became quite sentimental over him. In her way, which of course is quite different from me and Harry, she is really fond of Clarence. I do wish he was here, Anne, she gulped. It's such a long time since I've seen him. Have some face cream, I said soothingly. Suzanne rubbed a little on the tip of her charming nose. I shall want some more face cream soon, too, she remarked, and you can only get this kind in Paris. She sighed. Paris. Suzanne, I said, very soon you'll have had enough of South Africa and adventure. I should like a really nice hat, admitted Suzanne wistfully. Shall I come with you to meet Guy Paget tomorrow? I'd prefer to go alone. He'd be shyer speaking before two of us. So it came about that I was standing in the doorway of the hotel on the following afternoon, struggling with a recalcitrant parasol that refused to go up, while Suzanne lay peacefully on her bed with a book and a basket of fruit. According to the hotel porter, the train was on its good behaviour today and would be almost on time, though he was extremely doubtful whether it would ever get through to Johannesburg. The line had been blown up, so he solemnly assured me. It sounded cheerful. The train drew in just ten minutes late. Everybody tumbled out on the platform and began walking up and down feverishly. I had no difficulty in espying Paget. I accosted him eagerly. He gave his usual nervous start at seeing me, somewhat accentuated this time. Dear me, Miss Beddingfeld, I understood that you had disappeared. I have reappeared again, I told him solemnly. And how are you, Mr. Paget? Very well, thank you. Looking forward to taking up my work again with Sir Eustace. Mr. Paget, I said, there is something I want to ask you. I hope that you won't be offended, but a lot hangs on it, more than you can possibly guess. I want to know what you were doing at Marlow on the 8th of January last. He started violently. Really, Miss Beddingfeld, I... Indeed, you were there, weren't you? I, for reasons of my own, I was in the neighbourhood, yes. Won't you tell me what those reasons were? Sir Eustace has not already told you. Sir Eustace? Does he know? I am almost sure that he does. I hoped he had not recognised me, but from the hints he has let drop and his remarks, I fear it is only too certain. In any case, I meant to make a clean breast of the matter and offer my resignation. He is a peculiar man, Miss Beddingfeld, with an abnormal sense of humour. It seems to amuse him to keep me on tenterhooks. All the time, I dare say, he was perfectly well aware of the true facts. Possibly he has known them for years. 
I hoped that sooner or later I should be able to understand what Paget was talking about. He went on fluently. It is difficult for a man of Sir Eustace's standing to put himself in my position. I know that I was in the wrong, but it seemed a harmless deception. I would have thought it better taste on his part to have tackled me outright, instead of indulging in covert jokes at my expense. A whistle blew, and the people began to surge back into the train. Yes, Mr. Paget. I broke in. I'm sure I quite agree with all you're saying about Sir Eustace, but why did you go to Marlow? It was wrong of me, but natural under the circumstances. Yes, I still feel natural under the circumstances. What circumstances? I cried desperately. For the first time, Paget seemed to recognize that I was asking him a question. His mind detached itself from the peculiarities of Sir Eustace and his own justification, and came to rest on me. "'I beg your pardon, Miss Biddingfeld,' he said stiffly, "'but I fail to see your concern in the matter.' He was back in the train now, leaning down to speak to me. I felt desperate. What could one do with a man like that? "'Of course, if it's so dreadful that you'd be ashamed to speak of it to me,' I began spitefully. At last I had found the right stop. Paget stiffened and flushed. Dreadful? Ashamed? I don't understand you. Then tell me! In three short sentences he told me. At last I knew Paget's secret. It was not in the least what I expected. I walked slowly back to the hotel. There a wire was handed to me. I tore it open. It contained full and definite instructions for me to proceed forthwith to Johannesburg, or rather to a station this side of Johannesburg, where I should be met by a car. It was signed, not Andy, but Harry. I sat down in a chair to do some very serious thinking. Chapter 31 From the Diary of Sir Eustace Pedler Johannesburg, March 7th. Paget has arrived. He is in a blue funk, of course. Suggested at once that we should go off to Pretoria. Then, when I had told him kindly but firmly that we were going to remain here, he went to the other extreme, wished he had his wife all here, and began bucking about some bridge he guarded during the Great War. A railway bridge at Little Puttacombe Junction or something of that sort. I soon cut that short by telling him to unpack the big typewriter. I thought that that would keep him employed for some time, because the typewriter was sure to have gone wrong. It always does, and he would have to take it somewhere to be mended. But I'd forgotten Paget's powers of being in the right. I've already unpacked all the cases, Sir Eustace. The typewriter is in perfect condition. What do you mean, all the cases? The two small cases as well. I wish you wouldn't be so officious, Paget. Those small cases were no business of yours. They belong to Mrs. Blair. Paget looked crestfallen. He hates to make a mistake. So you can just pack them up again neatly, I continued. After that, you can go out and look around you. Joburg will probably be a heap of smoking ruins by tomorrow, so it may be your last chance. I thought that that would get rid of him successfully for the morning at any rate. There is something I want to say to you when you have the leisure, Sir Eustace. I haven't got it now, I said hastily. At this minute I have absolutely no leisure whatsoever. Paget retired. By the way, I called after him, what was there in those cases of Mrs. Blair's? Some fur rugs and a couple of fur hats, I think. That's right, I assented. She bought them on the train. They are hats, of a kind, though I hardly wonder at your not recognizing them. I dare say she's going to wear one of them at Ascot. What else was there? Some rolls of films and some baskets. A lot of baskets. There would be, I assured him. Mrs. Blair is the kind of woman who never buys less than a dozen or so of anything. I think that's all, Sir Eustace except some miscellaneous odds and ends, a motor veil and some odd gloves, that sort of thing. If you hadn't been a born idiot, Paget, you would have seen from the start that those couldn't possibly be my belongings. I thought some of them might belong to Miss Pettigrew. Ah, 
That reminds me. What do you mean by picking me out such a doubtful character as a secretary? And I told him about the searching cross-examination I had been put through. Immediately I was sorry. I saw a glint in his eye that I know only too well. I changed the conversation hurriedly, but it was too late. Paget was on the warpath. He next proceeded to bore me with a long, pointless story about the Kilmorden. It was about a roll of films and a wager. The roll of films being thrown through a porthole in the middle of the night by some steward who ought to have known better. I hate horseplay. I told Paget so, and he began to tell me the story all over again. He tells a story extremely badly anyway. It was a long time before I could make head or tail of this one. I did not see him again until lunchtime. Then he came in brimming over with excitement, like a bloodhound on the scent. I never have cared for bloodhounds. The upshot of it all was that he had seen Rayburn. What? I cried, startled. Yes, he had caught sight of someone whom he was sure was Rayburn crossing the street. Paget had followed him. And who do you think I saw him stop and speak to? Miss Pettigrew. What? Yes, Sir Eustace, and that's not all. I've been making inquiries about her. Wait a bit. What happened to Rayburn? He and Miss Pettigrew went into that corner curio shop. I uttered an involuntary exclamation. Paget stopped inquiringly. Nothing, I said. Go on. I waited outside for ages, but they didn't come out. At last, I went in. Sir Eustace, there was no one in the shop. There must be another way out. I stared at him. As I was saying, I came back to the hotel and made some inquiries about Miss Pettigrew. Paget lowered his voice and breathed hard as he always does when he wants to be confidential. Sir Eustace... A man was seen coming out of her room last night. I raised my eyebrows, and I always regarded her as a lady of such eminent respectability, I murmured. Paget went on without heeding. I went straight up and searched her room. What do you think I found? I shook my head. This. Paget held up a safety razor and a stick of shaving soap. What would a woman want with these? I don't suppose Paget ever reads the advertisements in the high-class ladies' papers. I do. Whilst not proposing to argue with him on the subject, I refuse to accept the presence of the razor as proof positive of Miss Pettigrew's sex. Paget is so hopelessly behind the times. I should not have been at all surprised if he had produced a cigarette case to support his theory. However, even Paget has his limits. You are not convinced, Sir Eustace. What do you say to this? I inspected the article which he dangled aloft triumphantly. It looks like hair, I remarked distastefully. It is hair. I think it's what they call a toupee. Indeed, I commented. Now are you convinced that that Pettigrew woman is a man in disguise? Really, my dear Paget, I think I am. I might have known it by her feet. Then that's that. And now, Sir Eustace, I want to speak to you about my private affairs. I cannot doubt from your hints and your continual allusions to the time I was in Florence that you must have found me out. At last the mystery of what Paget did in Florence is going to be revealed. Make a clean breast of it, my dear fellow. I said kindly, much the best way. Thank you, Sir Eustace. Is it her husband? Annoying fellow's husbands, always turning up when they're least expected. I fail to follow you, Sir Eustace. Whose husband? The lady's husband. What lady? God bless my soul, Paget. the lady you met in Florence. There must have been a lady. Don't tell me that you merely robbed a church or stabbed an Italian in the back because you didn't like his face. I am quite at a loss to understand you, Sir Eustace. I suppose you are joking. I am an amusing fellow sometimes, when I take the trouble, but I can assure you that I'm not trying to be funny this minute. I hope that, as I was a good way off, you had not recognised me, Sir Eustace. Recognised you where? At Marlow, Sir Eustace. 
At Marlow? What the devil were you doing at Marlow? I thought you understood that. I'm beginning to understand less and less. Go back to the beginning of the story and start again. You went to Florence. Then you don't know after all, and you didn't recognize me. As far as I can judge, you seem to have given yourself away needlessly, made a coward of by your conscience. But I shall be able to tell better when I've heard the whole story. Now then, take a deep breath and start again. You went to Florence. But I didn't go to Florence. That is just it. Well, where did you go then? I went home, to Marlow. What the devil did you want to go to Marlow for? I wanted to see my wife. She was in delicate health and expecting... Your wife? But I didn't know you were married. No, Sir Eustace, that is just what I am telling you. I deceived you in this matter. How long have you been married? Just over eight years. I had been married just six months when I became your secretary. I did not want to lose the post. A resident secretary is not supposed to have a wife so I suppressed the fact. You take my breath away, I remarked. Where has she been all these years? We have had a small bungalow on the river at Marlow, quite close to the mill house for over five years. God bless my soul, I muttered. Any children? Four children, Sir Eustace. I gazed at him in a kind of stupor. I might have known all along that a man like Paget couldn't have a guilty secret. The respectability of Paget has always been my bane. That's just the kind of secret he would have, a wife and four children. Have you told this to anyone else? I demanded at last, when I had gazed at him in fascinated interest for quite a long while. Only Miss Beddingfeld. She came to the station at Kimberley. I continued to stare at him. He fidgeted under my glance. I hope, Sir Eustace, that you are not seriously annoyed. My dear fellow, I said, I don't mind telling you here and now that you've blinking well torn it. I went out seriously ruffled. As I passed the corner curio shop, I was assailed by a sudden irresistible temptation and went in. The proprietor came forward obsequiously rubbing his hands. Can I show you something? Furs, curios. I want something quite out of the ordinary, I said. It's for a special occasion. Will you show me what you've got? Perhaps you will come into my back room. We have many specialities there. That is where I made a mistake, and I thought I was going to be so clever. I followed him through the swinging portier. Chapter 32 Anne's narrative resumed. I had great trouble with Suzanne. She argued, she pleaded, she even wept before she would let me carry out my plan. But in the end, I got my own way. She promised to carry out my instructions to the letter and came down to the station to bid me a tearful farewell. I arrived at my destination the following morning early. I was met by a short, black-bearded Dutchman whom I had never seen before. He had a car waiting and we drove off. There was a queer booming in the distance, and I asked him what it was. Guns, he answered laconically. So there was fighting going on in Joburg. I gathered that our objective was a spot somewhere in the suburbs of the city. We turned and twisted and made several detours to get there, and every minute the guns were nearer. It was an exciting time. At last we stopped before a somewhat ramshackle building. The door was opened by a kaffir boy. My guide signed to me to enter. I stood irresolute in the dingy square hall. The man passed me and threw open a door. The young lady to see Mr. Harry Laban, he said, and laughed. Thus announced, I passed in. The room was sparsely furnished and smelt of cheap tobacco smoke. Behind a desk, a man sat writing. He looked up and raised his eyebrows. Dear me, he said, if it isn't Miss Beddingfeld. I must be seeing double, I apologized. Isn't Mr. Chichester or is it Miss Pettigrew? There is an extraordinary resemblance to both of them. 
Both characters are in abeyance for the moment. I have doffed my petticoats and my cloth likewise. Won't you sit down? I accepted a seat composedly. It would seem, I remarked, that I have come to the wrong address. From your point of view, I am afraid you have. Really, Miss Beddingfeld, to fall into the trap a second time. It was not very bright of me, I admitted meekly. Something about my manner seemed to puzzle him. You hardly seem upset by the occurrence, he remarked dryly. Would my going into heroics have any effect upon you? I asked. It certainly would not. My great-aunt Jane always used to say that a true lady was neither shocked nor surprised at anything that might happen, I murmured dreamily. I endeavour to live up to her precepts. I read Mr. Chichester Pettigrew's opinion so plainly written on his face that I hastened into speech once more. You really are positively marvellous at makeup, I said generously. All the time you were Miss Pettigrew, I never recognised you, even when you broke your pencil in the shock of seeing me climb upon the train at Cape Town. He tapped upon the desk with the pencil he was holding in his hand at the minute. All this is very well in its way, but we must get to business. Perhaps, Miss Beddingfeld, you can guess why we required your presence here. You will excuse me, I said, but I never do business with anyone but principals. I had read the phrase, or something like it, in a moneylender's circular, and I was rather pleased with it. It certainly had a devastating effect upon Mr. Chichester Pettigrew. He opened his mouth and then shut it again. I beamed upon him. My great-uncle George's maxim, I added as an afterthought. Great-aunt Jane's husband, you know. He made knobs for brass beds. I doubt if Chichester Pettigrew had ever been ragged before. He didn't like it at all. I think you would be wise to alter your tone, young lady. I did not reply, but yawned, a delicate little yawn that hinted at intense boredom. What the devil? he began forcibly. I interrupted him. I can assure you it's no good shouting at me. We are only wasting time here. I have no intention of talking with underlings. You will save me a lot of time and annoyance by taking me straight to Sir Eustace Pedler. To... He looked dumbfounded. Yes, I said, Sir Eustace Pedler. I... I... Excuse me. He bolted from the room like a rabbit. I took advantage of the respite to open my bag and powder my nose thoroughly. Also, I settled my hat at a more becoming angle. Then I settled myself to wait with patience for my enemy's return. He reappeared in a subtly chastened mood. Will you come this way, Miss Beddingfeld? I followed him up the stairs. He knocked at the door of a room, a brisk, Come in, sounded from inside, and he opened the door and motioned to me to pass inside. Sir Eustace Pedler sprang up to greet me, genial and smiling. Well, well, Miss Anne, he shook me warmly by the hand. I'm delighted to see you. Come and sit down, not tired after your journey. That's good. He sat down facing me, still beaming. It left me rather at a loss. His manner was so completely natural. Quite right to insist on being brought straight to me, he went on. Minx is a fool, a clever actor, but a fool. That was Minx you saw downstairs. Oh, really? I said feebly. And now, said Sir Eustace cheerfully, let's get down to facts. How long have you known that I was the colonel? Ever since Mr. Paget told me that he had seen you in Marlow when you were supposed to be in Cannes. Sir Eustace nodded ruefully. Yes, I told the fool he'd blinking well torn it. He didn't understand, of course. His whole mind was set on whether I'd recognised him. It never occurred to him to wonder what I was doing down there. A piece of sheer bad luck, that was. I arranged it all so carefully, too, sending him off to Florence, telling the hotel I was going over to Nice for one night or possibly two. Then, by the time the murder was discovered, I was back again in Cannes, with nobody dreaming that I'd ever left the Riviera. He still spoke quite naturally and unaffectedly. I had to pinch myself to understand that this was all real, that the man in front of me was really that deep-dyed criminal, the colonel. 
I followed things out in my mind. Then it was you who tried to throw me overboard on the Kilmorden, I said slowly. It was you that Paget followed up on deck that night. He shrugged his shoulders. I apologize, my dear child, I really do. I always liked you, but you were so confoundedly interfering. I couldn't have all my plans brought to naught by a chit of a girl. I think your plan at the Fools was really the cleverest, I said, endeavouring to look at the thing in a detached fashion. I would have been ready to swear anywhere that you were in the hotel when I went out. Seeing is believing in future. Yes, Minx had one of his greatest successes as Miss Pettigrew, and he can imitate my voice quite creditably. There is one thing I should like to know. Yes? How did you induce Paget to engage her? Oh, that was quite simple. She met Paget in the doorway of the Trade Commissioner's office, or the Chamber of Mines, or wherever it was he went, told him I had phoned down in a hurry and that she had been selected by the government department in question. Paget swallowed it like a lamb. You're very frank, I said, studying him. There's no earthly reason why I shouldn't be. I didn't like the sound of that. I hastened to put my own interpretation on it. You believe in the success of this revolution. You've burnt your boats. For an otherwise intelligent young woman, that's a singularly unintelligent remark. No, my dear child, I do not believe in this revolution. I give it a couple of days longer and it will fizzle out ignominiously. Not one of your successes, in fact, I said nastily. Like all women, you've no idea of business. The job I took on was to supply certain explosives and arms, heavily paid for, to ferment feeling generally, and to incriminate certain people up to the hilt. I've carried out my contract with complete success, and I was careful to be paid in advance. I took special care over the whole thing, as I intended it to be my last contract before retiring from business. As for burning my boats, as you call it, I simply don't know what you mean. I'm not the rebel chief or anything of that kind. I'm a distinguished English visitor who had the misfortune to go nosing into a certain curio shop and saw a little more than he was meant to. And so the poor fellow was kidnapped. Tomorrow or the day after, when circumstances permit, I shall be found tied up somewhere in a pitiable state of terror and starvation. Ah, I said slowly, but what about me? That's just it said Sir Eustace softly. What about you? I've got you here. I don't want to rub it in in any way, but I've got you here very neatly. The question is, what am I going to do with you? The simplest way of disposing of you, and, I may add, the pleasantest to myself, is the way of marriage. Wives can't accuse their husbands, you know, and I'd rather like a pretty young wife to hold my hand and glance at me out of liquid eyes. Don't flash them at me so. You quite frighten me. I see that the plan does not commend itself to you. It does not. Sir Eustace sighed. Ah, pity. But I am no Adelphi villain. The usual trouble, I suppose. You love another, as the books say. I love another. I thought as much. First I thought it was that long-legged pompous ass race. But I suppose it's the young hero who fished you out of the falls that night. Women have no taste. Neither of those two have half the brains that I have. I'm such an easy person to underestimate. I think he was right about that. Although I knew well enough the kind of man he was and must be, I could not bring myself to realize it. He had tried to kill me on more than one occasion. He had actually killed another woman, and he was responsible for endless other deeds of which I knew nothing— and yet I was quite unable to bring myself into the frame of mind for appreciating his deeds as they deserved. I could not think of him as other than our amusing, genial, travelling companion. I could not even feel frightened of him, and yet I knew he was capable of having me murdered in cold blood if it struck him as necessary. The only parallel I can think of is the case of Stevenson's Long John Silver. He must have been much the same kind of man. Well, well, said this extraordinary person, leaning back in his chair. It's a pity that the idea of being Lady Peddler doesn't appeal to you. The other alternatives are rather crude. 
I felt a nasty feeling going up and down my spine. Of course, I had known all along that I was taking a big risk, but the price had seemed worth it. Would things turn out as I had calculated, or would they not? The fact of the matter is, Sir Eustace was continuing, I've a weakness for you. I really don't want to proceed to extremes. Suppose you tell me the whole story from the very beginning, and let's see what we can make of it. But no romancing, mind, I want the truth. I was not going to make any mistake over that. I had a great deal of respect for Sir Eustace's shrewdness. It was a moment for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I told him the whole story, omitting nothing, up to the moment of my rescue by Harry. When I had finished, he nodded his head in approval. Wise girl, you've made a clean breast of the thing. And let me tell you, I should soon have caught you out if you hadn't. A lot of people wouldn't believe your story anyway, especially the beginning part. But I do. You're the kind of girl who would start off like that at a moment's notice on the slenderest of motives. You've had amazing luck, of course, but sooner or later the amateur runs up against the professional, and then the result is a foregone conclusion. I am the professional. I started on this business when I was quite a youngster. All things considered, it seemed to me a good way of getting rich quickly. I always could think things out and devise ingenious schemes, and I never made the mistake of trying to carry out my schemes myself. Always employ the expert. That has been my motto. The one time I departed from it, I came to grief, but I couldn't trust anyone to do that job for me. Nadina knew too much. I'm an easygoing man, kind-hearted and good-tempered, so long as I'm not thwarted. Nadina both thwarted me and threatened me, just as I was at the apex of a successful career. Once she was dead and the diamonds were in my possession, I was safe. I've come to the conclusion now that I bungled the job. That idiot Paget with his wife and family. My fault. It tickled my sense of humour to employ the fellow with his cinquecento poisoner's face and his mid-Victorian soul. A maxim for you, my dear Anne. Don't let your sense of humour carry you away. For years I've had an instinct that it would be wise to get rid of Paget. But the fellow was so hard-working and conscientious that I honestly couldn't find an excuse for sacking him. So I let things drift. But we're wandering from the point. The question is what to do with you. Your narrative was admirably clear. But there is one thing that still escapes me. Where are the diamonds now? Harry Rayburn has them, I said, watching him. His face did not change. It retained its expression of sardonic good humour. Hmm. I want those diamonds. I don't see much chance of your getting them, I replied. Don't you? Now I do. I don't want to be unpleasant, but I should like you to reflect that a dead girl or so found in this quarter of the city will occasion no surprise. There's a man downstairs who does those sort of jobs very neatly. Now, you're a sensible young woman. What I propose is this. You will sit down and write to Harry Rayburn, telling him to join you here and bring the diamonds with him. I won't do anything of the kind. Don't interrupt your elders. I propose to make a bargain with you. The diamonds in exchange for your life. And don't make any mistake about it. Your life is absolutely in my power. And Harry? I'm far too tender-hearted to part two young lovers. He shall go free, too, on the understanding, of course, that neither of you interfere with me in the future. And what guarantee have I that you will keep your side of the bargain? None whatever, my dear. You'll have to trust me and hope for the best. Of course, if you're in an heroic mood and prefer annihilation, that's another matter. This was what I'd been playing for. I was careful not to jump at the bait. Gradually, I allowed myself to be bullied and cajoled into yielding. I wrote at Sir Eustace's dictation, Dear Harry, I think I see a chance of establishing your innocence beyond any possible doubt. Please follow my instructions minutely. Go to Agrisato's curio shop, ask to see something out of the ordinary for a special occasion. The man will then ask you to come into the back room, go with him, 
You will find a messenger who will bring you to me. Do exactly as he tells you. Be sure and bring the diamonds with you, not a word to anyone. Sir Eustace stopped. I leave the fancy touches to your own imagination, he remarked. But be careful to make no mistakes. Yours for ever and ever, Anne, will be sufficient, I remarked. I wrote in the words. Sir Eustace stretched out his hand for the letter and read it through. That seems all right. Now the address. I gave it him. It was that of a small shop which received letters and telegrams for a consideration. He struck the bell upon the table with his hand. Chichester Pettigrew, alias Minx, answered the summons. This letter is to go immediately, the usual route. Very well, Colonel. He looked at the name on the envelope. Sir Eustace was watching him keenly. A friend of yours, I think. Of mine? The man seemed startled. You had a prolonged conversation with him in Johannesburg yesterday. A man came up and questioned me about your movements and those of Colonel Race. I gave him misleading information. Excellent, my dear fellow, excellent, said Sir Eustace genially. My mistake. I chanced to look at Chichester Pettigrew as he left the room. He was white to the lips, as though in deadly terror. No sooner was he outside than Sir Eustace picked up a speaking tube that rested by his elbow and spoke down it. That you, Schwart? Watch Minx. He's not to leave the house without orders. He put the speaking tube down again and frowned, slightly tapping the table with his hand. May I ask you a few questions, Sir Eustace? I said after a minute or two of silence. Certainly. What excellent nerves you have, Anne. You are capable of taking an intelligent interest in things when most girls would be sniffling and wringing their hands. Why did you take Harry as your secretary instead of giving him up to the police? I wanted those cursed diamonds. Nadina, the little devil, was playing off your Harry against me. Unless I gave her the price she wanted, she threatened to sell them back to him. That was another mistake I made. I thought she'd have them with her that day, but she was too clever for that. Carton, her husband, was dead too. I'd no clue whatsoever as to where the diamonds were hidden. Then I managed to get a copy of a wireless message sent to Nadina by someone on board the Kilmorden. Either Carton or Rayburn, I didn't know which. It was a duplicate of that piece of paper you picked up. Seventeen one twenty two. it ran. I took it to be an appointment with Weyburn, and when he was so desperate to get aboard the Kilmorden, I was convinced that I was right. So I pretended to swallow his statements and let him come. I kept a pretty sharp watch upon him and hoped that I should learn more. Then I found Minx trying to play a lone hand and interfering with me. I soon stopped that. He came to heel all right. It was annoying not getting cabin 17, and it worried me not being able to place you. Were you the innocent young girl you seemed, or were you not? When Rayburn set out to keep the appointment that night, Minx was told off to intercept him. Minx muffed it, of course. But why did the wireless message say 17 instead of 71? I've thought that out. Carton must have given that wireless operator his own memorandum to copy off onto a form, and he never read the copy through. The operator made the same mistake we all did and read it as 17 one instead of one seventy one twenty two. The thing I don't know is how Minx got onto cabin 17. It must have been sheer instinct. And the dispatch to General Smuts, who tampered with that? My dear Anne, you don't suppose I was going to have a lot of my plans given away without making an effort to save them? With an escaped murderer as a secretary, I had no hesitation whatever in substituting blanks. Nobody would think of suspecting poor old peddler. What about Colonel Race? Yes, that was a nasty jar. When Paget told me he was a Secret Service fellow, I had an unpleasant feeling down the spine. I remembered that he'd been nosing around Nadina in Paris during the war, and I had a horrible suspicion that he was out after me. I don't like the way he's stuck to me ever since. 
He's one of those strong, silent men who have always got something up their sleeve. A whistle sounded. Sir Eustace picked up the tube, listened for a minute or two, then answered, Very well, I'll see him now. Business, he remarked. Miss Anne, let me show you your room. He ushered me into a small, shabby apartment. A kaffir boy brought up my small suitcase, and Sir Eustace, urging me to ask for anything I wanted, withdrew. The picture of a courteous host. A can of hot water was on the washstand, and I proceeded to unpack a few necessaries. Something hard and unfamiliar in my sponge bag puzzled me greatly. I untied the string and looked inside. To my utter amazement, I drew out a small pearl-handled revolver. It hadn't been there when I started from Kimberley. I examined the thing gingerly. It appeared to be loaded. I handled it with a comfortable feeling. It was a useful thing to have in a house such as this, but modern clothes are quite unsuited to the carrying of firearms. In the end, I pushed it gingerly into the top of my stocking. It made a terrible bulge, and I expected every minute that it would go off and shoot me in the leg. But it really seemed the only place. Chapter 33 I was not summoned to Sir Eustace's presence until late in the afternoon. Eleven o'clock tea and a substantial lunch had been served to me in my own apartment, and I felt fortified for further conflict. Sir Eustace was alone. He was walking up and down the room. There was a gleam in his eye and a restlessness in his manner which did not escape me. He was exultant about something. There was a subtle change in his manner towards me. I have news for you. Your young man is on his way. He will be here in a few minutes. Moderate your transports. I have something more to say. You attempted to deceive me this morning. I warned you that you would be wise to stick to the truth, and up to a certain point you obeyed me. Then you ran off the rails. You attempted to make me believe that the diamonds were in Harry Rayburn's possession. At the time I accepted your statement because it facilitated my task, the task of inducing you to decoy Harry Rayburn here. But, my dear Anne, the diamonds have been in my possession ever since I left the falls, though I only discovered the fact yesterday. You know, I gasped. It may interest you to hear that it was Paget who gave the show away. He insisted on boring me with a long, pointless story about a wager and a tin of films. It didn't take me long to put two and two together. Mrs. Blair's distrust of Colonel Race, her agitation, her entreaty that I would take care of her souvenirs for her. The excellent Paget had already unfastened the cases through an excess of zeal. Before leaving the hotel, I simply transferred all the rolls of films to my own pocket. They're in the corner there. I admit that I haven't had time to examine them yet, but I notice that one is of a totally different weight to the others, rattles in a peculiar fashion, and has evidently been stuck down with secotine, which will necessitate the use of a tin opener. The case seems clear, does it not? And now, you see, I have you both nicely in the trap. It's a pity that you didn't take kindly to the idea of becoming Lady Peddler. I did not answer. I stood looking at him. There was the sound of feet on the stairs, the door was flung open, and Harry Rayburn was hustled into the room between two men. Sir Eustace flung me a look of triumph. According to plan, he said softly, you amateurs will pit yourselves against professionals. What's the meaning of this? cried Harry hoarsely. It means that you have walked into my parlour, said the spider to the fly, remarked Sir Eustace facetiously. My dear Rayburn, you are extraordinarily unlucky. You said I could come safely, Anne. Do not reproach her, my dear fellow. That note was written at my dictation, and the lady could not help herself. She would have been wiser not to write it, but I did not tell her so at the time. You followed her instructions, went to the curio shop, were taken through the secret passage from the back room, and found yourself in the hands of your enemies. 
Harry looked at me. I understood his glance and edged nearer to Sir Eustace. Yes, murmured the latter. Decidedly, you are not lucky. This is, let me see, the third encounter. You are right, said Harry. This is the third encounter. Twice you have worsted me. Have you never heard that the third time the luck changes? This is my round. Cover him, Anne. I was all ready. In a flash I had whipped the pistol out of my stocking and was holding it to his head. The two men guarding Harry sprang forward, but his voice stopped them. Another step, and he dies. If they come any nearer, Anne, pull the trigger. Don't hesitate. I shan't. I replied cheerfully. I'm rather afraid of pulling it anyway. I think Sir Eustace shared my fears. He was certainly shaking like a jelly. Stay where you are, he commanded, and the men stopped obediently. Tell them to leave the room, said Harry. Sir Eustace gave the order, the men filed out, and Harry shot the bolt across the door behind them. Now we can talk, he observed grimly and, coming across the room, he took the revolver out of my hand. Sir Eustace uttered a sigh of relief and wiped his forehead with a handkerchief. I'm shockingly out of condition, he observed. I think I must have a weak heart. I am glad that revolver is in competent hands. I didn't trust Miss Anne with it. Well, my young friend, as you say, now we can talk. I'm willing to admit that you stole a march upon me, where the devil that revolver came from, I don't know. I had the girl's luggage searched when she arrived. And where did you produce it from now? You hadn't got it on you a minute ago. Yes, I had, I replied. It was in my stocking. Oh, I don't know enough about women. I ought to have studied them more, said Sir Eustace sadly. I wonder if Paget would have known that. Harry rapped sharply on the table. Don't play the fool. If it weren't for your grey hairs, I'd throw you out of the window, you damned scoundrel. Grey hairs or no grey hairs, I... He advanced a step or two, and Sir Eustace skipped nimbly behind the table. The young are always so violent, he said reproachfully. Unable to use their brains, they rely solely on their muscles. Let us talk sense. For the moment, you have the upper hand, but that state of affairs cannot continue. The house is full of my men. You are hopelessly outnumbered. Your momentary ascendancy has been gained by an accident. Has it? Something in Harry's voice, a grim raillery, seemed to attract Sir Eustace's attention. He stared at him. Has it? said Harry again. Sit down, Sir Eustace, and listen to what I have to say. Still covering him with the revolver, he went on. The cards are against you this time. To begin with, listen to that. That was a dull banging at the door below. There were shouts, oaths, and then a sound of firing. Sir Eustace paled. What's that? Race and his people. You didn't know, did you, Sir Eustace, that Anne had an arrangement with me by which we should know whether communications from one to the other were genuine. Telegrams were to be signed Andy. Letters were to have the word and crossed out somewhere in them. Anne knew that your telegram was a fake. She came here of her own free will, walked deliberately into the snare in the hope that she might catch you in your own trap. Before leaving Kimberley, she wired both to me and to Race. Mrs. Blair has been in communication with us ever since. I received the letter written at your dictation, which was just what I expected. I had already discussed the probabilities of a secret passage leading out of the curio shop with Race, and he had discovered the place where the exit was situated. There was a screaming, tearing sound, and a heavy explosion which shook the room. They're shelling this part of the town. I must get you out of here, Anne. A bright light flared up. The house opposite was on fire. Sir Eustace had risen and was pacing up and down. Harry kept him covered with the revolver. So you see, Sir Eustace, the game is up. It was you yourself who very kindly provided us with the clue of your whereabouts. Race's men were watching the exit of the secret passage. 
In spite of the precautions you took, they were successful in following me here. Sir Eustace turned suddenly. Very clever, very creditable, but I've still a word to say. If I've lost the trick, so have you. You'll never be able to bring the murder of Nadina home to me. I was in Marlow on that day, that's all you've got against me. No one can prove that I even knew the woman, but you knew her. You had a motive for killing her, and your record's against you. You're a thief, remember? A thief! There's one thing you don't know, perhaps. I've got the diamonds, and here goes! With an incredibly swift movement, he stooped, swung up his arm, and threw. There was a tinkle of breaking glass as the object went through the window and disappeared into the blazing mass opposite. There goes your only hope of establishing your innocence over the Kimberley affair. And now we'll talk. I'll drive a bargain with you. You've got me cornered. Race will find all he needs in this house. There's a chance for me if I can get away. I'm done for if I stay, but so are you, young man. There's a skylight in the next room. A couple of minutes start and I shall be all right. I've got one or two little arrangements already made. You let me out of the way and give me a start, and I leave you a signed confession that I killed Nadina. Yes, Harry, I cried. Yes, yes, yes! He turned a stern face on me. No, Anne, a thousand times no. You don't know what you're saying. I do, it solves everything. I'd never be able to look race in the face again. I'll take my chance, but I'm damned if I'll let this slippery old fox get away. It's no good, Anne. I won't do it. Sir Eustace chuckled. He accepted defeat without the least emotion. Well, well, he remarked. You seem to have met your master, Anne but I can assure you both that moral rectitude does not always pay. There was a crash of rending wood, and footsteps surged up the stairs. Harry drew back the bolt. Colonel Race was the first to enter the room. His face lit at the sight of us. You're safe, Anne. I was afraid. He turned to Sir Eustace. I've been after you for a long time, peddler, and at last I've got you. Everybody seems to have gone completely mad, declared Sir Eustace airily. These young people have been threatening me with revolvers and accusing me of the most shocking things. I don't know what it's all about. Don't you? It means that I've found the Colonel. It means that on January 8th last you were not at Cannes, but at Marlow. It means that when your tool, Madame Nadina, turned against you, you planned to do away with her. And at last we shall be able to bring the crime home to you. Indeed? And from whom did you get all this interesting information? From the man who is even now being looked for by the police? His evidence will be very valuable. We have other evidence. There is someone else who knew that Nadina was going to meet you at the mill house. Sir Eustace looked surprised. Colonel Race made a gesture with his hand. Arthur Minx alias the Reverend Edward Chichester, alias Miss Pettigrew, stepped forward. He was pale and nervous, but he spoke clearly enough. I saw Nadina in Paris the night before she went over to England. I was posing at the time as a Russian count. She told me of her purpose. I warned her, knowing what kind of man she had to deal with, but she did not take my advice. There was a wireless message on the table. I read it. Afterwards, I thought I would have a try for the diamonds myself. In Johannesburg, Mr. Rayburn accosted me. He persuaded me to come over to his side. Sir Eustace looked at him. He said nothing, but Minx seemed visibly to wilt. Rats always leave a sinking ship, observed Sir Eustace. I don't care for rats. Sooner or later, I destroy vermin. There's just one thing I'd like to tell you, Sir Eustace, I remarked. That tin you threw out of the window didn't contain the diamonds. It had common pebbles in it. The diamonds are in a perfectly safe place. As a matter of fact, they're in the big giraffe's stomach. Suzanne hollowed it out, put the diamonds in with cotton wool so that they wouldn't rattle, and plugged it up again. Sir Eustace looked at me for some time. His reply was characteristic. I always did hate that blinking giraffe, he said. 
It must have been instinct. Chapter 34 We were not able to return to Johannesburg that night. The shells were coming over pretty fast, and I gathered that we were now more or less cut off, owing to the rebels having obtained possession of a new part of the suburbs. Our place of refuge was a farm some twenty miles or so from Johannesburg, right out on the veld. I was dropping with fatigue. All the excitement and anxiety of the last two days had left me little better than a limp rag. I kept repeating to myself, without being able to believe it, that our troubles were really over. Harry and I were together, and we should never be separated again. Yet all through I was conscious of some barrier between us, a constraint on his part, the reason of which I could not fathom. Sir Eustace had been driven off in an opposite direction, accompanied by a strong guard. He waved his hand airily to us on departing. I came out onto the stoop early on the following morning and looked across the feld in the direction of Johannesburg. I could see the great dumps glistening in the pale morning sunshine, and I could hear the low rumbling mutter of the guns. The revolution was not over yet. The farmer's wife came out and called me in to breakfast. She was a kind, motherly soul, and I was already very fond of her. Harry had gone out at dawn and had not yet returned, so she informed me. Again I felt a stir of uneasiness pass over me. What was this shadow of which I was so conscious between us? After breakfast I sat out on the stoop, a book in my hand which I did not read. I was so lost in my own thoughts that I never saw Colonel Race ride up and dismount from his horse. It was not until he said, Good morning, Anne, that I became aware of his presence. Oh, I said with a flush, it's you. Yes, may I sit down? He drew a chair up beside me. It was the first time we had been alone together since that day at the Matopos. As always, I felt that curious mixture of fascination and fear that he never failed to inspire in me. What is the news? I asked. Smuts will be in Johannesburg tomorrow. I give this outbreak three days more before it collapses utterly. In the meantime, the fighting goes on. I wish, I said, that one could be sure that the right people were the ones to get killed. I mean the ones who wanted to fight, not just all the poor people who happen to live in the parts where the fighting is going on. He nodded. I know what you mean, Anne. That's the unfairness of war. But I've other news for you. Yes? A confession of incompetency on my part. Peddler has managed to escape. What? Yes, no one knows how he managed it. He was securely locked up for the night in an upper-story room of one of the farms roundabouts which the military have taken over. But this morning the room was empty and the bird had flown. Secretly, I was rather pleased. Never to this day have I been able to rid myself of a sneaking fondness for Sir Eustace. I dare say it's reprehensible, but there it is. I admired him. He was a thoroughgoing villain, I dare say, but he was a pleasant one. I've never met anyone half so amusing since. I concealed my feelings, of course. Naturally, Colonel Race would feel quite differently about it. He wanted Sir Eustace brought to justice. There was nothing very surprising in his escape when one came to think of it. All round Joburg he must have innumerable spies and agents. And whatever Colonel Race might think, I was exceedingly doubtful that they would ever catch him. He probably had a well-planned line of retreat. Indeed, he had said as much to us. I expressed myself suitably, though in a rather lukewarm manner, and the conversation languished. Then Colonel Wace asked suddenly for Harry. I told him that he had gone off at dawn and that I hadn't seen him this morning. You understand, don't you, Anne, that apart from formalities, he is completely cleared. There are technicalities, of course, but Sir Eustace's guilt is well assured. There is nothing now to keep you apart. He said this without looking at me in a slow, jerky voice. I understand, I said gratefully. 
And there is no reason why he should not at once resume his real name. No, of course not. You know his real name. The question surprised me. Of course I do. Harry Lucas. He did not answer, and something in the quality of his silence struck me as peculiar. Anne, do you remember that as we drove home from the Metopos that day, I told you that I knew what I had to do? Of course I remember. I think that I may fairly say I have done it. The man you love is cleared of suspicion. Was that what you meant? Of course. I hung my head, ashamed of the baseless suspicion I had entertained. He spoke again in a thoughtful voice. When I was a mere youngster, I was in love with a girl who jilted me. After that, I thought only of my work. My career meant everything to me. Then I met you, Anne, and all that seemed worth nothing. But youth calls to youth. I've still got my work. I was silent. I suppose one can't really love two men at once, but you can feel like it. The magnetism of this man was very great. I looked up at him suddenly. I think that you'll go very far, I said dreamily. I think that you've got a great career ahead of you. You'll be one of the world's big men. I felt as though I was uttering a prophecy. I shall be alone, though. All the people who do really big things are. You think so? I'm sure of it. He took my hand and said in a low voice, I'd rather have had the other. Then Harry came striding round the corner of the house. Colonel Race rose. Good morning, Lucas, he said. For some reason, Harry flushed up to the roots of his hair. Yes, I said gaily, you must be known by your real name now. But Harry was still staring at Colonel Race. So you know, sir, he said at last. I never forget a face. I saw you once as a boy. What's all this about? I asked, puzzled, looking from one to the other. It seemed a conflict of wills between them. Race won. Harry turned slightly away. I suppose you're right, sir. Tell her my real name. Anne, this isn't Harry Lucas. Harry Lucas was killed in the war. This is John Harold Erdsley. Chapter 35 with his last words, Colonel Race had swung away and left us. I stood staring after him. Harry's voice recalled me to myself. Anne, forgive me. Say you forgive me. He took my hand in his, and almost mechanically I drew it away. Why did you deceive me? I don't know that I can make you understand. I was afraid of all that sort of thing, the power and fascination of wealth. I wanted you to care for me just for myself, for the man I was, without ornaments and trappings. You mean you didn't trust me? You can put it that way if you like, but it isn't quite true. I'd become embittered, suspicious, always prone to look for ulterior motives, and it was so wonderful to be cared for in the way you cared for me. I see, I said slowly. I was going over in my own mind the story he had told me. For the first time I noted discrepancies in it which I had disregarded, an assurance of money, the power to buy back the diamonds of Nadina, the way in which he had preferred to speak of both men from the point of view of an outsider. And when he had said, my friend, he had meant not Erdsley, but Lucas. It was Lucas, the quiet fellow, who had loved Nadina so deeply. How did it come about? I asked. We were both reckless, anxious to get killed. One night we exchanged identification discs for luck. Lucas was killed the next day, blown to pieces. I shuddered. But why didn't you tell me now, this morning? You couldn't have doubted my caring for you by this time. 
Anne, I didn't want to spoil it all. I wanted to take you back to the island. What's the good of money? It can't buy happiness. We'd have been happy on the island. I tell you, I'm afraid of that other life. It nearly rotted me through once. Did Sir Eustace know who you really were? Oh, yes. And Carton? No. He saw us both with Nadina at Kimberley one night, but he didn't know which was which. He accepted my statement that I was Lucas, and Nadina was deceived by his cable. She was never afraid of Lucas. He was a quiet chap, very deep. But I always had the devil's own temper. She'd have been scared out of her life if she'd known that I'd come to life again. Harry, if Colonel Race hadn't told me, what did you mean to do? Say nothing. Go on as Lucas. And your father's millions? Race was welcome to them. Anyway, he would make a better use of them than I ever shall. Anne, what are you thinking about? You're frowning so. I'm thinking, I said slowly, that I almost wish Colonel Race hadn't made you tell me. No, he was right. I owed you the truth. He paused, then said suddenly, You know, Anne, I'm jealous of race. He loves you too, and he's a bigger man than I am or ever shall be. I turned to him, laughing. Harry, you idiot. It's you I want, and that's all that matters. As soon as possible, we started for Cape Town. There Suzanne was waiting to greet me, and we disemboweled the big giraffe together. When the revolution was finally quelled, Colonel Race came down to Cape Town, and at his suggestion the big villa at Musenberg that had belonged to Sir Lawrence Erdsley was reopened and we all took up our abode in it. There we made our plans. I was to return to England with Suzanne and to be married from her house in London, and the trousseau was to be bought in Paris. Suzanne enjoyed planning all these details enormously, so did I, and yet the future seemed curiously unreal. And sometimes, without knowing why, I felt absolutely stifled, as though I couldn't breathe. It was the night before we were to sail. I couldn't sleep. I was miserable, and I didn't know why. I hated leaving Africa. When I came back to it, would it be the same thing? Would it ever be the same thing again? And then I was startled by an authoritative rap on the shutter. I sprang up. Harry was on the stop outside. Put some clothes on, Anne, and come out. I want to speak to you. I huddled on a few garments and stepped out into the cool night air, still and scented with its velvety feel. Harry beckoned me out of earshot of the house. His face looked pale and determined, and his eyes were blazing. Anne. Do you remember saying to me once that women enjoyed doing things they disliked for the sake of someone they liked? Yes, I said, wondering what was coming. He caught me in his arms. Anne, come away with me, now, tonight, back to Rhodesia, back to the island. I can't stand all this tomfoolery. I can't wait for you any longer. I disengaged myself a minute. And what about my French frocks? I lamented mockingly. To this day, Harry never knows when I'm in earnest and when I'm only teasing him. Damn your French frocks. Do you think I want to put frocks on you? I'm a damned sight more likely to want to tear them off you. I'm not going to let you go, do you hear? You're my woman. If I let you go away, I may lose you. I'm never sure of you. You're coming with me now, tonight, and damn everybody. He held me to him, kissing me until I could hardly breathe. I can't do without you any longer, Anne. I can't indeed. I hate all this money. Let race have it. Come on, let's go. My toothbrush? I demurred. You can buy one. I know I'm a lunatic, but for God's sake, come. He stalked off at a furious pace. I followed him as meekly as the Barozzi woman I had observed at the falls. Only I wasn't carrying a frying pan on my head. He walked so fast that it was very difficult to keep up with him. Harry, I said at last in a meek voice, are we going to walk all the way to Rhodesia? 
He turned suddenly and with a great shout of laughter gathered me up in his arms. I'm mad, sweetheart, I know it, but I do love you so. We're a couple of lunatics, and oh, Harry, you never asked me, but I'm not making a sacrifice at all. I wanted to come. Chapter 36 That was two years ago. We still live on the island. Before me, on the rough wooden table, is the letter that Suzanne wrote me. Dear babes in the wood, dear lunatics in love, I'm not surprised, not at all. All the time we've been talking Paris and frocks, I felt that it wasn't a bit real, that you'd vanish into the blue some day to be married over the tongs in the good old gypsy fashion. But you are a couple of lunatics. This idea of renouncing a vast fortune is absurd. Colonel Race wanted to argue the matter, but I have persuaded him to leave the argument to time. He can administer the estate for Harry, and none better, because, after all, honeymoons don't last forever. You're not here, Anne, so I can safely say that without having you fly out at me like a little wildcat, love in the wilderness will last a good while, but one day you will suddenly begin to dream of houses in Park Lane, sumptuous furs, Paris frocks, the largest thing in motors and the latest thing in perambulators, French maids and Norland nurses. Oh, yes, you will. But have your honeymoon, dear lunatics, and let it be a long one, and think of me sometimes comfortably putting on weight amidst the flesh pots. Your loving friend, Suzanne Blair. P.S. I am sending you an assortment of frying pans as a wedding present and an enormous terrine of pâté de foie gras to remind you of me. There is another letter that I sometimes read. It came a good while after the other and was accompanied by a bulky parcel. It appeared to be written from somewhere in Bolivia. My dear Anne Beddingfeld, I can't resist writing to you, not so much for the pleasure it gives me to write, as for the enormous pleasure I know it will give you to hear from me. Our friend Race wasn't quite as clever as he thought himself, was he? I think I shall appoint you my literary executor. I'm sending you my diary. There's nothing in it that would interest Race and his crowd, but I fancy that there are passages in it which may amuse you. Make use of it as you like. I suggest an article for the daily budget. Criminals I have met. I only stipulate that I shall be the central figure. By this time, I have no doubt that you are no longer Anne Beddingfeld, but Lady Erdsley, queening it in Park Lane. I should just like to say that I bear you no malice whatever. It is hard, of course, to have to begin all over again at my time of life, but entre nous... I had a little reserve fund carefully put aside for such a contingency. It has come in very usefully, and I am getting together a nice little connection. By the way, if you ever come across that funny friend of yours, Arthur Minx, just tell him that I haven't forgotten him, will you? That will give him a nasty jar. On the whole, I think I've displayed a most Christian and forgiving spirit, even to Paget. I happen to hear that he or rather Mrs. Paget, had brought a sixth child into the world the other day. England will be entirely populated by Paget soon. I sent the child a silver mug and, on a postcard, declared my willingness to act as godfather. I can see Paget taking both mug and postcard straight to Scotland Yard without a smile on his face. Bless you, Liquid Eyes. Some day you will see what a mistake you have made in not marrying me. Yours ever. Eustace Peddler. Harry was furious. It is the one point on which he and I do not see eye to eye. To him, Sir Eustace was the man who tried to murder me and whom he regards as responsible for the death of his friend. Sir Eustace's attempts on my life have always puzzled me. They're not in the picture, so to speak, for I am sure that he always had a genuinely kindly feeling towards me. Then why did he twice attempt to take my life? Harry says, because he's a damned scoundrel, and seems to think that settles the matter. Suzanne was more discriminating. I talked it over with her, and she put it down to a fear complex. Suzanne goes in, rather, for psychoanalysis, 
She pointed out to me that Sir Eustace's whole life was actuated by a desire to be safe and comfortable. He had an acute sense of self-preservation, and the murder of Nadina removed certain inhibitions. His actions did not represent the state of his feeling towards me, but were the result of his acute fears for his own safety. I think Suzanne is right. As for Nadina, she was the kind of woman who deserved to die. Men do all sorts of questionable things in order to get rich, but women shouldn't pretend to be in love when they aren't for ulterior motives. I can forgive Sir Eustace easily enough, but I shall never forgive Nadina. Never, never, never. The other day, I was unpacking some tins that were wrapped in bits of an old daily budget, and I suddenly came upon the words, The Man in the Brown Suit. How long ago it seemed. I had, of course, severed my connection with the daily budget long ago. I had done with it sooner than it had done with me. My romantic wedding was given a halo of publicity. My son is lying in the sun, kicking his legs. There's a man in a brown suit, if you like. He's wearing as little as possible, which is the best costume for Africa, and is as brown as a berry. He's always burrowing in the earth. I think he takes after Papa. He'll have that same mania for Pleistocene clay. Suzanne sent me a cable when he was born. Congratulations and love to the latest arrival on Lunatic's Island. Is his head dolichocephalic or brachycephalic? I wasn't going to stand that from Suzanne. I sent her a reply of one word, economical and to the point. Platycephalic. We hope you have enjoyed The Man in the Brown Suit by Agatha Christie, performed by Amelia Fox. Four fifty from Paddington, performed by Joan Hickson. Mrs. McGillicuddy panted along the platform in the wake of the porter carrying her suitcase. Mrs. McGillicuddy was short and stout. The porter was tall and free-striding. In addition, Mrs. McGillicuddy was burdened with a large quantity of parcels, the result of a day's Christmas shopping. The race was, therefore, an uneven one, and the porter turned the corner at the end of the platform whilst Mrs. McGillicuddy was still coming up the straight. Number one platform was not at the moment unduly crowded, since a train had just gone out, but in the no-man's land beyond, a milling crowd was rushing in several directions at once, to and from undergrounds, left luggage offices, tea rooms, inquiry offices, indicator boards, and the two outlets, arrival and departure, to the outside world. Mrs. McGillicuddy and her parcels were buffeted to and fro, but she arrived eventually at the entrance to number three platform, and deposited one parcel at her feet, while she searched her bag for the ticket that would enable her to pass a stern, uniformed guardian at the gate. At that moment a voice, raucous yet refined, burst into speech over her head. "'The train standing at Platform 3, the voice told her, "'is the 450 for Brackhampton, Milchester, Waverton, Carville Junction, Roxeter, and stations to Chadmouth. "'Passengers for Brackhampton and Milchester travel at the rear of the train. "'Passengers for Vainkey change at Roxeter.' "'The voice shut itself off with a click.' and then reopened conversation by announcing the arrival at Platform 9 of the 435 from Birmingham and Wolverhampton. Mrs. McGillicuddy found her ticket and presented it. The man clipped it and murmured, On the right, rear portion. Mrs. McGillicuddy padded up the platform and found her porter looking bored and staring into space outside the door of a third-class carriage. Here you are, lady. I'm travelling first class, said Mrs. McGillicuddy. You didn't say so, grumbled the porter. His eyes swept her masculine-looking pepper-and-salt tweed coat disparagingly. Mrs. McGillicuddy, who had said so, 
didn't argue the point. She was sadly out of breath. The porter retrieved the suitcase and marched with it to the adjoining coach, where Mrs. McGillicuddy was installed in solitary splendour. The 450 was not much patronised, the first-class clientele preferring either the faster morning express or the 640 with dining car. Mrs. McGillicuddy handed the porter his tip, which he received with disappointment, clearly considering it more applicable to third-class and to first-class travel. Mrs. McGillicuddy, though prepared to spend money on comfortable travel after a night journey from the north and a day's feverish shopping, was at no time an extravagant tipper. She settled herself back on the plush cushions with a sigh oh, and opened a magazine. Five minutes later, whistles blew and the train started. The magazine slipped from Mrs. McGillicuddy's hand. Her head dropped sideways. Three minutes later, she was asleep. She slept for 35 minutes and awoke refreshed. Resettling her hat, which had slipped askew, she sat up and looked out of the window at what she could see of the flying countryside. It was quite dark now, a dreary, misty December day. Christmas was only five days ahead. London had been dark and dreary. The country was no less so, though occasionally rendered cheerful with its constant clusters of lights as the train flashed through towns and stations. "'Serving last tea now,' said an attendant, whisking open the corridor door like a gin. Mrs. McGillicuddy had already partaken of tea at a large department store. She was for the moment amply nourished. The attendant went on down the corridor, uttering his monotonous cry. Mrs. McGillicuddy looked up at the rack where her various parcels reposed with a pleased expression. The face towels had been excellent value and just what Margaret wanted. The space gun for Robbie and the rabbit for Jean were highly satisfactory, and that evening coatee was just the thing she herself needed, warm but dressy. The pullover for Hector, too. Her mind dwelt with approval on the soundness of her purchases. Her satisfied gaze returned to the window. A train travelling in the opposite direction rushed by with a screech, making the windows rattle and causing her to start. The train clattered over points and passed through a station. Then it began suddenly to slow down, presumably in obedience to a signal. For some minutes it crawled along, then stopped, and presently began to move forward again. Another up train passed them, though with less vehemence than the first one. The train gathered speed again. At that moment, another train, also on the down line, swerved inwards towards them for a moment with almost alarming effect. For a time, the two trains ran parallel, now one gaining a little, now the other. Mrs. McGillicuddy looked from her window through the windows of the parallel carriages. Most of the blinds were down, but occasionally the occupants of the carriages were visible. The other train was not very full, and there were many empty carriages. At the moment when the two trains gave the illusion of being stationary, a blind in one of the carriages flew up with a snap. Mrs. McGillicuddy looked into the lighted first-class carriage that was only a few feet away. Then she drew her breath with a gasp and half rose to her feet. Standing with his back to the window and to her was a man. His hands were round the throat of a woman who faced him, and he was slowly, remorselessly, strangling her. Her eyes were starting from their sockets. Her face was purple and congested. As Mrs. McGillicuddy watched, fascinated, the end came. The body went limp and crumpled in the man's hands. At the same moment, Mrs. McGillicuddy's train slowed down again, and the other began to gain speed. It passed forward, and a moment or two later it had vanished from sight. Almost automatically, Mrs. McGillicuddy's hand went up to the communication cord, then paused, irresolute. After all, what use would it be ringing the cord of the train in which she was travelling? The horror of what she had seen at such close quarters and the unusual circumstances made her feel paralysed. Some immediate action was necessary. 
But what? The door of her compartment was drawn back and a ticket collector said, Ticket, please. Mrs. McGillicuddy turned to him with vehemence. A woman has been strangled, she said, in a train that has just passed. I saw it. The ticket collector looked at her doubtfully. I beg your pardon, madam? A man strangled a woman in a train. I saw it through there. She pointed to the window. The ticket collector looked extremely doubtful. Strangled, he said disbelievingly. Yes, strangled. I saw it, I tell you. You must do something at once. The ticket collector coughed apologetically. Well, uh, <clears throat> you don't think, madam, you may have had a little nap, and uh, he broke off tactfully. I have had a nap. But if you think this was a dream, you're quite wrong. I saw it, I tell you. The ticket collector's eyes dropped to the open magazine lying on the seat. On the exposed page was a girl being strangled while a man with a revolver threatened the pair from an open doorway. He said persuasively, Now, don't you think, madam, that you've been reading an exciting story? You just dropped off and awaking a little confused. But Mrs. McGillicuddy interrupted him. I saw it, she said. I was as wide awake as you are. And I looked out of the window into the window of the train alongside, and a man was strangling a woman. And what I want to know is, what are you going to do about it? Uh, well, madam, you're going to do something, I suppose. The ticket collector sighed reluctantly and glanced at his watch. We shall be in Brackhampton in exactly seven minutes. I'll report what you've told me. But in what direction was the train you mentioned going? This direction, of course. You don't suppose I'd have been able to see all this if a train had flashed past going in the other direction? The ticket collector looked as though he thought Mrs. McGillicuddy was quite capable of seeing anything anywhere as the fancy took her. But he remained polite. You can rely on me, madam, he said. I'll report your statement. Perhaps I might have your name and address, just in case. Mrs. McGillicuddy gave him the address where she would be staying for the next few days, and her permanent address in Scotland, and he wrote them down. Then he withdrew with the air of a man who has done his duty, and dealt successfully with a tiresome member of the travelling public. Mrs. McGillicuddy remained frowning and vaguely unsatisfied. Would the ticket collector really report her statement? Or had he just been soothing her down? There were, she supposed vaguely, a lot of elderly women travelling around, fully convinced that they had unmasked communist plots, were in danger of being murdered, saw flying saucers and secret spaceships, and reported murders that had never taken place. If the man dismissed her as one of those... The train was slowing down now, passing over points, and running through the bright lights of a large town. Mrs. McGillicuddy opened her handbag, pulled out a receipted bill, which was all that she could find, and wrote a rapid note on the back of it with her ballpoint pen, put it into a spare envelope that she fortunately happened to have, stuck the envelope down, and wrote on it. The train drew slowly into a crowded platform. The usual ubiquitous voice was intoning, The train now arriving at Platform 1 is a 538 for Milchester. Waverton, Roxeter, and stations to Chadmouth. Passengers for Market Basing take the train now waiting at number three platform. Number one bay for stopping train to Carberry. Mrs. McGillicuddy looked anxiously along the platform. So many passengers and so few porters. Ah, there was one. She hailed him authoritatively. Porter, please take this at once to the station master's office. She handed him the envelope and with it a shilling. Then, with a sigh, she leaned back. Well, she'd done what she could. Her mind lingered with an instant's regret on the shilling. Sixpence would really have been enough. Her mind went back to the scene she'd witnessed. Horrible! Quite horrible! She was a strong-nerved woman, but she shivered. What a strange, what a fantastic thing to happen to her! Elspeth McGillicuddy. If the blind of the carriage had not happened to fly up. But that, of course, was Providence. Providence had willed that she, 
Elspeth McGillicuddy should be the witness of the crime. Her lips set grimly. Voices shouted, whistles blew, doors were banged shut, and the 538 drew slowly out of Brackhampton Station. An hour and five minutes later, it stopped at Milchester. Mrs. McGillicuddy collected her parcels and her suitcase and got out. She peered up and down the platform. Her mind reiterated its former judgment. Not enough porters. Such porters as there were seemed to be engaged with mailbags and luggage vans. Passengers nowadays seemed always expected to carry their own cases. Well, she couldn't carry her suitcase and her umbrella and all her parcels. She would have to wait. In due course, she secured a porter. Taxi? There will be someone to meet me, I expect. Outside Milchester Station, a taxi driver who had been watching the exit came forward. He spoke in a soft local voice. Is this Mrs. McGillicuddy? For some Mary Mead? Mrs. McGillicuddy acknowledged her identity. The porter was recompensed adequately, if not handsomely. The car with Mrs. McGillicuddy, her suitcase and her parcels drove off into the night. It was a nine-mile drive. Sitting bolt upright in the car, Mrs. McGillicuddy was unable to relax. Her feelings yearned for expression. At last the taxi drove along the familiar village street and finally drew up at its destination. Mrs. McGillicuddy got out and walked up the brick path to the door. The driver deposited the cases inside as the door was opened by an elderly maid. Mrs. McGillicuddy passed straight through the hall to where, at the open sitting-room door, her hostess awaited her, an elderly, frail old lady. Elspeth! Jane! They kissed, and without preamble or circumlocution, Mrs. McGillicuddy burst into speech. Oh, Jane, she wailed, I've just seen a murder! True to the precepts handed down to her by her mother and grandmother, to wit, as a true lady, can neither be shocked or surprised. Miss Marple merely raised her eyebrows and shook her head, as she said, Most distressing for you, Elspeth, and surely most unusual. I think you'd better tell me about it at once. That was exactly what Mrs. McGillicuddy wanted to do. Allowing her hostess to draw her nearer to the fire, she sat down, pulled off her gloves, and plunged into a vivid narrative. Miss Marple listened with close attention. When Mrs. McGillicuddy at last forced for breath, Miss Marple spoke with decision. The best thing, I think, my dear, is for you to go upstairs and take off your hat and have a wash. Then we'll have supper, during which we'll not discuss this at all. And after supper, we can go into the matter thoroughly and discuss it from every aspect. Mrs. McGillicuddy concurred with this suggestion. The two ladies had supper, discussing as they ate various aspects of life as lived in the village of St. Mary Mead. Miss Marple commented on the general distrust of the new organist, related the recent scandal about the chemist's wife, and touched on the hostility between the schoolmistress and the village institute. They then discussed Miss Marple's and Mrs. McGillicuddy's gardens. Pianis, said Miss Marple as she rose from table, are most unaccountable. Either they do or they don't do, but if they do establish themselves, they are with you for life, so to speak, and really most beautiful varieties nowadays. They settled themselves by the fire again, and Miss Marple brought out two old Waterford glasses from a corner cupboard, and from another cupboard produced a bottle. No coffee for you tonight, Elspeth, she said. You are already overexcited, and no wonder, and probably wouldn't sleep. I prescribe a glass of my cowslip wine, and later perhaps a cup of chamomile tea. Mrs. McGillicuddy acquiescing in these arrangements, Miss Marple poured out the wine. Jane, said Mrs. McGillicuddy, as she took an appreciative sip. You don't think, do you, that I dreamt it or imagined it? Certainly not, said Miss Marple with warmth. Mrs. McGillicuddy heaved a sigh of relief. That ticket collector, she said, he thought so. Quite polite, but all the same. I think, Elspeth, 
that that was quite natural under the circumstances. It sounded, and indeed was, a most unlikely story. And you were a complete stranger to him. No, I have no doubt at all that you saw what you told me you saw. It's very extraordinary, but not at all impossible. I recollect myself being interested when a train ran parallel to one in which I was travelling to notice what a vivid and intimate picture one got of what was going on in one or two of the carriages. A little girl, I remember, playing with a teddy bear, and suddenly she threw it deliberately at a fat man who was asleep in the corner, and he bounced up and looked most indignant. And the other passenger looked so amused. I saw them all quite vividly. I could have described afterwards exactly what they looked like and what they had on. Mrs. McGillicuddy nodded gratefully. That's just how it was. The man had his back to you, you say, so you didn't see his face. No. And the woman, you can describe her. Young, old, youngish, between thirty and thirty-five, I should think. I couldn't say closer than that. Good-looking. Ugh, that again, I couldn't say. Her face, you see, was all contorted, and... Miss Marple said quickly, Yes, oh yes, I quite understand. How was she dressed? She had on a fur coat of some kind, a palish fur, no hat. Her hair was blonde. And there was nothing distinctive that you can remember about the man? Mrs. McGillicuddy took a little time to think carefully before she replied, he was tallish and dark, I think. He had a heavy coat on, so that I couldn't judge his build very well. She added despondently, It's not really very much to go on. It's something, said Miss Marple. She paused before saying, You feel quite sure in your own mind that the girl was dead. She was dead, I'm sure of it. Her tongue came out and... Uh, well, I'd rather not talk about it. Of course not, of course not, said Miss Marvel quickly. We shall know more, I expect, in the morning. In the morning? I should imagine it'll be in the morning papers. After this man had attacked and killed her, he would have a body on his hands. Now, what would he do? Presumably, he would leave the train quickly at the first station. Oh, by the way, can you remember if it was a corridor carriage? No, it was not. That seems to point to a train that was not going far afield. It would almost certainly stop at Brackhampton. Let us say he leaves the train at Brackhampton, perhaps arranging the body in a corner seat with the face hidden by the fur collar to delay discovery. Yes, I think that's what he'd do, but of course it will be discovered before very long. And I should imagine that the news of a murdered woman discovered on a train would be almost certain to be in the morning papers. Well, we shall see. But it was not in the morning papers. Miss Marple and Mrs. McGillicuddy, after making sure of this, finished their breakfast in silence. Both were reflecting. After breakfast, they took a turn round the garden. But this, usually an absorbing pastime, was today somewhat half-hearted. Miss Marple did indeed call attention to some new and rare species she had acquired for her rock garden, but she did so in an almost absent-minded manner, and Mrs. McGillicuddy did not, as was customary, counter-attack with a list of her own recent acquisitions. "'The garden is not looking at all as it should,' said Miss Marple, "'but still speaking absent-mindedly. "'Dr. Haydock has absolutely forbidden me to do any stooping or kneeling, "'and really, what can you do if you don't stoop or kneel? "'There's old Edwards, of course, but so opinionated. "'And all this jobbing gets them into bad habits. "'Lots of cups of tea and so much pottering. "'Not any real work.' Oh, I know, said Mrs. McGillicuddy. Of course, there's no question of my being forbidden to stoop. But really, especially after meals and having put on weight, she looked down at her ample proportions, it does bring on heartburn. There was silence. And then Mrs. McGillicuddy planted her feet sturdily, stood still and turned on her friend. Well, 
she said. It was a small, insignificant word, but it acquired full significance from Mrs. McGillicuddy's tone, and Miss Marple understood its meaning perfectly. I know, she said. The two ladies looked at each other. I think, said Miss Marple, we might walk down to the police station and talk to Sergeant Cornish. He's intelligent and patient, and I know him very well, and he knows me. I think he'll listen and pass the information on to the proper quarter. Accordingly, some three quarters of an hour later, Miss Marple and Mrs. McGillicuddy were talking to a fresh-faced, grave man between thirty and forty, who listened attentively to what they had to say. Frank Cornish received Miss Marple with cordiality and even deference. He set chairs for the two ladies and said, Now, what can we do for you, Miss Marple? Miss Marple said, I would like you, please, to listen to my friend Mrs. McGillicuddy's story. And Sergeant Cornish had listened. At the close of the recital, he remained silent for a moment or two. Then he said, That's a very extraordinary story. His eyes, without seeming to do so, had sized Mrs. McGillicuddy up while she was telling it. On the whole, he was favourably impressed. A sensible woman, able to tell a story clearly, not so far as he could judge an over-imaginative or hysterical woman. Moreover, Miss Marple, so it seemed, believed in the accuracy of her friend's story and he knew all about Miss Marple. Everybody in St Mary Mead knew Miss Marple. Fluffy and dithery in appearance, but inwardly as sharp and as shrewd as they make them. He cleared his throat and spoke. Well, uh, <clears throat> of course, he said, you may have been mistaken. I'm not saying you were mine, but you may have been. There's a lot of horseplay goes on. It mayn't have been serious or fatal. I know what I saw, said Mrs. McGillicuddy grimly. And you won't budge from it, thought Frank Cornish, and I'd say that likely or unlikely you may be right. Aloud, he said, you reported it to the railway officials and you've come and reported it to me. That's the proper procedure and you may rely on me to have inquiries instituted. She stopped. Miss Marple nodded her head gently, satisfied. Mrs. McGillicuddy was not quite so satisfied, but she didn't say anything. Sergeant Cornish addressed Miss Marple, not so much because he wanted her ideas, as because he wanted to hear what she would say. Granted the facts are as reported, he said, but what do you think has happened to the body? There seem to be only two possibilities, said Miss Marple, without hesitation. The most likely one, of course, is that the body was left in the train. But that seems improbable now, for it would have been found some time last night by another traveller, or by the railway staff, or at the train's ultimate destination. Frank Cornish nodded. The only other course open to the murderer would be to push the body out of the train onto the line. Must, I suppose, be still on the track somewhere as yet undiscovered. Though that does seem a little unlikely. But there would be, as far as I can see, no other way of dealing with it. You read about bodies being put in trunks, said Mrs. McGillicuddy, but no one travels with trunks nowadays, only suitcases, and you couldn't get a body into a suitcase. Yes, said Cornish, I agree with you both. The body, if there is a body, ought to have been discovered by now, or will be very soon. I'll let you know any developments there are, though I dare say you'll read about them in the papers. There's a possibility, of course, that the woman... Though savagely attacked, was not actually dead. She may have been able to leave the train on her own feet. Hardly without assistance, said Miss Marple, and if so, it will have been noticed. A man supporting a woman whom he says is ill. Yes, it will have been noticed, said Cornish. Or if a woman was found unconscious or ill in a carriage and was removed to hospital, that too will be on record. I think you may rest assured that you'll hear about it all in a very short time. But that day passed, and the next day. On that evening, Miss Marple received a note from Sergeant Cornish. In regard to the matter on which you consulted me, full inquiries have been made with no result. No woman's body has been found. 
No hospital has administered treatment to a woman such as you describe, and no case of a woman suffering from shock or taken ill or leaving a station supported by a man has been observed. You may take it that the foolish inquiries have been made. I suggest that your friend may have witnessed a scene such as she described, but it was much less serious than she supposed. Less serious? Fiddlestick, said Mrs. McGillicuddy. It was murder. She looked defiantly at Miss Marple, and Miss Marple looked back at her. Go on, Jane, said Mrs. McGillicuddy. Say it was all a mistake. Say I imagined the whole thing. That's what you think now, isn't it? Anyone can be mistaken, Miss Marple pointed out gently. Anybody else, but even you. I think we must bear that in mind, but I still think you know that you were most probably not mistaken. You used glasses for reading, but you got very good far sight, and what you saw impressed you very powerfully. You were definitely suffering from a shock when you arrived here. It's a thing I shall never forget, said Mrs. McGillicuddy with a shudder. The trouble is, I don't see what I can do about it. I don't think, said Miss Marple thoughtfully, that there's anything more you can do about it. If Mrs. McGillicuddy had been alert to the tones of her friend's voice, she might have noticed a very faint stress laid on the you. You've reported what you saw to the railway people and to the police. No, there's nothing more that you can do. Well, that's a relief in a way, said Mrs. McGillicuddy, because, as you know, I'm going out to Salon immediately after Christmas to stay with Roderick, and I certainly do not want to put that visit off. I've been looking forward to it so much. Of course, I... I would put it off if I thought it was my duty, she added conscientiously. I'm sure you would, Elspeth, but as I say, I consider you've done everything you possibly could do. It's up to the police, said Mrs. McGillicuddy, and if the police choose to be stupid... Miss Marple shook her head decisively. Oh, no, she said, the police aren't stupid, and that makes it interesting, doesn't it? Mrs. McGillicuddy looked at her without comprehension. And Miss Marple reaffirmed her judgment of her friend as a woman of excellent principles and no imagination. One wants to know, said Miss Marple, what really happened. She was killed. Yes, but who killed her and why? And what happened to her body? Where is it now? That's the business of the police to find out. Exactly. And they haven't found out. That means, doesn't it, that the man was clever. Very clever. I can't imagine, you know, said Miss Marple, knitting her brows, how he disposed of it. You kill a woman in a fit of passion. It must have been unpremeditated. You never choose to kill a woman in such circumstances just a few minutes before running into a big station. No, it must have been a quarrel. Jealousy. Something of that kind. You strangle her, and there you are, as I say, with a dead body on your hands, on the point of running into a station. What could you do, except, as I said at first, prop the body up in a corner, as though asleep, hiding the face, and then yourself leave the train as quickly as possible? I don't see any other possibility. Yet there must have been one. Miss Marple lost herself in thought. Mrs. McGillicuddy spoke to her twice before Miss Marple answered. You're getting deaf, Jane. Just a little, perhaps. People don't seem to me to enunciate their words as clearly as they used to do, but it wasn't that I didn't hear you. I'm afraid I wasn't paying attention. I just asked about the trains to London tomorrow. Would the afternoon be all right? I'm going to Margaret's, and she isn't expecting me before tea time. I wonder, Elspeth, if you would mind going up by the 12.15. We could have an early lunch. Of course, and Miss Marple went on drowning her friend's words. And I wonder, too, if Margaret would mind if you didn't arrive for tea, if you arrived about seven, perhaps. Mrs. McGillicuddy looked at her friend curiously. What's on your mind, Jane? I suggest, Elspeth, that I should travel up to London with you, and that we should travel down again as far as Brackhampton in the train that you travelled by the other day. You would then return to London from Brackhampton, and I would come on here as you did. 
I, of course, would pay the fares, Miss Marple stressed the point firmly. Mrs. McGillicuddy ignored the financial aspect. What on earth do you expect, Jane? she asked. Another murder? Certainly not, said Miss Marple, shocked. But I confess I should like to see for myself, under your guidance, the, uh, the really, it's most difficult to find the correct term, the terrain of the crime. So accordingly, on the following day, Miss Marple and Mrs. McGillicuddy found themselves in two opposite corners of a first-class carriage speeding out of London by the 450 from Paddington. Paddington had been even more crowded than on the preceding Friday, as there were now only two days to go before Christmas, but the 450 was comparatively peaceful, at any rate in the rear portion. On this occasion no train grew level with them, or they with another train. At intervals, trains flashed past them towards London. On two occasions, trains flashed past them the other way, going at high speed. At intervals, Mrs. McGillicuddy consulted her watch doubtfully. It's hard to tell just when we'd pass through a station I know. But they were continually passing through stations. We are due in Brackhampton in five minutes, said Miss Marple. A ticket collector appeared in the doorway. Miss Marple raised her eyes interrogatively. Mrs. McGillicuddy shook her head. It was not the same ticket collector. He clipped their tickets and passed on, staggering just a little as the train swung round a long curve. It slackened speed as it did so. I expect we're coming into Brackhampton, said Mrs. McGillicuddy. We're getting into the outskirts, I think, said Miss Marple. There were lights flashing past outside, buildings, an occasional glimpse of streets and trams. Their speed slackened further. They began crossing points. We'll be there in a minute, said Mrs. McGillicuddy, and I can't really see this journey has been any good at all. Has it suggested anything to you, Jane? I'm afraid not, said Miss Marple in a rather doubtful voice. A sad waste of good money, said Mrs. McGillicuddy but with less disapproval than she would have used had she been paying for herself. Miss Marple had been quite adamant on that point. All the same, said Miss Marple, one likes to see with one's own eyes where the thing happened. This train's just a few minutes late. Was yours on time on Friday? I think so. I didn't really notice. The train drew slowly into the busy length of Brackhampton Station. The loudspeaker announced hoarsely, doors opened and shut, people got in and out, milled up and down the platform. It was a busy, crowded scene. Easy, thought Miss Marble, for a murderer to merge into that crowd, to leave the station in the midst of that pressing mass of people, or even to select another carriage and go on in the train to whatever its ultimate destination might be. Easy to be one male passenger amongst many but not so easy to make a body vanish into thin air. That body must be somewhere. Mrs. McGillicuddy had descended. She spoke now from the platform through the open window. Now, take care of yourself, Jane, she said. Don't catch a chill. It's a nasty, treacherous time of year, and you're not so young as you were. I know, said Miss Marple. And don't let's worry ourselves any more over all this. We've done what we could. Miss Marple nodded and said, Now don't stand about in the cold, Elspeth, or you'll be the one to catch a chill. Go and get yourself a good hot cup of tea in the refreshment room. You've got time, twelve minutes before your train back to town. I think perhaps I will. Goodbye, Jane. Goodbye, Elspeth, and a happy Christmas to you. I hope you find Margaret well. Enjoy yourself in Salon, and give my love to dear Roderick, if he remembers me at all, which I doubt. Of course he remembers you. Very well. You helped him in some way when he was at school. Or with something to do with money that was disappearing from a locker. He's never forgotten it. Oh, that, said Miss Marple. Mrs. McGillicuddy turned away. A whistle blew. The train began to move. Miss Marple watched the sturdy, thick-set body of her friend recede. Elspeth could go to Salon with a clear conscience. She'd done her duty. 
and was freed from further obligation. Miss Marple didn't lean back as the train gathered speed. Instead, she sat upright and devoted herself seriously to thought. Though in speech Miss Marple was woolly and diffuse, in mind she was clear and sharp. She had a problem to solve, the problem of her own future conduct. And perhaps, strangely, it presented itself to her as it had to Mrs McGillicuddy, as a question of duty. Mrs McGillicuddy had said that they both done all that they could do. It was true of Mrs McGillicuddy, but, but about herself Miss Marple didn't feel so sure. It was a question, sometimes, of using one's special gifts. But perhaps that was conceited. After all, what could she do? Her friend's words came back to her, You're not as young as you were. Dispassionately, like a general planning a campaign or an accountant assessing a business, Miss Marple weighed up and set down in her mind the facts for and against further enterprise. On the credit side were the following. One, my long experience of life and human nature. Two, Sir Henry Clithering and his godson, now at Scotland Yard, I believe, who was so very nice in the little paddock's case. Three, my nephew Raymond's second boy, David, who is, I'm almost sure, in British Railways. Four, Griselda's boy Leonard, who is so very knowledgeable about maps. Miss Marble reviewed these assets and approved them. They were all very necessary to reinforce the weaknesses on the debit side, in particular her own bodily weakness. It's not, thought Miss Marple, as though I could go here, there and everywhere, making inquiries and finding out things. Yes, that was the chief objection, her own age and weakness. Although for her age her health was good, yet she was old. And if Dr. Haydock had strictly forbidden her to do practical gardening, he would hardly approve of her starting out to track down a murderer. For that, in effect, was what she was planning to do. And it was there that her loophole lay. For if heretofore murder had, so to speak, been forced upon her, in this case it would be that she herself set out deliberately to seek it. And she was not sure that she wanted to do so. She was old. Old and tired. She felt at this moment at the end of a tiring day a great reluctance to enter upon any project at all. She wanted nothing at all but to reach home and sit by the fire with a nice tray of supper, and go to bed and potter about the next day, just snipping off a few things in the garden, tidying up in a very mild way, without stooping, without exerting herself. I'm too old for any more adventure, said Miss Marple to herself, watching absently out of the window the curving line of an embankment. A curve. Very faintly something stirred in her mind. Just after the ticket collector clipped their tickets. Suggested an idea. Only an idea. An entirely different idea. A little pink flush came into Miss Marple's face. Suddenly she didn't feel tired at all. I'll write to David tomorrow morning, she said to herself. And at the same time another valuable asset flashed through her mind. Of course, my faithful Florence. Miss Marple set about her plan of campaign methodically and making due allowance for the Christmas season, which was a definitely retarding factor. She wrote to her great-nephew David West, combining Christmas wishes with an urgent request for information. Fortunately, she was invited, as on previous years, to the vicarage for Christmas dinner, and here she was able to tackle young Leonard, home for the Christmas season, about maps. Maps of all kinds were Leonard's passion. The reason for the old lady's inquiry about a large-scale map of a particular area didn't rouse his curiosity. He discoursed on maps generally with fluency, and wrote down for her exactly what would suit her purpose best. In fact, he did better. He actually found that he had such a map amongst his collection, and he lent it to her, Miss Marple promising to take great care of it and return it in due course. 
Nap, said his mother, Griselda, who still, although she had a grown-up son, looked strangely young and blooming to be inhabiting the shabby old vicarage. What does she want with maps? I mean, what does she want them for? I don't know, said young Leonard. I don't think she said exactly. I wonder now, said Griselda. It seems very fishy to me. At her age, the old pet ought to give up that sort of thing. Leonard asked what sort of thing, and Griselda said elusively, Oh, well, poking her nose into things. Why maps, I wonder? In due course, Miss Marple received a letter from her great-nephew, David West. It ran affectionately, Dear Aunt Jane, now what are you up to? I've got the information you wanted. There are only two trains that can possibly apply, the 4.33 and the 5 o'clock. The former is a slow train and stops at Hailing Broadway, Barwell Heath, Brackhampton, and then stations to Market Beijing. The five o'clock is the Welsh Express for Cardiff, Newport, and Swansea. The former might be overtaken somewhere by the 4.50, though it's due in Brackhampton five minutes earlier, and the latter passes the 4.50 just before Brackhampton. In all this, do I smell some village scandal of a fruity character? Did you, returning from a shopping spree in town by the 450, observe in a passing train the mayor's wife being embraced by the sanitary inspector? But why does it matter which train it was? A weekend at Porth Call, perhaps. Thank you for the pullover. That's what I wanted. How's the garden? Not very active this time of year, I should imagine. Yours ever, David. Miss Marple smiled a little, then considered the information thus presented to her. Mrs. McGillicuddy had said definitely that the carriage had not been a corridor one, therefore not the Swansea Express. The 4.33 was indicated. Also, some more travelling seemed unavoidable. Miss Marple sighed, but made her plans. She went up to London as before on the 12.15, but this time returned not by the 4.50, but by the 4.33, as far as Brackhampton. The journey was uneventful, but she registered certain details. The train was not crowded. 4.33 was before the evening rush hour. Of the first-class carriages, only one had an occupant, a very old gentleman reading The New Statesman. Miss Marple travelled in an empty compartment, and at the two stops, Hailing Broadway and Barwell Heath, leaned out of the window to observe passengers entering and leaving the train. A small number of third-class passengers got in at Hailing Broadway. At Barwell Heath, several third-class passengers got out. Nobody entered or left a first-class carriage except the old gentleman carrying his new statesman. As the train neared Brackhampton, sweeping around a curve of line, Miss Marple rose to her feet and stood experimentally with her back to the window over which she had drawn down the blind. Yes, she decided, the impetus of the sudden curving of the line and the slackening of speed did throw one off one's balance back against the window, and the blind might in consequence very easily fly up. She peered out into the night. It was lighter than it had been when Mrs. McGillicuddy had made the same journey, only just dark, but there was little to see. For observation, she must make a daylight journey. On the next day, she went up by the early morning train, purchased four linen pillowcases, tut-tutting at the price, so as to combine investigation with the provision of household necessities, and returned by a train leaving Paddington at 12.15. Again she was alone in a first-class carriage. This taxation, thought Miss Marple, that's what it is. No one can afford to travel first-class, except businessmen in the rush hours. I suppose because they can charge it to expenses. About a quarter of an hour before the train was due at Brackhampton, Miss Marple got out the map with which Leonard had supplied her and began to observe the countryside. She had studied the map very carefully beforehand, and after noting the name of a station they passed through, she was soon able to identify where she was, just as the train began to slacken for a curve. 
It was a very considerable curve indeed. Miss Marple, her nose glued to the window, studied the ground beneath her. The train was running on a fairly high embankment. With close attention, she divided her attention between the country outside and her map until the train finally ran into Brackhampton. That night she wrote and posted a letter addressed to Miss Florence Hill, 4 Madison Road, Brackhampton. On the following morning, going to the county library, she studied a Brackhampton directory and gazetteer and a county history. Nothing so far had contradicted the very faint and sketchy idea that had come to her. What she had imagined was possible. She would go no further than that. But the next step involved action, a good deal of action, the kind of action for which she herself was physically unfit. If the theory were to be definitely proved or disproved, she must at this point have help from some other person. The question was, who? Miss Marple reviewed various names and possibilities, rejecting them all with a vexed shake of the head. The intelligent people on whose intelligence she could rely were all far too busy. Not only had they all got jobs of varying importance, their leisure hours were usually apportioned long beforehand. The unintelligent who had time on their hands was simply, Miss Marple decided, no good. She pondered in growing vexation and perplexity. Then suddenly her forehead cleared. She ejaculated a louder name. Of course, said Miss Marple. Lucy Islesbarrow. The name of Lucy Islesbarrow had already made itself felt in certain circles. Lucy Islesbarrow was thirty-two. She had taken a first in mathematics at Oxford, was acknowledged to have a brilliant mind, and was confidently expected to take up a distinguished academic career. But Lucy Islesbarrow, in addition to a scholarly brilliance, had a core of good, sound, common sense. She couldn't fail to observe that a life of academic distinction was singularly ill-rewarded. She had no desire whatever to teach, and she took pleasure in contacts with minds much less brilliant than her own. In short, she had a taste for people, all sorts of people, and not the same people the whole time. She also, quite frankly, liked money. To gain money, one must exploit shortage. Lucy Islesbarrow hit at once upon a very serious shortage, the shortage of any kind of skilled domestic labour. To the amazement of her friends and fellow scholars, Lucy Islesbarrow entered the field of domestic labour. Her success was immediate and assured. By now, after a lapse of some years, she was known all over the British Isles. It was quite customary for wives to say joyfully to husbands, It'll be all right. I can go with you to the States. I've got Lucy Islesbarrow. The point of Lucy Islesbarrow was that once she came into a house, all worry, anxiety and hard work went out of it. Lucy Islesbarrow did everything, saw to everything, arranged everything. She was unbelievably competent in every conceivable sphere. She looked after elderly parents, accepted the care of young children, nursed the sickly, cooked divinely, got on well with any old crusted servants there might happen to be. There usually weren't. Was tactful with impossible people, soothed habitual drunkards, was wonderful with dogs. Best of all, she never minded what she did. She scrubbed the kitchen floor, dug in the garden, cleaned up dog messes, and carried coals. One of her rules was never to accept an engagement for any long length of time. A fortnight was her usual period. A month at most under exceptional circumstances. For that fortnight you had to pay the earth, but during that fortnight your life was heaven. You could relax completely, go abroad, Stay at home, do as you pleased, secure that all was going well on the home front in Lucy Islesbarrow's capable hands. Naturally, the demand for her services were enormous. She could have booked herself up if she chose for about three years ahead. 
She'd been offered enormous sums to go as a permanency. But Lucy had no intention of being a permanency, nor would she book herself for more than six months ahead. And within that period, unknown to her clamouring clients, she always kept certain free periods which enabled her either to take a short, luxurious holiday, since she spent nothing otherwise and was handsomely paid and kept, or to accept any position at short notice that happened to take her fancy either by reason of its character or because she liked the people. Since she was now at liberty to pick and choose amongst the vociferous claimants for her services, she went very largely by personal liking. Mere riches wouldn't buy you the services of Lucy Islesbury. She could pick and choose, and she did pick and choose. She enjoyed her life very much and found in it a continual source of entertainment. Lucy Isles Barrow read and re-read the letter from Miss Marple. She had made Miss Marple's acquaintance two years ago when her services had been retained by Raymond West, the novelist, to go and look after his old aunt, who was recovering from pneumonia. Lucy had accepted the job and had gone down to St Mary Mead. She had liked Miss Marple very much. As for Miss Marple, once she had caught a glimpse out of her bedroom window of Lucy Islesbarrow really trenching for sweet peas in the proper way, she had leaned back on her pillows with a sigh of relief, eaten the tempting little meals that Lucy Islesbarrow had brought to her, and listened, agreeably surprised, to the tales told by her elderly, irascible maidservant of how I taught that Miss Islesbarrow a crochet pattern, what she'd never heard of proper grateful she was, and had surprised her doctor by the rapidity of her convalescence. Miss Marple wrote, asking if Miss Islesbarrow could undertake a certain task for her, rather an unusual one. Perhaps Miss Islesbarrow could arrange a meeting at which they could discuss the matter. Lucy Islesbarrow frowned for a moment or two as she considered. She was in reality fully booked up. But the word unusual, and her recollection of Miss Marple's personality, carried the day, and she rang up Miss Marple straight away, explaining that she couldn't come down to St Mary Mead, as she was at that moment working, but that she was free from two to four on the following afternoon, and could meet Miss Marple anywhere in London. She suggested her own club a rather nondescript establishment, which had the advantage of having several small dark writing rooms, which were usually empty. Miss Marple accepted the suggestion, and on the following day the meeting took place. Greetings were exchanged. Lucy Islesbarrow led her guest to the gloomiest of the writing rooms and said, "'I am afraid I am rather booked up just at present, but perhaps you will tell me what it is you want me to undertake.' It's very simple, really, said Miss Marple. Unusual, but simple. I want you to find a body. For a moment, the suspicion crossed Lucy's mind that Miss Marple was mentally unhinged, but she rejected the idea. Miss Marple was eminently sane. She meant exactly what she had said. What kind of a body? asked Lucy Owlsparrow with admirable composure. A woman's body, said Miss Marple, the body of a woman who was murdered, strangled, actually, in a train. Lucy's eyebrows rose slightly. Well, that's certainly unusual. Tell me about it. Miss Marple told her. Lucy Owlsbarrow listened attentively without interrupting. At the end, she said, It all depends on what your friend saw or thought she saw. She left the sentence unfinished with a question in it. Elspeth McGillicuddy doesn't imagine things, said Miss Marple. That's why I'm relying on what she said. If it had been Dorothy Cartwright now, it would have been quite a different matter. Dorothy always has a good story and quite often believes it herself, and there is usually a kind of basis of truth, but certainly no more. But Elspeth is the kind of woman who finds it very hard to make herself believe that anything at all extraordinary or out of the way could happen. She's most unsuggestible, rather like granite. I see, said Lucy thoughtfully. Well, let's accept it all. Where do I come in? 
"'I was very much impressed by you,' said Miss Marple, "'and you see I haven't got the physical strength nowadays "'to get about and do things. "'You want me to make inquiries, that sort of thing? "'But won't the police have done all that? "'Or do you think that they've just been slack?' "'Oh, no,' said Miss Marple, "'they haven't been slack. "'It's just that I've got a theory about the woman's body. "'It's got to be somewhere.' If it wasn't found in the train, then it must have been pushed or thrown out of the train, but it hasn't been discovered anywhere on the line. So I travelled down the same way to see if there was anywhere where the body could have been thrown off the train, and yet wouldn't have been found on the line. And there was. The railway line makes a big curve before getting into Brackhampton on the edge of a high embankment. If a body were thrown out there when the train was leaning at an angle, I think it would pitch right down the embankment. But surely it would still be found, even there. Oh, yes, it would have to be taken away, but we'll come to that presently. Now, here's the place on this map. Lucy bent to study where Miss Marple's finger pointed. "'It's right in the outskirts of Brackhampton now,' said Miss Marple, "'but originally it was a country house with extensive park and grounds, "'and it's still there, untouched, "'ringed round now with building estates and small suburban houses. "'It's called Rutherford Hall. It "'Was built by a man called Crackenthorpe, "'a very rich manufacturer, in 1884. The original Crackenthorpe's son, an elderly man, is still living there with, I understand, a daughter. The railway encircles quite half of the property. And you want me to do what? Miss Marple replied promptly, I want you to get a post there. Everyone is crying out for efficient domestic help. I, I should not imagine it would be difficult. No, I don't suppose it would be difficult. I understand that Mr. Crackenthorpe is said locally to be somewhat of a miser. If you accept a low salary, I will make it up to the proper figure, which should, I think, be rather more than the current rate. Because of the difficulty. Not the difficulty so much as the danger. It might, you know, be dangerous. It's only right to warn you of that. I don't know, said Lucy pensively, that the idea of danger would deter me. I didn't think it would, said Miss Marple. You're not that kind of person. I dare say you thought it might even attract me. I've encountered very little danger in my life, but do you really believe it might be dangerous? Somebody, Miss Marple pointed out, has committed a very successful crime. There's been no hue and cry. No real suspicion. Two elderly ladies have told a rather improbable story. The police have investigated it and found nothing in it. So everything is nice and quiet. I don't think that this somebody, whoever he may be, will care about the matter being raked up, especially if you are successful. What do I look for exactly? Any signs along the embankment? A scrap of clothing, broken bushes, that kind of thing. Lucy nodded. And then? I shall be quite close at hand, said Miss Marple. An old maid servant of mine, my faithful Florence, lives in Brackhampton. She's looked after her old parents for years. They are now both dead, and she takes in lodgers, all most respectable people. She's arranged for me to have rooms with her. She will look after me most devotedly and I feel I should like to be close at hand. I would suggest that you mention you have an elderly aunt living in the neighbourhood, and that you want a post within easy distance of her, and also that you stipulate for a reasonable amount of spare time so that you can go and see her often. Again, Lucy nodded. I was going to Taormina the day after tomorrow. She said the holiday can wait, but I only promised three weeks. After that, I'm booked up. Three weeks should be ample, said Miss Marple. If we can't find out anything in three weeks, we might as well give up the whole thing as a mare's nest. Miss Marple departed, and Lucy, after a moment's reflection, rang up a registry office in Brackhampton, the manageress of which she knew very well. 
She explained her desire for a post in the neighbourhood, so as to be near her aunt. After turning down, with a little difficulty and a good deal of ingenuity, several more desirable places, Rutherford Hall was mentioned. "'That sounds exactly what I want,' said Lucy firmly. The registry office rang up Miss Crackenthorpe. Miss Crackenthorpe rang up Lucy. Two days later, Lucy left London en route for Rutherford Hall. Driving her own small car, Lucy Isbarrow drove through an imposing pair of vast iron gates. Just inside them was what had originally been a small lodge, which now seemed completely derelict. Whether through war damage or merely through neglect, it was difficult to be sure. A long winding drive led through large, gloomy clumps of rhododendrons up to the house. Lucy caught her breath in a slight gasp when she saw the house, which was a kind of miniature Windsor Castle. The stone steps in front of the door could have done with attention, and the gravel sweep was green with neglected weeds. She pulled an old-fashioned wrought-iron bell, and its clamour sounded echoing away inside. A slatternly woman, wiping her hands on her apron, opened the door and looked at her suspiciously. "'Expected, aren't you?' she said. "'Miss Something Barrow,' she told me. "'Quite right,' said Lucy. The house was desperately cold inside. Her guide led her along a dark hall and opened a door on the right. Rather to Lucy's surprise, it was quite a pleasant sitting-room, with books and chintz-covered chairs. "'I'll tell her,' said the woman." and went away shutting the door after having given Lucy a look of profound disfavour. After a few minutes, the door opened again. From the first moment, Lucy decided that she liked Emma Crackenthorpe. She was a middle-aged woman with no very outstanding characteristics, neither good-looking nor plain. Sensibly dressed in tweeds and pullover, with dark hair swept back from her forehead, steady hazel eyes, and a very pleasant voice. She said, Miss Isles Barrow, and held out her hand. Then she looked doubtful. I wonder, she said, if this post is really what you're looking for. I don't want a housekeeper, you know, to supervise things. I want someone to do the work. Lucy said that was what most people needed. Emma Crackenthorpe said apologetically, so many people, you know, seem to think that just a little light dusting will answer the case, but I can do all the light dusting myself. I quite understand, said Lucy. You want cooking and washing up and housework and stoking the boiler. That's all right. That's what I do. I'm not at all afraid of work. It's a big house, I'm afraid, and inconvenient, of course. We only live in a portion of it, my father and myself, that is. He's rather an invalid. We live quite quietly, and there's an August stove. I have several brothers, but they're not here very often. Two women come in, a Mrs. Kidder in the morning, and Mrs. Hart three days a week to do brasses and things like that. You have your own car? Yes, it can stand out in the open if there's nowhere to put it. It's used to it. Oh, there are any amount of old stables. There's no trouble about that. She frowned a moment and then said, Isle Sparrow. That's rather an unusual name. Some friends of mine were telling me about a, a Lucy Isle Sparrow, the Kennedys. Yes, I was with them in North Devon when Mrs. Kennedy was having a baby. Emma Crackenthorpe smiled. I know, they said they never had such a wonderful time as when you were there seeing to everything. But I had the idea that you were terribly expensive. The sum I mentioned, that's quite all right, said Lucy. I want particularly, you see, to be near Brackhampton. I have an elderly aunt in a critical state of health, and I want to be within easy distance of her. That's why the salary is a secondary consideration. I can't afford to do nothing if I could be sure of having some time off most days. Oh, of course, every afternoon till six, if you like. That seems perfect. Miss Crackenthorpe hesitated a moment before saying, uh, My father is elderly and a little uh, difficult sometimes. He's very keen on economy, and he says things sometimes that upset people. I, uh, well, I wouldn't like... Lucy broke in quickly. 
I'm quite used to elderly people of all kinds, she said. I always manage to get on well with them. Emma Crackenthorpe looked relieved. Trouble with father, diagnosed Lucy. I bet he's an old tartar. She was apportioned a large gloomy bedroom, which a small electric heater did its inadequate best to warm, and was shown round the house, a vast, uncomfortable mansion. As they passed a door in the hall, a voice roared out, "'That you, Emma? Got the new girl there? Bring her in. I want to look at her.' Emma flushed, glanced at Lucy apologetically. The two women entered the room. It was richly upholstered in dark velvet. The narrow windows let in very little light, and it was full of heavy mahogany Victorian furniture. Old Mr. Crackenthorpe was stretched out in an invalid chair, a silver-headed stick by his side. He was a big, gaunt man, his flesh hanging in loose folds. He had a face rather like a bulldog, with a pugnacious chin. He had thick, dark hair flecked with grey, and small, suspicious eyes. "'Let's have a look at you, young lady.' Lucy advanced, composed and smiling. "'There's just one thing you'd better understand straight away. Just because we live in a big house doesn't mean we're rich. We're not rich. We live simply. Do you hear? Simply.' "'No good coming here with a lot of highfalutin ideas.' "'Cod's as good a fish as turbot any day, and don't you forget it. "'I don't stand for waste. "'I live here because my father built the house and I like it. "'After I'm dead they can sell it up if they want to, "'and I expect they will want to. "'No sense of family. "'This house is well built, it's solid, "'and we've got our own land round us, keeps us private. "'It would bring in a lot if sold for building land, "'but not while I'm alive.' You won't get me out of here until you take me out feet first. He glared at Lucy. Your house is your castle, said Lucy. Laughing at me? Of course not. I think it's very exciting to have a real country place all surrounded by town. Quite so. Can't see another house from here, can you? Fields with cows in them, right in the middle of Brackhampton. You hear the traffic a bit when the wind's that way, but... Otherwise, it's still country. He added without pause or change of tone to his daughter, Ring up that damn fool of a doctor. Tell me that last medicine's no good at all. Lucy and Emma retired. He shouted after them, And don't let that damned woman who sniffs dust in here. She's disarranged all my books. Lucy asked, Has Mr. Crackenthorpe been an invalid long? Emma said rather evasively, Oh, well, for years now, yes. This is the kitchen. The kitchen was enormous. A vast kitchen range stood cold and neglected. An arger stood demurely beside it. Lucy asked times of meals and inspected the larder. Then she said cheerfully to Emma Crackenthorpe, I know everything now. Now don't bother. Leave it all to me. Emma Crackenthorpe heaved a sigh of relief as she went up to bed that night. The Kennedys were quite right, she said. She's wonderful. Lucy rose at six the next morning. She did the house, prepared vegetables, assembled, cooked and served breakfast. With Mrs Kidder she made the beds, and at eleven o'clock they sat down to strong tea and biscuits in the kitchen. Mollified by the fact that Lucy had no airs about her, and also by the strength and sweetness of the tea, Mrs. Kidder relaxed into gossip. She was a small spare woman, with a sharp eye and tight lips. Regular old skinflint he is. What she has to put up with. All the same, she's not what I call downtrodden, can hold her own all right when she has to. When the gentlemen come down, she sees to it there's something decent to eat. The gentlemen? Yes, big family it was. The eldest, Mr. Edmund, he was killed in the war. Then there's Mr. Cedric. He lives abroad somewhere. He's not married. Paints pictures in foreign parts. Mr. Harold's in the city, lives in London. Married an earl's daughter. 
Then there's Mr. Alfred. He's got a nice way with him, but he's a bit of a black sheep. Been in trouble once or twice. And there's Miss Edith's husband, Mr. Brown. Oh, ever so nice he is. She died some years ago, but he's always stayed one of the family. And there's Master Alexander, Miss Edith's little boy. He's at school, comes here for part of the holidays always. Miss Emma's terribly set on him. Lucy digested all this information, continuing to press tea on her informant. Finally, reluctantly, Mrs. Kidder rose to her feet. Seem to have got along a treat we do this morning, she said wonderingly. Want me to give her a hand with the potatoes, dear? They're done already. Well, you are the one for getting on with things. I might as well be getting along myself if there doesn't seem anything else to do. Mrs. Kidder departed, and Lucy, with time on her hands, scrubbed the kitchen table, which she had been longing to do, but which she had put off so as not to offend Mrs. Kidder, whose job it properly was. Then she cleaned the silver, till it shone radiantly. She cooked lunch, cleared it away, washed it up, and at two-thirty was ready to start exploration. She had set out the tea things ready on a tray, with sandwiches and bread and butter covered with a damp napkin to keep them moist. She strolled first round the gardens, which would be the normal thing to do. The kitchen garden was sketchily cultivated with few vegetables. The hothouses were in ruins. The paths everywhere were overgrown with weeds. A herbaceous border near the house was the only thing that showed free of weeds and in good condition, and Lucy suspected that that had been Emma's hand. The gardener was a very old man, somewhat deaf, who was only making a show of working. Lucy spoke to him pleasantly. He lived in a cottage adjacent to the big stable yard. Leading out of the stable yard, a back drive led through the park, which was fenced on either side of it, and under a railway arch into a small back lane. Every few minutes a train thundered along the main line over the railway arch. Lucy watched the trains as they slackened speed, going round the sharp curve that encircled the Crackenthorpe property. She passed under the railway arch and out into the lane. It seemed a little used track. On the one side was the railway embankment, and on the other side was a high wall, which enclosed some tall factory buildings. Lucy followed the lane till it came out into a street of small houses. She could hear a short distance away the busy hum of main road traffic. She glanced at her watch. A woman came out of a house nearby, and Lucy stopped her. Oh, excuse me, can you tell me if there's a public telephone near here? Post office, just at the corner of the road. Lucy thanked her and walked along till she came to the post office, which was a combination shop and post office. There was a telephone box at one side. Lucy went into it and made a call. She asked to speak to Miss Marple. A woman's voice spoke in a sharp bark. She's resting, and I'm not going to disturb her. She needs her rest. She's an old lady. Well, who shall I say called? Miss Islesbarrow. There's no need to disturb her. Just tell her that I've arrived and everything is going on well and that I'll let her know when I've any news. She replaced the receiver and made her way back to Rutherford Hall. I suppose it will be all right if I just practice a few iron shots in the park, asked Lucy. Oh, yes, certainly. Are you fond of golf? I'm not much good, but I like to keep in practice. It's a more agreeable form of exercise than just going for a walk. Nowhere to walk outside this place, growled Mr. Crackenthorpe. Nothing but pavements and miserable little band boxes of houses. I'd like to get hold of my land and build more of them, but they won't until I'm dead, and I'm not going to die to oblige anybody. I can tell you that, not to oblige anybody. Emma Crackenthorpe said mildly, Now, Father, I know what they think and what they're waiting for, all of them. Cedric, that sly fox Harold with his smug face, and as for Alfred, I wonder he hasn't had a shot of bumping me off himself. Not sure he didn't at Christmas time. That was a very odd turn I had. Puzzled old Quimper. Asked me a lot of discreet questions. Everyone gets these digestive upsets now and again, Father. 
All right, all right, say straight out I ate too much. That's what you mean. And why did I eat too much? Because there was too much food on the table, far too much. Wasteful and extravagant. And that reminds me, you, young woman, five potatoes you sent in for lunch, good-sized ones too. Two potatoes are enough for anybody, so don't send in more than four in future. The extra one was wasted today. It wasn't wasted, Mr. Crackenthorpe. I planned to use it in a Spanish omelette tonight. Ugh. As Lucy went out of the room carrying the coffee tray, she heard him say, Slick young woman, that. Always got all the answers. Cooks well, though, and she's a, she's a handsome kind of girl. Lucy Isles Barrow took a light iron out of the set of golf clubs she had had the forethought to bring with her and strolled out into the park, climbing over the fencing. She began playing a series of shots. After five minutes or so, a ball, apparently sliced, pitched on the side of the railway embankment. Lucy went up and began to hunt about for it. She looked back towards the house. It was a long way away, and nobody was in the least interested in what she was doing. She continued to hunt for the ball. Now and then she played shots from the embankment down into the grass. During the afternoon, she searched about a third of the embankment. Nothing. She played her ball back towards the house. Then, on the next day, she came upon something. A thorn bush growing about halfway up the bank had been snapped off. Bits of it lay scattered about. Lucy examined the tree itself. Impaled on one of the thorns was a torn scrap of fur. It was almost the same colour as the wood a pale brownish colour. Lucy looked at it for a moment, and then she took a pair of scissors out of her pocket and snipped it carefully in half. The half she had snipped off she put in an envelope which she had in her pocket. She came down the steep slope searching about for anything else. She looked carefully at the rough grass of the field. She thought she could distinguish a kind of track which someone had made walking through the long grass. But it was very faint not nearly so clear as her own tracks were. Must have been made some time ago, and it was too sketchy for her to be sure that it was not merely imagination on her part. She began to hunt carefully down in the grass at the foot of the embankment, just below the broken thorn bush. Presently, her search was rewarded. She found a powder compact, a small, cheap, enamelled affair. She wrapped it in her handkerchief and put it in her pocket. She searched on, but didn't find anything more. On the following afternoon, she got in her car and went to see her invalid aunt. Emma Crackenthorpe said kindly, Don't hurry back. We shan't want you until dinner time. Thank you, but I shall be back by six at the latest. Number four Madison Road was a small drab house in a small drab street. It had very clean Nottingham lace curtains, a shining white doorstep and well-polished brass door handle. The door was opened by a tall, grim-looking woman dressed in black with a large knob of iron-grey hair. She eyed Lucy in suspicious appraisal as she showed her into Miss Marple. Miss Marple was occupying the back sitting room, which looked out on a small, tidy square of garden. It was aggressively clean, with lots of mats and doilies, a great many china ornaments, a rather big Jacobean suite, and two ferns in pots. Miss Marple was sitting in a big chair by the fire, busily engaged in crocheting. Lucy came in and shut the door. She sat down in the chair facing Miss Marple. Well, she said, it looks as though you were right. She produced her finds and gave details of their finding. A faint flush of achievement came into Miss Marple's cheeks. Perhaps one ought not to feel so, she said, but it is rather gratifying to form a theory and get proof that it is correct. She fingered the small tuft of fur. Elspeth said the woman was wearing a light-coloured fur coat. I suppose the compact was in the pocket of the coat and fell out as the body rolled down the slope. Doesn't seem distinctive in any way, but it may help. You didn't take all the fur. No, I left half of it on the thorn bush. Miss Marple nodded approval. Quite right.
You are very intelligent, my dear. The police will want to check exactly. You are going to the police with these things? Well, not quite yet, Miss Marple considered. It would be better, I think, to find the body first, don't you? Yes, but isn't that rather a tall order? I mean, granting that your estimate is correct. The murderer pushed the body out of the train, then presumably got out himself at Brackhampton at some time, probably the same night, came along and removed the body. But what happened after that? He may have taken it anywhere. Not anywhere, said Miss Marple. I don't think you followed the thing to its logical conclusion, my dear Miss Islesparrow. You call me Lucy. Well, why not anywhere? Because if so, he might much more have easily killed the girl in some lonely spot and driven the body away from there. You, you haven't appreciated. Lucy interrupted. Are you saying... Do you mean that this was a premeditated crime? I didn't think so at first, said Miss Marple. One wouldn't, naturally. It seemed like a quarrel, and a man losing control and strangling the girl and then being faced with the problem of disposing of his victim. A problem which he had to solve within a very few minutes. But it really is too much of a coincidence that he should kill the girl in a fit of passion and then look out of the window and find the train was going round a curve exactly at the spot where he could tip the body out and where he could be sure of finding his way later and removing it. If he'd just thrown her out there by chance, he'd have done no more about it and the body would, long before now, have been found. She paused. Lucy stared at her. You know, said Miss Marple thoughtfully, it's really quite a clever way to have planned a crime. And I think it was very carefully planned. There's something so anonymous about a train. If he'd killed her in the place where she lived or, or was staying, or somebody might have noticed him come or go. Or if he'd driven her out in the country somewhere, someone might have noticed the car and its number and make... But a train is full of strangers coming and going. In a non-corridor carriage alone with her, it was quite easy, especially if you realise that he knew exactly what he was going to do next. He knew he must have known all about Rutherford Hall, its geographical position, I mean its queer isolation, an island bounded by railway lines. It is exactly like that, said Lucy. It's an anachronism out of the past. Bustling urban life goes on all around it but doesn't touch it. The tradespeople deliver in the mornings, and that's all. So we assume, as you said, that the murderer comes to Rutherford Hall that night. It's already dark when the body falls, and no one is likely to discover it before the next day. No, indeed. The murderer would come, how? In a car? Which way? Lucy considered. There's a rough lane alongside a factory wall. He'd probably come that way, turn in under the railway arch, and along the back drive. Then he could climb the fence, go along at the foot of the embankment, find the body, and carry it back to the car. And then, continued Miss Marple, he took it to some place he'd already chosen beforehand. This was all thought out, you know. And I don't think, as I say, that he would take it away from Rutherford Hall, or if so, not very far. The obvious thing, I suppose, would be to bury it somewhere. She looked inquiringly at Lucy. I suppose so, said Lucy, considering, but it wouldn't be quite so easy as it sounds. Miss Marple agreed. He couldn't bury it in the park, too hard work and very noticeable. Somewhere... Where the earth was turned already? The kitchen garden, perhaps, but that's very close to the gardener's cottage. He's old and deaf, but still it might be risky. Is there a dog? No. Then in a shed, perhaps, or an outhouse? That would be simpler and quicker. There are a lot of unused old buildings, broken-down pigsties, harness rooms, workshops that nobody ever goes near, or he might perhaps thrust it into a clump of rhododendrons or shrub somewhere. Miss Marple nodded. Yes, I think that's much more probable. There was a knock at the door, and the grim Florence came in with a tray. 
Nice of you to have a visitor, she said to Miss Marple. I've made you my special scones you used to like. Florence always made the most delicious tea cakes, said Miss Marple. Florence, gratified, creased her features into a totally unexpected smile and left the room. I think, my dear, said Miss Marple, we won't talk any more about murder during tea. Such an unpleasant subject. After tea, Lucy rose. I'll be getting back, she said. As I've already told you, there's no one actually living at Rutherford Hall who could be the man we're looking for. There's only an old man and a middle-aged woman and an old deaf gardener. I didn't say he was actually living there, said Miss Marple. All I mean is that he's someone who knows Rutherford Hall very well. But we can go into that after you've found the body. You seem to assume quite confidently that I shall find it, said Lucy. I don't feel nearly so optimistic. I'm sure you will succeed, my dear Lucy. You're such an efficient person. In some ways, but I haven't had any experience in looking for bodies. I'm sure all it needs is a little common sense, said Miss Marple encouragingly. Lucy looked at her, then laughed. Miss Marple smiled back at her. Lucy set to work systematically the next afternoon. She poked round outhouses, prodded the brass which reeded the old pig's ties, and was peering into the boiler room under the greenhouse when she heard a dry cough and turned to find old Hillman, the gardener, looking at her disapprovingly. "'You be careful you don't get a nasty fall, miss,' he warned her. "'Them steps isn't safe, and you was up in the loft just now, and the floor there ain't safe neither.' Lucy was careful to display no embarrassment. "'I expect you think I'm very nosy,' she said cheerfully. "'I was just wondering if something couldn't be made out of this place, "'growing mushrooms for the market, that sort of thing. "'Everything seems to have been let go terribly.' "'That's the master, that is. Won't spend a penny. "'Ought to have two men and a boy here. "'I ought to keep the place proper, but he won't hear of it, he won't. "'Had all I could do to make him get a motor mower. "'Wanted me to mow all that front grass by hand, he did. But if the place could be made to pay, with some repairs. Won't get a place like this to pay. Too far gone, and he wouldn't care about that anyway. Only cares about saving. Knows well enough what'll happen after he's gone. The young gentlemen sell up as fast as they can. Only waiting for him to pop off, they are. Going to come into a tidy lot of money when he dies, so I've heard. I suppose he's a very rich man, said Lucy. Crackenthorpe's fancies, that's what they are. The old gentleman started it, Mr. Crackenthorpe's father. Sharp one he was, by all accounts. Made his fortune and built this place. Hard as nails, they say, and never forgot an injury. But with all that, he was open-handed. Nothing of the miser about him. Disappointed in both his sons, so the story goes. Give him an education, brought him up to be gentlemen. Oxford and all. But they were too much a gentleman to want to go into the business. The younger one married an actress and then smashed himself up in a car accident when he'd been drinking. The elder one, our one here, his father never fancied so much. Abroad a lot he was. Bought a lot of heathen statues and had them sent home. Wasn't so close with his money when he was young. Come on him more in middle age, it did. No, they never hit it off him and his father. So I've heard. Lucy digested this information with an air of polite interest. The old man leant against the wall and prepared to go on again with his saga. He much preferred talking to doing any work. Died before the war, the old gentleman did. Terrible temper he had. Didn't do to give him any sauce. He wouldn't stand for it. And after he died, this Mr. Crackenthorpe came and lived here. Him and his family, yes. Night had grown up, they was by then. But surely... Oh, I see you mean the 1914 war. No, I don't. Died in 1928, that's what I mean. Lucy supposed that 1928 qualified as before the war. There is not the way she would have described it herself. She said, Well, I expect you'll be wanting to go on with your work. You mustn't let me keep you. Ah, uh, said old Hillman without enthusiasm, 
Not much you can do this time of day. Night's too bad. Lucy went back to the house, pausing to investigate a likely-looking copse of birch and azalea on her way. She found Emma Crackenthorpe standing in the hall reading a letter. The afternoon post had just been delivered. My nephew will be here tomorrow with a school friend. Alexander's room is the one over the porch. The one next to it will do for James Stoddart West. They'll use the bathroom just opposite. Yes, Miss Crackenthorpe, I'll see the rooms are prepared. They'll arrive in the morning before lunch. She hesitated. I expect they'll be hungry. I bet they will, said Lucy. Roast beef, do you think, and perhaps a treacle tart. Alexander's very fond of treacle tart. The two boys arrived on the following morning. They both had well-brushed hair, suspiciously angelic faces, and perfect manners. Alexander Eastley had fair hair and blue eyes, and Stoddart West was dark and spectacled. They discoursed gravely during lunch on events in the sporting world, with occasional references to the latest space fiction. Their manner was that of elderly professors discussing Paleolithic implements. In comparison with them, Lucy felt quite young. The sirloin of beef vanished in no time, and every crumb of the treacle tart was consumed. Mr. Crackenthorpe grumbled, You too will eat me out of house and home. Alexander gave him a blue-eyed, reproving glance. We'll have bread and cheese if you can't afford meat, Grandfather. Afford it? I can afford it. I don't like waste. We haven't wasted any, sir, said Stoddart West, looking down at his plate, which bore clear testimony of that fact. You boys both eat twice as much as I do. We're in the bodybuilding stage, Alexander explained. We need a big intake of proteins. The old man grunted. As the two boys left the table, Lucy heard Alexander say apologetically to his friend, "'You mustn't pay any attention to my grandfather. "'He's on a diet or something, and that makes him rather peculiar. "'He's terribly mean, too. "'I think it must be a complex of some kind.' Stoddart West said comprehendingly, "'I had an aunt who kept thinking she was going bankrupt. "'Really, she had oodles of money. "'Pathological,' the doctor said. "'Have you got that football, Alex?' "'After she had cleared away and washed up lunch, Lucy went out.' She could hear the boys calling out in the distance on the lawn. She herself went in the opposite direction down the front drive, and from there she struck across to some clumped masses of rhododendron bushes. She began to hunt carefully, holding back the leaves and peering inside. She moved from clump to clump systematically, and was raking inside with a golf club when the polite voice of Alexander Eastley made her start. "'Are you looking for something, Miss Islesbarrow? A golf ball, said Lucy promptly. Several golf balls. In fact, I've been practising golf shots most afternoons, and I've lost quite a lot of balls. I thought that today I really must find some of them. We'll help you, said Alexander obligingly. That's very kind of you. I thought you were playing football. One can't go on playing footer, explained Stoddart West. One gets too hot. Do you play a lot of golf? I'm quite fond of it. I don't get much opportunity. I suppose you don't. You do the cooking here, don't you? Yes. Did you cook lunch today? Yes. Was it all right? Simply wizard, said Alexander. We get awful meat at school, all dried up. I love beef that's pink and juicy inside, and that treacle tart was pretty smashing, too. You must tell me what things you like best. Could we have apple meringue one day? It's my favourite thing. Of course. Alexander sighed happily. Oh, there's a clock golf set under the stairs. He said we could fix it up on the lawn and do some putting. What about it, Stoddart? Good o, said Stoddart West. He isn't really Australian, said Alexander courteously, but he's practising talking that way in case his people take him out to see the test match next year. Encouraged by Lucy, they went off to get the clock golf set. Later, as she returned to the house, she found them setting it out on the lawn and arguing about the position of the numbers. "'We don't want it like a clock,' said Stoddart West. "'That's kids' stuff. "'We want to make a course of it. "'Long holes and short ones. 
It's a pity the numbers are so rusty you can hardly see them. They need a lick of white paint, said Lucy. You might get some tomorrow and paint them. Good idea. Alexander's face lit up. I say, I believe there are some old pots of paint in the long barn, left there by the painter's last holes. Shall we see? What's the long barn? asked Lucy. Alexander pointed to a long stone building a little way from the house, near the back drive. It's quite old, he said. Grandfather calls it a league barn and says it's Elizabethan, but that's just swank. It belonged to the farm that was here originally. My great-grandfather pulled it down and built this awful house instead. He added, a lot of grandfather's collection is in the barn, things he had sent home from abroad when he was a young man. Most of them are pretty frightful, too. The long barn is used sometimes for whist drives and things like that. Women's Institute stuff. And conservative sales of work. Come and see it. Lucy accompanied them willingly. There was a big nail-studded oak door to the barn. Alexander raised his hand and attached a key on a nail just under some ivy to the right hand of the top of the door. He turned it in the lock pushed the door open, and they went in. At a first glance, Lucy felt that she was in a singularly bad museum. The heads of two Roman emperors in marble glared at her out of bulging eyeballs. There was a huge sarcophagus of a decadent Greco-Roman period. A simpering Venus stood on a pedestal, clutching her falling draperies. Besides these works of art, there were a couple of trestle tables, some stacked-up chairs, and sundry oddments such as a, a rusted hand mower, two buckets, a couple of moth-eaten car seats, and a green-painted iron garden seat that had lost a leg. "'I think I saw the paint over here,' said Alexander vaguely. He went to a corner and pulled aside a tattered curtain that shut it off. They found a couple of paint pots and brushes, the latter dry and stiff. You really need some turps, said Lucy. They could not, however, find any turpentine. The boys suggested bicycling off to get some, and Lucy urged them to do so. Painting the clock golf numbers would keep them amused for some time, she thought. The boys went off, leaving her in the barn. This really could do with a clear-up, she had murmured. I shouldn't bother, Alexander advised her. It gets cleaned up if it's going to be used for anything, but it's practically never used this time of year. Do I hang the key up outside the door again? Is that where it's kept? Yes. There's nothing to pinch here, you see. Nobody would want those awful marble things, and anyway, they weigh a ton. Lucy agreed with him. She could hardly admire old Mr. Crackenthorpe's taste in art. He seemed to have an unerring instinct for selecting the worst specimen of any period. She stood looking round her after the boys had gone. Her eyes came to rest on the sarcophagus and stayed there. That sarcophagus. The air in the barn was faintly musty, as though unaired for a long time. She went over to the sarcophagus. It had a heavy, close-fitting lid. Lucy looked at it speculatively. Then she left the barn, went to the kitchen, found a heavy crowbar, and returned. It was not an easy task, but Lucy toiled doggedly. Slowly the lid began to rise, prized up by the crowbar. It rose sufficiently for Lucy to see what was inside. A few minutes later, Lucy, rather pale, left the barn, locked the door, and put the key back on the nail. She went rapidly to the stables, got out her car, and drove down the back drive. She stopped at the post office at the end of the road. She went into the telephone box, put in the money, and dialed. I want to speak to Miss Marple. She's resting, Miss. It's Miss Isles Barrow, isn't it? Yes. I'm not going to disturb her in that flat, miss. She's an old lady and she needs her rest. You must disturb her. It's urgent. I'm not. Please do what I say at once. When she chose, Lucy's voice could be as incisive as steel. 
Florence knew authority when she heard it. Presently Miss Marple's voice spoke. Yes, Lucy? Lucy drew a deep breath. You are quite right, she said. I found it. A woman's body? Yes, a woman in a fur coat. It's in a stone sarcophagus in a kind of barn cum museum near the house. Well, what do you want me to do? I ought to inform the police, I think. Yes, you must inform the police at once. But what about the rest of it, about you? The first thing I want to know is why I was prying up a lid that weighs tons for apparently no reason. Do you want me to invent a reason? I can. No, I think you know, said Miss Marple in her gentle, serious voice, that the only thing to do is to tell the exact truth. About you? About everything. A sudden grin split the whiteness of Lucy's face. That would be quite simple for me, she said, but I imagine they'll find it quite hard to believe. She rang off, waited a moment, and then rang and got the police station. I have just discovered a dead body in a sarcophagus in the long barn at Rutherford Hall. What's that? Lucy repeated her statement, and anticipating the next question, she gave her name. She drove back, put the car away, and entered the house. She paused in the hall for a moment, thinking. Then she gave a brief sharp nod of the head and went to the library, where Miss Crackenthorpe was sitting helping her father to do the Times crossword. Can I speak to you a moment, Miss Crackenthorpe? Emma looked up, a shade of apprehension on her face. The apprehension was, Lucy thought, purely domestic. In such words do useful household staff announce their imminent departure. Well, speak up, girl, speak up, said old Mr. Crackenthorpe irritably. Lucy said to Emma, I'd like to speak to you alone, please. Nonsense, said Mr. Crackenthorpe. You say straight out here what you've got to say. Just a moment, father. Emma rose and went towards the door. All oh, nonsense. It can wait, said the old man angrily. I'm afraid it can't wait, said Lucy. Mr. Crackenthorpe said, What impertinence! Emma came out into the hall. Lucy followed her and shut the door behind them. Yes, said Emma. What is it? If you think there's too much to do with the boys here, I can help you, and... It's not that at all, said Lucy. I didn't want to speak before your father, because I understand that he is an invalid, and it might give him a shock. You see, I've just discovered the body of a murdered woman in that big sarcophagus in the long barn. Emma Crackenthorpe stared at her. In the sarcophagus? A murdered woman? It's impossible. I'm afraid it's quite true. I've rung the police. They'll be here at any minute. A slight flush came into Emma's cheek. You should have told me first, before notifying the police. I'm sorry, said Lucy. I didn't hear you ring up. Emma's glance went to the telephone on the hall table. I rang up from the post office just down the road. How extraordinary! Why not from here? Lucy thought quickly. I was afraid the boys might be about, might hear if I rang up from the hall here. I see. Yes, I see. They are coming. The police, I mean. They are here now, said Lucy, as with a squeal of brakes, a car drew up at the front door, and the front door bell pealed through the house. I'm sorry, very sorry to have asked this of you, said Inspector Bacon. His hand under her arm, he led Emma Crackenthorpe out of the barn. Emma's face was very pale. She looked sick, but she walked firmly erect. I'm quite sure that I've never seen the woman before in my life. We are very grateful to you, Miss Crackenthorpe. That's all I wanted to know. Perhaps you'd like to lie down. I must go to my father. I telephoned to Dr. Quimper as soon as I heard about this, and the doctor is with him now. Dr. Quimper came out of the library as they crossed the hall. He was a tall, genial man with a casual, off-hand, cynical manner that his patients found very stimulating. He and the inspector nodded to each other. Miss Crackenthorpe 
has performed an unpleasant task very bravely, said Bacon. Well done, Emma, said the doctor, patting her on the shoulder. You can take things. I've always known that. Your father's all right. Just go in and have a word with him, and then go into the dining room and get yourself a glass of brandy. That's a prescription. Emma smiled at him gratefully and went into the library. That woman's the salt of the earth, said the doctor, looking after her. A thousand pity she never married. Penalty of being the only female in the family of men. The other sister got clear. Married at seventeen, I believe. This one's quite a handsome woman, really. She'd have been a success as a wife and mother. Too devoted to her father, I suppose, said Inspector Bacon. She's not really as devoted as all that, but she's got the instinct some women have to make their menfolk happy. She sees that her father likes being an invalid, so she lets him be an invalid. She's the same with her brothers. Cedric feels he's a good painter. What's his name? Um, Harold knows how much she relies on his sound judgment. She lets Alfred shock her with his stories of his clever deals. Oh, yes, she's a clever woman. No fool. Well, do you want me for anything? Want me to have a look at your corpse now Johnston has done with it? Johnston was a police surgeon. And see if it happens to be one of my medical mistakes. I'd like you to have a look. Yes, Doctor, we want to get her identified. I suppose it's impossible for old Mr. Crankenthorpe too much of a strain. Strain? Fiddlesticks. He'd never forgive you or me if we didn't let him have a peep. He's all agog. Most exciting thing that's happened to him for 15 years or so. And it won't cost him anything. There's nothing really much wrong with him, then. He's 72, said the doctor. That's all, really. That's the matter with him. He has odd rheumatic twinges. Who doesn't? So he calls it arthritis. He has palpitations after meals, as well he may. He puts them down to heart. But he can always do anything he wants to do. I've plenty of patients like that. The ones who are really ill usually insist desperately that they're perfectly well. Well, come on, let's go and see this body of yours. Unpleasant, I suppose. Johnston estimates she's been dead between a fortnight and three weeks. Quite unpleasant, then. The doctor stood by the sarcophagus and looked down with frank curiosity, professionally unmoved by what he had named the unpleasantness. Never seen her before. No patient of mine. I don't remember ever seeing her about in Brackhampton. She must have been quite good-looking once. Hmm. Somebody had it in for her, all right. They went out again into the air. Dr. Quimper glanced up at the building. Found in the, what do they call it? The long barn in a sarcophagus. Fantastic. Well, who found her? Miss Lucy Islesbury. Oh, the latest lady help. What was she doing poking about in the sarcophagi? That, said Inspector Bacon grimly, is just what I'm going to ask her. Now, about Mr. Crackenthorpe. Will you, uh, I'll bring him along. Mr. Crackenthorpe, muffled in scarves, came walking at a brisk pace, the doctor beside him. Disgraceful, he said. Absolutely disgraceful. I brought back that sarcophagus from Florence in, uh, now, let me see, it must have been in 198. Or was it 199? Steady now, the doctor warned him. This isn't going to be nice, you know. No matter how ill I am, I've got to do my duty, haven't I? A very brief visit inside the long barn was, however, quite long enough. Mr. Crackenthorpe shuffled out into the air again with remarkable speed. Never saw her before in my life, he said. What's it mean? Absolutely disgraceful. I had one in Florence. I remember now it was Naples, a very fine specimen, and some fool of a woman has to come and get herself killed in it. He clutched at the folds of his overcoat on the left side. Oh, too much for me. My heart. Where's Emma? Doctor? Dr. Quimper took his arm. You'll be all right, he said. I prescribe a little stimulant. Randy. They went back together towards the house. Sir, please, sir. Inspector Bacon turned. 
Two boys had arrived, breathless on bicycles. Their faces were full of eager pleading. Please, sir, can we see the body? No, you can't, said Inspector Bacon. Oh, sir, please, sir, you never know. We might know who she was. Oh, please, sir, do be a sport. It's not fair. Here's murder right in our own barn. It's the sort of chance that might never happen again. Oh, do be a sport, sir. Who are you two? I'm Alexander Eastley, and this is my friend James Stoddart West. Have you ever seen a blonde woman wearing a light-coloured dyed squirrel coat anywhere about the place? Well, I can't remember exactly, said Alexander astutely. If I were to have a look... Take him in, Sanders, said Inspector Bacon to the constable who was standing by the barn door. One's only young once. Oh, sir, thank you, sir. Both boys were vociferous. It's very kind of you, sir. Bacon turned away towards the house. And now, he said to himself grimly, for Miss Lucy Islesbarrow. After leading the police to the long barn and giving a brief account of her actions, Lucy had retired into the background, but she was under no illusion that the police had finished with her. She had just finished preparing potatoes for chips that evening when word was brought to her that Inspector Bacon required her presence. Putting aside the large bowl of cold water and salt in which the chips were reposing, Lucy followed the policeman to where the inspector awaited her. She sat down and awaited his questions composedly. She gave her name and her address in London and added of her own accord, I'll give you some names and addresses of references if you want to know all about me. The names were very good ones. An admiral of the fleet, the provost of an Oxford college, and a dame of the British Empire. In spite of himself, Inspector Bacon was impressed. Now, Miss Arsbarrow went into the long barn to find some paint. Is that right? And after having found the paint, you got a crowbar, forced up the lid of the sarcophagus, and found the body. What were you looking for in the sarcophagus? I was looking for a body, said Lucy. You were looking for a body, and you found one. Doesn't that seem to you a very extraordinary story? Oh, yes, it is an extraordinary story. Perhaps you'll let me explain it to you. I certainly think you'd better do so. Lucy gave him a precise recital of the events which had led up to her sensational discovery. The inspector summed it up in an outraged voice. You were engaged by an elderly lady to obtain a post here and to search the house and grounds for a dead body? Is that right? Yes. Who is this elderly lady? Miss Jane Marple. She's at present living at 4 Madison Road. The inspector wrote it down. You expect me to believe this story? Lucy said gently, Not, perhaps, until after you have interviewed Miss Marple and got her confirmation of it. I shall interview her, all right. She must be cracked. Lucy forbore to point out that to be proved right is not really a proof of mental incapacity. Instead, she said, What are you proposing to tell Miss Crackenthorpe? About me, I mean. Why do you ask? Well, as far as Miss Marple is concerned, I've done my job. I found the body she wanted found. But I'm still engaged by Miss Crackenthorpe, and there are two hungry boys in the house, and probably some more of the family will soon be coming down after all this upset. She needs domestic help. If you go and tell her that I only took this post in order to hunt for dead bodies, she'll probably throw me out. Otherwise, I can get on with my job and be useful. The inspector looked hard at her. I'm not saying anything to anyone at present, he said. I haven't verified your statement yet. For all I know, you may be making the whole thing up. Lucy rose. Thank you. Then I'll go back to the kitchen and get on with things. We'd better have the yard in on it. Is that what you think, Bacon? The chief constable looked inquiringly at Inspector Bacon. The inspector was a big, solid man. His expression was that of one utterly disgusted with humanity. The woman wasn't a local, sir, he said. There's some reason to believe, from her underclothing, that she might have been a foreigner. Of course, added Inspector Bacon hastily, I'm not letting on about that yet a while. 
We're keeping it up our sleeves until after the inquest. The chief constable nodded. The inquest will be purely formal, I suppose. Yes, sir, I've seen the coroner. And it's fixed for when? Tomorrow. I understand the other members of the Crackenthorpe family will be here for it. There's just a chance one of them might be able to identify her. They'll all be here. He consulted a list he held in his hand. Harold Crackenthorpe. He's something in the city. Quite an important figure, I understand. Alfred. Don't quite know what he does. Cedric. That's the one who lives abroad. Paints. The inspector invested the word with its full quota of sinister significance. The chief constable smiled into his moustache. No reason is there to believe the Crackenthorpe family are connected with the crime in any way, he asked. Not apart from the fact that the body was found on the premises, said Inspector Bacon. And of course it's just possible that this artist member of the family might be able to identify her. What beats me is this extraordinary rigmarole about the train. Ah, yes. You've been to see this old lady, this, uh, he glanced at the memorandum lying on his desk, Miss Marple? Yes, sir. And she's quite set and definite about the whole thing. Whether she's balmy or not, I don't know, but she sticks to her story about what her friends saw and all the rest of it. As far as all that goes, I dare say it's just make-believe, you know, the sort of thing old ladies do make up, like seeing flying saucers at the bottom of the garden and Russian agents in the lending library. But it seems quite clear that she did engage this young woman, the lady help, and told her to look for a body, which the girl did. And found one, observed the chief constable. Well, it's all a very remarkable story. Marple, Miss Jane Marple. The name seems familiar enough. Anyway, I'll get on to the yard. I think you're right about it not being a local case, though we won't advertise the fact just yet. For the moment, we'll tell the press as little as possible. The inquest was a purely formal affair. No one came forward to identify the dead woman. Lucy was called to give evidence of finding the body, and medical evidence was given as to the cause of death. Strangulation. The proceedings were then adjourned. It was a cold, blustery day when the Crackenthorpe family came out of the hall where the inquest had been held. There were five of them all told. Emma, Cedric, Harold, Alfred and Brian Eastley, the husband of the dead daughter Edith. There was also Mr Wimborne, the senior partner of the firm's solicitors, who dealt with the Crackenthorpe's legal affairs. He had come down especially from London at great inconvenience to attend the inquest. They all stood for a moment on the pavement, shivering. Quite a crowd had assembled. The piquant details of the body in the sarcophagus had been fully reported in both the London and the local press. A murmur went round. That's them, Emma said sharply. Let's get away. The big hired Daimler drew up to the curb. Emma got in and motioned to Lucy. Mr. Wimborne, Cedric and Harold followed. Brian Eastley said, I'll take Alfred with me in my little bus. The chauffeur shut the door and the Daimler prepared to roll away. Oh, stop, cried Emma, there are the boys. The boys, in spite of aggrieved protests, had been left behind at Rutherford Hall, but they now appeared grinning from ear to ear. We came on our bicycle, said Starrett West. The policeman was very kind and let us in at the back of the hall. I, I hope you don't mind, Miss Crackenthorpe, he added politely. She doesn't mind, said Cedric, answering for his sister. You're only young once. Your first inquest, I expect. It was rather disappointing, said Alexander, all over so soon. We can't stay here talking, said Harold irritably. There's quite a crowd. And all those men with cameras. At a sign from him, the chauffeur pulled away from the curb. The boys waved cheerfully. All over so soon, said Cedric. That's what they think. The young innocence is just beginning. It's all very unfortunate. Most unfortunate, said Harold. I suppose he looked at Mr. Wimborne, who compressed his thin lips and shook his head with distaste. I hope he said sententiously, that the whole 
matter will soon be cleared up satisfactorily. The police are very efficient. However, the whole thing, as Harold says, has been most unfortunate. He looked as he spoke at Lucy, and there was distinct disapproval in his glance. If it had not been for this young woman, his eyes seemed to say, poking about where she'd no business to be, none of this would have happened. This sentiment, or one closely resembling it, was voiced by Harold Crackenthorpe. By the way, uh, Miss uh, 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 Isles Barrow, just what made you go looking into that sarcophagus? Lucy had already wondered just when this thought would occur to one of the family. She'd known that the police would ask it first thing. What surprised her was that it seemed to have occurred to no one else until this moment. Cedric, Emma, Harold and Mr Wimborne all looked at her. Her reply, for what it was worth, had naturally been prepared for some time. Really, she said in a hesitating voice, I, I hardly know. I did feel that the whole place needed a thorough clearing out and cleaning, and there was, uh, she hesitated, a very peculiar and disagreeable smell. She had counted accurately on the immediate shrinking of everyone from the unpleasantness of this idea. Mr. Wimborne murmured, uh, yes, yes, of course, yes, about three weeks, the police surgeon said. I think, you know, we must all try and not let our minds dwell on this thing. He smiled encouragingly at Emma, who had turned very pale. Remember, he said, this wretched young woman was nothing to do with any of us. Ah, but you can't be sure of that, can you? said Cedric. Lucy Isles Barrow looked at him with some interest. She had already been intrigued by the rather startling differences between the three brothers. Cedric was a big man with a weather-beaten, rugged face, unkempt dark hair and a jocund manner. He had arrived from the airport unshaven, and although he had shaved in preparation for the inquest, he was still wearing the clothes in which he had arrived, and which seemed to be the only ones he had. Old grey flannel trousers, and a patched and rather threadbare baggy jacket. He looked the stage bohemian to the life, and proud of it. His brother Harold, on the contrary, was the perfect picture of a city gentleman and a director of important companies. He was tall, with a neat erect carriage, had dark hair going slightly bald on the temples, a small black moustache, and was impeccably dressed in a dark well-cut suit and pearl-grey tie. He looked what he was, a shrewd and successful businessman. He said now stiffly, Really, Cedric, that seems a most uncalled for remark. Don't see why. She was in our barn after all. What did she come there for? Mr. Wimborne coughed and said, <coughs> well, possibly some uh, assignation. I understand it was a matter of local knowledge that the key was kept outside on a nail. His tone indicated outrage at the carelessness of such procedure. So clearly marked was this that Emma spoke apologetically. Well, it, it started during the war for the ARP wardens. There was a little spirit stove and they made themselves hot cocoa and afterwards, since there was really nothing there anybody could have wanted to take, we went on leaving the key hanging up. It was convenient for the Women's Institute people. If we'd kept it in the house it might have been awkward when there was no one at home to give it them when they wanted to get the place ready. With only daily women and, uh, well... No resident servants. Her voice trailed away. She had spoken mechanically, giving a wordy explanation without interest, as though her mind was elsewhere. Cedric gave her a quick, puzzled glance. You're worried, sis. What's up? Harold spoke with exasperation. Really, Cedric, can you ask? Yes, I do ask. Granted a strange young woman has got herself killed in the barn at Rutherford Hall, sounds like Victorian melodrama, and granted it gave Emma a shock at the time. But Emma's always been a sensible girl, and I, I don't see why she goes on being worried now. Well, dash it, one gets used to everything. Murder takes a little more getting used to by some people than it may in your case, said Harold acidly. I dare say murders are to a penny in Mallorca, and... Uh, Ibiza, not Mallorca. It's the same thing. Not at all. It's quite a different island. Harold went on talking. 
My point is that though murder may be an everyday commonplace to you, living amongst hot-blooded Latin people, nevertheless in England we take such things seriously, he added with increasing irritation, and really, Cedric, to appear at a public inquest in those clothes. What's wrong with my clothes? They're comfortable. They're unsuitable. Well, anyway, they're the only clothes I've got with me. I didn't pack my wardrobe trunk when I came rushing home to stand in with the family over this business. I'm a painter, and painters like to be comfortable in their clothes. So you're still trying to paint? Look here, Harold, when you say trying to paint, Mr. Wimble cleared his throat in an authoritative manner. This discussion is unprofitable, he said reprovingly. I hope, my dear Emma, that you will tell me if there is any further way in which I can be of service to you before I return to town. The reproof had its effect. Emma Crackenthorpe said quickly, It was most kind of you to come down. Not at all. It was advisable that someone should be at the inquest to watch the proceedings on behalf of the family. I have arranged for an interview with the inspector at the house. I have no doubt, distressing as all this has been, the situation will soon be clarified. In my own mind, there seems little doubt as to what occurred. As Emma has told us, the key of the long barn was known locally to hang outside the door. It seems highly probable that the place was used in the winter months as a place of assignation by local couples. No doubt there was a quarrel, and some young man lost control of himself. Horrified at what he had done, his eyes lit on the sarcophagus, and he realised that it would make an excellent place of concealment. Lucy thought to herself, Yes, it sounds most plausible. That's just what one might think. Cedric said, You say a local couple, but nobody's been able to identify the girl locally. It's early days yet. No doubt we shall get identification before long. And it's possible, of course... The man in question was a local resident, but that the girl came from elsewhere, perhaps from some other part of Brackhampton. Brackhampton's a big place. It's grown enormously in the last twenty years. If I were a girl coming to meet my young man, I don't stand for being taken to a freezing cold barn miles from anywhere, Cedric objected. I'd stand out for a nice bit of a cuddle in the cinema, wouldn't you, Miss Islesbarrow? Do we need to go into all this? Harold demanded plaintively. And with the voicing of the question, the car drew up before the front door of Rutherford Hall, and they all got out. On entering the library, Mr. Wimborne blinked a little as his shrewd old eyes went past Inspector Bacon, whom he had already met, the fair-haired, good-looking man beyond him. Inspector Bacon performed introductions. This is Detective Inspector Craddock of New Scotland Yard, he said. New Scotland Yard? Hmm, Mr. Wimborne's eyebrows rose. Dermot Craddock, who had a pleasant manner, went easily into speech. We have been called in on the case, Mr. Wimborne, he said. As you are representing the Crackenthorpe family, I feel it only fair that we should give you a little confidential information. Nobody could make a better show of presenting a very small portion of the truth and implying that it was the whole truth than Inspector Craddock. Inspector Bacon will agree, I'm sure, he added, glancing at his colleague. Inspector Bacon agreed with all due solemnity, and not at all as though the whole matter were prearranged. It's like this, said Craddock. We have reason to believe, from information that has come into our possession, that the dead woman is not a native of these parts that she travelled down here from London, and that she had recently come from abroad. Probably, though we're not sure of that, from France. Mr. Wimborne again raised his eyebrows. Indeed, he said. Indeed. That being the case, explained Inspector Bacon, the Chief Constable felt that the Yard was better fitted to investigate the matter. I can only hope, said Mr. Wimborne, that the case will be solved quickly. As you can no doubt appreciate, the whole business has been a source of much distress to the family. Although not personally concerned in any way, they are... Uh, he paused for a bare second, but Inspector Craddock filled the gap quickly. It's not a pleasant thing to find a murdered woman on your property. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, I should like to have a brief interview with the various members of the family. I really cannot see what they can tell me 
Perhaps nothing of interest, but one never knows. I dare say I can get most of the information I want from you, sir. Information about this house and the family. And what can that possibly have to do with an unknown young woman coming from abroad and getting herself killed here? Well, that's rather the point, said Craddock. Why did she come here? Had she once had some connection with this house? Had she been, for instance, a servant here at one time? A lady's maid, perhaps. Or did she come here to meet a former occupant of Rutherford Hall? Mr. Wimborne said coldly that Rutherford Hall had been occupied by the Crackenthorpes ever since Josiah Crackenthorpe built it in 1884. That's interesting in itself, said Craddock. If you just give me a brief outline of the family history. Mr. Wimborne shrugged his shoulders. There's very little to tell. Josiah Crackenthorpe was a manufacturer of sweet and savoury biscuits, relishes, pickles, etc. He accumulated a vast fortune. He built this house. Luther Crackenthorpe, his eldest son, lives here now. Any other sons? One other son, Henry, who was killed in a motor accident in 1911. At the present, Mr. Crackenthorpe has never thought of selling the house. He's unable to do so, said the lawyer dryly, by the terms of his father's will. Perhaps you'll tell me about the will. Why should I? Inspector Craddock smiled. Because I can look it up myself if I want to at Somerset House. Against his will, Mr. Wimborne gave a crabbed little smile. Quite right, Inspector. I was merely protesting that the information you ask for is quite irrelevant. As to Josiah Crackenthorpe's will, there's no mystery about it. He left his very considerable fortune in trust, the income from it to be paid to his son Luther for life, and after Luther's death, the capital to be divided equally between Luther's children, Edmund, Cedric, Harold, Alfred, Emma, and Edith. Edmund was killed in the war, and Edith died four years ago, so that on Luther Crackenthorpe's decease, the money will be divided between Cedric, Harold, Alfred, Emma, and Edith's son, Alexander Eastley. And the house? That will go to Luther Crackenthorpe's eldest surviving son, or his issue. Was Edmund Crackenthorpe married? No. So the property will actually go to the next son, Cedric. Mr. Luther Crackenthorpe himself cannot dispose of it. No. And he has no control of the capital. No. Isn't that rather unusual? I suppose, said Inspector Craddock shrewdly, that his father didn't like him. You suppose correctly, said Mr. Wimborne. Old Josiah was disappointed that his eldest son showed no interest in the family business, or indeed in business of any kind. Luther spent his time travelling abroad and collecting objets d'art. Old Josiah was very unsympathetic to that kind of thing, so he left his money in trust for the next generation. But in the meantime, the next generation have no income except what they make or what their father allows them. And their father has a considerable income, but no part of disposal of the capital. Exactly. And what all this has to do with the murder of an unknown young woman of foreign origin, I cannot imagine. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with it, Inspector Craddock agreed promptly. I just wanted to ascertain all the facts. Mr. Wimborne looked at him sharply, then seemingly satisfied with the result of his scrutiny, rose to his feet. I am proposing now to return to London, he said, unless there's anything further you wish to know. He looked from one man to the other. No, thank you, sir. The sound of the gong rose fortissimo from the hall outside. Dear me, said Mr. Wimborne, one of the boys, I think, must be performing. Inspector Craddock raised his voice to be heard above the clamour as he said, We'll leave the family to have lunch in peace, but Inspector Bacon and I would like to return after it, say at 2.15, and have a short interview with every member of the family. You think that is necessary? Well, Craddock shrugged his shoulders, it's just an off chance. Somebody might remember something that would give us a clue to the woman's identity. I doubt it, Inspector. I doubt it very much. But I wish you good luck. And as I said just now, the sooner this distasteful business is cleared up, the better for everybody. 
shaking his head, he went slowly out of the room. Lucy had gone straight to the kitchen on getting back from the inquest and was busy with preparations for lunch when Brian Eastley put his head in. "'Can I give you a hand in any way?' he asked. "'I'm handy about the house.' Lucy gave him a quick, light, preoccupied glance. Brian had arrived at the inquest direct in his small MG car and she had not yet had time to size him up. What she saw was likeable enough. Eastley was an amiable-looking young man, of thirty-odd, with brown hair, rather plaintive blue eyes, and an enormous fair moustache. The boys aren't back yet, he said, coming in and sitting on the end of the kitchen table. It'll take them another twenty minutes on their bikes. Lucy smiled. They were certainly determined not to miss anything. Can't blame them. I mean to say, first inquest in their young lives and right in the family, so to speak. Do you mind getting off the table, Mr. Eastley? I want to put the baking dish down there. Brian obeyed. I say, that fat's corking hot. What are you going to put in it? Yorkshire pudding. Good old Yorkshire. Roast beef of old England. Is that the menu for today? Yes. The funeral baked meats, in fact. Smells good. He sniffed appreciatively. Do you mind my gassing away? If you came in to help, I'd rather you helped. She drew another pan from the oven. Here, turn all these potatoes over so that they brown on the other side. Brown obeyed with alacrity. Have all these things been fizzling away in here while we've been at the inquest? Supposing they'd all burnt up. Most improbable. There's a regulating number on the oven. Kind of electric brain, eh? What? Is that right? Lucy threw a swift look in his direction. Quite right. Now put the pan in the oven. Here, take the cloth. On the second shelf, I want the top one for the Yorkshire pudding. Brown obeyed, but not without uttering a shrill yelp. Burn yourself? Just a bit. Doesn't matter. What a dangerous game cooking is. I suppose you never do your own cooking. As a matter of fact, I do, quite often, but not this sort of thing. I... I can boil an egg if I don't forget to look at the clock, and and I can do eggs and bacon. And I can put a steak under the grill or open a tin of soup. I've got one of those little electric whatnots in my flat. You live in London, if you call it living. Yes. His tone was despondent. He watched Lucy shoot in the dish with the Yorkshire pudding mixture. This is awfully jolly, he said and sighed. Her immediate preoccupations over, Lucy looked at him with more attention. What is? This kitchen? Yes. Reminds me of our kitchen at home, when I was a boy. It struck Lucy that there was something strangely forlorn about Brian Eastley. Looking closely at him, she realised that he was older than she had first thought. He must be close on forty. It seemed difficult to think of him as Alexander's father, he reminded her of innumerable young pilots she had known during the war when she had been at the impressionable age of fourteen. She had gone on and grown up into a post-war world, but she felt as though Brian had not got on, but had been passed by in the passage of years. His next words confirmed this. He had subsided onto the kitchen table again. It's a difficult sort of world, he said, isn't it? To get your bearings in, I mean. You see, one hasn't been trained for it. Lucy recalled what she had heard from Emma. You were a fighter pilot, weren't you, she said. You got a DFC. That's the sort of thing that puts you wrong. You got a gong, and so people try to make it easy for you. Give you a job and all that. Very decent of them. But they're all admin jobs. One simply isn't any good at that sort of thing. Sitting at a desk, getting tangled up in figures... I've had ideas of my own, you know. Tried a wheeze or two, but you can't get the backing. Can't get the chaps to come in and put down the money. If I had a bit of capital, she brooded. You didn't know Edie, did you? My wife? No, of course you didn't. She was quite different from all this lot. Younger, for one thing. She was in the WAF. She always said her old man was crackers. He is, you know. Mean as hell over money, and it's not as though he could take it with him. It's got to be divided up when he dies. Edith's share will go to Alexander, of course. 
He won't be able to touch the capital till he's twenty-one, though. Oh, I'm sorry, but will you get off the table again? I want to dish up and make gravy. At that moment, Alexander and Stoddart West arrived with rosy faces and very much out of breath. Hello, Brian, said Alexander kindly to his father. So this is where you got to. I say, what a smashing piece of beef. Is the Yorkshire pudding? Yes, there is. We have awful Yorkshire pudding at school, all damp and limp. Get out of my way, said Lucy. I want to make the gravy. Make lots of gravy. Can we have two sauce boats full? Yes. Good O, said Stoddart West, pronouncing the word carefully. I don't like it pale, said Alexander anxiously. It won't be pale. She's a smashing cook, said Alexander to his father. Lucy had a momentary impression that their roles were reversed. Alexander spoke like a kindly father to his son. "'Can we help you, Miss Islesbarrow?' asked Toddot West politely. "'Yes, you can. "'Alexander, go and sound the gong. "'James, will you carry this tray into the dining-room? "'And will you take the joint in, Mr Eastley? "'I'll bring the potatoes and the Yorkshire pudding.' "'There's a Scotland Yard man here,' said Alexander. "'Do you think he'll have lunch with us?' "'That depends on what your aunt arranges.' "'I don't suppose Aunt Emma would mind.' She's very hospitable, but uh, I suppose Uncle Harold wouldn't like it. He's being very sticky over this murder. Alexander went out through the door with the tray, adding a little additional information over his shoulder. Mr. Wimborne's in the library with the Scotland Yard man now, but he isn't staying to lunch. He said he had to get back to London. Come on, Stoddard. Oh, he's gone to do the gong. At that moment, the gong took charge. Stoddard West was an artist. He gave it everything he had, and all further conversation was inhibited. Brian carried in the joint, and Lucy followed with the vegetables, returning to the kitchen to get the two brimming sauce boats of gravy. Mr. Wimborne was standing in the hall, putting on his gloves, as Emma came quickly down the stairs. Are you really sure you won't stop for lunch, Mr. Wimborne? It's all ready. No, I have an important appointment in London. There's a restaurant car on the train. It was very good of you to come down, said Emma gratefully. The two police officers emerged from the library. Mr. Wimborne took Emma's hand in his. There's nothing to worry about, my dear, he said. This is Detective Inspector Craddock from New Scotland Yard, who's come down to take charge of the case. He's coming back at 2.15 to ask you for any facts that may assist him in his inquiry. But as I say... You have nothing to worry about. He looked towards Craddock. I may repeat to Miss Crackenthorpe what you have told me. Certainly, sir. Inspector Craddock has just told me that this almost certainly was not a local crime. The murdered woman is thought to have come from London and was probably a foreigner. Emma Crackenthorpe said sharply, A foreigner? Was she French? Mr. Wimborne had clearly made his statement to be consoling. He looked slightly taken aback. Dermot Craddock's glance went quickly from him to Emma's face. He wondered why she had leapt to the conclusion that the murdered woman was French, and why that thought disturbed her so much. The only people who really did justice to Lucy's excellent lunch were the two boys and Cedric Crackenthorpe, who appeared completely unaffected by the circumstances which had caused him to return to England. He seemed, indeed, to regard the whole thing as a rather good joke of a macabre nature. This attitude, Lucy noted, was most unpalatable to his brother Harold. Harold seemed to take the murder as a kind of personal insult to the Crackenthorpe family, and so great was his sense of outrage that he ate hardly any lunch. Emma looked worried and unhappy, and also ate very little. Alfred seemed lost in a train of thought of his own, and spoke very little. He was quite a good-looking man, with a thin, dark face and eyes set rather too close together. After lunch, the police officers returned and politely asked if they could have a few words with Mr. Cedric Crackenthorpe. Inspector Craddock was very pleasant and friendly. Sit down, Mr. Crackenthorpe. I understand you've just come back from the Balearics. You live out there? Have done for the last six years. In Ibiza. Suits me better than this dreary country. 
You get a good deal more sunshine than we do, I expect, said Inspector Craddock agreeably. You were home not so very long ago, I understand. For Christmas, to be exact. What made it necessary for you to come back again so soon? Cedric grinned. Got a wire from Emma, my sister. We never had a murder on the premises before. Didn't want to miss anything. So along I came. You were interested in criminology. Oh, we, we needn't put it in such highbrow terms. I, I just like murders, who done it's and all that. With a who done it parked right on the family doorstep, it seemed the chance of a lifetime. Besides, I thought poor old M might need a spot of help, managing the old man and the police and all the rest of it. I see. It appealed to your sporting instincts and also to your family feelings. I have no doubt your sister will be very grateful to you, although her two other brothers have also come to be with her. But not to cheer and comfort, Cedric told him. Harold is terrifically put out. It's not at all a thing for a city magnate to be mixed up with the murder of a questionable female. Craddock's eyebrows rose gently. Was she a questionable female? Well, you're the authority on that point. Going by the facts seems to me likely. I thought perhaps you might have been able to make a guess at who she was. Come now, Inspector, you already know, or your colleagues will tell you, that I haven't been able to identify her. I said a guess, Mr. Crackenthorpe. You might never have seen the woman before, but you might have been able to make a guess at who she was, or who she might have been. Cedric shook his head. You're barking up the wrong tree. I've absolutely no idea. You're suggesting, I suppose, that she may have come to the long barn to keep an assignation with one of us. But we none of us live here. The only people in the house were a woman and an old man. Well, you don't seriously believe that she came here to keep a date with my revered pop. Our point is, Inspector Bacon agrees with me, that the woman may once have had some association with this house. It may have been a considerable number of years ago. Now cast your mind back, Mr. Crackenthorpe. Cedric thought a moment or two, then shook his head. We've had foreign help from time to time, like most people, but I can't think of any likely possibility. Better ask the others. They know more than I would. We shall do that, of course. Craddock leant back in his chair and went on. As you have heard at the inquest, the medical evidence cannot fix the time of death very accurately. Longer than two weeks, less than four, which brings it somewhere around Christmas time. You have told me you came home for Christmas. Well, when did you arrive in England, and when did you leave? Cedric reflected. Let me see. I flew. Got here on the Saturday before Christmas. That would be the 21st. You flew straight from Yorker? Yes, left at five in the morning and got here midday. And you left? I flew back on the following Friday, the 27th. Thank you.
and pouring out a stream of fulsome compliments. A knock at the door interrupted the flow. Jeanne went to answer it and returned with a card in her hand. Madame will receive? Let me see. The dancer stretched out a languid hand, but at the sight of the name on the card, Count Sergius Pavlovich, a sudden flicker of interest came into her eyes. I will see him, the maze penoir, Jeanne, and quickly, and when the Count comes, you may go. Bien, madame. Jeanne brought the peignoir, an exquisite wisp of corn-coloured chiffon and ermine. Nadina slipped into it and sat smiling to herself, whilst one long white hand beat a slow tattoo on the glass of the dressing table. The Count was prompt to avail himself of the privilege accorded to him. A man of medium height, very slim, very elegant, very pale, extraordinarily weary. In feature little to take hold of, a man difficult to recognize again if one left his mannerisms out of account. 
he bowed over the dancer's hand with exaggerated courtliness. Madame, this is a pleasure indeed. So much Jeanne heard before she went out, closing the door behind her. Alone with her visitor, a subtle change came over Nadina's smile. Compatriots though we are, we will not speak Russian, I think, she observed. Since we neither of us know a word of the language, it might be as well, agreed her guest. By common consent, they dropped into English, and nobody, now that the Count's mannerisms had dropped from him, could doubt that it was his native language. He had indeed started life as a quick-change music hall artist in London. You had a great success tonight, he remarked. I congratulate you. All the same, said the woman. I am disturbed. My position is not what it was. The suspicions aroused during the war have never died down. I am continually watched and spied upon. But no charge of espionage was ever brought against you. Our chief lays his plans too carefully for that. Long life to the colonel, said the count, smiling. Amazing news, is it not, that he means to retire? To retire, just like a doctor or a butcher or a plumber. Or any other businessman, finished Nadina. It should not surprise us. That is what the colonel has always been, an excellent man of business. He has organized crime as another man might organize a boot factory. Without committing himself, he has planned and directed a series of stupendous coups, embracing every branch of what we might call his profession. Jewel robberies, forgery, espionage, the latter very profitable in wartime, sabotage, discreet assassination, there is hardly anything he has not touched. Wisest of all, he knows when to stop. The game begins to be dangerous. He retires gracefully with an enormous fortune. Hmm, said the Count doubtfully. It is rather upsetting for all of us. We're at a loose end, as it were. But we are being paid off on a most generous scale. Something, some undercurrent of mockery in her tone, made the man look at her sharply. She was smiling to herself, and the quality of her smile aroused his curiosity. But he proceeded diplomatically. Yes. The colonel has always been a great paymaster. I attribute much of his success to that and to his invariable plan of providing a suitable scapegoat. A great brain, undoubtedly a great brain, and an apostle of the maxim, if you want a thing done safely, do not do it yourself. Here are we, every one of us incriminated up to the hilt and absolutely in his power, and not one of us has anything on him. He paused, almost as though he were expecting her to disagree with him. But she remained silent, smiling to herself as before. Not one of us, he mused. Still, you know he's superstitious, the old man. Years ago, I believe he went to one of these fortune-telling people. She prophesied a lifetime of success, but declared that his downfall would be brought about through a woman. It interested her now. She looked up eagerly. That is strange, very strange, through a woman, you say. He smiled and shrugged his shoulders. Doubtless, now that he has retired, he will marry some young society beauty who will disperse his millions faster than he acquired them. Nadina shook her head. No, no, that is not the way of it. Listen, my friend, tomorrow I go to London. But your contract here? I shall be away only one night, and I go incognito, like royalty. No one will ever know that I have left France. And why do you think that I go? Hardly for pleasure at this time of year. January, a detestable foggy month. It must be for profit, eh? Exactly. She rose and stood in front of him, every graceful line of her arrogant with pride. You said just now that none of us had anything on the chief. You were wrong. I have. I, a woman, have had the wit and, yes, the courage, for it needs courage, to double-cross him. You remember the De Beer diamonds? Yes, I remember. At Kimberley, just before the war broke out. I had nothing to do with it, and I never heard the details. The case was hushed up for some reason, was it not? 
A fine haul, too. A hundred thousand pounds worth of stones. Two of us worked it, under the colonel's orders, of course. And it was then that I saw my chance. You see, the plan was to substitute some of the De Beer diamonds for some sample diamonds brought from South America by two young prospectors who happened to be in Kimberley at the time. Suspicion was then bound to fall on them. Very clever, interpolated the Count approvingly. The Colonel is always clever. Well, I did my part, but I also did one thing which the Colonel had not foreseen. I kept back some of the South American stones. One or two are unique and could easily be proved never to have passed through De Beer's hands. With these diamonds in my possession, I have the whip hand of my esteemed chief. Once the two young men are cleared, his part in the matter is bound to be suspected. I have said nothing all these years. I have been content to know that I had this weapon in reserve. But now matters are different. I want my price, and it will be big. I might almost say a staggering price. Extraordinary, said the Count, and doubtless you carry these diamonds about with you everywhere. His eyes roamed gently around the disordered room. Nadina laughed softly. You need suppose nothing of the sort. I am not a fool. The diamonds are in a safe place where no one will dream of looking for them. I never thought you a fool, my dear lady, but may I venture to suggest that you are somewhat foolhardy? The colonel is not the type of man to take kindly to being blackmailed, you know. I am not afraid of him, she laughed. There is only one man I have ever feared, and he is dead. The man looked at her curiously. Let us hope that he will not come to life again, then, he remarked lightly. What do you mean? cried the dancer sharply. The Count looked slightly surprised. Oh, I only meant that resurrection would be awkward for you, he explained. A foolish joke. She gave a sigh of relief. Oh no, he is dead all right, killed in the war. He was a man who once loved me. In South Africa, asked the Count negligently. Yes, since you ask it, in South Africa. That's your native country, is it not? She nodded. Her visitor rose and reached for his hat. Well, he remarked, you know your own business best, but if I were you, I should fear the colonel far more than any disillusioned lover. He is a man whom it is particularly easy to underestimate. She laughed scornfully, as if I did not know him after all these years. I wonder if you do, he said softly. I very much wonder if you do. Oh, I am not a fool, and I am not alone in this. The South African mailboat docks at Southampton tomorrow, and on board her is a man who has come specially from Africa at my request, and who has carried out certain orders of mine. The colonel will have not one of us to deal with, but two. Is that wise? It is necessary. You are sure of this man? A rather peculiar smile played over the dancer's face. I am quite sure of him. He is inefficient, but perfectly trustworthy. She paused and then added in an indifferent tone of voice, As a matter of fact, he happens to be my husband. Chapter One Everybody has been at me right and left to write this story, from the great represented by Lord Naseby, to the small, represented by our late maid-of-all-work, Emily, whom I saw when I was last in England. Law, miss, what a beautiful book you might make out of it all, just like the pictures. I'll admit that I have certain qualifications for the task. I was mixed up in the affair from the very beginning. I was in the thick of it all through, and I was triumphantly in at the death. Very fortunately, too, the gaps that I cannot supply from my own knowledge are amply covered by Sir Eustace Pedler's diary, of which he has kindly begged me to make use. So here goes. Anne Bedingfeld starts to narrate her adventures. 
I'd always longed for adventures. You see, my life had such a dreadful sameness. My father, Professor Beddingfeld, was one of England's greatest living authorities on primitive man. He really was a genius. Everyone admits that. His mind dwelt in Paleolithic times, and the inconvenience of life for him was that his body inhabited the modern world. Papa did not care for modern man, even Neolithic man he despised as a mere herder of cattle, and he did not rise to enthusiasm until he reached the Mousterian period. Unfortunately, one cannot entirely dispense with modern men. One is forced to have some kind of truck with butchers and bakers and milkmen and greengrocers. Therefore, Papa being immersed in the past, Mama having died when I was a baby, it fell to me to undertake the practical side of living. Frankly, I hate Paleolithic man, be he Aurignacian, Mousterian, Shellian, or anything else, and though I typed and revised most of Papa's Neanderthal man and his ancestors, Neanderthal men themselves fill me with loathing, and I always reflect what a fortunate circumstance it was that they became extinct in remote ages. I do not know whether Papa guessed my feelings on the subject, probably not, and in any case he would not have been interested. The opinion of other people never interested him in the slightest degree. I think it was really a sign of his greatness. In the same way, he lived quite detached from the necessities of daily life. He ate what was put before him in an exemplary fashion, but seemed mildly pained when the question of paying for it arose. We never seemed to have any money. His celebrity was not of the kind that brought in a cash return. Although he was a fellow of almost every important society, and had rows of letters after his name, the general public scarcely knew of his existence, and his long, learned books, though adding signally to the sum total of human knowledge, had no attraction for the masses. Only on one occasion did he leap into the public gaze. He had read a paper before some society on the subject of the young of the chimpanzee. The young of the human race show some anthropoid features, whereas the young of the chimpanzee approach more nearly to the human than the adult chimpanzee does. That seems to show that whereas our ancestors were more simian than we are, the chimpanzees were of a higher type than the present species. In other words, the chimpanzee is a degenerate. That enterprising newspaper, The Daily Budget, being hard up for something spicy, immediately brought itself out with large headlines. We are not descended from monkeys, but are monkeys descended from us? Eminent professor says chimpanzees are decadent humans. Shortly afterwards, a reporter called to see Papa and endeavoured to induce him to write a series of popular articles on the theory. I have seldom seen Papa so angry. He turned the reporter out of the house with scant ceremony, much to my secret sorrow, as we were particularly short of money at the moment. In fact, for a moment I meditated running after the young man and informing him that my father had changed his mind and would send the articles in question. I could easily have written them myself, and the probabilities were that Papa would never have learnt of the transaction— not being a reader of the daily budget. However, I rejected this course as being too risky, so I merely put on my best hat and went sadly down the village to interview our justly irate grocer. The reporter from the daily budget was the only young man who ever came to our house. There were times when I envied Emily, our little servant, who walked out whenever occasion offered with a large sailor to whom she was affianced. In between times, to keep her hand in, as she expressed it, she walked out with the greengrocer's young man and the chemist's assistant. I reflected sadly that I had no one to keep my hand in with. All Papa's friends were aged professors, usually with long beards. It is true that Professor Peterson once clasped me affectionately and said I had a neat little waist and then tried to kiss me. The phrase alone dated him hopelessly. No self-respecting female has had a neat little waist since I was in my cradle. I yearned for adventure, for love, for romance, and I seemed condemned to an existence of drab utility. 
The village possessed a lending library, full of tattered works of fiction, and I enjoyed perils and love-making at second hand, and went to sleep dreaming of stern, silent Rhodesians, and of strong men who always felled their opponent with a single blow. There was no one in the village who even looked as though they could fell an opponent with a single blow or several. There was the cinema, too, with a weekly episode of The Perils of Pamela. Pamela was a magnificent young woman. Nothing daunted her. She fell out of aeroplanes, adventured in submarines, climbed skyscrapers, and crept about in the underworld without turning a hair. She was not really clever. The master criminal of the underworld caught her each time, but as he seemed loath to knock her on the head in a simple way, and always doomed her to death in a sewer gas chamber, or by some new and marvellous means— the hero was always able to rescue her at the beginning of the following week's episode. I used to come out with my head in a delirious whirl, and then I would get home and find a notice from the gas company threatening to cut us off if the outstanding account was not paid. And yet, though I did not suspect it, every moment was bringing adventure nearer to me. It is possible that there are many people in the world who have never heard of the finding of an antique skull at the Broken Hill Mine in northern Rhodesia. I came down one morning to find Papa excited to the point of apoplexy. He poured out the whole story to me. You understand, Anne? There are undoubtedly certain resemblances to the Java skull, but superficial, superficial only. No, here we have what I have always maintained— the ancestral form of the Neanderthal race. You grant that the Gibraltar skull is the most primitive of the Neanderthal skulls found. Why? The cradle of the race was in Africa. They passed to Europe. Not marmalade on kippers, papa, I said hastily, arresting my parents' absent-minded hand. Yes, you were saying? They passed to Europe on... Here he broke down with a bad fit of choking, the result of an immoderate mouthful of kipper bones. But we must start at once, he declared as he rose to his feet at the conclusion of the meal. There is no time to be lost. We must be on the spot. There are doubtless incalculable finds to be found in the neighbourhood. I shall be interested to note whether the implements are typical of the Mousterian period. There will be the remains of the primitive ox, I should say, but not those of the woolly rhinoceros. Yes, a little army will be starting soon. We must get ahead of them. You will write to Cook's today, Anne. What about money, Papa? I hinted delicately.